So good morning, everyone. We start with the topic of image optimization. We mode imaging. Actually, the ultrasound is basically a frequency from twenty to twenty thousand hertz. What is infrasound is below twenty megahertz, and what is ultrasound is above twenty thousand. So it is the frequency of one megahertz to forty megahertz that are important for ultrasound, and it is in our practice done by a pulse transducer. We sends sound. and receives sound continuous transducer is used in cardiology for us it is pulse transducer 1% is time is spent in sending and 99% time is spent in listening what is coming back so what do you want to listen to you want to listen to information of short distance or you want to listen for information of long distance when you say it is a short distance the sound comes back quite quickly it is traveling only 2 cm distance whereas on the right side it is traveling 40 cm distance so if it is traveling 40 cm distance it will take more time and the image quality will not be as good one right to the face so it is not compulsory okay you should not have jerky movements in the camera because you are alone but i leave it on you okay. check so check so what are you feel comfortable you do it the ravi there is some voice there are interference there on the other side yeah can you stop our voice yeah hello ravi there is some interference in my voice on the other side somebody was speaking there okay sorry about that so we are seeing a distance traveling and coming back so if it is more depth or less depth if it is more depth we have less temporal resolution if it is less depth we have good temporal resolution so why 2 or why 20 cm so the principle is do not waste energy and use minimum distance that is required for improvement of resolution it is the elements which are sending you can see these are the elements fitted in a transducer and they send one by one 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 these lines and if we take a one 20 degree transducer we will find there are about 240 elements and 0.5 degree spacing between one element so we can imagine that there are going to be around 240 beams or lines that are going to be sent by this ultrasound transducer and these beams will converge like a focus like a torch focuses and then diverges so this focus is the area where you will get the best resolution of the image today fortunately all the companies have come under one brand that is fujinon or hitachi or ariata 850 and hopefully this machine will be a universal machine in future for all companies of olympus pentax and fujinon because it has got a fantastic resolution and till now mainly it is the pentax company which has been working with hitachi and making this transducer but now olympus also is forced to use with transducer and since fuji has acquired hitachi it is most likely we will see all the new scopes of all three good companies fitting into area type 50 so resolution is a three kind spatial temporal and contrast we have 
talked of temporal resolution already that you don't see too much you don't see too wide you see little narrow area when you are doing ultrasound talking of spatial resolution what is spatial is ability to see two structures along this or along this axis when you see along this axis this is called axial axial resolution when you see along this axis this is called lateral resolution so the frequency improves axial resolution and you will see in this case we are increasing frequency and with each increase in frequency the axial resolution improves a little bit more about elements so these elements combine to form waves suppose there are five people is speaking two on side one in center singing in a choir and all the waves are converging so the waves can be focused and this focus point is an important so the elements combine to form waves which are sent into tissue and when this focus is there this will improve the lateral resolution because you can move the focus up you can move the focus down and you can keep it into the area of interest to improve lateral resolution so frequency axial focus lateral and the third thing is you can improve by lines which are firing like this which are firing like this which are firing like this and all these are combining in an area which is in the central part of the screen and this central part of the screen this rounded area is the best area where you get compound imaging and better resolution we already talked of temporal resolution but we need to know that when the sound waves go they go for a depth they go for a width and the velocity of sound is related to frame depth into two going and coming frame rate which is shown in this screen as 47 and frame width how wide is the screen that will depend on the line density on the number of elements that are firing i hold it is so temporal resolution depends on frame rate frame dimension and width line density as i already explained more lines better spatial resolution but less temporal resolution less lines better temporal resolution so for example in this case we see a diatonal gland but we cut off the angle from the side from 150 to 100 Hundred degree, and the temporal resolution improved from fourteen to twenty-one. So, what is the best temporal resolution? Generally, fifteen, fifteen to twenty. Then we take zoom, we zoom the area. So, what is right zoom and what is read zoom? One thing is we take a picture in my mobile, and then we enlarge it. That is called read zoom and second thing is why taking picture in my mobile i zoom it first and then take it that is called right zoom so any picture where you are capturing you should try and capture on right zoom not on read zoom so i have explained bit of some temporal resolution special resolution and ultrasound has got bits 8 bit image and that is 8 bit image has got 256 shades of gray these are 256 shades of gray different more black more white more blue going from most black to most white and it is these 256 shades which are responsible for formation of ultrasound image just to check in ct scan you will see 1024 images bits But in ultrasound, two fifty six. What is the dynamic range? My voice is changing. I'm slow, and I am very fast. My change is up and down. Whatever audio you are receiving, that can capture a wide bit of dynamic range. AM radio, digital audio. 
So the dynamic range of change of p by decibel is less or more. Same way, the dynamic range of capture of your screen can be very low or can be very high. Means it is pick up many white shade, gray, 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 many shades, more dynamic range. It is picking up few shades, less dynamic range. So ultrasound waves return after hitting an object. And when they come back, you can see very loud echo. Why? Because very white. Why? Because it is hitting a very echogenic object. Or it can see very soft echo. Or it can hit nothing at all, like the fluid in the gallbladder. And this is seen as black. So most black is no reflection. Most white is everything reflected. What is tissue harmonic imaging? When we send ultrasound waves into the tissue and they come back. Sending is say on 10 megahertz frequency. But when they return, they carry their harmonics also. Say 20 megahertz, 30 megahertz. And when we analyze this 20 megahertz harmonics frequency, then that is the time you can analyze the, the returning frequency and that is the best frequency to do if you can concentrate on the area of the focus as seen in this case. So increase frequency and just focus, do right zoom and then, then see as in this case we did zooming and then we applied color Doppler. I think Dr. Vikram Bhatia will be giving a lecture on common Doppler. Can you please check? Dr. Vikram Bhatia must be on the way and so we will be giving the lecture soon afterwards. On this, so I will not speak on this more, but we need to decrease the gain. And in this case, we show the gain has been decreased, the spots have disappeared. Keep leveling the structures as you do, as you recall, because that will help you. What is this? What is this? And that will help you in thinking process, analytic process. For example, we have written, this is CBD, splenic vein, superior mesenthic vein, this is the portal vein, and this is the pancreatic duct. And these are the different structures that you see. They improve our analysis. And then you follow the structure during continuous movement. You can follow the structures by applying continuous color Doppler ultrasound, or you can follow the structures by to keep on writing, keep on following the structures and see all these structures from multiple stations. Zoom, as I said, in a right mode. Do not zoom in a read mode. So this is one example of doing imaging. Right zoom, as I said, is better than read zoom. And this is an example of right zoom because we have zoomed everything. And this is the example of a gall stone with thickening of the wall of the neck of the gall batter. And we must record, we must analyze, and then review the images later on also. Coming a bit to one part, this is the second part is that we must be able to see the needle. While we are doing EUS, we must be able to see the needle in a good way. One part is seeing the tissue, second part is seeing the needle. Most of the principles apply. Number one, use highest frequency. Adjust focus at the tip of the needle. Sometimes we can split the focus. Do not use compound imaging because the needle may disappear if you use compound imaging. Try tissue harmonic imaging. Decrease the dynamic range and adjust the basal gain to decrease or increase the contrast. I will explain. Use 
highest frequency. Focus, as I said, keep the tip of the needle in the focus area, in between two focus. Use these lines, one line, two line. Do not compound the image because by compounding the needle artifact may disappear. You want to create an artifact. We want to create an artifact and we don't want artifact to disappear. In fact, needle is an artifact which must be look like, it must appear. Try tissue harmonic imaging. You know, try the tissue harmonic imaging. Sometimes it will increase, sometimes it will decrease. Adjust the contrast. Contrast can be decreased. Decrease contrast a little bit. Sound hits the plane surface. So it can hit irregular surface and it hits small surface. I will just try to explain how does the needle, how is the needle seen when you are hitting it with the sound. So if you are hitting a plane surface, it will just come back. Irregular surface, it will come back in multiple axes and a small surface, it will scatter. So this is what happens when you are hitting on a plane surface, which is at this angle, sound will come back. But if sound is, needle comes out an oblique angle. So sound hitting the needle at oblique angle will go out of the, they will. So what was done? You try to make the surface of the needle irregular. And so that some of the sound waves come back. This is, and how was this irregularity created on the needle? It was by sand blasting. So sound waves will be needle, reflected from the needle, they will come back. Number one, with some, some sound waves which are close to the needle will come back, but those which are away will not come back. So this needle comes out, smooth surface as I shown you will reflect, but if it is an irregular surface, as it is corrugated surface, then the sound wave will come back into the to the transducer. So this was the trick involved in visualizing the needle by sand blasting and creating corrugated irregular surface. One of the last thing is adjust the dynamic range. And as I said, I want the dynamic range to be as narrow as possible. I just want to see black and white. Most black, most white. When I am seeing the needle, everything, I have analyzed it. I have done the imaging, I have done everything. But right now, all I want is most black or most white. And that can be done by... So the low dynamic range enhances the visibility of all of the needle. So this is the part that I wanted to emphasize that while you are doing deep imaging, try to do low dynamic range. So in summary, I would like to explain the following points. You save energy to an area on ultrasound. Identify the area of interest in imaging. Use High frequency, if area is close to transducer. Use low frequency, if area is away from the transducer. Adjust focus. And as I said, this will not be required in newer machines. Because newer machines will have batch firing and there will be no need to focus. Pre frame rate above 15 to 20. Use tissue harmonic when it is required. Identify your need. What is the need? You want to do imaging or you want to do FNSC? And always compound for better resolution except during FNSC and use Zoom. So, I have finished my lecture a bit early. I will be handing over the mic another few minutes to Dr. Bikram Bhatia.
and he will be speaking on color doppler we are doing this for the first time and uh, we do not have the it is the first time we are doing we do not have the know how of how to do a smooth transition so i will apologize to my audience but we are still uh, evolving so there will be couple of minutes delay before dr vikram bhatia takes over for his lecture so uh, ravi will now fit the camera of dr for dr vikram bhatia's lecture he want to i am sorry means i do not have cause uh, your questions in this session and uh, i have no idea if i i did not foresee that if i finish my lecture early so there will be questions so however i request those to so those to continue uh, with the lecture in the meantime uh, shikha can i uh, get my screen share my screen once more so i want to continue the uh, screen for some time because i want to explain on some parts more so this part i would like to uh, re emphasize on this point few points as i said in my lecture so to briefly summarize this that this is ultrasound image that we see it is a transducer which is going and coming back we should use minimum distance while we are doing more distance less distance this is good versus bad temporal resolution do not waste energy sound is formed by elements elements are fitted in the transducer and these elements these elements are fitted at about 6 points uh, five, 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 five degrees and the elements produce waves which converge converge like this and then they diverge this is convergence and as i told you the new machines have developed a system where there is batch firing so the focus in new machines have almost disappeared disappeared and in batch firing is many elements firing together so there is no need for ultrasound waves to focus so this is called batch firing a new technology which has evolved very recently resolution is of three kinds spatial resolution temporal resolution and contrast resolution axial resolution is along the axis lateral resolution is along this axis we improve the frequency use highest frequency when we want to see closer structure lowest frequency when we want to see distant structure the elements form waves which can converge and the focus improves lateral resolution but as i told you in newer machine there will be no focus the concept of focus will be gone okay compounding improves the lateral resolution and this is the important part okay so uh, how much time i have ravi sir we have four minutes okay so we can start early or temporal resolution is 15 meter per second as i said the sound waves can travel only 1500 meters in one second they have to go and come back so whatever information is on the screen total screen is being collected by this traveling of 1500 meters in one second 
for example this is an interesting concept i have told you that this is 1500 meter per second sound wave sound is traveling down and back this is called frame depth in this case sound is traveling for 120 degree the so 120 degree has 240 element 240 elements and this frame width to so frame depth frame width and frame rate so whenever you are trying to see an image you must find out in your mind what is your frame depth what is your frame width what is your frame rate because these are the lines as i have shown you that these are the lines which are coming on the ultrasound screen more lines or less lines this is what we want to see we can increase the number of lines we can decrease the number of lines you must ask this question from your ultrasound machine people how can i increase number of line how can i decrease my number of lines increase number of lines will a better resolution for example in this case i had cut off the angle 150 degree angle has been cut off to 100 degree angle okay you can zoom right zoom and read zoom i have already explained you right zoom you must do because it has good image the same image is that is in the center is red zoom on the left side you will have good image resolution of final part there is a thing called contrast resolution the contrast resolution shows 256 shades of gray this bits 8 bit is 2 into 2 into 2 into 2 8 times that is 256 bits 10 bit is 2 into 2 10 times that is 10 bits of gray shade ct scan has got 1024 bits ultrasound has got 256 bits must adjust the dynamic range this is the dynamic range has got less dynamic range low dynamic range good quality of imaging you should have good high dynamic range and bad quality of imaging we have low dynamic range we must improve the resolution high dynamic range in this case we are seeing soft echoes we are seeing large soft echoes as gray dot loud echoes as white dots no echoes as black dots tissue harmonic imaging i have already explained so i will now come to my last slide and give away my lecture uh, to 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 dr vikram the podium to dr vikram bhatia because this is my last slide that to say save energy identify the area of interest use high frequency if you are close to transducer low frequency if you are away adjust focus keep frame rate to 15 20 use tissue harmonic and identify your need always compound for better resolution and zoom whenever you can zoom so nine o'clock we can shift now to in 2 minutes dr vikram bhatia will be on sir sir apartment mein hi se kar raha hu ab aaiye
good morning everyone uh, i need some feedback if i am uh, my slides are visible and uh, i am audible there please yes we can hear you uh, uh, was it dr malik please okay so am i audible can i proceed please Are my slides seen? Can you check if I'm uh, seen? I will come, Mr. Vivek. Yes, we can hear you and see you. Okay, so uh, uh, let me begin by thanking Dr. Malay Sharma. Uh, this is uh, a, actually a new way, new normal, if I might, of uh, presenting. I am sitting in Dr. Malay Sharma's beautiful office in Aryavrat Hospital on his table and uh, projecting uh, my slides from his uh, desktop. So the topic that he has given me is actually uh, very pertinent. It is the optimal use and applicability of color Doppler, and I have added pulse Doppler because we'll talk of Doppler as it is. And uh, these things are very commonly underutilized. and most of us don't even know how to uh, sorry my slides are not moving okay so this is the second slide so uh, we will talk by telling you how to interpret and optimize a color doppler us display we will then talk on how to interpret and optimize pulse wave what is also called a spectral doppler us display we'll also share some examples of applications of us doppler just bear with me please uh, this may sound very theoretical at first but let me assure you it is extremely practical very underutilized uh, topic and uh, uh, you will find a lot of applications of this as you go by so let us start by uh, talking of the color doppler display so i'll be showing you a a, a picture from a olympus machine but the same principles apply to all fujinon pentax hitachi aloka all the ultrasound consoles that you see now this is what you normally display on the screen and we all look at the red color the blue color the color box and certain controls here let me take you through what they mean so this is a roi color box so what it means is that there is a b mode image and a color box has overlaid the doppler signal on the b mode image so the machine knows that it is going to allocate color to areas which are dark which means that if you look here this g is the b mode gain this c is the color mode color or the b mode contrast so if you are going to do a color doppler display we want the b mode gain to be low so that the image is a little bit on the darker side so that the machine can allocate the color to more darker areas and a little bit the color doppler imaging will become more crisp fg refers to the flow gain flow gain as you know is similar to a b mode gain that is how much the returning doppler signals are amplified by the machine so if you increase the flow gain a lot there will be color bleeding or there will be a spill of color outside the vessel which you don't want if you reduce the flow gain you will not see image and much of the vessel will be black so the first thing to optimize is the b mode gain should be brought down a bit low the flow gain is to be optimized which means that there should be color inside the vessel but no spill outside the vessel if you take the roi or the color box a bit deeper you have to increase the flow gain if it is superficial you have to obviously reduce the gain furthermore as dr male would have told you you keep the depth of the image optimal you don't have to image very deep because you want to save the ultrasound pulses and you want to maintain a good frame rate so you should image at a depth of around 4 maximum 5 cm if you are going to do a color doppler uh, evaluation of the field i hope i am uh, uh, getting through clearly now look at these color bars on 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 the upper left side of the screen there are two numbers here plus 7.5 minus 7.5 these tell you what is called the flow velocity range please remember that these are not the velocity the true velocity at which the blood is flowing 
but this is the main spectral or uh, sorry the main uh, the main doppler shift which is being displayed here this is a color display or a color scale bar which tells you that blood which is coming towards the transducer is red that which is going away from the transducer is blue it does not mean that red is artery and blue is vein that is a very common mistake it simply tells you the direction of flow of the blood so here you see a vessel in the us image the flow is coming this is actually a portal vein so the the portal vein initially approaches the uh, transducer it is color coded in red and then the flow goes down it is color coded in blue now we have what i told you something called the velocity map and the, uh, the the scheme that we use is bart scheme bart scheme means blue away red towards blue away red towards color scheme for color doppler so this basically tells you that what is the direction of flow of the blood and it also uses color saturation to code for the velocity so if you have a lighter hue or a lighter shade it tells you that the blood is flowing faster it does not tell you the absolute flow rate in the uh, in the vessel but gives you a mean doppler velocity shift in the color coding you can also have variance maps in which it tells you that if there is a turbulence in a flow but most often in us we use a bart scheme velocity map so this shows you the flow direction this vessel is a per inflow perforator this is a outflow perforator and the flow is directed from away the transducer now look at the three color doppler modes there is a color flow or a color doppler there is a power flow and there is also something called h flow or e flow uh, newer modes in the in all of the machines and some variants of all of these so what is color flow we just saw color flow here this is a color flow color flow doppler so color flow doppler basically displays the direction of flow and the rate of flow or the frequency shift of blood in the colors that is it gives you an approximate idea of how fast the blood is flowing it will not tell you the absolute velocity it will tell you that the blood here is maybe faster than the blood here and it also tells you the direction of the blood but in relation to the transducer it does not tell you the intensity or the strength of doppler signal or how much the blood is flowing that is told to you by what is called the power flow so you all have seen this yellow uh, power doppler flow this displays the intensity or the strength of the doppler signals in color what does it mean it tells you it do doesn't tell you any information on the velocity whether the blood is going from here to here or from uh, away from the transducer or the direction of flow it simply tells you the intensity or the strength of the flow in a vessel how much the blood is flowing it uses a monochromatic color scale higher the intensity lighter the hue less yellow brighter more whiter is the hue and more vivid is the color now because power flow is not dependent upon the velocity or the direction of flow it is not suffering from aliasing which i will talk and it is uh, very insensitive to the angle of insulation of the vessel this property makes it much more sensitive more than 3 times sensitive than a color doppler so if you have slow flow in a vessel power doppler may show that to you better but you please remember that power flow is depicting the intensity it is not telling you the the direction of flow or the 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 velocity of the blood flowing in a particular vessel another mode which has come up now is the h flow or the e flow this tells you the blood flow strength information plus the flow direction and color what h flow or e flow in hitachi and in olympus systems and in fuji systems uh, have the property is that they have a higher light higher uh, line recording density. in progress so they have better resolution but the frame rate is slower now because the line density is higher there is less blooming artifacts it is useful when you want to visualize a small vessel in the near field h flow or e flow become less sensitive as you image far in the field so if you have to look at a smaller vessel closer to the transducer this is the mode color doppler flow mode that you have to use while if the uh, if you have to image if you have to place the roi deeper in the uh, in the visual field h flow may not show you the flow in the vessel now these just show you this is a color flow this is a power flow this is a h flow or a e flow 
I don't have a feedback here. I hope I am audible uh, so far. Okay, so I'll carry on. How do you optimize a color Doppler display? We have already talked of the color gain. This is the flow gain 26. This is a image with a high color gain. You can see, see what we call color bleeding or the spill of the, uh, of the color map onto non-vascular structures. So you reduce the flow gain from 26 to 19. And now the color is nicely confined to the vessel. This is a portal vein being imaged from the duodenum. This is the bile duct. And this portal vein is showing you a hepatopetal flow coming towards the liver, towards the transducer coded in red and then away from the transducer coded in blue. So you can tell the portal vein flow direction by this way. Now, further optimizing the color Doppler display, you must understand the concept of aliasing. Now, aliasing is seen, color Doppler is basically a pulsed imaging technique, so it suffers from aliasing, which means that if the pulse repetition frequency is less than two times the velocity or the Nyquist limit, then there is an apparent reversal of flow direction. On color Doppler, you see it as a, as a mixture of colors. You see blue and green here without any black space between the blue pixels and the red pixels. So this is a depiction of aliasing on color Doppler. This is not an aliasing. Here is a black space between the red and blue pixels. So you can see that aliasing only appears in some portion of the vessels because of the effect of Doppler angle. When the vessel is imaged here, the Doppler angle is less. So aliasing appears, the, 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 the flow rate is amplified, while in the center where the image is almost at a 90 degree, there is no aliasing. So on color Doppler, you suspect aliasing. This is not a good image. We are often not bothered, but this is not a good image. You see red and blue colors intermingled. So this is an, an example of an aliasing. And how do you correct aliasing? We avoid too low a velocity scale. So look at the velocity scale here. It is uh, very less here, plus minus six. If you increase the velocity scale, you reduce the depth of imaging. So if you increase the velocity scale, aliasing goes, and now you see a clean red here and a clean blue here and a black uh, in between. But if you increase the, the velocity scale too high, and then the sensitivity goes down, and then the flow may not be depicted. So what is very important for the, for the endosonographers to remember in color uh, Doppler is the use of optimal use of the velocity scale. Please remember that if you reduce the velocity scale, the machine becomes more sensitive to flow. So in venous images and in small low flow vessels, you have to reduce the velocity scale. However, there is more aliasing if you reduce the velocity scale too much. If you increase the velocity scale, the color coding is optimized. There is no aliasing, but the sensitivity to slow flow decreases and you may not be able to depict flow in a blood vessel. So very often in practice, endosonographers see that you have placed a color Doppler on a vessel, but no flow is being seen. In that case, the step to be done is to reduce the size of the color box, reduce the depth of imaging and reduce the pulse repetition frequency or the velocity scale. I hope I am uh, again uh, clear on this account. Let us now move to pulsed or spectral Doppler display. Now, normally we all have seen this spectral or a pulse Doppler display. Most often in US, we just use it to define whether a said vessel is an artery or a said vessel is a vein. This is a arterial spectral Doppler from the right common iliac artery. This is from the right common iliac vein. I'm doing a transrectal US, but there is so much more to understand in a pulse wave Doppler. And this is a sample of a pulse wave Doppler display. We are trying to display the hepatic artery pulse spectral waveform. You can see that this is the hepatic artery trace. It is a low resistance arterial waveform. We will just tell you how to decide whether it is low or high resistance. There is a spectral broadening or a fill-in of the spectral window, which is very often seen when there is turbulence. Uh, just look at all of these. This is actually a triplex. Uh, a display with B mode, color Doppler mode and spectral mode display. This is the sample volume. The two, the two bars which you see is the sample volume. This is the area from which the spectral or the pulse Doppler information is being gathered. You do not have to align the sample volume with the angle with, with the vessel. This is simply telling you the area from which the pulse Doppler information is being obtained. 
this sample volume should be very narrow it should be less than half to two third of the vessel diameter and usually less than 2 to 2.5 millimeters in size here you see the width of the sample volume which is 1.5 millimeters this sample volume should be kept in the center of the artery or the vein to target the laminar flow in the center and to avoid turbulence or spurious spectral widening if you place the sample volume periphery so please remember that the sample volume should be as small as possible particularly for arteries in veins you can keep the sample volume a bit broader it should be placed in the center and it should be less than 2 to 2.5 mm in size you do not need to align the sample volume with the vessel this is the pulsed wave cursor which tells you the direction at which the vessel is being interrogated in general it is very difficult in us to get a correct uh, interrogation angle of the vessel but generally try to image into the vessel try to image into the vessel do not try to image vertically into the vessel do not try to image cross sections of the vessels when you are using a pulsed wave or a spectral doppler this is the angle correction bar we sometimes use it often we do not use it now you know the doppler equation the angle which is this has to be less than 60 degrees so angle correction bar is used to align the sample volume or the sampling Uh, the uh, the pulsed wave doppler to the direction of the blood flow we do not often use it angle correction bar is only used if you want to estimate the velocity otherwise in us we depend upon the uh, the the morphology of this pulsed or the spectral doppler display and whether it is low resistance or high resistance okay similarly you can have this doppler gain this is the pulsed wave gain setting if you increase the gain this becomes more white and you can have a spurious spectral broadening if you reduce the gain of the pulsed wave display you can miss a small volume blood flow so let us see how to interpret a pulsed wave spectral doppler display this is the baseline which tells you the velocity of 0 cm per second this is the direction of flow this is towards the transducer a display which is below the baseline is away from the transducer and all of these white 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 things are velocity points which means that at any given point on the waveform this corresponds to a specific velocity which is happening in the interrogation point at that point in time so this is the time i hope you can see my arrow this is the direction towards transducer below is the direction away from the transducer and each of these white points represents a velocity so at this point in time this range of velocities is present in the vessel at this point this range of velocities is present in the same vessel the peak of the spectral display is called the peak systolic velocity or psv or v max this is the systole this is the diastole and this is the end diastolic velocity or the vd or the edv end diastolic velocity how to optimize a pulsed wave doppler display again like a color doppler you decrease the depth of imaging so that the ultrasound waves are optimized the cursor is used to reduce the angle to flow what i have mentioned in my last slide you must image into the uh, artery or the vein which is extremely difficult at times with the us even for large vessels like the portal vein very often in us you are seeing the vessel in b mode in a long axis this is good for a b mode imaging but for color doppler or for pulse doppler you have to image the vessel at an angle in a long axis not in a cross section sample volume i have mentioned again this is the sample volume this is placed in the mid portion of the vessel size should be 2 to 4 mm less than 2 mm in arteries maybe a bit, little more bigger for smaller flowing veins 1/3 to half of the vessel diameter you adjust the velocity scale this is the velocity scale you keep the velocity scale lower for venous studies you increase the velocity if there is aliasing and if you see a gap here this means that the wall filter will need to be adjusted so there are many things i am just introducing concepts and uh, i just hope that you, the audience gathers what all is to be done for a doppler display again like color doppler pulse doppler is also a 
uh, pulsed technique. So we have the problem of aliasing. Again, to reiterate, aliasing in spectral Doppler is seen when the you very often display a spectral uh, waveform like this. When the spectral waveform goes over the top of the display and wraps around at the bottom, this is aliasing. So what you have to do is you have to decrease the depth of imaging. You have to increase the Doppler angle. You have to reduce the baseline and you have to increase the range of displayed velocity. A good spectral waveform the should uh, span around half to, to three fourths of the height of the velocity scale. This is what happens if with the effect of Doppler gain. Again, if you want to display a good spectral waveform for your studies, for academics, for patient diagnosis, this is a portal vein uh, pulsed wave Doppler. This is the Doppler angle. The vessel is coming like this and it, you are interrogating into the vessel as you rightfully uh, give. This is the portal vein spectral Doppler that I obtained first. But see that the Doppler gain here is 40. You reduce the Doppler gain and now you get a clean spectral waveform of the portal vein at a Doppler gain of 20. So the pulsed wave Doppler gain is also to be optimized. Color flow Doppler gain is to be optimized. B mode gain is totally separate. That is to be optimized in each of the triplex imaging. Now, moving on to how to interpret an arterial waveform on EUS. We will not go into detail. We just want to do eyeballing. Have a broad idea of how the arterial waveform is to be interpreted. In general, arteries can be divided into two. One is a low resistance arteries, others are high resistance arteries. What do they mean? Low resistance arteries doesn't mean that the artery has low resistance. It means that the vascular bed that it is perfusing, the capillaries and the arterioles in that vascular bed are low resistance. While high resistance arteries have nothing to do with the arterial wall, it simply means that the blood that the artery is delivering to the, the vascular bed the artery arterioles and the capillaries, precapillary sphincters are constricted. So there is more resistance in the perfused vascular bed. Now, why should that be? Low resistance means that the perfused organ needs a lot of blood supply. What would these organs be? They would be the liver. They always need blood. So the blood vessels to the liver are low resistance. Spleen always needs blood, low resistance arteries. Brain, low resistance, art, low resistance arteries, internal carotid. The celiac artery, because it branches off to the hepatic artery and the splenic artery. An example of a low resistance artery. But on the other hand, unlike celiac artery, the SMA, when you are doing US, the patient is fasting. The SMA doesn't need to provide blood to the fasting gut. So during fasting, SMA is high resistance. If you feed the patient, SMA becomes low resistance. External carotid artery, the scalp doesn't need much blood, so it is high resistance. Peripheral arteries to the hand, to the arms, to the legs, which obviously we don't see on US, uh, are high resistance arteries. So low resistance arteries, this is systole, this is diastole broadly. So you basically identify them when the trough of waveform at end diastole is high which means that there is some pan diastolic flow, but there is a high end diastolic velocity here. So the trough at end diastole is high. This is basically a low resistance artery. Examples again being hepatic artery, renal artery, celiac artery, internal carotid. High resistance means that there is a low trough at end diastole with relatively less flow during diastole. You only, the artery can only deliver a push during systole during diastole, the flow collapses, and this is a high resistance artery. Resistive index here is 0.55 to 0 0.7. Our EUS transducers give us a RI, and RI here is more than 0 0.7. Let me show you some EUS examples of arterial waveforms. This is a transrectal EUS of a hemorrhoidal artery. Now, what do you expect? A hemorrhoidal artery is an artery which is pretty far. It, this is a high resistive artery. Good systolic peak. Diastolic reversal, no diastolic flow. This is a classical high resistive artery. This is a fasting SMA. Peaks, uh, fast systolic upstroke, fast downstroke, diastolic reversal, maybe a notch, hardly any flow in the diastole, high resistance SMA. This is a 
low resistive flow in the same celiac artery once the patient has been given food. This is the hepatic artery trace that I showed you. This is also a low resistance artery. Obviously, the systolic upstroke is fast, but the diastolic flow persists and there is a high end diastolic velocity. So, hepatic artery EUS waveform shows you a low resistive waveform. What about the aorta? This is a spectral waveform that I am taking from the thoracic aorta. In the upper part, the aorta is low resistive because it perfuses beds which require blood all through. But this is the aortic waveform that I am taking from below, transrectal, in a pelvic part of the, uh, sorry, in the suprapelvic aorta where it just before it divides. And here the aorta becomes high resistive. So this is the same vessel, aorta, low resistance above, becomes high resistive below the renal uh, vessel takeoff. How do you interpret venous waveforms on US? There are many ways, but I have broadly divided the venous waveforms on US into four types. First is a pulsatile waveform. This is seen when the, the, the waveform looks just like arterial waveform. This is seen in veins which are closer to the heart, like a zygous vein, IVC. So there is a lot of cardiophasic or a cardiac impulses being transmitted to these veins. The second extreme is a continuous or non-phasic waveform. This is seen in veins which are far away from the heart. So you have a continuous venous waveform. While closer to the heart, you have more pulsatile waveform. Obviously, on a continuous and on a pulsatile, you will have respirophasic or respiratory variations also. I will just show you some an example. Regurgitant waveform we hardly ever seen in US. This is seen in cases like TR where there is two and forward and backward flow of equal magnitude. Sometimes you will see fistula flow, particularly I find this in the uh, certain uh, subgroup of rectal varices. When there is an arteriovenous communication, there is broad peaks and the flow looks like this. These are some US examples of venous spectral waveforms. This is a perirectal collateral. See that it, the, the rectum is so far away from the heart. There is no arterial pulsation on it. This is a minimally or a non-phasic continuous venous waveform. This is what you expect in a uh, perirectal uh, collateral. However, in this particular case, in the rectal varices, you get a pulsatile waveform. And these patients would often go on to have bleed from rectal varices. This is what we have found. So, uh, a pulsatile waveform in the rectal varices. These are the hemorrhoids. So, these are mildly or minimally phasic venous waveform over the hemorrhoids in the upper part, upper third of the anal canal. This is the inferior vena cava, which I told you is very close to the heart. And this is a pulsatile waveform. This is again in the anal canal showing a posterior midline trans anal perforator. And this is showing a fistula flow. When we, in, when we study the anus, as we often do, we often find fistula flows of arteriovenous communications in the anal canal. This is still unpublished, but we should be able to uh, interpret the venous spectral waveforms. This is how you normally see a venous waveform. I have shown you a portal vein spectral waveform just to illustrate. Again, to reiterate that veins at a distance from the heart, only respirophasic flow, that is mesenteric veins, you will only have respiratory variations. This is a portal vein flow. Now, please look that this, this, this are cardiophasic or transmitted pulsations. But in between, you have the super added respirophasic variation. So this is a normal portal vein waveform. As an example, which shows you cardiophasic uh, pulsations transmitted from the hepatic veins through the sinusoids. And then superimposed on that, you have the respirophasic variations. As you know, when, the, when you expire, the flow increases in the portal vein. When you inspire, flow decreases in the portal vein. So expiration, inspiration, expiration, inspiration, plus super added cardiophasic pulsations. This is a normal uh, portal vein spectral waveform and disease will cause variations from this normal. So we must learn to interpret the normal waveforms. Now, let me just rush through. Uh, Dr. Malay, what's the time uh, line here? If anybody can give me a feedback. I'm sorry, I'm alone in this room. So if anybody can come in and let me know the time, how much I have. Uh, in the meantime, I'll just, I hope that- uh, Sir, I we have, have 14 minutes for you, sir. How much? 14, 1-4, 14. 1-4, fair enough. 
so i fair enough 15 minutes or 14 minutes for me so in the first part of this section uh, was mainly didactic i have tried to tell you what is the meaning of color doppler how to optimize color doppler how do you on the screen look at the spectral waveform and all the data that is there how do you optimize the spectral waveform how do you correct aliasing in the color doppler and spectral doppler what is the difference between color doppler power doppler and h flow and then finally how do you interpret an arterial spectral waveform how do you interpret a venous spectral waveform now all this is very nice to hear now let me also show you on us just some examples of application uh, of this all of this in portal and systemic circulation this is not comprehensive this is just to show you something normal hepatic artery size around 5 mm low resistance monophasic flow now in cirrhosis we can study changes the hepatic artery becomes bigger it, it, obviously there is a compensatory hepatic increase flow flow rate increases velocity increases normal is 70 in this case you see that the velocity is going almost up to 120 the resistance or the ri of the hepatic artery in cirrhosis is variable we have found that it can either increase or decrease i don't have time to discuss all that what happens in portal vein on eus you can very easily see the hepatopetal hepatofugal absent flow or to and fro flow in a patient of cirrhosis so this is you can all imagine an imaging of the portal vein from the stomach you have the quadrate lobe and then you have the portal vein dipping down portal vein coming in this is the cranial part this is the caudal part so here the color coding is in red because flow is towards you here the color coding is in blue because the flow is away from you but basically tells you that the portal vein flow is towards the liver so this is a hepatopetal flow one two this is an example of what i told you of aliasing and you see aliasing here because now the doppler angle is very shallow so the uh, aliasing is seen in this part of the portal vein but uh, very easy to demonstrate the hepatopetal flow when you image from a d1 this is the bile duct this is the portal vein this is our hepatopetal portal flow is seen red and then blue when if it is hepatofugal then well it is red here and blue here so away from the liver so the normal portal vein diameter is 6 to 12 mm and the flow direction is hepatopetal or antegrade throughout the cardiac cycle i just showed you the portal vein uh, waveform normal there are gentle undulations the pi you can very easily calculate here is more than 0.5 normally peak systolic velocity which you can also calculate if you give the angle correction is 16 to 40 cm per second please remember that in cirrhotic the flow velocity decreases and the diameter increases now this is what happens to the portal vein in cirrhosis the diameter on us is more than 13 mm and it is to be measured where the hepatic artery crosses the portal vein that is where you measure the diameter from one inner wall to the one outer wall at the level of hepatic vein crossing more than 13 mm is portal hypertension there is blunting of the respiratory variation so this is normal then there is bidirectional to and fro flow and then there is a reverse or a hepatofugal flow in a cirrhotic patients with us good technique you can see all of these what is also very important is that the velocity decreases to less than 16 cm per second this is pathognomic of portal hypertension you can measure it with us uh what is very interesting another thing which we can do and which we should be doing is us hepatic vein evaluation again just bear with me for 2 minutes remember your uh, previous physiology the hepatic waveform this is the trans ultra the trans abdominal hepatic vein spectral display so you have small waves on top big waves down antegrade wave is towards the heart retrograde wave is away from the heart so if you are doing a uh, trans abdominal ultrasound the antegrade waves go away from you the retrograde waves come towards you when you are doing us it is the reverse of a trans abdominal hepatic spectral doppler the antegrade waves come towards you and the retrograde waves go away from you so please remember that the hepatic veins have a wave s wave b wave d wave i hope you remember that the s and d waves are antegrade waves which go towards the atria 
the A and B waves in hepatic veins, spectral Doppler are away from the, uh, the right atrium uh, retrograde. This is how you do a hepatic vein spectral Doppler evaluation and it is very important. The hepatic vein spectral Doppler that you obtain with US is the reverse of the, uh, the what is given in radiology books. You have the S wave and the D wave anti-grade waves above the baseline that is towards the transducer. The A wave and the B wave and the V wave, which are the retrograde waves away from the US transducers. So this is a hepatic wave waveform. It has huge number of applications, A wave, S wave, V wave, D wave. And uh, I shall not go into detail, but in general for US hepatic vein evaluation, this is my protocol. The depth of field is kept to four centimeter. I study the left hepatic vein. It is very easy. It comes at a shallow Doppler angle. The distance is two to three centimeters from the entry into the hepatic vein. At this point in a non-serotic patient, the diameter should be more than 10 millimeter while it becomes thinner in a serotic uh, liver. We make three recordings and then we average. We basically see, uh, classify in a, in, in a nutshell, whether the hepatic waveform is triphasic, biphasic or monophasic. And we see that the S wave should always be more than the D wave. This is normal. I don't have to make more measurements. If I want to be very smart, I can calculate the damping index also. And this is what happens in cirrhosis. There is a decrease in hepatic vein phasicity and there is also a spectral broadening or a filling in of the hepatic veins. So if you see here above, this is a normal triphasic hepatic vein spectral waveform. This is normal. And the hepatic vein is of a good size. This is a normal triphasic spectral waveform. As cirrhosis progresses, the triphasic waveform becomes biphasic and then monophasic. So let me show you. This is a cirrhotic patient. The vein is thinner. And well, this is a biphasic, actually a monophasic waveform. And this is classical for cirrhosis. So on EUS, Sometimes we are confused if this says patient has CLD, cirrhosis, advanced fibrosis. This is a very good way to detect that. If you get a monophasic or a biphasic waveform, it correlates with higher CTP scores, higher HVPG level. If the waveform in hepatic vein is monophasic, the HVPG is almost always more than 15 millimeter of mercury. So a monophasic hepatic vein waveform on US indicates advanced portal hypertension. I hope I am clear on this. As I guess is also very nicely evaluated and uh, fortunately is the, the uh, US is the only way as an as I guess vein can be evaluated. We see the as I guess arch, you all know this at 24 to 27 centimeters over the right main bronchus and right pulmonary arteries. This is a linear trans thoracic imaging. Uh, the lowermost part of the as I guess we can trace down to 32 to 37 centimeter. If you remember your anatomy, the esophagus moves to the left. So the end of azygus for me is when I find the esophagus, the outer and the azygus, which means the outer comes between the transducer and the azygus. This is the lowermost part and we see certain intercostal veins. Now on EUS, we divide the azygus vein into, or I divide the azygus vein into two. This is the esophago petal that is flowed towards you. And this is the esophago fugal, which is away from you at the azygus arch. This is where we can measure the azygous diameter and this is the azygous spectral waveform. Again, a very big S wave, a smaller D wave and a E wave. So we can calculate the azygous blood flow, the azygous dilatation and the uh, azygous flow parameters in patients of cirrhosis and other pathologies. Uh, I have three, four minutes and I shall end by giving you some miscellaneous examples. This was for portal hypertension, other vascular diseases. Uh, just let me uh, uh, sort of excite you where you can use it. It is very useful, for example, for distinguishing biliary polyps and tumor from sludge. Mm -hmm. So a good use of Doppler, particularly the H flow or the E flow will often help you decide if this is a perfused tumor or a adenoma. This is a perfused gallbladder polyp. This is a gall uh, gallbladder polyp, adenoma on resection. This is a gallbladder carcinoma. Or if it is a non-perfused disturbance as well. 
or this is a non perfume sludge in the gall bladder it will also tell you even without even before an fna if a pancreatic tumor is peanut because h flow or e flow will almost always show you vascularity inside this pancreatic tumor it will show you whether a tumor tumor in this case a pvt portal vein thrombosis is tumoral by means of perfusion confirmed on contrast us or whether it is a bland thrombus it can pick up strange pathologies like the pseudo tumoral uh, or a mass forming cavernoma in the head pancreas which was sent to me sent to me as a pancreatic head tumor and it can also show you something called a twinkle artifact this is something very exciting so if you place a doppler with certain uh, specific settings for your transducer on a stone it will show you this doppler artifact this is actually a stone this is called a twinkle artifact uh, this is very useful for picking up urinary stones particularly in transrectal ultrasound at the urethro uh, bladder junction and certain other areas even in the bile duct so a twinkle artifact last slide we must understand the limitations of us studies uh with us the angle correction is extremely difficult the vessel somehow always seem to come uh, at right angles to the transducer so you have to make some effort after the bmo to get the the vessels at an angle to the transducer true flow velocities are very difficult to estimate because your field is moving and the angle correction bar is very difficult to place many vessels are displayed in cross section it is incorrect to measure a measure measure parameters in a vessel which is in cross section because you can never be sure of the angle of interrogation however here the waveform morphology of the spectral doppler helps you it is very difficult to get stationary vascular images and we have to deal with more artifacts so with this i end the talk i hope that i have been able to stimulate the audience for a uh, very important topic and uh, thank you I need a glove. Glove. Some sterile glove. This is enough. Sterile glove, you know. हाँ जी सर जी फर्स्ट फ्लोर पर रह लो आप आई विल कीप ऑन कॉलिंग ठीक है जी सर आपको मेन लाभ के हमने ई आर सी भी रखा है मेन लाभ के लिए ठीक है जी सर बाकी देखते हैं जो मौका हो बट आई थिंक विल गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीबॉडी हम नहीं नहीं वी हैव एन इंटरेस्टिंग केस क्योंकि आज भी आर ट्रांसमिटिंग तो यहाँ से रिसर्च है कि यूरोप यूरोप में साला सिस्टम में चल रहा तो वी लेव टू कीप मिनिमम एंड ही प्रेजेंटेड विथ हिस्ट्री ऑफ फीवर पेन ऑफ डोमेन यू प्लीज बेड लेट मिक्स बाय डिस्चार्ज वी डोंट वांट टू मिनिमली ट्राइंग लास्ट थ्री डेज ALT AST were 30 by 39 alkaline phosphorus was 244 Sir, and GGT was upper floor pe baith lo 120 uh, 20 minute when we have uh, analyzed the hemoglobin concentration of the PCT trend it is showing to be 5 mg per 5 uh, g per deciliter and uh, this is the uh, initial so uh, good morning ERT. everyone uh, what we have done and which is not showing any bile leak uh, further dr ravi will enlighten us how to approach the case and manage the nee, case uh, further maine fir phone kahan rakh diya first floor pe rehna mera phone dhoond lo zara kahan gaya maine so 
गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन सो आई एम डॉक्टर मल्लेश शर्मा वी आर कॉलिंग फ्रॉम इंडिया सो दिस इज वी आर स्टार्टिंग अनफॉर्चुनेटली द रेस्ट ऑफ द ऑडियंस विल बी ज्वाइनिंग इन इजिप्ट से आफ्टर अबाउट फिफ्टीन मिनट और सो वी आर वेटिंग वी आर स्टार्टिंग विद द फर्स्ट केस एंड दिस इज ए आर सी पी डॉक्टर रवि इज डूइंग तो डॉक्टर रवि सो वी विल स्टार्ट विद द फर्स्ट केस and uh, first let us present somebody who is going to present it they have already presented i think shivanshu uh, someone has presented the case you are presenting okay okay has someone presented the yes. case yes sir i okay. have briefed the case sir this is a patient uh, uh, this gentleman uh, 40 years old who were presented with the history of uh, he underwent cholecystectomy for gallstones one week back and uh, subsequently uh, a drain was placed inside the gallbladder fossa because there was some collection as usual uh, uh, then uh, it was observed that there is a blood mixed bile a leak from the collection uh, which is consistently coming in addition to that patient is also complaining of pain and uh, fever from last three days what system so we have done the analysis Alexia. of this pcd collection Uh, PCD fluid showing uh, hemoglobin of actually multi elite multi elite special like DLA hemoglobin uh, it is significantly it is there so when we have done an uh, ERCP uh, with, uh, when we have done a cholangiogram we could not demonstrate any leak but however there is a significant leak of 200 to 300 ml from the PCD drain so subsequently so there is some sort of biliary leak but we could not see on cholangiogram on initial cholangiogram so this is a brief history of this patient and uh, now doctor uh, uh, subsequently we have done a contrast enhanced ct scan to find out where is the leak from to localize the site of the leak and uh, there we found out there is a, a leakage from the intrahepatic biliary radicals uh, from the intrahepatic biliary radicals from peripheral injury as happened and further doctor uh, ravi will uh, enlighten us about this uh, case yeah. thank you thank you doctor good morning everybody welcome to the live workshop uh, i have uh, malesha ma along with me to help me out in this case as you heard from the history it is a laparoscopic cholecystectomy and patient uh, develop a bile and blood leak uh, from uh, uh, in the drain so we are planning a ercp already ercp is on, uh, done uh, a, a few days back and they have placed a stent let me show you how we go i am using a fuji film uh, elexera system elexera system with uh, blue light imaging it's uh, one of the high end uh, scope i am using it uh, first time this is a side wing scope as you see the cameras are on the sides uh, whatever is uh, in the sites only will be visible generally the introduction into the uh, esophagus is blind in the from the throat so i'll go and then um, i'll enter into the esophagus generally you won't see the lumen here um, you have to uh, put some air uh, in the esophagus i'll tell you why uh, in spite of what you put inside the esophagus you won't see the lumen but we need to instill some amount of air so that when you reach the stomach the stomach is already distended otherwise um you won't uh, see the you will hit on the stomach wall so if you put some small quantity of air by the time we reach the stomach uh, stomach will be distended so what we are seeing we are seeing so large Ravi, amount of bile here so you said start inflating from the esophagus only yes so that when we reach the ge junction already the stomach is distended Inflated. if you uh, as soon as you go to the ge junction if you rotate left side you will see the nice lumen then um, otherwise you have to you will invariably impinge on the stomach uh, lesser or greater curvature and lesser so curvature generally keep on inflating push um, and turn to yeah, left yes okay then you will see the lumen if you put too much of air then it will be um, this is uncomfortable for patient also but generally we do it in sedation so so, so how do you go to pylorus then right pylorus 
and generally you see a lot of uh, ryuge these uh, ryuges will help us um, locate the pylorus sometime in the beginning we used to uh, rotate inside the fundus only if you if you keep this ryuge left to right the left side is towards the fundus and if you turn to the right it is always to the andrum so your trick is follow the ruge yes follow the ruge from left to right, right. to approach the pylorus you will it will take you to the if you flatten it too much then you cannot appreciate the ruge but you should have a so generally we aspirate uh, whatever is in the stomach so that uh, patient don't get aspirated into the lung so now um, as we go inside So now we have to search for uh, so much as secretion. We see the pylorus there and uh, the famous sunset sign. As you go near, the pylorus should uh, disappear. So It is uh, slightly eccentric in this. Um, so now we have gone into the duodenum. In the duodenum, we turn to the right and use the up knob and then shorten the scope. Uh, we will... Um, see the stent so there is already a stent i think uh, i don't know whether it's a, a seven french stent or ten french stent so we have to remove the stent before we proceed with the cholangiogram so shall i get a snare sit to seven french So get me a snare, um, so there is a small uh, sphincterotomy is done. Um, so so Ravi, why do you want to remove the snare? Remove, I prefer a snare because uh, if you use a foreign body forceps, uh, sometime when we are pulling it through the channel, uh, you will leave it inside the channel and then you have to uh, take out the score, push the stand out and then remove it. There now uh, the tip is visible, so it is easier to catch, open the stand. Okay. Easier to catch it. Um, anyway. Sometimes the, um, the tip may not be visible, so in that case you have to catch the, the Pig tail itself. So it's a seven fine stent. So we can easily remove it through the channel. If it is ten French, you cannot remove it through the channel. So uh, now you see a nice uh, small sphincterotomy, papilla. We need to cannulate again to do a cholangiogram. Generally, uh, this um, uh, the uh, the screen can be divided into four areas. Um, four quarters, upper, left, right, upper quarter, left, right, lower quarter. If you have the papilla uh, at the uh, left uh, lower bottom of the right upper quadrant, that is the perfect uh, position for so cannulating a bile. This is the upper quarter. Up, this is the right Hello? upper quarter. Okay. One, two, three, four, this side. Ah, right okay. upper side and you should have the opening at the left lower side okay. and then there is Hello. a perfect place for cannulating okay. the bile. Hello, good morning Dr. Malay. Yes, yes. Yes. Can you can you hear us? Yes, yes, we yes. can hear you. Yeah. Dr. Piyush here. Okay, Piyush. Yeah. yeah, good morning, sir. Good morning, morning, Dr. Ravi. Yeah, good morning. Good morning, Piyush. So what's the plan for this case? So we are going to do a cholangiogram. We are yeah. going to do a cholangiogram, but let us, you, you, will, you, are, you have an apron on, Ravi? No, okay, I didn't we'll take give it you an apron. So some uh, thick uh, fluid is coming. Some purulent material is also coming. It is not uh, pure bile. There is some pus is coming from... Um, I will hold it. You yeah. put it on. So what Ravi was saying was that you need to keep it towards the right upper quadrant 
so i always try and keep it my body like this rather than standing so that helps me in keeping the papilla in the right upper quadrant so what we are noticing now is that there is a lot of pus coming and we are worried because despite placing the stent there yeah. is a pus yes, okay yes. ravi yeah yeah this uh, this uh, i didn't expect it but uh, obviously pus is uh, coming along with bile so we need so to we need to be okay so we need to be careful when we are injecting but anyway patient doesn't have symptoms of sepsis so if you have pus and uh, do a cholangiogram sometime we can cause uh, sepsis so, so uh, i would analyze the cholangiogram first right now can you show here yeah ki this is the guide wire that is in place this is the drain that is in place and this is the clip that was applied from the injury so clip is away from the bile duct yeah. so we are suspecting some bile duct injury is there you know, the the, the uh, uh yeah sometime it can happen but uh, th obviously the surgeon has worked well away from the bile duct so let us the, see the clip is uh, very much away sometimes in spite of that it can happen um let's see we'll do a cholangiogram and see how it is so if you do a big sphincterotomy sometime cholangiogram doing a cholangiogram is quite difficult bile will leak the cholangiogram should be done before uh, doing a sphincterotomy if you do it afterwards it is better i think we'll do a occlusion cholangiogram okay so i will okay. uh, remove the exchange the cannula exchange the sphincterotomy for a, a balloon because there is a sphincterotomy so bile will leak uh, uh, wire exchange you push the wire this is thermo huh this is thermo thermo so oh. this is so, so okay this is a thermo wire we could so have this is a thermo wire short wire short uh, wire so we need so to have a long once wire. you have a short wire you will either change it to long wire for a change or you I have to learn how to do a short wire exchange. Yeah, sometimes uh, I don't know about this scope is new to me. Sometimes we can grip the wire with the elevator, and Ravi, then uh, you can use a short wire also. So we will try and show short wire exchange, but we have to uh, see what goes on. So this is a yeah, long is, wire. Yeah. So there are two short wire exchange. How to do it? That will be one part we will show. but this is a long wire we have changed it and now we want to change it to a balloon so we want to put in a balloon yes and do an occlusion cholangiogram and see what is wrong with us so till now we are suspecting a bile duct injury the patient had bleeding the bleeding is less now but the drain is still draining some bile and in emergency yesterday or two days back the ercp was done and a drain was placed okay anyway i i'm going to put a balloon and do um, uh, i don't think there is a v grip in this elevator because uh, it's a g lock hmm? uh, it's it, a g lock sorry g lock guide wire lock there is a guide wire lock yes sir g lock so there is where a g is lock it? where is it sir with the elevator it lock Uh, no, but it is not so strong when i push so so so, so uh, i am locking it and push pulling it out it's coming it is there resistance is there it is not completely locking the guide wire so this is called g lock um, so g lock will probably not work for tarumo wire it may work partially for this kind of wire so that is what ravi said that yeah, this wire this is coming um, back he showed you that he lifted the elevator fully up and then, and then he pulled the air back it is coming back Maybe so is there is no locking by elevator on the guide wire thermo wire will slip out fast so we'll keep that in mind okay so so invariably these leaks happen uh, very close to the hilum uh, so we'll go slightly up and do an occlusion cholangiogram close to the hilum you mean uh, uh, proximal uh, cbd so instead yes. of if we 
do it from below then you need to inject a lot mm. of dye lot of dye so generally yeah. i don't dilute the dye when we are don't dilute don't uh, dilute dye no dilution of dye yeah, is that what you mean yes i so don't want to dilute because if you dilute it sometime it takes longer to visualize the site of leak okay uh, so that is second trick ravi has told uh, number 1 go take a balloon go high up go close to hilum and don't use too much diluted slightly uh, diluted yeah. okay so i will again show you on the fluoro this is so the balloon uh, we have it slightly up you want more up i uh, this is okay i think okay. it is very close this is the clip upload yeah. balloon push push blend okay here uh, okay and then um, you will inject inject uh, better include the no, uh, whole this, um, show this this is more important okay now the most important part is on the fluoro that we will see okay inject inject fluoro fluoro so we see some dye going up like this uh, can you move a little bit higher up side uh this is going like this or into the duct is this dye coming out like this no no there is no as such there is i'm not able to see a leak uh, now um sometime we tend to think uh, uh bef- uh we have injected a lot of dye but till now we don't see any leak ravi yes so what to do um if bile is uh, coming in the drain it has to leak here if it is a minor leak sometimes you know hmm. uh, you have to strongly inject uh, to see the uh, forcefully inject forcefully inject the difference is minor leak uh, is leak uh, happening only after filling the intrahepatic biliary radicals major leak is a leak the leak happens even before you start seeing the intrahepatic biliary radicle okay so maybe we'll inject a little bit strongly and see so only worry is uh, sometimes uh, this patient at some pus coming out okay um inject inject will inject forcefully now so we have mm. injected forcefully Hmm. So we have seen the whole liver. Uh, right now, we are not seeing any leak happening. So keep on injecting. We will see because will you pull out the balloon a little bit back also? Yeah. So okay. Because I don't know if then be lower injury. No. Keep on yeah, injecting. I'll, um, now we have come almost lower down uh we are not seeing anything happening maybe it is a very minor leak and it's got stopped because uh, some stent was placed yesterday uh, so i will have to ask the resident has the bile output decreased since yesterday Yeah, so maybe it is. So, Ravi, we have now two problems. Number one, we have a drain. Uh, we have CBD, yeah. but which is normal, no leak. No, there is no leak uh, right now. We are not seeing any leak uh, from so, the but bile duct. So, so this maybe it leaked and stopped because you had a stenting done yesterday. So, or it could be uh, duct of Lushka leak, but they say yeah, leak. Sometimes, yes, duct of Lushka. if it is tied uh, we won't see the leak from this side if we inject this side it won't be seen because uh, the uh, bile duct end would have been tied the uh, the hepatic end may be open if still bile is coming in the uh, drainage we have to think about um, aberrant six duct uh, leak uh, can we see the c arm arun do we have the old yes. recorded videos of this c arm can uh, we see ravi uh. Yeah, we you have done it yesterday. So, so can you s- review the old videos? Go okay, there and okay. review the old videos. 
Okay. Of this case, I will hold the scope for you. There is some pus coming out. So, Ravi, can you focus uh, one camera on? Oh, Ravi, this is the old video. Uh, so here, uh, there is some leak happening. I am not able to see. Yeah, it is uh, coming somewhere here. The bile is uh, leaking somewhere here. It is very peripheral. Uh, Peripheral duct leaks, uh, generally it happens after liver surgeries, liver transplantation. We see this uh, uh, in liver transplant recipients, uh, okay. we see this kind of peripheral leak, not after lab coli. I haven't seen, this is the first time I'm seeing a leak happening at such peripheral level following a lab coli. Any PTB is done for this patient? No. Yes, CT, CT scan was done. CT scan is done. It can happen after uh, PTBD, this kind of leak. Lab coli, quite unusual. Anyway, uh, we'll review the CT scan report. What is the CT scan report says? Can we show the CT scan uh, video once more? We'll show the CT scan. Dr. Malay? Yes. Yeah, so now, now this leak appears to be in the peripheral branch. Okay. So, how much effective will be the stenting in, in such cases? Sorry, what was the question? This leak is in the peripheral branch of the liver, bile uh. duct. So, how much effective will be the stenting? See, we are still worried why this peripheral leak has happened. So, we have to answer this question. So, we are, Ravi has asked to review the CT. So, Ravi, can you uh, show yeah. the, review the CT? CT yeah. is on that side. Where is the CT? I'll no, you will have to go. Huh. So, Ravi is going to review the CT once more because we have to answer. Huh? The question is why a peripheral duct leak happened. So, can you display the CT once more? CT film on the screen. Ravi, go there. No, no, they, yeah. they will display it here. I think there is okay. no way I can. Can you make it a big, big zoom a little bit, only the CT image? Okay. Sir. Yeah, I'm seeing the CT. I think there is a injury at the undersurface of liver. Where, where? Can you go back a little bit? Yes, yes. I, yeah, I agree. There is an undersurface uh, liver injury. So, no, yeah. So, there is an yeah, injury on the undersurface injury. of the liver. So, so, this peripheral duct leak could have been from the undersurface of the liver. There is some uh, hyperdensity also. Obviously, there is bleeding also happening in that. Um, so, it should be, you know, only trocar goes there. So, it must be trocar injury which has happened to the liver, which is causing um, peripheral bile leak. Generally, peripheral bile leaks uh, happen after uh, liver surgeries. Uh, and the uh, percutaneous transhepatic uh, drainage. Oh, 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 that, that is good. I think that is the correct explanation, Ravi. So, okay. so we, you reviewed the CT and then we found out uh, there okay. is a peripheral duct. So, this is, so in this case, it appears that the peripheral duct leak has stopped. Uh, it has stopped uh, um, and then uh, you have done an uh, sphincterotomy also. Uh, only thing uh, which is worrying is uh, when we did the, you know, even now you see pus coming out. Why a peripheral duct injury pus should be coming out? I think we should uh, increase the length of uh, sphincterotomy and put in a stent. Uh, or maybe I will try a balloon uh, sweeping. Because if when we do a balloon sweeping in this, this uh, okay. even if there is a stone, it won't come. We need to increase the length of sphincterotomy. Obviously, there is some pus coming out. Uh, that is not explained by the peripheral uh, ductal leak. So, so let uh, me summarize it for a second. We, we have got seven minutes more. Yeah. So let me summarize it. This is a case who pre presented with uh, distension of abdomen, presence of blood within the peritoneal cavity and blood mixed with bile. You suspected bile duct injury, ERCP was done yesterday 
and the drain was placed the drain was bile and blood both we tried to today do the ERCP with but was any CT angiography did it show any hematobilia was CT angiography done So CT angiography was done, we suspected complete complex bile duct injury and now we had asked Ravi to review it and Ravi has demonstrated that this is not at all a bile duct injury, it is a peripheral type of bile duct injury which happens after PTBD or he has said this is trocar and Ravi has suspected that this is a trocar related injury of the under surface of the liver which led to the hematoma as well as to the presence of bile within the peritoneal cavity. But right now Ravi is doing an extension of the sphincterotomy yeah, I'm going and to extend the followed by placement of the stent. So, um, okay. the sphincterotomy can be extended up to the wall of duodenum. We so don't want a big clever, sphincterotomy, yeah, I, Ravi. I won't do. Okay. Uh, this is a clever cut. You can see the wire, uh, insulated wire uh, proximally and the distal end is uh, open wire. So, we will slightly extend it because you need a bigger sphincterotomy when uh, we see large stones there. Here we are not, we haven't seen anything large. So, I will extend it slightly and then stop there. Dr. Ravi. Yeah. Yeah. Tell yeah. me. Yeah, what yeah, is Dr. Ravi, just uh, show us the technique of uh, spintrotomy with, with the technical steps for the audience here yeah, and all sometime, over. Sometimes, you know, the, these wires, uh, when we, these wire, uh, many times, you know, if you keep this wire and apply any amount of cut current, it won't cut. Actually, to cut the sphincter, you have to apply pressure. If you apply too much pressure, too many length of uh, too much length of uh, sphincter will be cut. Uh, so, by over a period of time, by experience, we know how much pressure you have to apply and then apply the pedal, end of cut. So uh, let if me you don't apply pressure, if you keep like this and uh, apply current, it won't cut only, it will be, it will only burn. So, you have to apply slight pressure and the, 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 the amount of pressure you apply, uh, depends on the length of sphincter you have proximally. If you have close to the wall, then you, you shouldn't apply too much pressure because it will result in uh, perforation. Or if you have such a long uh, sphincter, uh, you can apply a little bit more pressure proximally. So, let me, can you show the hand of Dr. Ravi? Yes, this is very interesting thing Ravi has pointed out just now. What Ravi is doing is, he is keeping it little bit clockwise and then he is slightly turning to left. And then he is moving up or doing yeah, applying as yeah. much pressure. So, at the time of his finger trot me, you are adjusting. Uh, can you have a bigger view? Yeah. Bigger? You are adjusting number one, the length of wire inside, number so, two, the pressure. Yeah. And, 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 so. and, and actually, uh, I asked the, um, the technician to bow. Uh, many times, these technicians uh, themselves are. Uh, uh, bow it uh, to their convenience to apply pressure, but I do not allow that. Generally, I uh, make them keep at one level. After that, the pressures are applied by three ways. One, if you elevate the, um, uh, elevate the, uh, the uh, swing throat dome, it will apply pressure. And okay. the, the third way, is, second way is to elevate up. the up, up knob. Up, up. If you come okay. closer, it will apply. And then if you turn the left, it will apply more pressure. These so three three ways. Uh, combination of this three, you adequately uh, do it to apply enough pressure so that less amount of current is uh, used at the papilla uh, and you make a maximum amount of cut very quickly. If you use too many, um, uh, too much of pedal uh, standing at one place, particularly if it is close to the uh, orifice, it will result in pancreatitis. Means, uh, for example, if, uh, if I do not apply pressure and apply current, it will not, the, the cut will not progress. Cut won't it, progress. It will result in pancreatitis only. So, when we are uh, applying sphincterotomy uh, close to the orifice, we need to quickly apply pressure and go away from the pancreatic orifice so that the, the, the incidences of pancreatitis is much less 
What uh, you are saying is cut and go away. Go away from pancreas. Pancreatic cut and duct. go away. Yes, yes. So you are saying cu cut, uh, turn to away. left, move up and go away. Yes. Something like that? Yes, yes. So because, but um, yeah. you are, yes. there is a problem Ravi. What you are saying is that each cut should count. Am I right? Yes. So, but you are not doing continuous cutting. You are doing that way interrupted cutting. No, no. This is for demonstration. Otherwise, I normally, whatever length, I will continuously cut only. Okay. Every time we apply a pedal uh, from the beginning, there is an amount of coagulation delivers to the papilla and then only the cut starts. So, we have so got only two minutes left. Yes. So, we so will remove and, yeah, place, this I will and place a stent yeah. in this case. I will place so, a stent. So, please so place your questions in the question box if you have any. We will so just place a stent uh, and learn some tricks so of yeah, standing from Ravi. In case of bile, bile leak, uh, you know, if even uh, sometimes if the cut is very adequate and you have, if you think you have completely uh, a, a destroyed the uh, papilla, one need not uh, apply a, uh, place a stent. Adequate sphincterotomy itself is uh, enough. Here uh, we have remaining uh, long amount of sphincter left and there is some uh, pusses also coming out. So we will uh, deploy a stent uh, and maybe later on after the patient has recovered. You want to well. do balloon sweep? No need now. Um, yeah, I generally I do it. The duct seems balloon, to be... Balloon, balloon, balloon uh, The duct seems to be bigger. Balloon. Uh, because of the pus only, I am uh, thinking maybe okay. something is. So we don't uh, have there. any explanation why should there be pus, but we yeah. will nonetheless do a balloon sweeping. Yeah. Okay, and uh, so that was a very interesting case, uh, the first case of the day, where the diagnosis was changed with the help of Ravi, yeah. and because Ravi is also working in a center where there are a lot of transplant, so yeah. he could pick it up. So we were never, uh, we would not have picked it up because we were thinking all the time of bile duct injuries. So this is the one of the very few times I have taken a trocar related injury uh, to the under surface of liver. So, but that is a peripheral duct, trocar related peripheral duct injury. So that happened on the under surface of the liver and that resulted in this kind of problem. Okay. And that resulted in hemoperitoneum. So, very Ravi, have you seen something? No, this, no, this is the first time I'm seeing a trocar related uh, um, uh, trocar related peripheral duct uh, leak. I've seen peripheral duct leaks in patients uh, with uh, LDLT, liver uh, living related liver transplant recipients, and of course uh, following PTBD, but not uh, trocar. I think I should thank uh, Malay for giving. Uh, uh, first time, one one time in a lifetime case uh, for me. No, 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 no. And I should thank <laughs> you, Ravi, for at okay. least recognizing this. We were baffled as to what is the diagnosis. Okay. And balloon? we were not able to figure balloon, out balloon. why. Okay. Huh? You put already. So, uh, yeah, there is still a lot of first flakes coming. But so right now, would you oh. prefer 10 French stent in him? Yeah, I uh, I think we should put a 10 French stand. Okay, in so this. we'll put in a 10 French stand. We have, so we have done a balloon sweeping anyway. and we'll put in a 10 French stand. For want of time, I think I won't. Um, so we'll uh, do only one sweep. I'll go straight. Yeah, I'll go straight, put a stand uh, and come. 10 French straight stand? Straight or, or pigtail? I, I generally prefer a straight stand. I never use uh, pigtail stands. So okay. Only in rare okay. instances like uh, inside a metal stand, I use uh, pigtail. Give me pigtail, Ravi. Yeah, I will put a pigtail. I demonstrate how to put in a pigtail. Yes, yes, uh, okay. sure, I will give you. Thank that. you, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, very much, thank you. So, I prefer a pigtail for a couple of reasons now. Oh. Because the straight stands, they do go through the wall and they create trans duodenal perforation. The chances of migration are more with straight stand. So I will prefer a pigtail stand. So, so far as and when these stands migrate through the wall, they create more problems and I am relatively unprepared in this morbid patient to give him more morbidity. So that is the reason. So if we have any question? Yeah. 
I'm here okay. till evening. I Local. can do it later on also. Yeah, yeah. So, Dr. Piyush, is there any question so far? We have any question from the forum? Okay, so we will prefer how to place a pigtail stand. So, is pigtail stand, there are two problems. Number one, Boston Scientific has a stand which you can move in and out. You can never move it out. You are in trouble if you want to move out. You are in trouble. So if you want to place a pigtail stand, one of the tricks that you would do is never think of coming out because if you pull back, you are in trouble. A straight stands, you can, you are unable to go. Sometimes you can do that, but with plastic stand, you do not. Uh, with the pigtail stand, there is no room of, no margin for error. So one of the problem with pigtail stand is now we are pushing. So couple of things. While we are pushing, I pull my body to right, and then my up. I push my body to right, and then by then to left. Push my body to the right and then move it up. Why I am shadow practicing this movement? Because this is the way I am going to place the stent. Now, this is the tube that is coming and then I am moving it up. Body to the right, tube out, then tube move it up. Body to the right, tube out, elevator up, up knob up, body to left. Body to right, tube out, elevator up, up knob up, body to up. Body to right, elevator up and so this is the over tube. I will just check position of over tube. Just check position. Floro? Tube is up. Okay. Now we will release the stand. Release the stand. The stand is going. Simple thing. I will push the stand out. Up knob up. This is a and turn to left. Push the stand out. A little bit rotate to right. Up knob up. Elevator up. Move to left. The same movement that Ravi showed. Then tube. move to right, elevator stand out, guide wear. elevator up, so up knob up, move to left. First mark, first that, uh, then move to right, and down, elevator up, up knob up, move to left. Move to right, down, move down, elevator up, up knob up, move to left. Move to right, down, stand out. This is where you make the mistake commonly. When you are going toward the last part of the stand, do not push too much out. Take short step. Because you make a big loop, it will not go. Now you mm -hmm. make mm -hmm. it. Push, push it a little bit. So just check, we will just check with the position of the stand. Check position on floro, it has gone up. Okay. So, sometimes what happens, you make too much of a loop like this outside. And once you make too much of a loop like this, pig tail, you cannot push it in. You cannot push it in even by pushing the whole scope outside because you cannot straighten it. So these are some technical points we have to. In this case, we will now release the stand, we will remove the tube, we will release the stand and we will come out and give in another few minutes the platform will be with Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Praveer Rai for the gastrojejunostomy that the audience has been waiting for a long time. Okay. So in the meantime, me and Ravi will come there for questions, if there are any. Just want to show you that this is the patient who had bleeding. This is the trocar related blood mixed with bile that is leaking into his patient. So this is a percutaneous drain that has been placed. But the output as the uh, residents told me has decreased now significantly. So, and uh, so this. So, questions, are there any questions so far? Can you shift? We will stand there only. Dr. Male? Yes. Yeah, what is the next case, Dr. Male? The next case they are going to present will be a gastrojejunostomy. It will take 2-3 minutes and 2-3. Uh, so, you have time for 2 questions if you have any with Dr. Ravi. Two.
Uh, I like to tell you that we already got a good audi audience here in Dubai, and we got our three excellent moderators, Dr. Khalid, Dr. Mustafa Sabri, Dr. Filipos. Oh, so thank you I very hope much. You good morning, good morning, Dubai. So there are uh, no names in Dubai, and uh, we 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 are uh, Dr. Uh, I have met Dr. Khalid personally many times, and uh, I have seen Dr. Wallace in conference. So this is a great opportunity to say hello to my uh, friends there and uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, meet you people here. And uh, so this is Dr. Ravi. Dr. Ravi is in Chennai. So Dr. Ravi is in the... Uh, in... Rela Hospital. Rela Institute of Medical Science. Hello, can you hear us? Yes. Yeah, hello, I'm Dr. Filipos. Congratulations for the excellent presentation. Uh, although I, I was not here from the very beginning, I understand that there was a, a bile leak. Now, the, the question that I wanted to do, uh, do you find always absolutely necessary to, do, to, to make a combination of a sphincterotomy and a stent? Or do you think for minor leaks, you can do one or the other, considering that some patients may be having comorbidities that they may not... Uh, um, require a prolonged time for ERCP or even a cut because of the anticoagulant. So do you find necessary to do combined uh, stenting and uh, sphincterotomy for every single patient who has a bile leak? Um, actually, uh, if you have done a very adequate uh, sphincterotomy, uh, sphincterotomy might itself is uh, enough. Uh, if there is a uh, um, peripheral duct injury, sometimes we uh, bridge the site of leak using a stent. If it is from the common bile duct, um, good sphincterotomy is enough to uh, stop the leak. If uh, in, in patients who have a, a retained stone or a below, if there is a stricture, then we need to put a stent. Otherwise, uh, stenting is not 100% um, required. Uh, if you have done an inadequate sphincterotomy, and if you are uh, if you are very doubtful about the um, uh, uh, the remaining active sphincter fibers, then it is better to put a uh, stent and leave it. But uh, of course, it is not compulsory always. Sphincterotomy is a prerequisite. Without this sphincterotomy, we can't leave a stent. Uh, I am Dr. Mustafa from Dubai. Yes, sir. Uh, don't you think that has uh, depends on the size of the leak? If the leak is small. Maybe it can work with sphincterotomy, which will be larger than the leak, and uh, yeah. uh, preferably the uh, the flow of bile will go to the uh, through the sphincterotomy. But if the leak is significant, I think uh, the uh, stenting will be mandatory. Um, yeah, there are studies, uh, you know, which have done um, only sphincterotomy, uh, only short stent, uh, even below the site of leak. Uh, Sometimes they put the stent uh, across the site of leak, bridging the leak. Uh, practically, there is no significant difference between the outcome, uh, between all this, all uh, this three. Oh, we have to see here. Yeah, yeah, and come closer, yeah. All this three, they, all of them are equally effective. And uh, but then uh, many times, as uh, uh, we practice, we. Um, we are not happy only with the um, sphincterotomy. We leave uh, most of the time with a stent and then uh, uh, remove it later because the stents are very cheaper and um, uh, sometimes you know it's it helps uh, probably. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the feedback, Dr. Male. I fully agree with your uh, comment, Dr. Male. Good morning. Yes. First good morning, co Khalid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, first yeah, of all, congratulations yeah. for this uh, event, and I would like to welcome all the audience. Uh, my question is, you, uh, it looks that you inserted double big tail for, the, uh, for these patients. Uh, do you think that there is any difference between putting double big tail or a, slate, a straight uh, a stand for, for such cases? Um, shall I? You answer. The uh, straight stands uh, generally uh, drain well. Uh, the lumen is straight and they have a bigger lumen. Pigtail, uh, the longer the stand length, uh, the bile drainage is very less. In uh, straight stent, there is a side flap which uh, gives a very wide opening. In pigtail, uh, generally the stents are um, very long. 
they you have to account for the pigtail on both ends so a 7 uh, centimeter strand will uh, measure about 15 centimeters so they drain uh, less well compared to a straight stent but then uh, it is an advantage of not migrating uh, up and down it depends uh, on some personal experience also uh, I always prefer a straight stent but there are uh, my colleagues which prefer a, a pigtail stent because sometimes straight stents when they migrate in uh, sometime deep in it is very difficult to take it out if they migrate out it will be passed out through the stools uh, that is why some people prefer straight but uh, generally pigtail strand are longer and they have small opening they drain less uh, well compared to a straight stent so, so that is it for this session we will shift to second case thank you Ravi thank you Come. thank you thank you very much morning so good morning next we have a 80 year old male who presented with a progressive jaundice and recurrent recurrent nausea vomiting for past one month with a significant weight loss of around six kgs in past two months so imaging was done imaging was suggestive of a gb fossa mass of size 97 into 65 into 38 mm which was infiltrating into the liver inferior surface, common hepatic duct, uh -huh. hepatic flexure uh -huh. and the duodenal wall, which was causing gastric outlet obstruction. Other than that, uh, patient also had multiple hypoenhancing lesion in both lobe of the liver, largest of which was 20 into 21 mm, which was suggestive of multiple hepatic mats. Few periportal lymph nodes were also seen. So we came to the diagnosis of CAGB with malignant extrahepatic biliary obstruction and gastric outlet obstruction with distant mats into the liver and uh, further plan of action is EUS guided gastrojejunostomy to relieve the GO which is basically for palliation. Now I would like to request Dr. Praveer Rai to demonstrate the procedure. Mm -hmm. Pottery, pottery okay. settings 400 pure cut auto cut so auto -cut. good morning for this session and this case so generally uh, these cases are not wrecking and uh, i do not have the pure cut courage chahiye. pure cut to do these kind of cases so often 100 and uh, we have our experts and pure every country hai, has the experts so we will not talk of the problems that we happen uh, that can let a lot can happen so we have given full one hour for Ye demonstration of this case and uh, because karega, this can be tricky many problems can Three. arise but we will see and we will handle them as they come five, as they come mein, so or during the procedure dal. so or we are alert we are uh, in we are alert for all possible hai. fallouts of the what can happen hai, what can possibly go wrong or right so the Saline, main thing is to be able to introduce uh, into his stomach Simple. and after introduction into his stomach the main thing is keep it i will pick it up soon. so main thing is after going into his stomach to be pick out jejunum so the tricks is how to pick out jejunum so for a brief second means dr praveer will be concentrating more on uh, picking up the structures whenever he can speak he will speak take over Means and in the meantime, I will be just pitching in in between, filling in the gaps as he concentrates on uh, in ner on a relatively nervous procedure for me, for him. So we are. Uh, so Praveer, you are on. So we are finding some fluid filled in the stomach. So this fluid has to be removed. And uh, so, so he is initially removing the fluid. Eight 
एयर ऑफ करना एयर ऑफ एयर ऑफ फ्लोरो फ्लोरो प्लीज उल्टा सुबह स्कोप टेप प्लीज बस 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 स्कोप टेप स्कोप टेप ओके ओके गुड मॉर्निंग सो आई थिंक दिस एन एटी ईयर मेल एंड ही इज हैविंग सी ए जी बी with outlet obstruction the obstruction is predominantly involving uh, duodenum the d1 as well as the d2 part so uh, having an uh, relatively good performance status and infiltration of a large segment of the liver so we have decided to do an evers guided gastro jejunostomy which is specially important when you are planning for a patient on whom the performance status is good and you expect a survival of more than 3 months so the first step is we need to ensure that the uh, tube that is naso biliary tube that we have placed is across the site of the obstruction into the jejunum and this will confirmed by instilling some amount of contrast in the endoscopic naso biliary catheter which is placed so can i have some contrast there in the tube so we need some fluid contrast. there in the tube okay so what we have done is uh, we have mixed methylene blue contrast ha huh? okay can we inject fluoro contrast kaun kaun de raha hai hmm fluoro ne contrast put in contrast na no remove na remove the tube from there and put in contrast wahan se nikalo नहीं नहीं रिमूव इसमें डाल रखा थोड़ा सा थोड़ा सा ओके थोड़ा सा और डाल दो कंट्रास्ट ओके तुम्हारा फ्लोरो व्हाट इज नॉट डिंग इज नॉट यस या सो वी कैन सी जस्ट जस्ट वेट जस्ट वेट प्लीज ओके सॉरी एक्सक्यूज मी वो सॉरी व्हाट हैपेंड डॉक्टर प्रवीर हैज डिसाइडेड वन क्वेश्चन यू सेड यू सेड आउटलेट ऑब्स्ट्रक्शन एंड कनेक्टेड इट टू अ वाटर पंप रादर देन पुटिंग इट मैन्युअली ओके सो दैट इज व्हाट हैज हैपेंड I have one question. Where is the site of obstruction in the duodenum? So, site of obstruction is involving the D1 and the D2 region. So, how nasobiliary was inserted? So, it's uh, not that tight an obstruction which is not letting a wire to pass. Wire could be passed, and then over it, the tube was placed. So, we are just trying to figure out uh, a bowel loop. which we can choose to puncture so A fluid please. Question, please fluid please fluid oh, fluid Ravi. more doctor ravi i have a Floro? short question here can you hear me uh, tube is floro please doctor pravir yes Yeah, there's one question from uh, Dr. Aldershan. You have started the uh, session with setting up your ARB. Could you just elaborate on that? What are the settings for puncture in in such cases? So we are using a pure cut, which is effect four and watt hundred. Floro. Fluid, please. Some more contrast there. Doppler, Doppler. Open. More up. More up. So uh, we have figured out a bubble loop, which we are just seeing whether there is any flow. in the path of the uh, hot axios catheter which we intend to use in this particular patient so this is the bowel loop now it looks well distended huh. 
what you are looking for is presence of flow right now because the bowel moving so i will decrease the color gain a little bit busco pan busco pan please and more fluid please loro so this is the place where you looking for no no vessel in between loro but this looks like quite jejunum like because the folds yes because we are in the jejunum we are seeing and this is what is distending when you put it this is what is distending fluid please more fluid is going yes so you can think uh, see when we are installing fluid fluid is entering into it and uh, floro please and we are seeing the bowel loop as well so i think uh, it looks okay and then we can just apply doppler again just to be sure that we are not uh, going through any vascular structure okay that looks okay generally th there are no vascular structures in this part i will just freeze and show that this was the colon i believe this is the colon and this is what we don't want to enter okay so stent. more more fluid stent so we are now ready with the stent okay stent just wait just wait so uh, we are using a, a hot axial stent here so this is a typically cautery enhanced device so uh, we have a, a tip which has got a very small wire just to ensure that the cutting is very sharp and what we use is a pure cut current here so this stent is a 1 cm stent 20 mm in diameter these are available now in more sizes earlier it was uh, 15 and 20 now i think the smaller versions are also available fluid isko flush karna ek bar isko wipe karna hai aur usko flush karna hai so this is a hydrophilic uh, device so we are installing just uh, some water to ensure that uh, the just wipe this with wipe, water wipe also just mm -hmm. to ensure that this goes in easily there is a, there is a dedicated double balloon that uh, can help uh, in such procedure Do yeah sure uh, so I, i think uh, i still feel that the best is to use that double balloon Uh, because the thing that it does is that it ensures that the bowel gets fixed and doesn't move when you are puncturing so uh, since we don't have that balloon available with us we are resorting to floro so i found one vessel here this particular vessel here but i think this will not be seen when we puncture it floro uh, we need some water please more water please and we can see the tube also yes this is the tube dr praveer yes uh piyush here is okay. it is it uh, always necessary to put the tube uh, like it depends on the operator or is it compulsory to put the tube in the small bowl to confirm the position i think we will ask some questions later because right now is the time we want to put it in stand so and then we can we'll see that we are uh, just passing this device and you can see uh the tip of the catheter coming into picture can we just instill some more fluid please okay pottery doppler please again okay fair so we'll just measure this uh, measurement from the tip to the what is the length of this up to this bowel loop busco pan we have injected niche niche yes up to here 2.5 you want to measure the distal wall of the loop 
Yes. So this is yeah, 2.5 or say around 2.8 centimeter. Okay. That's okay. So can we install the some more fluid, please? So just before puncturing more fluid. Fluid, please. So what I have done, I have just entered into the bubble and quite deep there. Now this is the first step that has happened. We will just, uh, dip, uh, this first step is insertion of the cotter device into the lumen which we have done. And then following this what we will do is, we will just uh, remove, uh, lock this first, remove the uh, there is a locking device for the second step we will just remove this and then uh, this step now ensures release of the distal flange this is what we are trying to do now and for this Praveer yes could you have gone through and through you don't want to check through and through what to the other, no? No, no, no. no so, uh, okay. I don't think that we have that done that. Okay. So, I think that should be okay. So, now the second step is the release of the distal flange. This is what we are trying to do. So, we are pulling it back, pulling it back, pulling it back, pulling it back. And you can see now, the distal flange is released and this as seen on US image, we are convinced that this is in the bowel loop. So, second step is completed. This procedure is primarily three, four steps. So, the third step is primarily you intend to adjust the position of this and this we do. One is we can just unlock and then pull up the third. We, on this you can uh, see a markers uh, numbering labeled as one, two, three and three is we are just trying to pull the stent back slightly. This is what we are, we are trying to do. And as you can see, once we are pulling it, you can see this goes into the shape of a dumbbell, bell shaped. Sorry. So, can you see that? Yes, very clear. So, this looks okay. And uh, we are ready now for the fourth step, which is the deployment of the proximal flange. So, this is what we will do. So, once we have done the three steps, the fourth step is simply the deployment of the proximal flange. Again, we will try to do that once we have adjusted this. So, I am just trying to adjust this. And then the fourth step is we will release this. So, the, I have released the stent. Now, the proximal stent has released inside the scope and then we will try to push it out. Do you pull the scope now? Yes. So, can you see now the proximal stent in the flange in the stomach? Yes. Are you able to appreciate? So, now we will switch to the endoscopic image. Endoscopic image, please. So, can you see the stain now? Yes, yes. Excellent. So, I think we are done with the procedure. <coughs> and now, we will pull the assembly out. So, uh, we intend to see the fluoro also, just to ensure that the stent has been deployed right. So, can we see the fluoro image please? Can you see the stent? Nicely deployed there with the waist. Yes. So, you can choose to dilate this also, 
but usually what we have found that if you just leave it for 24 hours it opens up nice opens up nicely and you don't need to dilate it uh, you don't want to take the chance of uh, having the uh, strand migrated 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 yes so so just a small uh, comment yes uh, you saw that he deployed the stent inside the uh, uh, channel inside channel. the inside inside the stent yes yes and then he pulled the scope now the other technique is to do it under endoscopic guide which sometimes really uh, has a high, a high risk that yes. it can you can pull everything with you so i think the best way is like he demonstrated deploy the stent in, the, the the stent inside the scope and then just pull the scope and turn your your shoulder to the right and then you are done yeah so uh, i think uh, can we just see the fluoro image again please fluoro image please so you can see this is so once you have a waist lying there you know that you are across the wall so if it opens up totally sometimes that it indicates that that's lying somewhere else maybe hole in the peritoneum if it happens or hole in the stomach it will open up totally so uh, i think uh, uh, this patient now will be kept fasting for 24 hours after that we can easily allow liquid diet maybe for two three days and after that we can resort to uh, semi solid and then a solid diet so our, i think uh, that's how uh, we follow these patients up after the procedure uh, there's a question yes My, migration of of the stent or deployment in 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 other positions, yes. whether distally or proximally, how can you face and how can, can you manage this complication? Uh, how can we? Manage these cases. Yeah, so I think uh, the margin of error in this procedure is very, very less. Uh, so once you have a migration in, uh, in migration, that means the proximal end lying in the jejunum, the, sorry, the distal end and the proximal end in the peritoneum, then I think it becomes a very, very tall order to manage these patients up. You may well lose the patient. The reason is these patients are usually unfit for surgery because of the disseminated disease. Okay. And uh, that's the reason that there is a problem. Suppose you have one that's end of the stent in the peritoneum, another end in the stomach, then that's not a problem. You can well pull out the stent. So that should not be an issue. But yes, if the proximal end goes in the peritoneum and the distal end is in the jejunum, uh, you need to... Uh, um, offer prayers, uh, other things will be very, very difficult. Uh, for a brief second, we have some issues of breakfast here. So our breakfast will continue, but we are continuing with the cases right now, not for the Egyptian uh, or the uh, UAE audience. We will continue with the question answers and we will continue with the cases live demonstration. But for those who are here uh, in India right now, it's time for a breakfast, they can take a break. We will continue with the live yeah. demonstration. Can you so give us five minutes. We you have five minutes. Can you stand here and yes. answer the questions? Yes. Yes. And in the meantime, we will shift uh, another Mali, There case. is a question. There is a question from the audience. Yes. Uh, uh, now you, you use it as a, uh, to re resolve the, the best surgical disease. Can we use it as bariatric surgery? Uh, so can you just repeat that question? I missed it. Yeah, can you use it as bariatric surgery? I mean, to do uh, bypass uh, stomach by this one? Yeah, but, but I, I think uh, GG alone as a modality for uh, bariatric patients is not considered to be good enough. Moreover, then you are doing something for a patient with benign disease. The problem with this stent is, uh, maybe after some time, we don't know after what particular period of time this stent has to get blocked. So that's an issue. So uh, you place a stent, then you get it blocked after a period of say one, two, three years. Then you will possibly need to pull it out or reposition this stent. But that again for how long? So for a benign disease, I won't um, recommend this uh, procedure unless uh, you have uh, mm -hmm. some very strong reasons to do it. Non-surgical candidate. Yeah. Thank you. So, so you leave the stent in place as long as it's needed. Sorry? you leave the stent in, in place as long as it's needed. Yeah, sure. So uh, I think what we are doing is uh, uh, we are placing these in patients primarily for malignant uh, outlet obstruction. And if you see these patients, the survival of these patients varies from anything anywhere between say three months to 12 months. So uh, fortunately, uh, we haven't seen uh, uh, this blockage or migration of the stent. 
I often remember one patient in whom we placed it for a periampullary cancer, uh, non-operable, uh, but he had a good survival and the patient come, came to us after a period of one and a half years and at that time the stent had migrated but the lumen was, the fistula was patent. So what we did is uh, we placed a duodenal stent through that fistula and uh, the patient could be repalliated again. Yeah. Uh, because uh, when we put it for evacuation of uh, pancreatic cyst, usually we leave it only for one month or three weeks and then we remove it after that. Because there's a danger that the tissue will, uh, will grow over the, uh, the margin of the stent and removal will be difficult. Yeah, so I, I, I think these are totally different indications. Right now, what I'm discussing yeah. is about gastrojejunostomy. Oh, do, yeah. do, do you see this happens in this, in this case, in, uh, in this uh, indication, when you put it for gastrojejunostomy? Do you see sometimes that the stent has disappeared under the tissue after some time? No, so I think we have now follow-up of around 16 patients and in none we had a problem of uh, the stent getting blocked. As I mentioned, the survival of these patients, the median survival was around 9 months. Yeah, so not within that period. Thank you. Uh, this, where is the best side to puncture from the stomach? Where you put the scope? Exactly. Yeah, so usually the stum uh, you intend to see the bowel and then obviously you are going to see them only if you are somewhere in the distal body of the antrum region. So once you see a bowel which is very near to the stomach, you have minimum distance between the stomach wall and the uh, bowel loop, uh, nothing intervening. So that's the site you need to choose uh, where you need to puncture. Bowel collapse it before injection, before instilling water or uh, methylene blue. Uh, uh, can you just repeat that? Uh, you can detect the uh, bowel uh, after in, uh, installing, installing uh, methylene blue or water, yes? Or how you detect the uh, best site of injection, of puncturing uh, before uh, injecting uh, methylene blue or uh, water inside the bowel? Uh, so I just explain, I couldn't get your question well. So what we do is primarily we make a combination of methylene blue contrast and saline and uh, we inject that through the nasojejunal tube or uh, endoscopic naso um, ENBD that we have used in this particular patient. And once we are injecting, you, know, you, you, you are able to see as we saw in this particular case that the bowel loop obviously dilates. You want to ensure that that's a jejunum and it's not sometimes the colon which gets uh, delineated. So that's not going to happen. The colon, the water doesn't reach within a period of half an hour for sure. So whatever loop you are seeing is pro primarily a small bowel loop that you are trying to see. And the site where you need to puncture is where you have the minimum distance. You are just seeing the stomach wall and then the wall of the small bowel, nothing in between. So those are the sites and uh, least distance possible. So this, this stent is primarily a one centimeter long stent. So you have to be very, very uh, clear that if you are seeing a significant distance, you should not be using this uh, procedure. Thank you. I have a question. I'm Dr. Abid. How are you? Nice demonstration. Actually, it's an extension of the question which Dr. Mustafa asked. The thing is that with the hot exhaust stents, the recommendation is that you should remove them within six weeks uh, because there is, a, there is a problem of ingrowth. So if you keep it for a long time, especially for a patient who is, uh, in whom you expect who is going to live for more than three months, there is a risk of tissue in growth and the stent may migrate inwards. So uh, I don't know what your uh, practice is, but you can use an over suturing device or clips to secure the, the stent. Because I've had one case of a pseudocyst uh, punctured into the duodenum. The patient didn't come on time. He came around seven weeks back and the stent had migrated inside the duodenal wall. So this is a well-known thing which can happen with these hot exhaust stents if they're not, uh, you know, if they're not secured, especially for a gastrojejunostomy, because you don't want to do any intervention, especially for a very sick patient. So I, I think let, let, us, uh, let us be clear. Uh, I think a very important point that you have raised, but let us be clear that what we are doing is primarily for a gastro. Jejunostomy. What you are talking is of hot axial stent 
primarily you are placing uh, the site where you are placing this hot axial stent for acidosis drainage or a world of pancreatic necrosis, there are usually vascular structures they are running, the either gastrodudinal artery, you have a splenic artery coursing there, you have gastric artery, so these are the vessels which are running in the region where you are using it for a acidosis drainage. This is unlike the hot axials when you are using for a GJ and the reason why this recommendation of 4 weeks or 6 weeks has evolved for a hot axial stent or a metal stent in particular for acidosis drainage is primarily the study reported in gut about 2 or 3 patients of GI bleeding leading to mortality. So what I will tell you is uh, this again is specifically when you are placing it at a site where there are visible, where there are vessels adjoining and that is usually the case for a pseudocyst or a world of pancreatic necrosis. Unlike in GJ where as I mentioned we have 16 patients around 9 month of median follow up, no bleeding in any patient and the bleeding is the reason why you intend to remove it early, not the blockage of the stent which I, I can tell you is uh, very uh, rare within a uh, period of 6 months. Yeah. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you for uh, the nice demonstration of what uh, you made relatively look simple, but it's actually a difficult task. Question is two parts, which first is the choice between a, a new uh, US guided G, uh, GE and uh, and a duodenal stent. So I choose a, uh, a GE over a duodenal stent. And if you're aware of any comparative trials comparing using a duodenal enteral stent versus a G GE. Yeah. So I, I think a very, very important question and a very, very logical and a rational question com considering the cost of the duodenal stent which is cheaper compared to the hot axial stent. But I'll tell you the literature. So the literature clearly sh says that if the expected survival of the patient is more than three months, you should be choosing a GJ and the comparative studies of duodenal stent versus a hot axial or a GJ st hot axial stent. There are studies comparing between a GJ and a lab GJ though I would commit that these are retrospective studies but they clearly tell you that for a duodenal compare it to the duodenal stent once you use it for patients who have expected survival for more than three months the chances of reintervention increases the duodenal stent and ultimately it may not be that cost effective. And compared to surgery, you have lesser time of hospitalization, lesser cost involved, technical success again maybe a bit less in USGJ versus a surgical GJ. Moreover, you are preventing around say 15 to 30 percent chances of uh, morbidity which is predominantly in the form of gastroparesis which happens in patients who undergo a surgical GJ. So given a choice, a non-operable patient, patient who cannot undergo surgery, expected survival is more than three months, I think USGJ is the way to go. Thank you. Any other question? Uh, thank you very much um, for your talk. Um, just um, a simple question, which is, um, in case when you do have um, stent blockages, what do you do? Do you place an overlapping stent, or do you just go down again with a scope and try and unblock it, or use APC if there's tumor overgrowth? So, uh, you are asking if the stents get blocked? Yes. Yeah, I think, uh, so we frequently see even the biliary stents getting blocked, biliary metal stents. Uh, I think the way is similar. You just can pass a balloon across to uh, just open that up or pass um, any um, uh, thing to grasp it and remove. Usually these are food contents which are there. Unless it is tumor overgrowth, then obviously you may need to use uh, the APC. But as I mentioned, fortunately, uh, I think in whatever small number of cases that we have done, we didn't require that. Yeah, APC may be used for tumor in growth over growth. Um, Dr. Ravine, you mentioned before that uh, you have 16 cases already yes. uh, treated this way. Yes. Uh, what is the feedback from that? What is the follow-up that you have from them regarding patency yeah. and survival so, of the patients? Yeah, it so will be I, interesting I, I think I, I mentioned that. So the median, uh, the, uh, the, the follow-up was around nine months. No. Uh, mortality related to the procedure for sure. Obviously, these had uh, uh, malignant disease and mortality did happen because of the disease itself, not related to 
the uh, the procedure that is within seven days of the procedure there was no mortality and i think uh, the the best part is uh, the patient is able to resume a normal diet within a period of around say five to seven days something which is very good for the patient yeah uh, you didn't dilate it after the insertion of the stent yes and you prefer to delay the dilatation later uh, on. So, so I, I don't think we need to dilate it. This will open up for sure. And I think in the initial few cases that we did, uh, we did dilate that. Uh, that gives you a very good feel. You can straight away enter into the small bowel with a small, with a scope, upper GI scope. But I think it's not required. This stent will open up. The actual force is more. And this will open up for sure within 24 to 48 hours. I have a short question here also, please. Um, you mentioned that there is also biliary obstruction in this case particularly. So how did you approach on that? So uh, I'm not sure whether we really have uh, biliary obstruction because um, um, we didn't try to focus much, but the CT scan that I sh uh, saw was a large mass involving the uh, liver and that was possibly the reason for some jaundice. We didn't have a significant IHBR in this patient, at least on the CT scan that I saw. Yeah, but if you have biliary obstruction also, this patient you straight away you can do a hepaticogastrostomy. The problem will be that if you have the confluence which is blocked, so the confluence is blocked, then there may be some issues because left-sided hepaticogastrostomy are able to offer. Normally, you need to drain around two-thirds of the liver to achieve a significant biliary drainage. So the other segment then may be right anterior system, um, you may need to do a PTBD. For left system, you, do, you can do a hepaticogastrostomy. So that is the last question, I think. So we'll ask, proceed with the next case. So Dr. Uh, Chandrakant, can you brief the next case, please? Yes, sir. Uh, we have 60-year-old uh, uh, woman with history of right upper quadrant pain and jaundice from three days. Um, she does not have give any history of fever or chills. Her LFT total bilirubin is 6.3, with alpha is significantly elevated three times. SGOT, SGPT are mildly elevated, and total counts were normal. She had an ultrasound outside and the ultrasound done two days back showing a CBT diameter of uh, 11 mm with a calculus of 8.4 mm in the distal CBT with a bilobar IHBRD and multiple GB calculi. Our plan is to uh, do a CBT clearance of this patient uh, through ERCP. So, okay. So, here is possibly the only case of ERCP that I will be showing because uh, we will show, I will show more US cases but one ERCP case. Okay, so I stand, when I stand, I stand this way to the left and this is how I shake my hand, shake, can you close it, shake my hand to go past the pharyngoesophageal junction and as Dr. Ravi said, I start inflating in the esophagus and when I am advancing it in the esophagus, I am slowly rotating, inflate, rotate, and this is the way I am advancing roughly up to port. I am looking for that minor resistance that may be there because of an incidental stricture or narrowing in the esophagus. And when I am reaching lower down, I am also expecting possible hiatus hernia. So this is not there. So I have gone. As Dr. Ravi said, I have inflated this air from the very beginning. Only difference is when I move into the stomach, I do two more things. I move this knob half down and half to left. What is mean this? This is one down, this is two down. Can you show this? But I move this one down, two down. I move it only half down and half to left. Second thing I do is I hyper extend my hand like this and I inflate. So Dr. Ravi showed force going from left to right, but this is my way of achieving adequate distension of the stomach before proceeding towards the pylorus. Then from here to proceeding towards the pylorus, I need to do three things. Number one, push the scope in. Number two, lift the scope up, push, lift and move up and down knob up. So this is the movement I practice even in upper GI so that I am better in reaching duodenum consistently. So three things, push it in, rotate and move the up knob up. This is the way 
I advance towards the pylora. Then I shift my stance from left side to right side. I almost never personally stand like this. I will stand either like this or like this. So I will shift my stance to right side and proceed towards the pylorus. In this case, now I am proceeding towards the pylorus and proceeding towards the pylorus. Couple of things that I have learned over the years is that while coming to the pylorus, I can number one bring it here, straight away proceed or ask my assistant to fix the scope in this position and then move right and left now to the right. This I consider slightly safer compared to the routine entry and then I keep on moving my whole body to the right side just. So what has happened, I have decreased the chances of a potential post pyloric perforation because of forceful entry into the pylorus. Now, I am seeing the D1, D2 junction. What I am doing is, my scope, can you show down here? Right now, this scope is screaming because it is in a very torqued and twisted position. But I don't mind the screaming of the scope because this is the second place where I can cause perforation. So I am moving the right and left knob to the right, torquing my scope more, again moving my right and left to right, torquing my scope more, again moving my right and left knob right and torquing. So now I am seeing, I am visualizing the second part of duodenum. What to do now? I can do three things. Three things. Number one, I can move pull the scope back. Second thing, I can move the scope and gently jiggle it to the right and left, drizzle to the right and left. And the third thing is, I can move it more like this and pull it back. In this case, fortunately, it is a very lucky case for me because there is a big bulge and in this case, instead of a standard sphincterotomy, I will proceed with a pre-cut Wilson Cook or this is pre-cut needle knife from Boston Scientific. So we have, so we will do a pre-cut in this case. Now, so you understand please that I started from this position and now I am in this position. In this position, as Dr. Ravi said, I would like to place the papilla in the right upper quadrant right upper quadrant and this is where I place the papilla. So I am standing to the right side, I am introducing the needle knife introducing the needle knife and then I am trying to define few things number one is this is the needle knife lifted up so this knife is like a saber now. I will take the needle out, needle out, just show and I will just shadow practice. What should I do to move it like this? I should move it like this. But in this case, there is not much of room. So the room will be created as I cut it. So what to do? Two things. If I want more room, this is one thing I do is move the down knob down. In this case, I am keeping the down knob down to create the room. You will understand why in this case I am creating enough. Second thing is that this is the beginning point. I want to identify the end point. So I will just mark the possible max end point for you and this max end point, I will just place a marker there that this is the max end point that I can reach up to. Now I have to plan a pathway from the beginning point to the max end point. So the third thing that I am doing is, I am bringing my hand from inside, 
not from outside. If I bring my hand from outside to manipulate and adjust the position of scope, I inadvertently turn to left and compromise the position of the papilla. So what I am doing is I am rotating my body clockwise, bringing my hand from inside, keeping it like this. This movement I personally call criss cross movement. That is I am pushing the scope inside and I am keeping the left hand stable with the criss cross movement. Okay. So in this case, one of the things that we will do is we will execute pre-cut knife or pre-cut from this point to the end point that I have created. I can do it from above down or I can do it from below up. So, uh, so we right now I am doing it from above down. So, this is the needle knife. I am jamming it here and I am executing the cut. I am executing cut moving right and left knob trying to adjust the length and depth of cut. We can go more deeper, more deeper and I am trying slightly to move to left. This is partly blind but I will keep on cutting because once you do this, the risk of bleeding are very less and very minimal. So this first cut was by chance a little bit of direction but then I will correct the direction a little bit from here from this part okay and then correct it correct it right now what has happened that I can see the papilla even better and I can see the edematous mucosa in this case better so this is the second principle of a pre-cut what I call is an inside out pre-cut that is like uh, somebody is wearing a shirt I will give an example. Can you come closer for a second? So this is like a shirt. Come here. So I have opened it like a pier. I go inside the shirt and try to cut it from inside out. Can you can you see this is the way I am trying to see. turn it. So I am trying to cut it from inside out. So this is an improvisation that in this case I will just show you that we will extend this pre-cut a little bit higher up because we are not at any risk. So a little bit of inside out pre-cut to extend it in the upper part. Okay, now needle out once more. And this would be the inside out, inside out pre-cut that I am now executing. So this inside out pre-cut is and did you see that as I proceeded with the inside out pre-cut, the stone came out. So this stone is there and it has been delivered. So I will again do crisscross. Now I will remove the spring trot me pre-cut knife. So all this bulge was because of the stone and ideally I would have liked to give a complete cut because sometimes unfortunately it has happened with me that I have done a pre-cut on a bulge ampulla and then the bulge ampulla has collapsed so much that I didn't have time to reinsert a sphincterotome and a standard sphincterotome will not go. Now this is, now how to do insert the sphincterotome inside the papilla? For the beginners and fellows, I would like to tell you, I would like to keep the sphincterotome just outside the scope. I will keep it lifted with the base of my thumb, base of my thumb, I will crisscross again once more, make it stable and come so close to papilla that I am kissing the papilla. So now my push must go inside. So this is must go inside. So this is a simple case, but now my push has gone inside. So now is the first time that we will demonstrate, in this case, the cholangiogram. So till now the procedure has been done without a column. So please see that I am more turning my neck towards the uh, polaroscopic screen but I am holding the scope like this in my right hand so that while turning my neck towards the fluoroscopy screen I don't slip out. Okay. So we have we have done this. this yeah. we, can we count how many stones are there 
and does she have a gallbladder stone or not. So, we can start preparing for the second case, okay. Uh, in the meantime, I will just show what more. So, that splinter has opened up a little bit. Now, compared to Dr. Ravi and compared to convention also, I personally extend the cut in shorter burst. So, this cut I will be standing in shorter burst and I personally adjust the length of knife as very minimum and I right now, see this is the knife I am adjusting, length I am adjusting, I am keeping it up, I am pressing my feet over the pedal, but I am not yet cutting. In this case, in this case I am not doing anything, I am waiting for the respiratory movement to bring the papilla closer and as this closer I will apply one cut. I applied one cut and I will turn very slightly to the left, to left gone away, next time it comes closer, I come cut, come close, clo cut. So, I am applying a little bit use of respiratory movement which are, which are, which are happening to extend the cut. So, both technique are right, number one, you turn to left, that is one way, turn to left, use respiratory movement sometimes. In this case, I am showing whatever is coming. So, to turn to left, we rarely lock the right and left knob, why? Because if you slip out, while the right and left knob is locked, the chances of perforation are higher. So, I am likely to slip out now, I push the scope more in clockwise, again do the crisscross movement and then, so the question is, right now I am seeing the inside, I can afford to cut the swing trot me a little bit more, going away, come closer and I think I have enough of a sphinx rot me to do it, to take care of the stone. So, now I have unlocked the knob once more, I have shifted my body to hold right side, short wire, so this is a short wire and we will show you how a short wire exchange is done compared to long wire. So, the short wire exchange is done, we will push the short wire in, so this is, so I will keep, I have locked it, this is the, locked it and I have locked it till it comes out, I have jammed it with the help of elevator and my assistant is now showing, show his hand, come here, come here, my assistant is using the hydrostatic pusher to push the guide wire inside while him and me will coordinate together for this pull out and this push. So, this is short wire exchange happens very rapidly. Rahul, one come, come, wait, come here. Rahul, can you see Rahul? Short wire. So, this is, so he is pushing the water and I am pulling at it and you will see how rapidly the wire comes out. This is the wire. So, this is the short wire exchange. Whole of the stent has come out while we have synchronized our efforts in such a way now, now we will push in a balloon over this short wire exchange. So, this was an example to demonstration of short wire exchange on the sphincterotome compared to long wire exchange. The short wire has lot of advantage over us that we are able to quickly go and quickly swing and uh, quickly go with the help of a short wire. So, the long and, uh, and we use short wire 0 0.03 to thermo. Again and again remember that I am going in executing the crisscross movement all the time. My knobs right and left are not locked. My knob up and down is not locked because as I told you if I slip out there will be higher chances of perforation. So, I am advancing the balloon once more and I am pushing it to the ins pushing it inside the bile duct and so again one of the things we can do is we can just advance the balloon like this. Basically, there are two things, going in and coming out of, his, of his sphincter. So, this is going into his sphincter. So, going in into his sphincter, the fellows must practice same movement. This is out, in. A bit out, right and left knob in, move it in. More out, turn to right, move it in. 
move out turn to right move it in so this way i am moving it it is going in so i don't need to do any movement so i have pushed this balloon higher up now i have pushed the balloon to the highest side it is not going in anymore i will shift my attention by after keeping the scope like this again to the fluoroscopy fluoro so the balloon is inflated and we will pull the balloon now how to pull in the balloon again i am standing in a stable position remember this papilla is slightly unstable because it has moved from right upper to left upper quadrant i am pushing my scope inside again and slightly locking right and left knob to right so this is most stable but one thing has happened that right now my knobs are locked i cannot afford a slip back of the scope now so be careful while mind must know that you have locked the knobs okay now pulling it back i am pulling it back slowly slowly and slow, slowly pulling it back keeping it in the right upper quadrant pulling it back pulling it back and pulling it so balloon came out i didn't find any stone so at that time i saw some stone i will do an occlusion cholangiogram turning it to right and again so we'll see an occlusion cholangiogram to see if there is no stone we will place nonetheless a stent now you want to place a stent again on the short wire no my assistant tells me that he doesn't want to place the assistant on a short wire though we could have placed the assistant on a short wire but the placement of a of a stent on a short wire is relatively more challenging he does not want to do it in a workshop so because you may make a mistake and it can slip out but if you are in dire need you can place a 7 french stent over a short wire short term wire do not try to place a 10 french stent over a term wire because you will invariably be uh, fail in this endeavor so i am placing uh, a guide wire uh, again can, can we ask question yeah uh, i want to ask before yes. doing doing pre cut why you did not try to cannulate yeah you agree, i agree see number 1 you are absolutely correct i would say to each his own and in this case my logic is that i could have gone easily from a pre cut was the safest though there are no studies but i am very convinced that pre cut is the safest and easiest as you can see in retrospect but to each his own in this case bulge ampulla i see a stone impacted at the lower ampulla this is my thinking i would do a pre cut straight away rather than manipulate it rarely failing in the endeavor rarely i won't fail in this case i won't have failed with the regular sphincterotome but i have failed on previous many occasions whereas we have never failed uh, in uh, doing a pre cut in this case but yes scientifically you are absolutely theoretically you are correct for those who are not not uh, standard pre cutters who are not uh, who use pre cut only as a bail out option they should have tried with a regular uh, regular sphincterotome one more question please uh, why do you want to put the stent if you do an occlusion cholangiogram and okay, you have yeah. a wide sphincterotomy the, like that the, what the are problem you is that in india these patients almost always land up in problem because more stones slip out from gall bladder into the cbd and we do not leave them alone without a stent till their gall bladder is out so that is why we are placing the stent okay so with this case is over again last part i am pushing the knob down knob down i will not push any more because this may go in down knob down turning to right more push turning to right because i don't want the stent to and let it make a pick tail before i unlock all my knobs suck suck this come back into his stomach and suck it all before taking the scope out so we will have the next case of uh, uh, cystogastrostomy ready within few minutes so in the meantime if there are any more questions 
uh, about the technique or anything, I would be glad to answer. Any question? It will take few minutes, so you can ask, uh, you can, uh, you can, so, so you just can harass me it. about the pre-cut question. Just that is a good question and that is a good logical, but uh, people have shown that early uh, pre-cut has got less incidence. Now more logic, if I were to give more logic into why I did that. I am yeah. giving theoretical uh, logic, okay. Uh, I just one of the theoretical go. logic I would give is, is, number one, is that I am away from the pancreatic duct. My mind knows that papilla has got four quadrants and this quadrant that I was executing the cut current was in the left upper quadrant, not in the right lower quadrant where the pancreatic duct is expected to be. So manipulation of papilla theoretically could have created more problem than manipulation than failing manipulation through the papilla. That is one theoretical answer I have. Uh, just a small comment uh, regarding the uh, pre cut. Uh, I mean, uh, Dr. Mali Sharma, he is very expert, and you can see that he did it. In, in, in a very elegant, but I'm sure that he did thousands of pre-cut. So, uh, as he commented that uh, uh, those who are not familiar with the pre-cut, better to start with the standard cannulations, and if they fail, then you can do uh, pre-cut of fistulotomy, as uh, he mentioned. Dr. Khalid, yes. I just want to ask you, you share. Now, when we are doing the ERCP, do you think it is whoever is the, the person who is doing the endoscopist, you know, they're doing the ERCP, they should also be aware of pre-cut, you know, because there is a failure of cannulation, you know, almost in 5 to 10 percent of cases. So the one who does the ERCP, I feel, and I want to know your opinion about it, they should also be, I would say, have expertise in doing the pre-cut also. Sometimes they know, they know the cannulation, they know the spintrotomy, but the pre-cut part is there and then you'll end up with some cases referred because they didn't do the pre-cut. So pre-cut spintrotomy should also be part of the person who should be doing, you cannot label it as a failure of ERCP if the pre-cut has not been tried. What is your opinion on that? Yeah, Bayush, I totally agree with you. And there is a standard definition by the ESGE for the failed cannulations. Uh, so if you are beyond that time and you are just keep pushing your sphincterotome, you are causing edema, you are causing swelling, swelling of the uh, papilla, and then that will be, uh, uh, the risk of the pancreatitis really will be higher. So uh, shifting the gear to the pre-cut early is the, the way to take your patients, especially if you fail with 10 minutes after uh, failing. I think pre-cut is very uh, uh, safe. We saw the studies, many studies, and there is uh, 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 randomized control studies comparing the uh, standard cannulations with the uh, with the pre-cut. It is safe in terms of the pancreatitis, in terms of the uh, bleeding. Uh, but the thing is that, as as you mentioned, that not all the people they are familiar uh, of the pre-cut. Uh, I would like to just give a few more inputs about the pre-cut. One input I would like to, this is a case which would have been an ideal opportunity for fellows to learn how to do pre-cut. So given an option of trying to cannulate versus a trying to cannulate, though it takes nothing away, like experienced people like Khaled and Dr. Wallace can do it, but how many people train for pre-cut? And this, how many people train for exactly how to do pre-cut is a very difficult thing. So pre-cut from below up or above down, this would have been a good. And moreover, I am a little bit thin on literature, but in such cases, in pre-cut, the incidence of pancreatitis or any complication is very, very low when you have a bulged ampulla. So the chances of making a complication were very low versus a standard cannulation which would have failed if I had more, made more than three attempts. If you, if you allow me a comment, uh, Dr. Piyush, uh, I, I agree that uh, whoever practices RCP should be familiar with the pre-cut. Of course, the learning of pre-cut takes time. And uh, 
in this kind of case, the pre-cut was straightforward, maybe easier than the classic annulation because of the uh, bulge of the papilla. But uh, unfortunately, in most of the cases, even this papilla would have been easily cannulated with a standard guide wire that's finger on because of the bulge. But uh, in many cases, the pre-cut is done on a, a much smaller papilla. So the risk, especially of perforation, is significantly uh, high if you don't have very good orientation, which is the A and B in the pre-cut, in my opinion. However, regarding the successful cannulation, I believe that the endoscopy should take advantage of other techniques, uh, for example, the double guide wire technique that uh, I'm very much in favor of and I'm using it uh, all the time. So whenever I see that the the, the guide wire gets into the pancreatic duct more than two times. I leave the guide wire and I proceed with a success rate of 95% with the double guide wire technique that I believe it's much safer and it's giving you room also to put the pancreatic stent easier to prevent the uh, post-ERCP pancreatitis so you don't have to go to uh, the pre-cut uh, technique. Of course, uh, eventually, if you will fail also the double guide wire technique, then it's necessary to, to be familiar with the pre-cut, uh, with the needle knife technique. Uh, sorry, can I just um, have a comment as well? <clears throat> so I'll, I'll kind of agree with Dr. Piyush about the uh, pre-cut. However, um, it's just my experience. So when I was training um, in the UK um, to do ERCPs, I was never, ever given the opportunity to do a pre-cut. My consultant would take over at the time and he would never allow me to do a pre-cut. So I think there's no standard guidelines in terms of trainees at what point uh, they can do pre-cut. I mean, it depends. It varies from consultants to consultants. Sometimes they would allow you to carry on for a little bit longer. And even for the trainees, it's difficult because you are reluctant. You know you don't want to make the ampulla very edematous, so your consultant will fail. And it's very tricky. So in general, what do people do? As I'm sure all of us have trainees at some point. How far do you allow the trainees to go through? And at what point do you say, well, actually, um, you know, this is something, this is an easy um, uh, case for a pre-cut. We should allow the trainee. Just, just a general comment as to what uh, you all do. Excuse me. Uh, I would like to make a comment. Uh, thing is that uh, pre-cut depends on the papilla as well as the experience of the person who is doing the procedure. But I think this papilla, such a bulging papilla, is an ideal papilla where a trainee can start off actually. Of course, under the guidance of a mentor actually. So this is an ideal papilla where a pre-cut can be tried. But uh, as doctor uh, suggested before, uh, we should uh, do standard in a smaller papilla. Of course, you should go the standard way. If that fails, then you go double guide wire technique, then maybe a pancreatic stent, cut over that. Then finally, in a smaller papilla, you would like to go for a pre-cut. But uh, depending on the experience of the trainer, if a bulging papilla is there, I think a pre-cut pre -cut would not be bad. Like one of the most uh, strong opponents of pre-cut was Peter Cotton. And Peter Cotton said that I am on record that you do pre-cut, you'll end up in problem. And they kept the procedure as a very late. But then many studies came and people started to realize that early pre-cut is a thing. Unfortunately, we have, we, for or whatever, we have a strict protocol, three cannulations at our center. Unlike other center, if guide wire goes once into the pancreatic duct, we <laughs> never take it out because if may not go again into the pancreatic duct and we always place a pancreatic stent on the first entry of guide wire into the pancreatic duct. So, so we will be starting with the next case. So doctor, uh, yes, can you show there? Just a small announcement. Uh, we have uh, uh, coffee and uh, soft drinks on the left side. So throughout the day, you can have uh, if you want. Thank you. So good afternoon. 
so next we have a 30 year old lady who presented with the complain of earlier she presented with a complain of pain abdomen Check. suggestive of acute pancreatitis which was around 6 7 months back now she came again with persistent yeah, vomiting so loss of weight and mild pain abdomen for past 2 months so she had a history of acute biliary pancreatitis in september 2021 CT was done recently which showed a large pseudo cyst of 10 into 12 into 14 cm without any significant debris inside so today the plan of action is us guided cystogastrostomy and uh, this is being done to relieve the gastric outlet obstruction so dr deepak uh, gunjan will demonstrate the procedure sir please you can you can start sir so can you ask pentex guy to here सो दिस इज पेंटेक्स स्कोप एंड आई मीन दोस ऑफ फेगस now crossing g junction yeah. and this is the stomach data so i am trying to go inside the entrum first and then i will withdraw the scope So decrease the gain, please. Gorge piece, please. Gorge piece. so i think it is difficult to go into the entrum डॉक्टर मलेज ही है डॉक्टर मलेज ही है सो आई हैव स्लाइट डिफिकल्टी इन गोइंग इन टू द एंट्रम 
Because there is a compression of his stomach. So, uh, why don't we uh, see where you want to, you want to go to entrum or you yeah, I want avoid to. going to entrum? So this is a case which to me appears that uh, it is a big collection and this is in the splenic recess also because this is going into the splenic recess. So instead of being a standard pseudocyst, it is a collection in the lesser sac because this is the boundary uh, of a lesser sac. Uh, can you, uh, means if you rotate back? Yeah. So this is not such a straightforward pseudocyst because this is a could be a lesser sac collection, or is it the stomach fold that we are finding? What are these? I this think that was that was the stomach fold, and this is the collection. Collection the is very big. It should be seen as a very big collection. Yeah, but it is a small here. What is so the duration of so the collection? We, have we done a? Uh, what is the collection size roughly? It was 14 into 10 centimeter. 14 into 10 centimeter. Yeah. But somehow I sense that this collection is now no longer a very organized cystic collection because I see lot of uh, lot of structures within this collection, and they are lot of ecogenic shadows. Yeah. So that's why I want to go into the interim. Yes. So that I can uh, see, see now, properly. See, this is this is the collection. Shall I decrease the frequency? Uh, 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 miss, can I have the Hitachi people? Yeah, decrease the frequency. Hitachi uh, person, can we come? Okay. What is the duration of the collection? Since when it is there? Do you think this is the, this is the? Can we decrease the frequency, please? Yeah. What is the duration of the disease? Can can I be tell? Yes, please. Low, low. Already low. We will move the focus down. I don't think that is the collection. This is this is the, this is the collection. So, are there two collections? Is there a single collection? And that is the, so that is the problem because we have because we are trained. So I, I think you have to try one time to go into the interim. I am not able to go inside. Okay. So I have difficulty with uh, this. So because scope. of the size of the cyst, you have difficulty in going toward the interim. I yeah. Agree. So can we lift up the shoulder, please? Because sometimes if you lift up the shoulder, you can go proceed towards the interim. No, it is fundus. Okay. So I will also try once because sometimes when I feel, yeah, okay. This okay. is the this entrum. This is okay. Now you are yeah. in the entrum. Okay. Yes. So you want to see the cyst from here? Yeah, I, I will just withdraw it and see if the cyst is visible from here. So we are now seeing the liver. So this yeah. is okay. This is the IVC, and so this is. And no, this is the one. So we collection. see some fluid posterior to the wall of his stomach. Mm -hmm. This is posterior to the wall of his stomach. This is the fluid that we are seeing posterior to the wall of the stomach in the lesser set. So this is a lesser set collection and we are not seeing any. So I think we will see a repeat CT and a repeat is, CT and then decide because we are seeing very large ecogenic structures within this lesser set. Definitely. Okay. And this is a lesser set collection rather than a pseudocyst anymore. And this is a small in size also. It is a small in size. What is reported on CT scan, there is a very large collection. Yes. So this is pancreas, mm. this is the collection and this is now a pure lesser sac collection. So the cyst has probably ruptured into lesser sac. You Dr. can Malay. see one time. Yes. You can Dr. Dr. Malay. Yes. Tell me. 
can you show us the boundaries of lesser sect please to the audience see lesser sect has three boundaries number one is it, it has got a superior boundary which goes so this is the liver which goes into the liver so this is the ivc and the lesser sect collection goes superior boundary into the liver and the lesser sac will be somewhere close to the hilum of the liver so what i am seeing right now is this is portal vein this is portal vein we will we'll, um, uh, uh, level the structure we'll like cor corrector can we please correct add 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 hmm ha uh, type it portal vein portal vein pv this is hepatic artery, artery. This is pancreas. Okay. This is IVC. So okay. So then we will try and see. So where is the fluid? And this is the pancreatic duct. Pancreatic duct. So, and so we are finding fluid posterior to posterior to the wall of stomach. So I agree with the, uh, Dr. Gunjan that this case has got only. So this is the. So one is the inferior boundary of lesser sac. Second, the superior boundary of lesser sac, which comes close to the liver. Superior boundary of lesser sac comes into within the liver. Second is the inferior boundary of lesser sac, which goes like this. And third is the splenic recess of the lesser sac, which we rotate it. And once we rotate it all the way, we clear remove, character. Remove. Clear. Remove the yeah. We rotate it all the way and we come toward the spleen and when we see the spleen, that is the time we see the splenic recess. So we can prepare for the next case because in this case I believe uh, Dr. Gunjan is absolutely correct that the size of the cyst has gone down. So recently it may have ruptured and this is right now whatever we are seeing right now is some fluid collection within the lesser sac and this is the pancreas, this is the spleen. So this is the uh, fluid collection within the lesser cell. And the size is very small, I think. Take the size, please. The, the size we can measure. Freeze. Excuse me, when the CT scan was done, which was shown here. Yeah, that's what, that's very important question. When the CT was done, can you, can anybody tell the date of CT scan? Three days ago only. Okay. So, so it was then. So within three days, is, something has changed. The is what, is, what is what is the duration of illness since when the patient has been two months, two months? Two months. Two months. Two months. So two months. I think in, in three days this can happen. I don't know. So uh, I think uh, it must be ruptured in then bowel. Reason being, if it would have been ruptured in peritoneal cavity, there should be fluid or ascites into the peritoneal cavity. But I don't so think there is a fluid. There is into no fluid ascites into the peritoneal, peritoneal cavity. cavity. It means it has ruptured into the bowel, so that there is no fluid into the peritoneal cavity. No, it it has ruptured into lesser sac yeah, also. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. what we can see right now, so can we try and see if we can see if this pancreatic duct has ruptured anyway into the lesser sac? Because this is the pancreatic duct we are seeing, and if we follow this pancreatic duct all the way to the tail. So a tail, tail will leak into the peritoneal cavity, tail rupture and a body rupture will lead into the lesser sac Sack. or a ligament if the cyst is with. So we can trace this pancreatic duct all the way down towards the head. So now for, for beginners I would say how to see pancreatic duct. We are seeing this is the pancreatic duct in the body. Arrow. This yeah. is the pancreatic duct in yeah. the body. So we increase it. We increase the frequency also. Can we increase the frequency higher? We increase the frequency. We move the focus up, focus up. And then we apply auto. And then we see the pancreatic. This is the pancreatic duct, yeah. which is falling down like this. So we have another case of cystogastrostomy. So we will have to stop uh, this case uh, right now. Because in this case, I don't see any pancreatic duct disruption. Well, I am tracing it from this part to this part or I am tracing it at least in the body part. And this is the part that I am tracing the pancreatic duct and the fluid 
plute is the, it looks quite distant here is where where we see possibly possibly bilateral no these are these all are vessels. vessels we are finding all vessels so we cannot predict any sign of the uh, rupture of the pancreatic duct into if we can trace this pancreatic duct going to the periphery of this collection to or okay here is where possibly but this is all mostly in imagination as i said we do not find any pancreatic duct leak so uh, i think and we will remove the scope and uh, we'll uh, get on ready with the next case yeah that's what yes. yeah definitely into the bowel so, so there is so no there problem. are two assumptions that it might have ruptured into the bowel or it might have ruptured into the lesser sac ah okay. so there is no ascites into the bowel so we have we wait for 5 minutes before doing the next case can get ready with the next case yeah 14 cm and only 3 and 4 cm uh, i would like to just uh, elaborate few things number one is uh, in the meantime that when there is pancreatitis when there is pancreatitis how does the flu track initially in acute pancreatitis in this case there is no longer acute pancreatitis the flu tracks between the lobules of the pancreas then it goes anteriorly and it goes posteriorly once it goes anteriorly it goes posterior to the wall of the stomach and there it can go laterally anterior to the perirenal fascia and perirenal fascia and posterior to perirenal fascia okay so three places the more posterior it is the more serious it is what i mean to say if there is fluid between the stomach and pancreas and tear to the perirenal fascia it is less severe when it goes around the kidney and around the adrenal gland involving adrenal gland it is perirenal more extensive disease and when it goes posterior to the perirenal fascia it creates collens signs and that is more serious pancreatitis so it spreads anteriorly and posteriorly what can it do when it goes anteriorly it can go anteriorly into peritoneal cavity by two ways one is direct perforation through the posterior boundary of lesser sac into the lesser sac that happens more often with the body part of the pancreatic duct second thing is it can go intraperitoneally through the tail part of the pancreas the tail gets ruptured into the greater sac the part of peritoneal cavity sometimes why why the lesser sac collection does not go into greater sac because in most of the cases there is inflammation and the foramen of winslow closes down so the pathways of the spread of pancreatic fluid collection in pancreatitis are through the lobules peripancreatic anterior peripancreatic posterior peripancreatic and then from anterior peripancreatic spreading laterally anterior peri perirenal perirenal and posterior perirenal spaces so these are the just explanation that can help there is a, uh, a small concept that i would like to clarify for many many fellows that there are three compartments in our abdomen one is peritoneal compartment second is subperitoneal compartment and the third is retroperitoneal compartment the subperitoneal compartment is defined as the ligaments which comes from posteriorly along the vessels and which form ligaments so all the three compartments are potential spaces which can get filled with fluid so in pancreatitis is a retroperitoneal disease basically which spreads mainly into retroperitoneum but it can spread into the subperitoneal compartment also and when it spreads into subperitoneal compartment or ligaments they are called pseudocyst and when it spreads into the lesser sac 
or into the greater peritoneal cavity. Greater cell, then they cause ascites. So all three are potential spaces. There is no fluid normally in these three spaces. But the pancreatitis is spread from retro to sub and retro to peritoneal directly or indirectly into these three potential spaces in different manner. So that is one of the pathogenesis part I, I have tried to explain to the fellows. So we will have another case ready for Dr. Gunjan hopefully, but this is a, a good decision. Uh, I think anything else you want to say, good, very good decision and uh, we would not have punctured such a small collection which would have, which have ruptured recently. So what we practice uh, that before taking any patients for cystogastrostomy, whether it is pseudocyst or uh, wall of necrosis. On the same day, we used to do the ultrasound by self. That gives you a good idea of that what is the size of the cyst. And ultrasound is very good modality of uh, determining how much the content of the debris. So that's very important. The reason being Hello? that the content uh, no, of the sir. debris inside the wall of necrosis no, determines what is the type of drainage you will uh, need, whether it require a plastic stent or whether it require a, a metal stent, so whether it is a biflange metal stent or a lumen opposing metal stent. So usually what we practice that if there is a less than 30% debris, it is more of a overall estimation rather than calculating the volume of the debris. You can calculate it also. But it is more of our overall impression of uh, what is the content of the debris. If less than 30 percent, you can go ahead with plastic stent. And if it is more than 30 percent, you can go ahead with the metal sense placement, whether it is lumen opposing metal stent or biflange metal stent. The other part of that, uh, usually CT is not very good modality of uh, determining the content of the debris. You can see on endoscopic ultrasound also and also on MRI. So ultrasound and MRI, these are modalities that gives you a good idea of uh, how much is the debris and then determine which stent you require. Uh, the plastic stent, usually oh. if you put plastic stent, we do not do endoscopic lavas regularly. We do ultrasound on C, is there is a debris or not. If there is a debris, we can go with the upper GI endoscope, dilate, it with, dilate the tract with balloon, go inside the cavity and then do necrosectomy or lavas. If it is metal stent, then there is no problem. You can directly go with the upper GI endoscope and do the lavas or endoscopic necrosectomy. Thank you. Uh, I have a question <coughs> for this patient. Is she symptomatic or no with this uh, big uh, cyst which have been ruptured? So what you will do uh, after that? Uh, is she symptomatic? What are the markers of this patient's? Uh, would you go conservative or would you do uh, percutaneous drainage? Can you hear me? Sorry, uh, what was the question? Any question? Or we have started already? The question is for the previous patient, Dr. Malay. Uh, would so you go... Cons Khalid, we are going to the next case. Okay. So Ravindra, you are on. So Mike. Next, uh, next, we have a 97-year-old male. We, uh, who is having persistent pain upper abdomen radiating to the back for past one month and uh, he has also he has been diagnosed with diabetes recently in view of being poor ECOG status of 3 he is being considered for the palliation and the CT uh, was also done which uh, showed a hypodense mass region in the head of pancreas of size 20 into 21 mm with double duct sign being present. So further plan for this patient is EUS guided ciliate plexus neurolysis in view of poor performance status. 
Okay, yeah, I think as we have heard this particular case, this is a 92 year old man. He has got a mass in the pancreas and then first thing is we are going to assess okay. is the mass advanced or not. That is the one thing which we should know before we do a celiac block. Yes. Because celiac block is a palliative procedure wherein we do it for pain relief. I think the first thing here is to know the arterial involvement, the venous involvement of the pancreatic tumor, whether there is an arterial encasement and then the venous encasement. Something is not operable is whenever it is a celiac artery involved or an SMA involved, that's a, that's a non-operable one. And then or even if it is the portal vein, that's a borderline operable. I think these are the primary issues what we should address first. If there is an arterial involvement of celiac artery, SMA, then it is non-operable. Splenic vein, portal vein and SMV, they are now considered as borderline operable because more of our HBB surgeons, they will operate. I think let us start this case. First thing in this case is, I am using a fugiscope here. Make it smaller in depth. First thing what we should address is, I use the cranial to the left. This is what I, I practice. First thing I would look, look is the liver. Is there any metastasis in the liver? That says that I could see this is the left lobe of the liver what I am seeing. Where is the cursor? Cursor, cursor. Arrow. arrow. This is the left okay, arrow, arrow. Yeah, this is the left lobe of the liver. I don't see any mass inside the left lobe of the liver. And this is the portal vein which is entering here. And then first thing is that is what I would look and then I will rotate the scope clockwise. And now you are seeing a mass here. This is the mass, I think, and this is the portal vein which is very, very close. I think portal vein is already involved. That is the thing, and this is the this is the pancreatic duct what we are visualizing. Means one is this person is 92 year old, and the portal vein is almost very, very closely going through the mass. I think these are the two issues which we should be looking into, and uh, this looks like it's a borderline operable case. Now. I will rotate the scope clockwise, clockwise that, that is to see the celiac artery now. I think you can see the celiac artery, the origin, this is the first artery, that is the celiac artery and then if we want to inject, if we want to do a celiac block, our needle should come here and then this is exactly the area where we should be doing a celiac block. Celiac ganglion block is one where we use the ganglion, means these are all hypoechoic structures, we can see it here. That is a celiac ganglion block. Michael Levy uses that, but I think most of the time this is the celiac block what we do, wherein we inject the uh, alcohol as well as bupivacaine here. This is how the celiac block is, is done. And now in this particular case, as we have seen, there is no left lobe, there is no lesion in the left lobe. But as we are seeing this mass, which we are seeing here, you see this, this is the PD which is hugely dilated, you can see the PD. We can measure the PD. Where is the measurement? PD is, if you see, this is almost 6 millimeter. Very hugely dilated pancreatic duct. And, and I am going towards the tail end of the pancreas. Make him a little bit like this. Yeah. I think now we can. This is how the where exactly the celiac blocks is is done. So you can see the origin of the celiac artery here. Make it bigger. Bigger, bigger. Yeah, ah, that's it, that's it. Okay, and arrow. I think the arrow, I think our in celiac blocks is what we do is we will pass the needle just like in it is a simple procedure just like in FNAC what we will do is we will come here we will inject the BPVK in 0.25 percent around 10 to 15 ml and around 10 to 20 ml of absolute alcohol we inject. I think this is the procedure we do but one particular important thing what we should look is sometimes the artery to the diaphragm will come here. That is one thing which we should be looking. Well, color Doppler. See, this is the most important thing in celiac artery, what we should be careful. Sometimes an artery arises from the celiac artery which moves towards the diaphragm. 
if that is the case then you will when you puncture sometimes you can puncture that artery which can sometimes lead on to diaphragmatic palsies and other things that's why that's the only thing which we should be careful in this case as we go ahead i think now we will uh, do the procedure give the needle i think this case as i showed you one is is a 90 year old portal vein is involved and that means is a borderline operable now the and it has been the biopsy has been already been done it is a it is a proven malignancy 90 year old with severe back pain our now the thing is we are going to do a celiac block on him there are two types of needle we usually use one is a dedicated needle which comes from the wilson cook that's a celiac block needle that's itself another one is you can use a 22 gauge needle from cook boston scientific or mediglobe all of the needles can be used so what are you using now now i am using a cook needle of 22 gauge we are not using the dedicated uh, the cook needle in that you have multiple holes from where the you will get the the fluids comes out and then they will have much better uh, the fluid comes out around the lesion around the lesion where we will inject but here also there is there will be a jet which comes from the tip of the one minute open this yeah this is a very tight needle yeah i think now you can see my needle has come out see this is exactly the place where we should be injecting this is the area where we should be injecting arrow arrow this is the area of intended area where i would like to inject this area yeah that area so you are injecting in a triangular i can yeah yeah yeah, yeah. you are trying to inject it into, into a triangular area this area so this area uh, is behind the stomach above celiac and in front of our aorta uh, yeah so this is the triangular area i will make the triangle like this one boundary like this one boundary and this is one boundary yeah so into this triangular area so we will enlarge it even more to see if so can we trace can we trace yes, sir. trace how to trace trace me trace major we want to trace this one this yes, one okay so we will make this area from here we will enter it set at art now trace trace so trace the triangle i think we will have to go a little bit higher up up to this place and then come back So this is the triangle. Agreed? Yeah, yeah. So this is the triangle you are concentrating on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this triangle also contains uh, comes close to the crux of diaphragm. So you want don't want to inject into crux, crux of, of the diaphragm. That's very very important. So and wait a minute. Yeah. So shall we please shall we show them that this is the crux of the diaphragm? Yeah. If, if we can find out the crux of the diaphragm, the crux will be full base. This is the crux. Is this the crux? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the crux of the diaphragm. Arrow. Where is the arrow? Yeah. This is the crux. Yeah, yeah. So you don't want to show in in the inject in the crux of diaphragm. Crux of the diaphragm. Yeah. Hold it, sister. Hold on like this. Pakad lena zara. Hold. Hold it. So he is asking the assistant to hold the venue. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think I overshot. You, you, you overshot. Oh, you you overshot. Yeah, yeah, you overshot. But you, it doesn't happen. It doesn't. No, no, doesn't. It has happened here. Yeah, good, yeah. good for you. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, but wait a minute. Let me check if you have done some damage. Do you think if damage is no, there, no, what no. will happen? No, nothing. Usually there will be the white shadows will come all around. That is the bleeding. What we will see. But I usually nothing to panic here because when we little entry into the one way enter doesn't cause any major problem. Mm. So it, you went into the vessel. Yeah, yeah, I great. went into the celiac good. artery. Yeah. So good into the that the audience know that you going into celiac artery yeah, matter. Yeah, yeah. So I will 
volunteer one more thing. Even if you go into Aota, it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what are the chambers you can enter? Safely. I, I think Aota we can enter. Celia Cartry we can enter. Ah, Celia Cartry. I have seen first time entry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First time somebody yes. has entered Celia Cartry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have many stalwarts here. Any more? Any more person who will raise hand? None of the experts raise hand, Ravindra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but yes, why arteries are compressible? They are. Uh, uh, I think we can remove. So this. we'll remove the colored Doppler. And this one okay. we'll remove. Remove the. We'll remove the colored. Uh, this. Remove the needle. Needle. As but that is comforting to know that you can puncture celiac artery. But yeah. you must be careful. Careful, yeah. But why did an experienced person like you overshot? No, I think we didn't measure the uh, the length. That yeah. is the one thing. Okay. But yeah, we can inject. We can now. We'll add the BPK now. The only thing is, I am not very sure of the tip of the needle. Yeah, Would you second. like to yeah, yeah, move this up and down? Yeah, one second, sure? one second. One second. Yeah. And now I can show you. Yeah, you are outside. Yeah, yeah. Now I am outside. Yeah. You are outside. Yeah, yeah. Can I increase the frequency? Yeah. I, because increasing frequency might show the tip of the needle better. Now and you can see the needle better. Okay. And can I apply tissue harmonic imaging? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. that may make it even better. Because yes, yes. Right now, see. So these are the things to do. We can apply arrow here because this is the tip of the needle. And you yeah. can see this tip of the needle is outside. Yeah. But, but do you want to measure color once more? Yeah. No, no vessel here. No vessel. Okay. So we applied. We were not sure where the tip of the needle is. So we applied tissue harmonic. Yeah. We increase the frequency, and we the focus, as you said, is uh, rightly there, right there. Yeah. Sorry. Focus is right there where it should be. Yeah. Because this is the place where the. Yeah. I think now we will inject uh, 10 ml of BPK in. 10 ml BP. First aspirate. This is to confirm aspirate, that aspirate. 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 So you want to aspirate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Aspirate. Yeah. See that there is no blood inside, and then you inject. Inject. So once you are injecting, there is some sort of swelling in the yeah, yeah, yeah. in the retro gastric space. Yeah. So this is the retro gastric. So what are the vessels that can come here? One is the uh, from the celiac artery. Sometimes the diaphragmatic arteries they come. That is one thing. Left inferior, yeah, left phrenic inferior phrenic artery. Ah, uh, and the, maybe left gastric artery. Yeah, left gastric. So one of the complications that somebody mentioned was diaphragmatic what? paralysis. Yeah, alcohol. Diaphragmatic. And then the uh, adrenal infarction because yeah. of injection. Yeah. No. Now we are injecting alcohol. Yeah. Now we are injecting alcohol. Don't push. Don't push the needle. That is very important. Yeah. So he is holding the needle. Yeah. So while you are injecting the alcohol, yeah. The view will go down. Yeah. The visibility will go down. Yes. How much alcohol? Usually 10 ml. What do you think of this celiac ganglion block injection? Inject into ganglia? No, I think that is one thing uh, Michael Levy proposes. But most of the time, uh, this is sufficient when you do a proper uh, celiac no. axis block. Sufficient, sir. So you are confident with 10 yeah. ml block? Yeah, another 10, another 5 ml we can give. 5 ml alcohol? Yeah, alcohol. Okay. The Don't press too much, because if you press too much, sometimes we can go inside the celiac artery. Okay. So why why don't you lock it? Yeah, I have locked it with my hand. But despite locking, you want to take extra precaution yeah, that yeah, the yes. assistant is pushing. Yes, yes. So yes, remember, yes. there is too much of pressure involved. Yeah. So that is why, sufficient. by chance, by mistake, the assistant can push the needle inside. Now so see, I am just coming out. My needle is coming out. You can see the whole needle coming out. Okay. And this. This is exactly the thing. Yeah, I think this is done. Okay. So we can we will be shifting to the next case. Ravindra, can yeah. you go there and yeah. answer the question yeah. because we will be preparing for the next case yeah. immediately. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Uh, Stop the voice transmitting dead yeah, to India. Yeah. yeah.
Yeah, I think uh, the most important thing in this uh, particular case, what we should be, it's a simple procedure like an FNAC. I most important thing is the indication. I think now the indication is only the head of the pancreas. We don't use it no more for uh, chronic pancreatitis because it doesn't make any sense. We in a chronic pancreatitis we use tramsinolon and uh, bupivacaine, whereas in uh, the pancreatic mass we use absolute alcohol and bupivacaine. Bupivacaine 0.25 percent around 10 ml you can there are two different ways you put the bupivacaine then the absolute alcohol then bupivacaine sandwich and then you can use once again absolute alcohol that is a sandwiching method you can use or put 0.25 percent of bupivacaine around 10 ml followed by another 20 ml of absolute alcohol that is what the thing and only issue in celiac block what we should be uh, aware is the we should not be injecting into the crux that is one. And then sometimes the inferior phrenic artery comes out from the celiac artery, that is one thing we have to be careful. I think these are the two things we have to be careful. And the third important thing is hydration post procedure which has to be given so that some of them may, they may go for hypotension. I think these are the two, three issues which we should be aware. And sometimes the pain can go up and then they can come down. I think these are the instructions we should give to the patients. Yeah, hello, Dr. Ravindra. I can only put in one or two more inputs. Yeah, yeah. But when you trace the anterior border of aorta, sometimes there is left inferior phrenic artery also coming just above the celiac artery. So you can carefully scan for that left inferior phrenic artery because that is the first branch coming out of aorta. So you are injecting above aorta into this triangular space. So what are the contents of this triangular space includes left inferior phrenic artery. So the injection of alcohol into left inferior phrenic artery can lead to adrenal infarction and that is one complication. So as you said diaphragmatic paralysis, I, how will that happen? I think can I ask, uh, when can we, I ask, yeah, yeah, please. Can I ask a question? What are the AOS signs of successful injection? In, uh, I didn't block? get the, can you repeat this question? When you do celiac block yeah. and you do it with endoscopic ultrasound, what are the signs you see on the screen of AOS telling that the injection was successful? Injection is not successful. Is successful. Yeah, I think uh, the most important thing is the pain means Im immediately after the, this thing sometimes the pain can go up. That is one, th one, th one uh, thing what people can expect. That is one. Pain will go up and then come down. That is one sign the patient may say. That is the method to say that injection has been successful. That is immediately post procedure. That is one. Pain goes up. Pain goes time. up. Sometimes the pain goes up and then it comes out. And then sometimes they go in for a small episode of hypotension. Change of the tissue. Change yes. of the appearance yeah. of the tissue. Yeah. Other thing is the whiteness what you could see. That, is, that indicates that uh, you have injected into the right path. There, there will be a foaming all around the celiac axis where we could see in this case lot of foaming will happen around that that is see one is a method from the eus the, that is the foaming what we see that is number one and the methods post procedure is patient may have an increase in pain and then sometimes may, they may have a got a, they will get a small hypotension these are the two things that you have injected into the right uh, the path they call, they call it scramble eggs appearance yeah Thank you very much yeah. for the for the case. So I've got a, a question uh, and perhaps a couple of comments. So my question is: Have you had any? Have you, do you have any experience in uh, celiac plexus RFA? Uh, and what's this lead? What this leads was is leading to is um, I, I I think the studies and I've always find that if you are able to identify the ganglion, then that will make the the EUS FNA. So the the blood, the the neurolysis a lot more effective, and the the third part I suppose is there's been a comparison between injecting in two sites left and right, ten and ten versus a central twenty, uh, and what, what's your take on this and uh, in terms of efficiency? Now can you repeat the last one, the celiac block versus celiac ganglion? You mean to say? Uh, so so there's there's been comparative trials looking at injecting to the left and to the right of the the, the the celiac takeoff yeah. as opposed to just underneath it uh, the whole amount yeah yeah i think bilateral method and the unilateral method that is the one thing right, I right. Think, yeah i think there was a japanese study which said that bilateral if you do the pain is pain relief is better and then the duration of pain relief is better durable it's yeah, yeah that durable. is a japanese Correct. study which stated that but i think there are some studies which have come later 
which have shown that there is not much of a difference between bilateral as well as unilateral. I think even Sham's group had a study which said that the, the difference between these two is very minimal. But a Japanese study definitely showed, I think it was in 2017 or 18, there was a study which came, which showed that bilateral is better than unilateral. That is the study. But I think the, the final answer is yet to be very, very clear. And the RFA, if you've got any experience with RFA, uh, to, for, for instead of injection? Uh, other than injections? Yeah. So, so, uh, so not Shams able to drop holes, uh, in, in which they, they did RFA for the celiac plexus. Yeah, experience. yeah, there is an another Neuromyces. method. You can e inject even radioactive beads, which can go there and then they can emit the radiation. That is one method which they have proposed. I think but that is not much of in use. That is one way you can do that and even the small RFA probes which can go in and then they can coagulate those ganglions. They, these are the two methods. Radioactive beads are one and second thing is RFA of those ganglions. Small needle you can just go in but only thing is these ganglions are very very small. They may be around 2 mm, 3 mm and then the RFA, the probe what we use usually, usually are much much thicker. I think we need a specifically for these ganglions a little better RFA needles which is which has to be practically useful. Hi Dr. Ravindra, Dr. Abid here. Nice presentation. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Advanced pancreatic cancer, US celiac plexus neurolysis is a very well known indication. What is uh, your experience with other GIT malignancies uh, for the celiac plexus block in terms of pain palliation? I think we, I, we will be doing in uh, our center only for the pancreas very rarely for gallbladder. I think these are the only two indications. Stomach doesn't work, rest of the things they don't do well. Uh, I think this is the only indication which we use liver, second is the gallbladder. Dr. Ravindra, uh, good demonstration. Uh, one question actually, for benign indication like chronic pancreatitis, any role? Yeah, I think uh, there, there means people used to use chronic in chronic pancreatitis BPVKN uh, uh, with uh, triamcinolone. But I think we have we have stopped using it because it, 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 it's a chronic pancreatitis as you know it's a disease which is a long lasting disease giving a two months or three months relief is of no use. And then when they go for a sec means when they need a surgery later the whole thing gets into a problem. That's why we have stopped doing uh, celiac uh, plexus block uh, 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 this celiac plexus methods for chronic pancreatitis because it's of, an, it's of not use at all. Uh, Dr. Ravindra, very nice presentation. What is your take on paraparesis? Have you seen it? Uh, Yogeshwar's block. Yeah, I'm not able. To, can you repeat? There. Uh, any, any risk of paraparesis or lower limb paralysis after? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, there there means this is possible even with. Uh, I had seen a case with a anesthetist doing a celiac block. We had seen, but this is very known. But with the EUS blocks, the chances are less. The directly what they do through CT guided or an anesthetist without the guidance, they what they will do, they, that has got higher risk. Then is comes the CT guided and then, then comes the EUS guided. Definitely even with EUS guided blocks, there are reports of paraplegia. Because one of the artery which supplies the spinal cord, that is an artery of, I think it is an artery of Adam Kavis. When that gets into necrosis, there is a blood circulation which gets necrosed to the spinal cord and then they develop paraparesis. Just, just a point to mention here, which is I suppose uh, along what Yogesh was mentioning, which is um, I think part of what we need to do is as gastroenterologists and endosonographers is that we need to advertise to our colleagues that um, celiac plexus uh, block is now an essentially a GI um, thing to be dealt with. Uh, you still see in hospitals patients with cancer being referred to the uh, radiologist to have a CT guided uh, EOS plexus block which is a lot more uh, cumbersome, a lot more dangerous uh, and, and not that as effective. So I think we need to advertise to our oncology colleagues that and even to, it, the, by the way the radiologists they don't like doing this because for them it's too high risk. <clears throat> uh, uh, there was a, a paper from Alan Sahai um, quite a few years back in which they randomized uh, patients coming for an EUS FNA uh, for diagnosis uh, 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 into a celiac plexus block simultaneously regardless of symptoms at the time 
in, in, in operable patients, obviously, uh, and then uh, 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 versus symptomatic management. And they they did prove that actually um, the the patients who were given sort of preemptive blexus block they did very much better in terms of um, quality of life and pay and sort of long term management of palliation actually. I think they are inducing the next case. We'll go to the next case. Excellent demonstration by Dr. Uh, Ravindra sir. Thank you very much. And we move on to the next case by Dr. Pankaj Desai. And uh, sir will demonstrate a case of uh, uh, state, uh, p a patient who underwent cholecystectomy and right now presented with the history of pain abdomen. On MRCP, there was a stone the seen in the distal CBD. So sir will demonstrate the uh, this uh, ERCP guided stone extraction of this patient. Over to Dr. Pankaj sir. Yeah, hi. Hi, uh, good afternoon and uh, uh, thank a big thank you to Dr. Malai for this uh, kind invitation. Uh, now, uh, you have seen a couple of ERCPs uh, from the morning and uh, now I have uh, uh, Dr. Mohan uh, who has come from AIG Hyderabad is a very close friend of mine who is going to uh, share this uh, case with me and uh, give his uh, inputs. Uh, what we have seen in the morning is uh, we have had the patient in uh, uh, semi prone position in all the cases. What I prefer is my school of thought what I follow is I keep the patient in left lateral. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages of both uh, but uh, I have been trained like this so what I, whenever uh, we see uh, do the patient in left lateral. Uh, most of the times it makes uh, duodenal and intubation a little easier that is what my uh, feeling is and once when we require to have a uh, normal anatomy or see whether which duct is precisely we are going we will just turn the patient on the uh, back and that makes the things lot of, uh, easier and in a better perspective. So uh, the patient has been sedated I am entering the oral cavity and now everyone has shown you how to go in. Uh, this is a Pentex uh, uh, duodenoscope that we are using and as uh, Dr. Malai had showed once you have intubated the esophagus slowly very gently we just keep on moving the scope to and fro and just to see that we don't hit a stricture or we don't uh, push the scope inadvertently across uh, where it is not going on easily. This is the best way to prevent any perforation because this is a partly blind procedure. Once you enter the stomach, you go to the left, suck out all the fluid that is in the fundus. Slowly uh, with your big wheel, you just put a big wheel a little down, turn to the right and then you go towards the pylorus. There is a lot of froth inside. So we will just suck out whatever froth we can, see the pylorus, keep on pushing with now the big wheel going a little up. And when we see the pylorus in front of you, we'll just ask, uh, see the pylorus. It goes down, and let the duodenal scope pop in. Once we enter the first part of duodenum, what I do is slightly see where the second part is. You don't just pull blindly or do your uh, big wheel right. Once you see that, you can do your big wheel right, and you enter into the second part of duodenum. Just pull the scope, straighten the scope, and you come to the ampulla. One important thing uh, which we want to reiterate is uh, the PEP prophylaxis and this patient has received rectal endomethacin and uh, now uh, there is enough data to show that all the patient irrespective of their risk factor should receive uh, PEP prophylaxis in the form of rectal right. endomethacin. Right. Yeah, I think uh, and especially uh, Mohan, I would uh, see that in young females or female patients are more prone to pancreatitis. Yeah. And uh, in that, invariably, uh, we use rectal endomethacin. Plus, uh, we always see that uh, there is a liberal amount of fluid which yeah. is going on. Though the, uh, the data which is uh, recently come from European trial has not shown effect of ringer lactate, but yet I think uh, 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 hydration you know, there's is no is problem important. in uh, yeah. giving uh, uh, enough uh, ringer lactate to this patient. So we can start. Right. And now we have the ampulla. You can see the ampulla here. It's a small ampulla, not unlike uh, oh, the cases which we saw in the morning. And the scope 
position is unstable it just keeps on falling down so i have to support the scope what i usually do is try to see the bulge of the ampulla so this fold we will just try to see and the most important thing which i feel is looking at the direction where the bile duct is going so here the bile duct intramural part of the bile duct is going in this direction at 12 o'clock so we position the ampulla in the right upper quadrant as already told you in the morning and while cannulating see all the endoscopes have a different uh, <coughs> mechanism and different elevator uh, function so this elevator is a little uh, low on the elevator so what i would do is just keep the papillotome fixed get my big wheel near so that the ampulla comes near adjust the small wheel in the direction where i think the bile duct is going to be hook at 12 o'clock position just lift a little and then rather than pushing don't bend rather than pushing i will just bring the papilla near and then i'll ask him to flex a little just a little flexion hold the scope just adjust Pankaj, uh, do you have any preference for the wire this time? I am oh. using a Teruma wire. Okay, so I always angle prefer a Teruma a wire. Angle tip. Angle tip. A J tip Teruma wire, that is my preference in yeah. majority of the cases. Can we get the fluor image, please? Yeah. See, now, what is happening is just because the scope is slipping <laughs> out. <laughs> now we are in some duct. We will have to wait. Let us see the fluoro, please. Yeah, now you can see this is very important. Yeah. I never inject. When this wire in the left lateral position, when it crosses the scope and it goes across, then it is in the bile duct. That is what majority of the times it happens. And if it goes towards the spine, then probably you are in the pancreatic duct. Plus one more thing. Can you remove the mask or do you want to keep that mask? No, it's okay. <laughs> Not a problem. Okay. Yeah, okay. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Okay. So now we'll just <laughs> unbend, pull the wire. You have to go slow. Yeah. You are going too fast for the audience. Okay, okay, okay. Because so, they want to learn your final trick. Right, okay. <laughs> sure. So, yeah, so now what? Once you are sure that you are in the bile duct, I will gradually uh, ask my assistant to uh, give a little traction on the wire and we go right up with my papillotome. Now you can see the tip of the papillotome. So you said you ask the assistant to track. Give a traction on the wire. So, so I push. Synchrony. This is a synchronism. Okay. Yeah. So right. Now once we are right up in the duct, then we will ask uh, to do a cholangiogram. So now can you so inject? Please tell small tricks because the audience wants to know smaller yeah, tricks. Sure. Each small trick that you do. Okay. Okay. Go slow. Yeah. Yeah. So now can we have the fluoro please? Yeah, now you are yeah. injecting and I start injecting from the proximal end and gradually I will be pulling so my papillotome down. Do you keep the wire there? Yeah, we will keep the wire. So he will just intermittently push the wire inside. Yeah, sometimes the, the wire can slip you coming out. Down, you, yeah, yeah. you may come out. Inject. Fluoro. So wait a minute. What you are saying is that when you are pulling back, yeah. the assistant is pushing the guide wire in. In. Yes. Okay. That's right. But do you want to see the duct? Which duct it is? Right anterior posterior? Can for you point out? Moin, can you yeah. help? So, yeah. uh, so for that we have to take the proper position. Uh, so if you want me to turn to supine, then we will be able to tell properly. You can, you can turn can. into supine. 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 So whenever if you want to have a hilar structure, always do in supine. But once you are doing supine, Pankaj will move on to the onto his right so that he yeah. can keep his scope intact. Now you can see his screen. Now you can see all the ducts over there. So, uh, uh, this which one is anterior, which one is posterior duct and all this? So, if you can see his, his wire is on the left hepatic duct. Okay. And there are two ducts which are coming on to the right side. Uh, so this is a you yeah, want to invert? Inverted. Yeah, I think you invert. Take the spine invert. on the right. Make it right and left. Make it right and left. Okay. Spine has to be no. on the right. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, right. Now, now it's good. Now we can see there are two ducts on the right side. Uh, how can we point out? This is right posterior. 
This is the right see my finger. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And uh, above one is the right anterior, and the wire is in the left. So this is right posterior. This is right posterior. So right posterior is more inferior. Inferior. Yes. Right. So right posterior. Right. 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 right, right, right anterior. anterior and and this is segment left, two. Left. Uh, no. No. This is total left. left total left. Yeah. Total. Two, left. Yeah. Total left. This will this be segment two. two. This two, will be three. three. Yeah. So this is right posterior. Yeah. This will be again dividing into two. segment uh, five. Five and uh, no, eight. No, eight. Five and eight. So this will be yeah, six, six and, and seven. 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 Yeah. yeah. Okay. So can we write on this? Is it written? No. Okay. So we would have preferred to write on the screen how do segmental ducts are seen. So this is it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Carry on then. So now uh, we push the wire in. So I will ask my assistant to push the wire inside, and I'll slowly pull my papillotum out till I see. One third of the wire. This is a clever cut papillotum, as you can, as has been used in the uh, previous case. And now you see, this is a very small ampulla, and the stone, uh, as you see uh, on the uh, cholangiogram, is I think a little big. So we'll have to see whether it will come out without any, uh, only with a swintotomy. Again, I will align my papillotum and holding the scope as Dr. Malai showed you. From and inside, and one has to <coughs> observe Pankaj's position. He is torquing the scope onto the right, and his wrist is totally uh, twisted on the right, right to keep the position. When, when the patient is supine, <coughs> we have to keep that posture. Yeah. So you so have so to be facing again, back. So yeah. so if <coughs> if you are in the right side, if the patient is in supine, you have to turn your body onto the right so that you don't fall off. Even if you are doing some stenting or say for right. a spy glass, you you tend to. Forget that, and uh, you may slip into D1, D2. So, if your body is on the right and your wrist is twisted, you don't fall. Absolutely, that's true. Uh, and Dr. Mohan, yes. Yeah. Dr. Mohan Piyush here. Yeah, Piyush. Yeah, hi, Piyush. Uh, can you tell the camera person to focus more uh, on Dr. Pankaj's hand? He is not showing it completely. Okay, okay, we'll do that. If yes, we can so make Dr. Pankaj in the center and his hand movements. Yeah, I see. I am facing. To the right, absolutely. And One has to see his yeah. this hand this also, hand. which is torqued. I am torquing like it. This. Yeah, absolutely. And he is torquing like this. So, and the, my wire is facing at 12 o'clock, and this is the direction where I would like to do my uh, swintotomy. So, just tell, please tell before you proceed with the swintotomy what you are going to do, and then show. Yeah. So the first uh, few steps, what I uh, practice is, uh, you don't start with a continuous current. That is what my practice is. Initial few cuts I will make only uh, with cut, and that I can manage even with a endo cut. Is just tapping it single time like this. See that? Only one cut. Only wait, cut. Wait, wait, wait. You made one cut. Yeah, only you small. You didn't continue. Why? No, I, I prefer to use a pure cut because this will come only in a cut. I don't want coagulation when I start my swintotomy. Actually, that is a smart thinking when we are avoiding the pancreatic uh, orifice there. Yeah. And if you have a coagulation more, you may cause, but there, nobody has proven yeah, that. Yeah, that's not... A, but absolutely. if you use pure cut uh, right at the first, then you wait, may wait, avoid... Pankaj, uh, once you made that cut, did you do anything else? Did you flick? Or did you move up, or did you do turn to left? What exactly did you do? No, I am just trying to uh, position. I am see my hand is Flick, flicking. flicking I am flicking to the left, okay. so that my uh, swintotum wire stays at twelve o'clock position. Wait a minute. So what you are saying? You are flicking. Flicking to the left. To the left yes. How much of flick? Yeah, five just degree? yeah, yeah, five, very minimal. Just to so keep my wire in a position. Do you move up also, or only one? Doctor Malay, only only uh, little up, always a little up and to the left. Dr. Malay. Yes. Now we we'll continue. Malay, keep the mic near to your face. We are not able to hear. Okay. It okay. Here. Now it's okay. Yeah, it's perfect. Okay. Now he's using endo cut. Now using endo cut, and we will cut till the. So endo cut is only uh, applicable when you are comp compressing the pedal for long time. Long time. Absolutely. Otherwise, it converts into pure cut. And again, when you are reach the margin, I will use very small bursts of uh, cut. I don't want to have a zipper effect with a continuous cut, which wait sometimes minute, can minute, happen. Wait, wait a minute. What do you mean by a zipper effect? Yeah. So what happens is sometimes when you are pressing on the pedal continuously, what happens is if suddenly the papillotome bends more, you can have a zipper cut, 
which can cut uh, the bile duct beyond the so wall you, you of the duodenum. So you are not bending, he is not bending. He is bending, but it is bending uh, very minimally. Minimal bending. Yeah, and sometimes what happens is with continuous traction and in, in, in inadvertently he may bend a little more. So you can have a, a big cut. In fact, we can ask our technician to reduce the bend as we are approaching yes, to the apex. Absolutely, absolutely. That reduces yeah. the tension and that reduces the zipper. And always, right. always one important thing I don't wait, see wait, some wait, wait, wait. Mohan said something about tension. Right. That so is he what. said reducing the bend, tension, many smaller things. Yeah. This is a very important aspect. Yes. Syncrotomy is a very important aspect. Yes. Mohan, elaborate. Yeah. Please. So uh, especially once you are coming towards the apex. When we need to have more control on the cut, our tension should be re reduced. The, re the tension can be reduced by decreasing the bend. And once the bend, the wire is towards the sheath of the sphincterotome, there is the least tension and you have more control on the cut. But if you have uh, enough space, say for example in the mid of the sphincterotomy, at that time I will keep the sphincterotome stretched to the maximum. True. I okay. want to cut faster and, and yeah. I, I have enough space. Right. And one important thing which I always uh, see is when uh, what happens is I see a lot of people giving too much of traction like this. Pull the scope and your swintotome will uh, give traction on the papilla. What I like to keep is my papillotome relaxed uh, so, so that it does not bend or press too much on the papilla. And a little bend, just a bend a little and then slow small bursts of cut when I am reaching the margin. It has to be very controlled and my right hand which is holding the scope is giving a little torque to the scope, trying to keep it in position. And wait, now once... Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. So, I am getting confused. Let me say I am in a pillow. So, you are sometimes torquing, sometimes bending, sometimes torquing, sometimes bending, sometimes giving cut, sometimes doing continuous cut. So, can you give simple explanation slowly? Initially? Yeah. Initially only cut. Only cut. Yes. Then, then you can do uh, endocut. Torque a little to the left. Keep the wire at 12 o'clock position always. You can with a little bend. With swindle. a little bend, little bend of the swing. Then decrease tone. the bend. When you are reaching the apex, yes. When you are reaching the decrease the bend and then shorter cuts. That's right. A am I right, Mohan? Perfect. Okay. And uh, the end point of the cut would be suddenly you will see now you have started seeing uh, bile which is coming out continuously. Okay. So that is probably the end where the sphincter has opened. So I will not like to cut more, uh, just a little. That okay. That is the last Two margin. You, yeah. So you told a new thing. Appearance of bile freely coming out, though not mentioned, but is a practical tip that your adequate syncrotomy is done. Yes. It is not written. You see in majority of the cases that majority happened. Of. Yes. But yes. there is another practical tip, I believe. You said board is syncrotome coming in and out. Coming out. That we can. Can you do. show? Yeah. Unbend. I'll go with the syncrotome inside. Now bend it. And then, uh, when with the bend syncrotome, we'll just pull it out. And it comes out. There is still a little margin if I want to cut. Okay. Will you that tailor same. made your sphincterotomy according to size, size of, the, of stone? the stone? Yes, definitely. I think it should be size of the stone and lower, lower bile, bile duct. Lo lower bile duct anatomy. True. Wait, wait, what do you mean by, what do you think of this lower bile duct? I mean no. one, one has to see the Zoro. tapering of the lower bile duct. If you see the tapering of the lower bile duct, one has to take the ratio. Ratio Zoro. of Zoro. upper bile duct and lower bile duct. If upper bile duct and lower bile duct ratio is 1, that means the, the duct is cylindrical and you have you can do a liberal uh, sphincterotomy as well as balloon sphincteroplasty. But if the ratio of upper bile duct is more than the lower bile duct, then your sphincterotomy should be less uh, uh, and your balloon sphincteroplasty may not work to remove the stone and you may require additional treatments in the form of lithotripsy to True. crush the stone to bring it Agreed. out. Okay. So, these are smaller tips uh, of the execution of the syncrotomy. Now, suppose, uh, Pankaj, yeah. suppose, wait, 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 wait one minute. Hmm. Suppose you are not able to get a good access hmm. in a short loop. Right. Would you go into a long loop yeah, and yeah, get you a can, go can you into show, a, you can can you show go how to go? Yeah, you can just push, the papilla will move around 
and you can either go into a long loop, you can do in a semi long loop. So please show how will you go into a semi long loop? Where would you have cut and how would you have cut if you are making a semi long loop? So this is a semi long loop. Follow, you can see on the floor. See that? This is straight. So your scope is now how many centimeters inside? Yeah, this is at 50. This is straight. This is straight. So now once you go in, this is semi long and then you can do completely like this. This is a long loop, you can see. It comes like this somewhat when but you see on the But this is not floor. a good now. No, good. this is not a good this position is, this for this case. Yeah, this straight position is better in this case. Okay. So it depends on the anatomy and case anatomy. to case basis. Yes. So if you are unable to get a good position, you will go into a. You can change. Yes, position. you always push. Action. Push, push. No, no. You wire, wire. Exchange, exchange on this only. Yeah, yeah. So again, Pankaj is wants to do exchange on a short wire exchange. And uh, he is confident of our assistant. Generally, not many people so would have you been. You can see that now he is injecting the saline. Wait, wait, come here, come here. Yeah. Wait, wait. Anyway, this strain has been done. This is much faster. Uh, this is much faster. But that elevator has to be very strong to yeah, fix the wire. Yes. Otherwise, you will come out. That's true. So, uh, now always uh, we will try with a balloon first. Uh, this uh, I, uh, there appears to be a little discrepancy on the cholangiogram uh, as to the distal bile duct and uh, the size of the stone. So okay. I expect a little difficulty in retrieving, but we'll see. Whenever you use this short wire system, the uh, instruments have to be adequately lubricated. That is very important. You have to flush in with saline. You have to be very careful. Otherwise, you, is the wire out? Yeah, okay. And you have to always ask because sometimes what happens is with the pushing of the instrument, the wire will go inside in a short okay. wire system. So, so you no, have wait, to wait, wait. What Pankaj just said was that once he was pushing the balloon, he was he just asked my assistant, has the wire come out or not? So because he believed the wire keeps on going, especially if it is a dilated. Yeah, top. if even we short wire. Elevator, yeah, short wire plus sometimes the elevator is not very uh, strong to catch. Very it. strong to catch it. Okay. Either way, movement. It can move in. It yeah, can move out. Both ways. Like both ways. Absolutely. Okay. Floro. So now we have gone up almost to the hilum. The stone was a little down. So now we will inflate the balloon, and the inflation of the balloon would be depending on the size of the bile duct that you see it has not to be too big or too small so now okay uh, slowly now i am pulling the balloon down okay and giving a little traction don't inject wait so do you see there is a cystic duct here yeah yes, there is a small yes. cystic duct which is opening just behind the scope okay and the stone is there so now we have a we have to now differentiate between mirzi and a cbd stone that's right so what my next step would be, I have given traction to the balloon. I will hold the balloon Wait with my minute. finger here. So, we have given traction, yeah. holding with this finger, the balloon with this finger here. Right. So, and so that it doesn't slip out. Okay. Right. And then I am pushing the scope in and giving a right torque. Pushing the scope in and giving a right torque to see if the stone comes out. See, I told you this. Uh, you in majority of the cases, this would come out. Can you reduce the size of the balloon a little? Or we can do a lower CBD anatomy assessment first yeah. by injecting the contrast there. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, it is almost there. So maybe it was the balloon which was not coming out. Too yeah, big? it was too big a balloon probably. And we'll see. And just giving a torque. Still, it's not coming out. So, one of the things, uh, Pankaj, yeah. uh, I learned from Greg, Gregory Heber is, he said you believe no, you are no. doing epigeotomy. Yeah. And you are delivering, delivering a baby. The balloon has come out. So, what you do is just keep the traction applied. Right. And uh, then or it you will can, come after yeah, two yeah, yeah, yeah. But that is just, but it sometimes can take a long time, slow delivery of a stone may occur. Pankaj, Pankaj and Mohan, excellent, Pankaj? excellent yeah. demonstration. Okay. Uh, can you repeat uh, the, the movement again for the yeah, yeah, because uh, the This is the most important part, sir. Can yeah, you yeah. repeat it? But there are two stones, I believe. Wire. Please push the wire. Go on. Go I on. think there are two stones. Huh. No, no, we have to see whether it's a mirizi or not because I feel. It is a mirizi. It is, a, it is just at the. Can we, can we change this uh, position a bit? Screen? 
Just, uh, uh, I'm Dr. Ahmad. Thank you for demonstrating. Uh, can I ask a question, please? Ah, now yeah. it's now it's no, no. Wait. It's a narrow cystic duct. No, I saw two duct. stones lower down. I yeah. believe there are two. two when you make it slightly longer, the scope yeah, position, yeah. scope position long, then we'll be more long. Inject now. <coughs> can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, just I have a Still question, please. Yes, Generally, yes, before, the, uh, as we saw that your papilla, it's a little bit small, and we can see that the stone, it's around 12, 13 millimeter. Yes. So, uh, and we know, we noticed that there is a waste uh, down to the end of the common bile duct. Yes. So generally, we are what we are doing. We are evaluating the stone and we are evaluating the papilla. So your sphincter tummy here, it was around nine millimeter, ten millimeter maximum because the papilla is small. Yes. So generally, I'm asking uh, you are not going with the sphincteroplasty to reduce that waste in order to facilitate the mi migration yeah, have, of the stone. We may have to do. Yes, you are absolutely right. I think we have to do sphincteroplasty to make it. Be a pankaj. Yeah. Large. I have a small request. To mm. me, this looks like a squarish stone. Yes, they are triangular. One is a triangular, other and one, one is so a square. So, this squarish stone are more difficult to uh, push remove. The push the wire. So, I want to split now the risk of ERC. Push. Because push. I don't know to do syntroplasty now. Huh. I want to postpone syntroplasty to second stage. Okay. We will give it one more try, but then we will place a stent now. Okay. And take for stone removal at a second date Whatever. after syntroplasty. Sure. Or Push the uh, do you agree, with Mohan? Okay. No. I mean, so uh, though this is a workshop and all, we want to, but we have we have a habit of splitting Loro. the risk. I call it a split the risk. Huh. Huh, yeah. Seven French <laughs> pigtail. Uh, Pankaj movements again. Pankaj for the balloon. Yeah, okay. Okay. And wait. 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 Uh, deflect. Uh, pull. Pull. I'll just go in. Okay. The patient is awake. Can you just sedate her a little, please? So, inflate the balloon. So, so, so Dr. once Malia the balloon is inflated, Floro, please. So, just another uh, question from the panel. So, can I ask about the morale of bringing the patient to have this done in another day? Why, why not today? Clearing her duct and, or their patient's duct in a single session? Why not today? That is... Sorry Deflect. about that. I, may, I wrote a um, I video, I means my video published Deflect. in DDW, how to predict, prevent and uh, manage pancreatitis in ERCP. So this was one of our um, means observation that you can split the risk of, this, of ERCP if pancreatitis especially, if you split the procedure. So if this stone does not come out say after two or three attempts, it is the same. Uh, as uh, splitting the risk, I will not do sphincteroplasty now. I will try balloon extraction, but basket extraction maybe I will postpone for next time. Okay. I believe you have manipulated the papilla enough. Bringing out a balloon also applies a lot of pressure on the inflated uh, on, on the pancreatic duct. So this is. Chota karo balloon thoda. This is our just policy because. So now, uh, repeating the steps, uh, once you have uh, the balloon inflated, give adequate traction to the balloon, hold the balloon with your little finger against the shaft of the scope here. This time, Pankaj, just slow, very slow. Yeah, yeah, that is what very I mean. Slow either traction. focus, either karo. Continuous, slow traction. Focus, either karo, hat pe. So you are catching the uh, pulled balloon with your finger against the shaft holding the shaft of the scope and what we are doing is pushing the scope inside and giving a right torque you can see this and what you can see is you can see the stone here can you see yes you are seeing so yeah. what the two things you have to dilate this papilla that is for sure because this is a narrow papilla you can see the stone there definitely this stone can come out if you dilate the papilla just cutting the papilla too much sometimes will not help. So again I am trying, just giving a little traction, just giving and you can just keep on torquing the scope. Good, af good afternoon sir, my name is Dr. Prakash. I have no, a question. I think we will have to yeah, please go ahead. the papilla, okay? Uh, okay when please. should we consider okay. cholangioscopy? Let, let us in, uh, answer the question. Dr. Prakash, go on. 
what is the role of cholangioscopy sir in such yes, cases so as yes, as we uh, as you must have seen cgh paper by sham varadrajlu they have clearly demonstrated that if you take the ratio of upper bile duct to lower bile duct and if lower bile duct is too narrow Sintoplast. then we have to do additional treatments Sintoplast. in the form of lithotripsy Sintoplast. either you have to do mechanical Sintoplast. lithotripsy or you have to do, do a laser lithotripsy <laughs> if okay. the patient, if the if this sphincteroplasty also has limitation in this because the, the bile duct is too narrow at lower end i think so so we, what do you want i think so see i think this stones may be need to be broken okay. probably sphincteroplasty also may not have that risky. is what my feeling is yeah. because the duct is very narrow okay. that is why so, so because you your half an hour is up yeah. i would request then ranjit so, no uh, we'll so put in a stent we'll put now. in a stent and so then probably you can come in again and uh, you will need to break the stones we'll either laser or mechanical whatever either laser or mechanical you will need to break them no problem so now show your tricks of stenting also please yeah so after this we have got the last case before dr ditris lectures comes up it's 130 na no? yeah Yeah, uh, excuse me, just to make it clear for everybody here. Yes. So uh, generally, what we are doing no. before doing ERCP, we are aware about the case. So we have the MRCP, we have the size of the stone, we have the size of the common bile duct. So we are aware about the case we are facing. So whether we are prepared to go direct for sphincterotomy and uh, lithotripsy in the same session and extraction of the stone in pieces. whether in one piece with a sphincteroplasty i don't think so that uh, 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 postponing case i don't know i'm talking about my own experience postponing a case in a second day or a second shot that it will reduce the uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, pancreatitis so if you are uh, knowing what you are doing from the beginning uh, yes. i'm not talking about you for time being just to make it clear for everybody so knowing the size of the stone and you are prepared and you know what ex expecting So you are ready to do sphincteroplasty. It's not a matter that the common bile duct is stenosed here mainly. We have the uh, the waste which is uh, preventing the migration of the stone with the balloon. So I don't think so from the beginning that balloon it will be a case here to extract the stone rather than to have a basket and sometimes crusher and then it will be followed by stenting if the patient still having stone in the uh, gallbladder. What's your yeah, comment, please? Uh, I think that is very well said by Dr. Wallace and very very correct observation. and uh, i would like to just add on few things in india uh, we have the luxury of repeating cases so we can do it in two or three steps but wherever the insurance and all is a problem there we have to finish the job uh, on all things so we are working with several practical limitation so theoretically you are absolutely correct and uh, we i will agree with you that we should have been no, more we, prepared we definitely try to finish the cases in at one go but sometimes what happens is the we have a lot of as uh, dr malai says that in india we have a lot of uh, problems that we face that using a lithotripter may cause the patient the patient may not be ready for all those things so many things, things come practical. into uh, practical so, views but uh, absolutely true that uh, we have to be prepared to uh, remove it at one go we are, so yes now, so absolutely correct yeah so, so now so there are some personal a, preferences of yeah. different doctors all the way as many but uh, theoretically what you said is correct and should have been done the only uh, pring i can say uh, injecting contrast is the best way to identify the difference in upper and lower cbd mrcp will mislead i don't believe in mrcp would have given you uh, an idea of that yeah and so actually in this case uh, actually in this case uh, the first cholangiogram that we saw there was a definite uh, taper down taper taper down taper. So, and that is the bile duct which is narrow it's not only the problem so at the papilla so can you shift mohan and yeah. thank you uh, so yeah, much uh, ask some yeah. questions yeah yeah some we more I questions before 5 minutes yeah. before we take mohan yeah. yeah yeah mohan you can start i'll just deflate the stomach before i come out so you saw uh, a new uh, that Thank that you. is a local issues where we have to adapt to the uh, paying uh, issues and other things uh, so what dr malay follow is uh, if he finds crcp bit too difficult then he has to go back and uh, talk to attendants there are many things which are playing here the local factors but as uh, has been pointed out uh, we should have a road map 
with the MRCP and uh, all the accessories available, all the consent should be taken prior uh, and then we can go ahead with the, with the intent of uh, removing the stone in one go rather than uh, yeah, uh, splitting no. the thing. But we respect the uh, Dr. Malay's opinion also, uh, being local factor and patient's factor coming in play here. Hello. Absolutely. Dr. Mohan, Dr. Pankaj Piyush here. Yes, yeah, Piyush. Uh, I just want to ask you, now Dr. Mohan uh, is in AIG, Asian Institute of Gastroenterology, which is the largest center for gastroenterology in India, uh, doing lots and lots of work on large stone. And Dr. Pankaj is from Surat, it's in the western part of India. His center does lots and lots of those complex cases. I want to ask both of you, if you know, or uh, Dr. Imad has told that we need to have a road map and it is completely right. Suppose if you have got a patient where the MRCP shows the stone is 1.5 centimeter in the lower CVD and this is a virgin papilla, no ERCP has been done. I want to ask both of you, would you like to go directly for an ERCP with a spintroplasty, with a cholangioscopy, with a laser in one sitting or how you will approach this patient with a single large stone because the more intervention you do, whether it is a spintrotomy or a spintroplastic cholangioscopy, do you think this will increase the risk of pancreatitis? I just want opinion from two experts, both of you, how you will approach this patient. Will you finish the case in one sitting or you will do two sitting for such patient with a large stone? No, Thank you. I, I completely uh, agree with the comments made that we should complete the procedure in one go. Uh, there we are we have a trade off we we don't know whether we'll be able to prevent pancreatitis but multiple ercp will also subject patient to many other complications like repeated ercp repeated coming to the hospital cholangitis anesthesia issues it's not a, like a patient a pancreatitis is the only cause of uh, complication in a patient of ercp there are many other problems which can be prevented by one single uh, uh, treatment so, any day, we will definitely prefer a one single uh, procedure and we should have a good road map, we should have all lithotriptors available with us. If the, m m what I see is, I see the bile duct anatomy. If the bile duct anatomy is cylindrical when there is a lower uh, anatomy is quite big, I go straight away with the balloon sphincteroplasty, majority of the stones can be removed. But if the lower bile duct anatomy is distorted, say for example pulled up papilla or a completely tapered small uh, uh, papilla, then balloon sphincteroplasty may also pose a problem and then we definitely have to break this stone into the pieces which can be done either by mechanical lithotripsy or a laser lithotripsy. But we should aim at one uh, session to prevent the patient to come to hospital again and again. It is not only the ERCP, but pancreatitis, but also other factors which are responsible. Okay. Yeah. So, just last comment. I agree with uh, Mohan that the distal bile duct is the most important and deciding factor plus uh, the size and the shape of the stone. Square stones are like the ones which we had are always difficult. So, in that you have to take a call. Swintoplasty alone, absolutely true, but when you have a distal CBD narrowing, you have may have to uh, do a repeat procedure after a couple few days, depending on uh, the patient's uh, condition. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. And see you all. Bye bye. So we, will we are we running 10 minutes late. We will try to finish off this ERCP in 20 minutes. And uh, if we will try and show the basics, the stone extraction part has been removed, cannulation. So at one o'clock we will uh, get ready with the lecture of Dr. Dietrich. So at 1 o'clock we will disconnect. So Dr. Vadwa, you have got 20 minutes hmm. to show all to the audience of your important uh, skills that you have. And uh, if you don't mi mind removing your mask, we are comfortable with it. But if you mind, then it's okay. So you look, yeah, he's a handsome man with great moustaches. And uh, so there's Dr. Vikram also, uh, even more handsome than Dr. Vadwa. <laughs> So, but he doesn't want <laughs> So, we have a, uh, coming to the case by Dr. Rajkumar Ruhatwa sir and also Vikram Bhatia sir, we have a 71 year old uh, old man presented with obstructive jaundice from 5 days with uh, right upper quadrant pain. On ultrasound, we have found the mild uh, uh, IHBRD is there and CBD is dilated okay. to the tune of 17 mm. 
with a calculus measuring 12 mm. LFT is demonstrating obstructive pattern of jaundice. We are planning ERCP and stone extraction. Over uh, to Rajkumar Vatva, sir. Hi, good afternoon. Um, we will be doing an ERCP in a patient with obstructive jaundice. Um, this is a 71 year old with no major comorbidities, but has found to have an obstructive jaundice, mild hyperbilirubinemia and a CBD stone of 1.2 centimeters on ultrasound. We don't have any further information. Uh, we will be taking him up for the, the further information. I'm using a Fujifilm 580 scope um, uh, and, and we will try to see. Um, I will, just now all the basic steps have been discussed, so we will try to go to the papilla. Can I have some jelly? Mm. Jelly, jelly. On it? Uh, so, we are not seeing the endoscopic image. Suction, please. Can I have some suction here? Mm -hmm. um, we we are finding in the stomach there is uh, a lot uh, of fluid uh, I'm here. I am giving you suction. Um, it will be risky for us to just proceed for proceed into the duodenum with so this kind of fluid in so the stomach. Just wait for suction. Suction though? Sorry about that, we, but the patient should not have taken breakfast. I think we will remove the uh, suction. And uh, we'll remove and we'll keep some other care. So keep some other I, I think this will be a sensible thing because removing the entire food material will be risky for this patient. Risk of aspiration improves dramatically if we carry on to do the, the procedure in these situations. And uh, please remember that uh, when you are doing ERCP, you are working in the duodenum. You are not observing the, the stomach and the residue is upstream of you and patient is semi prone which is a slightly better position but the very fact that you are working beyond the residue and you are pushing and creating loops in the stomach at times intermittently patient may aspirate and you will never know and and, and since the endoscope is there both upper and the lower esophageal sphincters are open and that that with this kind of fluid residue it is bound to come up into the esophagus Break and risk the, of aspiration is, food that is much it's higher. ready now is it it's ready now once it is ready, after this you can tell them that uh, those who wants to take uh, some snacks or something, it is available right now. So you can just we don't check know there is a break. Transmission is happening. I think this is a very uh, important can, point for uh, everybody that you should right. know when to stop and see hour, what is safe for the patient. The you know? If the patient is there, you have scope doesn't mean you should go ahead and do the ERCP. I think this is very, very important. So, so, so again, you have to keep the indication in mind if the patient has hypotension and fulminant cholangitis, then it is better to convert to expedious intubation but then for all yeah. other elective and semi-elective it is safer to postpone no no we will just do it a little bit later uh, postpone so post uh, no, so mean cancel. time so we have got 20 minutes so we will utilize these 20 minutes uh, to uh, show a case uh, dr vikram bhatia uh, you linear us or radial us for a, a twin fistula for a what? Rect uh, perianal fistula. Perianal fistula. So, uh, if it's a rectal the case, then radial uh, would be better. So, we have sh asking for radial US probe to be shifted, but in the meantime, uh, we'll use couple of minutes before we are getting the, because in this machine, unfortunately, we do not have, uh, we, we have a radial scope, yes, sir. Pentex. Or we can do a linear in the mediastinum and then a radial. No. We have 20 okay, minutes, enough, so we don't want to sedate a case. This okay. case patient is unsedated, so we can do a rectal US okay. uh, in him. If, if we'll see, because we have prepared him ustaraf set head and that side. Right. So in this case, Sir. we want to show uh, the re no, no no he will yeah, you do it after two o'clock. No, no, I'm doing. You can come with me. <laughs> no, I'm coming. I'm uh -huh, coming. Uh -huh, okay. Uh -huh. So we will do. So I will do the linear US in this case. You do the radial US. Five five minutes. Five minutes. The machine will be here. Okay. I will do the linear US. Can can you? So I can sh also show the linear uh, rectal with you, but then we'll uh, discuss together. So. Am I audible there? Yeah. So normally a radial is the standard way to image the, the rectum, the lower sigmoid and the anal sphincters. But uh, linear US has its own advantage. So uh, particularly if you want to evaluate the prostate, the uh, ejaculatory ducts, the zones of the prostate which we, we may be able to show you. 
uh, and sometimes even the fistula track then a linear may be uh, also have its own utility and obviously any therapeutic any puncture you need a linear we all know that Uh, Do Dr. Vikram Yogesh here, do you yes. use balloon for your radial? Do you use yes, uh, balloon do. for we all do. the... We do, so uh, re uh, rectal ampulla is pretty capacious, so and the radial US have a uh, scopes have a channel of at best 2.2 millimeters, they are not very good at suctioning, so collapsing the rectal lumen is very difficult with the radial US scope. So we suction and we inflate the balloon for a extra mural evaluation of the uh, 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 transrectal US. We also put water. So for acoustic coupling in the rectum, we do all three things. We reduce the lumen, but as I have said, the channel diameter of the radial US is only 2.2 millimeters, so it often is insufficient. We put water, but then if you put a lot of water, you mobilize the stool from the proximal colon and suddenly you find all the stool has come down and it is counterproductive. So at any one time 150 to 200 ml water no more than that possibly even less and then the third is the third is the balloon. So basically you don't want you want least amount of air in the rectum and you want acoustic coupling with the wall so that you can image circumferentially around the rectum. Uh, Vikram, what, el what about the preparation? Do you give enema or do you give a proper preparation to these patients? So, uh, the protocols will vary. For me, a enema or even unprepared is okay for anal sphincters. For anything proximal, a full colonic preparation including a split dose, 4 liter split dose pack as is my protocol for a, uh, a, co a colonoscopy. Because again, US scopes uh, uh, should not be exposed to stool, very difficult to clear stool with them. Uh, a sigmoidoscopy almost always precedes or a colonoscopy almost always precedes a rectal US and we want to have a, a holistic complete examination. So, full bowel preparation for anything above the anus. So, this is linear? Linear. You okay. comfortable with linear? Aap karo, I will show I am comfortable. That's okay. okay. You start. I, ca I can show on the monitor also help you. No, 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 you take over. Because no, I will one just it's okay. Whoa. You have to. Yeah. Connect it. Jelly. Because the machine ka setting me will come there. No, 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 I will come there. No, it's okay. So I have more just difficulty with start. the settings here. I will just learn the settings. I was just wish to say that we had already prepared this patient already. And we are just going to show you the finding. I'll just few things to I would like to say before because this is the scope I am holding like this and this way I am seeing anterior and this way I am seeing posterior. So anteriorly we have more guidance but I will give it over to just to Victim Bhatia. No, we will we'll do it together Dr. Male. So we can discuss this thing is still undefined. In a linear, uh, linear US anterior for me is the prostate and the pelvic organs and posterior for me is the sacrum. So the US processor Hitachi Ariata 570 is coming on. Hitachi, Hitachi person, where is the Hitachi people? Some problem? So, unlike the mediastinum, the imaging is or the right and left orientation with the linear probe in the rectum is pretty uh, different no. and difficult. Dr. Malay will show No, no, I will. I will no, I, 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 no, no, seeing, I, I'm, I'm no, no I, I am better at this. Huh? Please take it. What? Please take the probe. No, I am. So, it's okay. okay. It's okay. Okay. Uh -huh. I'll take up the radial. It's okay. Okay. So, I'll, I'll use the pointer. Where is the pointer? I know this better. You now handle the scope, please. Okay. 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 Can I have a gauze, please? Can just gauze, somebody gauze, give me please. a gauze? So, Doctor uh, uh, Malay, can I have the endoscopic image first so I know where I am? Endoscopy image. Endoscopic image, lights on. Yes. Okay. So, so, so. So we are just at the anorectum. So. And you can see this is the so I am prostate and this is the bladder. So I have gone inside and now, Doctor Malay, can you show the bladder, please? This is the bladder and. This shows that the probe is facing anteriorly. Good. 
can you show the seminal vesicles which are which i also these see these are the seminal vesicle these are the seminal vesicles and then we see the prostate and then i'll just rotate over the prostate what you also see is the uh, is the prostatic venous plexus if you can place a doppler below uh uh uh, uh here yes yes we will apply e flow e maybe flow. we will able to pick up the sometimes we don't pick up the flow we can apply e flow and maybe we can pick up but we are not picking so up. i'll I, i'll tell you the utility of uh, doppler on the prostate so we dr now malay dr vikram yes please uh, can can we have the con uh, complete screen with the eos image if you are okay with it because you know we want yeah. to see the complete we EOS are not image. interested in endoscopic image full us yeah. image so no full us image full us ah fair okay. enough what you we'll are what you are seeing us is our faces you should see the us images please. okay we'll do that yeah, we want us image completely ah. on the okay. screen okay okay done yeah okay. that's okay. great okay so so let's go back this is the bladder the seminal vesicles linear uh, so now the next step is to uh, this urethra. is the uh, good starting orientation your probe is facing anteriorly and this is the urethra and so let me just rotate it once yeah. from one end this one to the other other end. other end yes so this is one seminal vesicle that is another yes uh, so so can you show the urethra now please now this is the urethra here and if you see what is around the urethra you see a whitish whitish uh, eco texture more hyper echoic eco texture okay, where, where dr male is this is the central zone of the prostate This, this uh, so this is the central zone cent Let central zones what we call cz so and i will i will freeze it and then i will outline it okay what you are saying is that this is the central zone yes and this also includes the transitional zone where the periurethral glands are but on us we cannot distinguish between the two mm. so what is hyperechoic and isoechoic continuing down till mainly the verum montanum is the central zone and so this is the central zone yes hyperechoic central zone so now. so 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 can you if you can hold this for a second just somebody who come on the other side hold the scope hold the scope because we need some assistant to hold the scope because i i my my hands are not that long so what you see is the internal urethral sphincter which is hypoechoic you see the urine flowing inside the urethra where dr male is yes, this the, is yes the hypoechoic area around it is the sorry if i can this is the internal urethral sphincter this hyperechoic area is the uh, the the central zone this which is further down the field field is the anterior side of the prostate on the linear us so this part is the anterior fibromuscular zone we are not much interested in that nothing happens in the prostate in this area we are mainly interested in the central zone or the transitional zone this is where the benign prostatic hyperplasia will happen so this zonal anatomy of the prostate will change with the age of the patient so in a young male the central zone is well seen this is called the peripheral zone which is closer to the transducer since you are imaging from behind and uh, if if you image it in the radial way you get donuts but if you image it with a linear you get a, a, a rim of hypoechoic tissue uh, behind so the reference eco texture for the prostate is this and anything hyper or hypo is, uh, uh, is is detailed with reference to the peripheral zone so the peripheral zone and then the central zone is hyperechoic in relationship to the peripheral zone therefore we call it hyperechoic this is the seminal vesicles and if i rotate a bit you can i don't know make out the ejaculatory ducts here this is the ejaculatory duct can you see this very thin line going and this there is the hyperechoic central zone around the ejaculatory ducts so please note that the the prostatic urethra is entering here this is the seminal vesicle and the ductus deferens and seminal vesicles combine to form the ejaculatory duct this is the ejaculatory duct coming like this and what is between is called the sign of mount everest and these two ducts then join that is the prostatic urethra and the ejaculatory ducts join somewhere here in the middle and this is called the verum montanum and many cysts and other pathologies happen here which i don't have time to tell you 
and then the prostate goes the urethra goes down dr malik can you take the 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 the, the, the uh, arrow please yeah i will take let us trace uh, so let us look at the bladder neck first again you see the central depression this is where the urethra is entering from the bladder and then sometimes you the median lobe of the so called median lobe of the prostate will bulge into the bladder you should not mistake it for a tumor if i rotate on the either sides you can actually see the ureters entering and sometimes if i rotate 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 these are seminal vesicles all and here you sometimes see the ureters entering where the arrow is and if you can't see it sometimes you can apply color doppler here and you see what are called ureteric jets you will have to get the window of the doppler less window smaller yes on the angle here and with doppler on so it is not always demonstrable but the outline of the the or the, the openings of the ureter uh, can if you can place the color doppler here please ah so let us wait so intermittently you will sometimes see the ureteric jets coming here so you will see the color doppler flow whoosh like this that's called a ureteric jet and you can pick up uh, the 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 stones here at the vesico uh, ureteric junctions also so these are the far side of the seminal vesicles we take it inside this is the central part and we are back on the prostate what is below the prostate dr male Yes. that is the muscle that, that is, is the, the pu this puborectalis that is this the, you, this is the muscle yes muscle muscle so we can see the fibers of the muscle we can see the fibers of the muscle and if you can make the image a bit a bit smaller please and then you see the hyperechoic interface of the pubis pubic symphysis pubic this. symphysis here this is the this is the pubis so that's anterior and i think that that muscle which you are showing me is the puborectalis hmm. converging like a like a cone 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 at the base of the prostate this is the base of the prostate yes and and if you can enlarge it again we see very nice something can you freeze now so can you freeze now please freeze please and the cursor cursor please i'm sorry so this part you can see is the peripheral zone this part is the central zone this is the urethra so uh in this uh, this is a healthy male so you see the zonal anatomy now we trace the urethra further we trace the urethra further and here you see the urethra going down out of the prostatic base can you see this please yes so this is the bulbar urethra which is coming up below the prostate this is the bulb yes and then you have here the perineal membrane and also the bulbospongiosus and the cowper's glands if they get diseased so going down which is in anteriorly is the penile part the bulbar urethra which goes into the its penile segment this is the bulb and this is the urethra going down yep like so this. we are in the midline now now if i rotate further you see the puborectalis which sort of like a cone holds the prostate up in a linear this thing okay so next very interesting thing that you see in this field dr malik can you please increase it uh, increase the size of the image is you see the beginning of the internal anal sphincter so you know that the inner circular and outer longitudinal muscles of the layer continue down the so you see the beginning of the beginning of the internal the inner circular continuing as the internal anal sphincter which is hypoechoic this one i'll just take you up and this transition is very well seen on linear us can you see this transition you can see dr male has described the division of the muscularis propria of rectum into by a hyperechoic band going inside in the rectum above so you see if you can freeze here please if you can freeze here the arrow i'm sorry so this is the inner circular outer longitudinal inner hyperechoic plane and the inner circular muscle goes and expands into the internal anal sphincter in a longitudinal way so you suddenly see it expanding up like this 
that is the another way which is not described in the books of how you pick up the anorectal junction on a linear US. So, you all know the puborectalis as the demarcation. So, you see what you say that this is yes. the junction anorectal. So, the internal anal sphincter is beginning here. Beginning here. So, okay. logically to me that is another yeah. way to look where it begins. So, this is the internal sphincter and then the outer longitudinal layer again I am sorry can you freeze. So, you see the outer longitudinal outer longitudinal air going so nicely here. So, you see the inner circular forming the internal anal sphincter which is hypoechoic, the outer longitudinal going here as the conjoint longitudinal ligament and the puborectalis coming here which we will show you continues into the external sphincter. So, that is the linear orientation of the sphincters here. So, can we request 5 minute postponement of the lecture of Dr. Dietrich, just 5 minute because we will take 5 more minute, this is going on well and we will be able to show only on linear US what we want to show. Ha, so, we, we are in the anal canal, so there is not much to uh, yeah, yeah. do below it. So, so, one technical issue when you are doing, when you are doing the linear US, I will need a gauze please, I had asked for a gauze. So, you need to have a gauze in your hand, that is very important. And, and normally the EUS scope is held a little bit far, if the, if the, if the, hold on, if the uh, uh, person can focus my hands, because the transducer of a linear US or a radial US is 1.5 to 2 centimeter from the optics. Once I have this image, the optics are now actually outside of the patient's anus. So, the way to hold the US probe I have learnt is, is flush with the patient's anus, otherwise the patient pulls it out, pushes it out. So, this is not a rigid rectal probe. So, now if you see my thumb and my hands are flush with the, with the level of the patient's anus and only then I can do a linear US imaging of the or a radial US imaging of the anal canal and once my hand is stable, you see the anatomy again, the inner circular going as the internal sphincter very nicely the outer longitudinal continuing as the conjoint longitudinal ligament where Dr. Malay is pointing now. And it becomes hyperechoic, hyper it spreads into several parts ah. and becomes yes. alternating rings of black and white yes. and merges with the puborectalis muscle here and to form external sphincter. And here is the puborectalis and as I, so rotation here is very difficult now. You see certain muscles outside those, uh, so, so area outside that is the, uh, the ischio anal fossa around outside and if you see, can you decrease the contrast Dr. Malay, contrast. Huh. So, now as we come down, we will show you the internal sphincter. The abscess is posteriorly Vikram on okay. MRI. Okay, fair enough. So, 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 we will just rotate this is, now this is where the problem starts. So, here we are in the posterior part, again the same thing, you see the internal sphincter you see the uh, intersphincteric plane and you see the external sphincter which is hyperechoic which is not very well defined here, but you see it better when the internal sphincter will is going to end. So, I am rotating very carefully Dr. Malay with the technique we described. So, so, so here is you see some abscess here where your arrow is above, 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 above. Yeah, I think here. No, above, above uh, I am sorry here. Uh, A, here close to your more this yes so this is the area of the intersphincteric plane so normally you find abscesses between the internal sphincter and the external sphincter and you see them as hyperechoic extensions possibly you can see it here so this is a clean muscle and now just watch the intersphincteric plane in the intersphincteric plane i'll rotate and this is where it expands no the intersphincteric plane a this is yes, the interesting. Yes, 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 yes. And I'll, I'll, I'll rotate back. Normal intersphincteric plane. And mm, this is the and expanded intersphincteric plane. Long abscess. This is expansion. Expansion. So okay. you see it here, expansion. And I'll rotate. Normal. This is normal intersphincteric. Normal intersphincteric and a content expanded. inside. So, so here is the abscess. It's a intersphincteric abscess which is tracking. Here you can see it very well. Yeah, somebody can hold this. So, 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 
this this area have have a look on this area this is the internal sphincter this is somewhere the external sphincter this is the intrasphincteric plane and to convince you i'll rotate back to normal this is normal okay this, this is, is normal this is normal and i am at the same plane and i am rotating and you see the intrasphincteric area see this area sort of planes expand and there are some air echoes also inside dr mal this is this is the air echoes air echoes also so this is where it expands so these are not very what what should i say magnificent in of sorts not very big or glamorous they are just long extensions in the intrasphincteric area uh, small small collections uh, nothing fancy here but you see the air echo there this this is there you see the air echo you see that the margins of the muscles have all become fuzzy and again i'll rotate over uh, rotate it clear clear margin crisp margins i am at the same plane i am rotating and everything is gone fuzzy and there are air air bubbles inside and let me rotate further 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 everything is clean again clean again so last thing let me show you so let me just what is also very uh, interesting and a beautiful in a way to say see is the end of the internal sphincter so you know that the external sphincter the superficial part of the external subcutaneous part of external sphincter extends around 1 cm below the internal sphincter which means the internal sphincter ends and then the external sphincter sort of continues down and hugs it so let me show i showed you the beginning of internal sphincter now let me sh show you the end of external uh, the internal sphincter dr male here it rounds off yes so that's where the internal sphincter end but the external hold this external sphincter is continuing like this uh, below the internal sphincter so and so here you see the alternating multi layered ring many rings yes so this is the intrasphincteric plane white black white black white black this is the intrasphincteric plane linear us offers you very good view of the intrasphincteric planes if you understand the anatomy and you must remember the direction of rotation which is right which is left so since we are going from below and my probe is facing anteriorly if i have to look at the right i rotate to the left if i am looking posteriorly if i rotate to the right i go to the right uh maybe on a paper i can explain it better it is totally different from the mediastinum so the right left orientation is also slightly different here with the linear probe and then you see the end of the external sphincter and what is white white remaining here where the arrow is is the external sphincter this the subcutaneous part so uh, we are we i think we finish here we apologize yep. for a 8 minute delay but i think this was worth it worth for for everyone for the dr dietrich lecture now please and i apologize again to dr dietrich uh, because he is there online yes, i i am sorry to dr dietrich too he, he, uh, he is my idol of sorts sorry so, dr dietrich please <laughs> Thank you very much for the nice demonstration. Yeah, good morning ladies and gentlemen, uh dear Malay, uh, dear colleagues. Uh I'm very proud and happy to be part of this excellent uh, meeting exciting explanations and images thank you so much my topic today is about contrast enhanced endoscopic ultrasound low mechanical endoscopic ultrasound when where how a little bit of history a little bit of technical aspects and going through the phases of contrast enhanced ultrasound and we will go from the head to the toe no better from the esophagus to the anus for applications so it has been first described in 2002 2003 and we published the first images um two years later here you can see the celiac trunk and the liver parenchyma enhancing using endoscopic ultrasound more advanced the technology really gave us real time imaging 
of very small structures showing enhancing and non-enhancing structures. First of all, we have that contrast agent, for example, some of you, and we do not need an extension line. And also from my point of view, any sort of extension, uh, so three stop clock devices might not be as useful as it could be considered. First of all, there is one mistake you might do. Always put the cell line uh, to uh, the connector and don't do it vice versa. So it should be done first with a syringe above the connector and then to the gas. If you do it otherwise, the gas will go away. The setting is, <clears throat> this is shown in the transcutaneous approach uh, that uh, the nurse is uh, to the opposite side of the examiner, as you can see here. Tips to do it right. No extension line, large cannula, always the cell line above the filter and the contrast agent directly into a large vein to have reproducible injection and contrast faces, as we can see here. Tips to avoid is all people on the same side having the cannula distally, which gives not reproducible uh, contrast faces, and to have an extension line, and uh, it's a mess. So, better, contralateral, as large as possible, cubital would be better more centrally than distally in the hand. Extension line is at least useless and the three-way stopcock, I don't use it. This is almost the biggest mistake. You put the contrast agent above the filter in a very small cannula, distally in the hand. Don't do it. Have a look to the faces, right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. Now the contrast arrives in the right ventricle, now in the left ventricle. Here's a septum, and we can nicely depict that in the systemic circulation, the contrast arrives. Pulmonary artery first, before the systemic circulation. Here you can see the pulmonary artery into the lung and later the lung has enhanced now the aorta and the systemic circulation follows later so we have an imagination of the contrast phases into the body don't use a two less acoustic power and don't use too much of energy. In the near field, we can often observe bubble destruction. Put the mechanical index, the acoustic power, as low as possible. This is called the circle of disaster. You might not have a good image. You increase the dosage. You will get shadowing. You might not see the distal part of the image. You increase the mechanical index even more and you get bubble destruction in the near field. The circle of disaster. Some of you is 
strict intravascular. Here we can see a pseudocyst, a pancreatic pseudocyst. No, it's an active bleeding into that pseudocyst. And you don't see any sort of individual bubble beyond the lumen. This was treated, embolization, and I showed the radiologist there's still lumen, and afterwards embolization was successful. No enhancement at all. On the way of the echo endoscope to the pancreas, for example, there are also eventually thrombi into the cardiac cavity. And we might be interested if that lesion is an appositional thrombus or if that lesion is a neoplasia. Injecting some of you and having the right setting of white band harmonic imaging, we delineate the thrombus, wait a few seconds, and we see bubbles inside. So we can be sure that this is neoplasia, a myxoma, and not an appositional thrombus. CEOS allows the differentiation of appositional thrombus and neoplasia. Two more examples of that use in cardiac cavity. Now, having a lung pneumonia, which is called hepatization of the lung parenchyma, we are interested if that lesion is abscess or neoplasia. And we can be sure after contrast enhanced ultrasound that this is small abscess. Real-time imaging. Pulmonary embolism is commonly thought to be a computer tomography finding, but also using ultrasound, we can delineate those thrombi. And here you can see the uh, lung parenchyma and using contrast enhanced ultrasound, we can delineate those peripherally non-enhancing subpleural consolidations proving lung embolism. And the source by transcutaneous ultrasound can be easily displayed. Here you can see the thrombus as the possible source of pulmonary embolism. Now um, let's talk about gastrointestinal stroma tumors. It's an eye-catching feature that those lesions, uh, we recorded the examination during Julio Iglesias' uh, very nice meeting in Santiago de Compostela. We had that lesion, we see the muscle proper layer, and we injected a son of you. And we know that GIST is hypervascular and therefore hyperenhancing. So um, we see um, now the first bubbles arriving and we see individual well vessels. And then we put all images above each other and we see that hypervascular structure with straight vessels as in gastrointestinal stroma tumor, a benign one, according to age, morbidity of the patient and symptoms, it should be operated. Lyomyosarcoma are typically hypovascular and therefore hypoenhancing, and it's an eye-catching feature to differentiate GIST and lyomyoma and lyomyosarcoma. GIST is a serious eye-catcher. And if you have spontaneous necrosis in a GIST, it's a typical sign of malignant transformation. And contrast-enhanced 
Ultrasound, endoscopic ultrasound is the only modality to show us those spontaneous early necrosis as a sign of malignant transformation. Another case in the esophagus with spontaneous non-enhancing areas. Elastography also gives us additional information. The softer the lesion, the less probability malignant transformation has occurred. The pancreas. The pancreas is highly vascularized and ductal adenocarcinoma is much less vascularized, which has been examined by vessel density and vessel diameter in comparison to the normal pancreas, let's say one third, one fourth of vessel density. And we recently published a study on small pancreatic tumors using endoscopic ultrasound as incidental findings in asymptomatic patients to determine etiology. And those have been 146 early ductal adenocarcinoma of the pancreas, a little more new endocrine tumors, a few metastases, and other various etiology. And CEUS was performed in 219 of those patients, and CEUS allowed differential diagnosis in 86% of those 219 patients. To be aware, very small pancreatic adenocarcinoma of less than 15 millimeters or even less than 10 millimeters have a much better prognosis than the larger ones. And we have to be aware that 60% of those very small pancreatic solid lesions are non-ductal adenocarcinoma. They do not require radical surgery. And we have to be aware of pre-operative diagnosis to have the best strategy. A lesion of six millimeters, six millimeters you can see here, and we perform a conscious enhanced ultrasound, endoscopic ultrasound, and we see that this lesion is slightly hypo-enhancing in comparison to the surrounding pancreatic parenchyma as shown here, a six millimeter lesion. And it was ductal adenocarcinoma and surgery performed in a radical technique. New endocrine tumors are hypervascular and hyper-enhancing. We have uh, some sort of six or seven millimeter lesion and you see the hyper-enhancing structure. And according to the proliferation index and the age of the patient comorbidity, those lesions do not necessarily to be operated. They might be watched over years. Always optimize B mode and always optimize contrasans, ultrasound images of new endocrine tumors. Here you can see non-enhancing areas. What are the signs of malignancy in new endocrine tumors? Those are spontaneous necrosis and those are flow profiles with a low diastolic flow and high resistive index. And the contrasans ultrasound shows those early necrosis as a sign of malignancy, similar to this as shown previously. Hyper-enhancing solid lesions are neuroendocrine tumors, solid serous microcystic pancreatic neoplasia, teratoma, accessory spleen, those intrapancreatic and metastasis of renal cell carcinoma. As you can see here, in such hyper-enhancing lesion, seven millimeters, hyper-enhancing over minutes. Renal cell carcinoma, metachronic, 15 years after surgery of the kidney, you find those small lesions, hyper-enhancing 
which has been shown renal cell carcinoma metastasis, and sometimes they may might be one, two, three, even multilocular. Rare lesions might be echinococcosis within the pancreas. Muscle cystic neoplasia, you can see a beautiful image of a cystic lesion, the tail of the pancreas using magnetic resonance imaging, but MRI is missing if this lesion is a pseudocyst or cystic neoplasia. But endoscopic ultrasound gives us such nodules, and then we have only to prove if those nodules are perfused or not. Injecting Sonoview, we can nicely see after um, a while that enhancing, the nodule is enhancing, and we know it's a mucinous cystic neoplasia in the tail of the pancreas of a young female patient with almost no symptoms. Incidental finding. Be aware that also transcutaneous ultrasound allows us to delineate the lesion and also the enhancing nodules. IPMN, this is MRI eye catcher at end stage disease. It's honestly a beautiful image, but often MRI missing intraductal lesions, and we have only to prove if that lesion is enhancing or not. Contrast enhanced ultrasound allows us, allows us not only to delineate the enhancement of that lesion, but also to differentiate what is mucus and which parts are neoplasia. Neoplasia, mucus. Neoplasia, mucus. Yes, no response, strict intravascular contrast agent. But also papillary neoplasia of the common bile duct can be nicely depicted using endoscopic ultrasound. Splenic vein thrombosis is shown here uh, in a septic patient. Um, contrast enhanced ultrasound allows us to delineate the enhancing and the non-enhancing areas as shown in this short sequence now starting and you can delineate which is thrombosis and which part are enhanced. So my conclusion would be contrast enhanced ultrasound Contrast enhanced endoscopic ultrasound has been introduced about 20 years ago. There are some technical aspects we have to be aware. It's strict intravascular. Go into a large cannula. Don't use additional material. Be aware of the phases of contrast enhanced ultrasound and always use it when there is a pretest probability testing that the finding of contrast enhanced ultrasound will change patient's strategy, diagnostic and treatment procedures. We have been showing examples and I'm very much looking forward um, to the um, discussion and thank you so much for the opportunity to present in such excellent surrounding. Dr. Piyush? Sir, are there any questions from the audience or we can go with the live case? You, your volume is, voice is not coming, sir. Uh, uh, Professor Dietrich, very nice lecture. Uh, what is the difference between the sonos view and sonozoid? You know, there, there are... Uh, 
Yeah, um, that's a very interesting and important question. Um, by using endoscopic ultrasound, we are most interested into the arterial phase. And um, in the arterial phase, uh, the uh, contrast resolution seems to be better for some of you. Whereas Zonazoid has an interesting characteristic profile for a so-called late phase, a Kupfer cell phase, 10 or even more minutes after injection in liver cirrhosis. So Zonazoid is important for liver cirrhosis and uh, a differentiation of HDC and uh, some of you seems to be um, uh, appropriate for endoscopic ultrasound. No, I use the cautery too, but I use the cautery too. I didn't use it too. Excuse me, I didn't hear the question. Sorry. Thank you, sir. We'll move on to the next case. Correct, but the hot XC or the Boston guy, I use the cautery too. I mean, it's the same thing, sir. It's the same thing. 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 You can start the session. Sir, is there any device? Is there any device? Is there any device? Is there any device? Next, we have a 35-year-old male patient with a history of acute biliary pancreatitis last year, October 2021. Now he is having complaints of pain abdomen and uh, with the epigastric mass for past three months. He is also having nausea vomiting for past one month. There is significant weight loss. CCT whole abdomen was done 8 of March 2022. which showed a large cystic collection in lesser sac of size 12 into 11 into 11 centimeter, indenting the posterior wall of the stomach. So patient is planned for US guided cystogastrostomy for today. Pseudocysts are always a challenge because uh, a lot of things happen. Sometimes you go with the intention of uh, puncturing a pseudocyst and you don't find uh, a pseudocyst. Sometimes you find it in the wrong place and you don't know where to puncture, what exactly to do. So, uh, the, the, in this case, uh, we are now Being a US, we are using a fusion on US scope and uh, this is uh, for the procedure and uh, Dr. Vadwa will show uh, the Okay, now we can have a so we, we are now uh, in the stomach and sometimes because the depth is we need to enlarge too much of depth because the cyst may be quite big and it may be sometimes difficult because you are seeing the aorta but this is the cyst which is coming in between and uh, so we may have to move the down knob down before we go finally over the cyst and now we are over the cyst. So now we'll, we'll, we'll try to look. We have already located the cyst. We'll try to see the characteristics of the cyst before we actually <coughs> puncture it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Can you pull this a little bit? Thoda sa piche ho jana. Okay. Yeah. Thoda sa aur udhar karna. Can I can I ask a question? Yes. Yes. No problem. Okay, which uh, diameter of the cyst you consider it uh, suitable for uh, drainage? 
What was the question? What is the diameter of a cyst? You consider it suitable for drainage? Um, I would normally have a minimum 4 cm available to me from the, the, the puncture site as uh, the, the drainageable cyst. Anything above that is, is a drainable cyst. The characteristics of the cyst which we will look forward to is, is the thickening of the wall of the, the cyst or, the, or the, the size of the cyst. Uh, the characters of the cyst whether it is clear or has an, an internal debris. Uh, when you have more than 50 percent of internal debris then probably it will be better that a surgeon goes for a, a single uh, stage drainage cyst. Um, anything below 20 percent, 20 to 30 percent you can de deal with with plastic stents. But any, anything between 30 and 50 percent, uh, anything between 30 and 50 percent you need to have a metal stent which you have, which you can go ahead and do a necrosectomy if required in these situation. This is a large cyst as you can see that with a well, very well mature wall and the wall is not grossly thickened. It should be the wall thickness should be around less than 1 centimeter. The other thing which I would like to know is whether there are any vessels in between where I will be puncturing and, and, and we are going to go inside. There are few vessels here. So the puncture site we have to avoid that area so that we do not cause a bleeding while, while we are puncturing inside. Uh, Can you get more about the characteristics a little bit before we do because the procedure is going to be short so, and uh, a little bit more. So you told one thing uh, that this is a cyst, it appears a very clear cyst, we can move the focus down uh, maybe but even then we don't see anything uh, here within the cyst because we don't see any echoes within the cyst. Second thing is the maximum depth of this machine is 12 centimeter. So this is a large cyst but we cannot see the deeper part unlike in the other probably we can go to 20 centimeters that the depth is limited but doesn't matter that is not important. Um, the larger cysts are, are relatively easier to drain the smaller cyst we need to be careful that when we do not have um, uh, whenever I puncture I, I take it a measurement of minimum of 4 centimeters should be there from the point of puncture for me to go inside and deliver a stent properly. So I just want to find out whether the vessel that is there is an artery or vein. So we are not able to focus because of the depth but but uh, that is one thing I wanted to find out before we, okay. Okay. So s s uh, anything else in this case it may be rotated we see a little bit or not me other structures if you want to show we can show. What has happened in the rest of the pancreas? What happened to the rest of the pancreas apart from this? Sir, one more practical point. How do we avoid a gallbladder and not puncture uh, mistake for a cyst? And we can avoid it and not do the cystogastrostomy instead of the going into the... Uh, uh, instead of going into the cyst, not going to the gallbladder. So what are the practical tips to... Uh, distinguish both of them Yeah, uh, for the beginners. The, the first will be the location of the cyst. These cysts will be located just beyond the G junction while gallbladder is, is better clear, clearly delineated in the antrum. So where you are placing your scope that is important and um, the, the lo gallbladder will almost always have an associated structure. You can see the, the common bile duct or you, you will be able to liver. see the liver. Uh, uh, in, in, in a proximal area and if you go down you will be able to trace the co common bile duct and the portal vein in that area which will not be present here if we go by the side of these cysts you will not be able to see the liver here on either side. See when I rotate this somewhere at this point I see it communicating with another cyst. So this is uh, this. Yeah. Okay. But, but does not matter. Yes. So we will drain this cyst. And we, we can use a variety of stents in this and a clear cyst, a plastic stents, uh, multiple plastic stents do work uh, where we do not anticipate uh, the necrosectomy as, as far as the drainage of these, these uh, cysts are concerned. Um, however, if we had a, a debris then we will have to have and we anticipate that necrosectomy will be required then a metal stent is preferable in these situations. Here we will be using a a hot uh, metal stent which is in India made from J Mitra and company.
can you describe the characteristics of the stent here? The advantage of Fujifilm is you can always mark the, the uh, area from where the needle is going to come out. You can see the uh, area, you can mark the distance on which you are going to come out with. So you have the range of, of these uh, things. While these, uh, 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 you can see my, the dots my. which are available. These dots also indicate the, the range available with the needle size you are going to puncture. If you are going to puncture it with the, the needle size of 19, 22 gauge or 25 gauge, they, they, the range varies be, be with those needles. And, and you can change that in the, in the settings of this. Here we will be using directly the, uh, we will not be puncturing, but we will be using direct uh, uh, so, the stent. So, so means we. Uh, uh, Malay will give us the description no, no, yeah, of the so stent. Can you tell? Yes, yeah, add on. Come yeah, on. So, so sir, basically this stent is Honto RF radio frequency based. So yeah, we have a tip. We have a marker just below the tip, a radio pack marker. Yes, sir, just below the tip for the proxying for the display. We will show, show uh, it. Show it on fluoro. Uh, fluoroscopy, please. Just one second. So, stop. So there are two markers on this. So there are two markers on this we are seeing. So one of the first marker is near the about 1 centimeter away from the tip of the scope and the second marker is how many centimeter away? The second marker is this one. Uh, the just uh, at the uh, uh, proximal end. So this is one marker, this is one marker. Approximately the distance is 4 centimeter, 5 yes, centimeter. 5 centimeter. 5 centimeter. So between these two markers the distance is of 5 centimeter. Yes, this, uh, and on the device sir, we have this black marker for the uh, distal player release and this is the red marker for the point of uh, recapture. Up to this point we can recapture this stand and okay. this and this uh, black marking is the so, uh, point of full deployment sir. So there are three markers. Yes sir. Uh, the first marker is the initial point of deployment. The second marker is where you can recapture. After that you cannot recapture it and the third marker is when the stent is completely deployed. So the distance between this first and second marker is approximately 4 to 5 centimeter yes. again. But up to this you can recapture it. And then this is the third marker. So anything else is there? No sir. Okay. So we need uh, to connect this with the cautery machine. What settings of cautery? Yes sir. So we use the endo cut mode. We will connect it. Take it. Connect. Pull the scope like this. Hold this. Do you manipulate on the elevator during the procedure or the or through, uh, during the entry point? And uh, second question: What is your preference point of entry angle? Do you do you keep it 90 degrees? Do you go for the 120? How do you preferably enter into the cyst? Um, it should be straight, the point, uh, where, wherever you are entering you should have the, the maximum diameter. If you see there, there is an angle of entry with a line and my needle is, is pointing exactly at the same point. Can you see that? And, and it, there, there will be, uh, we, we will not uh, use an elevator here because that makes the entry difficult. It will be a simple straight 90 degree entry here. You can see the, the marker as well as the needle. Can you see the movement of the needle here? Yes, sure. So we have uh, decreased the depth, we are not showing the, but we show the cyst once more, it was very black cyst. Are we a little bit to the right or left? No, or you are not able to see because you have lost contact because of this needle. Yes, I have, I have just withdrawn it back to, to get the uh, thing back again. So, so, so shall we fix it with, uh, with somebody, will fix it because you, because maybe you have slipped back while we were doing it and we will pull back the stand for a second and we will readjust. Because sometimes this can happen that while we are pushing the stand has gone into the wrong place and it, it can, you, you slip back. So this time to prevent the slipping back I will hold on to the scope. Uh, when once you find this uh, cyst once more
So I will decrease that uh, depth once more because we were seeing the full. So, so we will increase the depth once more to the full because this was the full cyst that we were watching. So somehow, once okay. we, we we are in the right place. Now we have, you want to watch full cyst probably. Yes, I, I would think like we'll to. I think we keep have. it max zoom because so that we have no problem. We know where we are. So, but we will hold the scope like this so that at the time of puncture nothing happens. Okay. You want to use color once more? No need. Yes, I will be using a color Doppler before I, I go ahead and puncture the cyst. Um, uh, we do not have any, any major vessels as you can see there. I will oppose it, gradually use the electrical current. Ready? Cautery is ready. We, we do probably something happened. Shall I? Yes. And with a single puncture, we are inside uh, the cyst. Once we are inside the cyst, deep enough, we will have the proximal flange which needs to be opened up. Can we have the proximal flange opened up? Open it up. Open, open. Yeah, yeah. It, it so, the current you used, was it a pure current? Yeah, open a little bit more, a little bit more, that is all. Now once we have opened the proximal flange, we will withdraw the needle and oppose this flange to the wall and, and there will be a slight tension here. With that I will turn to the right, withdraw the scope a little bit so that if I can see the, uh, 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 the lumen here, it will be seen. And then I will withdraw the scope here, separate it from the wall, inflate, turn to the right and then, then de de deploy the, uh -huh, we can see the, the stent here, can we see the stent here? Now we will deploy the stent in the scope, in the scope please, deploy the stent in the scope, in the scope. In the scope, ha. and I will keep drawing the scope now. Keep drawing the scope. Keep drawing the scope. Keep drawing the scope. And there we have deployed the stent. We will go and check whether the stent is deployed well or not. It is, it is deployed so right is now. It is slightly yes. proximally deployed. We will, we will go ahead and check yeah. it up later. I'll, uh, uh, I'll reposition the stent. It you is. You want a gastroscope? Yes, I would prefer a gastroscope, gastroscope. here. Wait, wait, because this stent is sticking to the scope. Just be careful. We don't want it to. So there will be lot of fluid coming out because this is a big cyst. So. One this, of is, this is the is? this yeah. is deployed at the G junction, and and gradually it will come down. You can see the 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 stent completely, the flower properly deployed here, and the fluid coming easily. This is a clear fluid here, and and this should empty the the patient. Why I we I need to be just careful that I do not pull the stent around. So I will keep my scope away from it, and and gradually. Withdraw the bag. No need back. to do endoscopy. Just suck the fluid a little bit. No need. Yeah. No need. No, no. there's no, no need. need. It is properly okay. deployed just below okay. the G junction. With expected large amounts of fluids, do you intubate such patients before procedures? Yes. Uh, before extubation, however, this patient needs to have uh, the aspiration of the fluid. I can use an apogee endoscope and carefully avoid the the stent, which is not yet fully deployed, opened up. It will open up in the next 24 hours, and then, if necessary. Only if necessary, necrosectomy will be done. These patients, uh, we will cover up with the antibiotics for 72 hours and, and, and then stop the antibiotics if, if not required. Dr. Vadva, what was the cautery setting for this patient? It was a simple... Did you uh, your uh, cut? Can we show the cautery setting? It is an endocut mode with effect 2 and cut duration and cut interval of 3 each. Can we show the cautery settings please? Can we have a question? Uh, so, we 
Trent administration. What it looks like it is a pseudo system. Yeah. Because okay. we we'll ship the patient in the meantime. I'll just come to. Them. So this is a pseudo cyst. So uh, why not plastic stent rather than uh, luminoposing stent? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. एक जल्दी से यू है दिखा दे भी दस मिनट है ना दस मिनट है दस क्या बजे लेक्चर लेक्चर थोड़ा सा लेट कर मैं दो मिनट में यू है दिखा दे जरा यू है दिखा दे कैन कैन वी बी द क्वेश्चन दस मिनट दस मिनट यस वी हैव गोट टेन मिनट वी विल जस्ट शो वन यू है जस्ट क्विकली हाउ टू सी सी बीडी स्टोन कोई है Yeah, I, I can hear you, sir. You can please ask the question. This is pseudo cyst, isn't it? So why not plastic stent rather than luminal opposing stent? No, not the voice is again not very clear. Um, the voice from Dr. that side is not clear. Why not plastic stent rather than uh, metallic stent, luminal opposing stent? Mm -hmm. Dr. Badwa, yes. तो can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Doctor Khalid wants to ask a question to you. Yes, yes, please. Stone, दिखा दो. Yeah, he is just asking. It's looking like a pseudo cyst. So traditionally we use plastic stand, as you know. Correct. So he is just asking, like, is there any particular reason for the metal stand, or is just for the demonstration purpose during the workshop we are using it? Actually, a transparent clear fluid. I just said that we can use a plastic stent here, and and uh, the plastic stent will work fine. Uh, that will save the cost. Here we used it uh, for the demonstration purposes, as well as there is a small area for debris. Um, which may may or may not require a necrosectomy. So whenever there is a doubt that you may require a necrosectomy, it is preferable to put a metal stent in that situation. Linear scope. Doctor Vadva. Yes. How long do you keep the stent in place, and when do you decide to remove it? Uh, normally between two and three weeks of time, uh, uh, we will remove this stent. By that time, patient usually settles down. If a necrosectomy is required, we will start the necrosectomy 48 hours after the the placement of the stent. If the patient continues to have fever, uh, if a large amount of debris is present, then I will put a double pigtail metal stent in the uh, uh, in this stent for a for a simple reason that necrosis should not come and and obstruct the the metal stent. So placement of double pigtail stent will be useful in a patient who has a large necrosis. Uh, just a question, probably not related to this case, but uh, do you use upstream and downstream plastic stents? Upstream and downstream? No. Yes. No, no. We so will different ends of the cavity. Uh, huh, uh, it, it's a la large cavity, but the it's, the it's a liquid. Uh, within 24 hours, this uh, the entire cavity will get emptied. Uh, I have a question, please. Mike, Mike, Mike. Uh, can I? Okay. In case of uh, disconnecting uh, bancatic that uh, you, when you remove the uh, metallic stent, you put a uh, plastic stent. Uh, can, can, I, can I have the, in, in the case of, once again, please? In case of disconnecting bancatic that and you used in the beginning a metallic stent, when you remove it, you put a plastic stent. Uh, uh, can you please uh, repeat the a question? question? Is, Dr. Vadva, the question is that uh, if you have a disconnected pancreatic duct and you mm. have used a lumen opposing stent and now you have to remove it after a few weeks, do you use plastic stents instead? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, For how long? Uh, we will remove the metal stent in about two weeks time, place a plastic stent and leave indefinitely. Uh, the plastic stent will get extruded on its own once the cavity completely closes and the leak stops. We will not remove the plastic stent. Uh, another question, please. Uh, do you uh, Mike, Mike. do you drain the uh, peribancatic uh, fluid uh, uh, collection before or we, before wall of necrosis uh, all wall uh, for me? Um, so the question uh, is: Is there I'm any understanding the question? Do we drain simultaneously pancreatic duct through ERCP? Is that the question? 
No, uh, no, no, no. Dr. Vajpa, I mean, can it be the last question? Because we have got only five minutes before the next lecture. Yeah. So we, we are going for the next lecture and we have got one case lined up. Dr. Puri is there. So doc, can we brief the case? Okay, doctor. Okay, can I? Uh, okay. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. We have, we have, have a 40 you. year old lady with a right upper quadrant uh, abdominal uh, pain from two days. And uh, one minute, sir. Hi, Rajesh. Upper abdominal pain and? Sir, we have a patient, 40 year old uh, lady with a right upper quadrant abdominal pain, but there is no history of fever, sir. Ultrasound is showing CVD uh, dilated, uh, minimally dilated, uh, 7 to 8 mm, and stone is 4 mm, is seen in the mid CVD, and she is also having uh, gallstone, sir. So, the reason of endoscopic ultrasound, like you said, ultrasound shows there is a 4 millimeter stone. Is the, what is the LFT report? Oh. What is Liver the function test? Left is showing mild obstructive jaundice. Alpha C is 312, sir. Okay. And bilirubin is 3.4 with predominantly uh, conjugated uh, this thing. SGOT, SGPT are 81 and 68, sir. So I think if you look at the history, the case is very straightforward. And but uh, the purpose of demonstration of this case is to show that endoscopic ultrasound is one of the modality of choice especially for the small stone if you look at in this case the ultrasound was able to pick up a 4 millimeter stone in the bile duct but mainly even the MRCP also misses the small stone in the uh, bile duct which is less than 6 millimeter where the EUS scope uh, EUS uh, uh, has an advantage over MRCP the most important thing is to focus the CBD stone, the technique is you go to the first part of the duodenum, engage your scope to the bulb, try to focus the portal vein and once uh, you focus, can you see the CBD stone? Dr. Male? Yes. Yeah, yeah. We wanted the full screen. So we have there, a challenge no? for Dr. Puri. 2 minutes 39 seconds so left. This is the stone is there. Can you oh, see the stone oh. in the CBD? So, to Dr. So, so, the technique is, uh, is for the beginners also, you take your scope into the duodenal bulb, do an anti-clockwise rotation, focus the portal vein in the longitudinal view, you will see the head of the pancreas and you see the suprapancreatic part of the CBD and I think it is not the 4 millimeter stone. It, it is, is six, a big, six. big, big stone. There are 6 millimeters. Can you see there are 2 stones. Can okay. you see here? Can you see here there are 2 stones? So this is 1 stone. 6.6. .6. Okay. So, uh, so I, I think the case is clear and this patient is going to require a ERCP. Okay. Is that right? Yes. So the, the only thing is, uh, uh, Dr. Puri, you have shown it from the duodenal bulb. Yeah. Can you show it from the stomach also? Yeah, I will try to show it from the stomach, stomach also. Huh. So, Dr. Puri, excellent demonstration. What about the role of radial scope? And you, if you have a radial scope, would you prefer a radial or yeah, you go with if radial? If I have a radial scope, I will prefer because there's a lot many uh, advantages theoretically also because it is more comfortable. Uh, so, uh, let me just focus first the CBD stone. You see the portal vein and the CBD. Can you put the Doppler? Yeah, can you see the CBD? Can you enlarge it? And here I will rotate my scope clockwise, clockwise. So, you are following the duct? Yes. So this is the duct that you are following down. Yes. Can you see the stone now? Yes. So we if the patient has an altered anatomy, even you can see the from the stomach. So I will again refocus it. Can you see the stone now very clearly? Okay. Now so the question asked to me was, is there any added advantage of radial endoscopic ultrasound over the linear? If you ask scientifically, there is no added advantage, but like in my unit, I have one linear and one radial. So to expedite the procedure, because once I do one case and scope goes for the washing, I can use the second. So I lined up my cases, which can be done with the radial. Otherwise, radial endoscopic ultrasound has no added advantage for the CBD. 
Yes, you can so see the entire You length. have got an extension of 5 minutes, Dr. Puri. Yeah. So, you have shown uh, it from the duodenal bulb. Yeah. You have shown it from the stomach. Can you show it from the descending duodenum also? Yeah, yeah I will show you. Okay. okay. So, the way is, this is always be people has a fear that they don't take the pentax scope into the second part of the duodenum. But in my early stage of the career, for 5 years, I have used the pentax scope. And I always go to the second part of the duodenum and I am going to show you how. So I'm This scope has been modified now. Okay. So the Even the larger scope is there, is not yeah. a problem. So like I have gone to the second part. Can we have the endoscopic view? view? Can we have an endoscopic view please? Endoscopic view please. Wait, wait, wait some time. So how to go first endoscopic view? Yeah, we, we got the view. Okay, can you see it here? Yeah. Now what Can I'm going repeat to do, again, I will make my right knob right, I will lock it, make the big knob up and I will give a little torque on my scope so the scope will be reduced as it is reduced in the ERCP. Is that right? So now, what you did was you, did, you just torqued, you didn't pull it back. Yeah, I torque and I pull it back by torquing movement. Took. So I rotate my right knob right, lock it make the big knob towards me the most important thing is for the beginner which i have seen they if somebody can focus what they do while doing the shortening scope they make the big knob up and down up and down up and down this is not the right way you make your i will again show you let's focus my hand i will come to the first part of the duodenum this i am in the first part of the duodenum i will make the right knob right this is the right knob right I will lock it, make the big knob towards me, do a clockwise rotation and I am going to shorten like this. So this is the way and I will again release my right left knob and I am into the deep second part of the rudna. Is that right? Yes. Now if you do a clockwise and anti-clockwise rotation, can you see the head of the pancreas here and the mesenteric vessels? This is the head of pancreas. Yeah, this is which part of head of pancreas it is? <laughs> this is anti head of pancreas. When you see mesenteric vessels, we see the anti head of pancreas. When you see the aorta, you see the posterior head of pancreas. Now the movement should be clockwise and just look at my left hand what I am doing. I am doing anti clockwise and the clockwise. And can you see the PD started appearing? So which duct appears first, PD or CBD? Yeah, the PD has appeared. So you once know? you are coming out of third part of duodenum, the PD appears first. Yeah. Okay. So this is the PD has appeared. So I will do the clockwise and the anti-clockwise movement. Can you have EUS for image, please? So this this is the PD, uh, Rajesh. This, so this is, is the, the PD. Yeah. This is the ampulla. Can you focus the ampulla? This is the ampulla. Yes. So, can we just put in some water and show ampulla better yes. because can you want to put in water? some water, 50 ml water? So, the best way to examine the ampulla is you put around 100 ml of the water, give the buscopan to the patient. Buscopan? Is balloon an alternative for water to have a better image for the ampulla? Hello? Yeah? There is one question from Aldashan. Yeah, Do you think that the balloon would be a better alternative or an alternative? I to absolutely agree. In my practice, I always use balloon. And as Malay has told me that I have to demonstrate the CBD stone, my first question is I need a balloon. But because the time was short, it was only 5 minutes. So that's why the balloon was not taken. Otherwise, in my day-to-day -day practice, I always prefer to use the balloon. Okay. So this is the... This is the pancreatic duct. Can and you give the water, please? Water. Dr. Malay? Yes. You, you, you don't use balloon. You, I you don't always use, use water. Because to me, it's costly. Also, you are, Dr. Puri lives in a very uh, center where cost is not a problem. Here for us, cost is always a problem. So we use balloon 500 rupees or 800 rupees more extra. So that is the reason. So, because of he is used to balloon, back. he has slipped back so again. I slipped back. But just so give me two minutes, let me so do again. The reason we don't, uh, the, what we generally do in these cases, we keep up now fully up, max up, and that prevents us from slipping back. So, uh, into this first part you of the diverticulum. 
Yeah, there yeah. is a possibility diverticulum. Okay. Dr. Puri, uh, please uh, show us the unsinate process also, you know, uh, from yeah. the this descending the aorta now? If you can. Yes. Yeah. This is the aorta. This is the mesenteric vessels. Again, the aorta and the IVC. Can you see the IVC? Yes. IVC? Yes. So sir, so sir, when we see the IVC and aorta, this is the time we will be looking at the ventral pancreas. That is, looking that at that the then we see process. a dentinate process. Yes. So this is a lymph node. This is a lymph node. Yes. But I think the time is up, Ravi. So just give me a second to focus uh, the bile duct. Bile duct. Last. Uh, just give me. Doctor Malay. Yeah. Can can we uh, allow Dr. Puri to demonstrate us the unsinate process, please? Okay. Yeah, I will just demonstrate you. Yeah. So this okay. is the PD. Can you see the CBD now? This is the CBD. Can you see the stone? This. You can see something within here, but not yet clear. So clearly, as we see it from the other places. This yeah. is the PD. This is the. Stone. This is the stone. Can you see the stone? Yes. Yes, the acoustic shadowing. We get the acoustic shadowing. We have seen this. Okay, stone. and now see the unsinate process here. This is the unsinate. Yes. Process. Can you see it here? This so is whatever aorta. is between the aorta below papilla. Yes. Infra papillary between probe and aorta is the unsinate process. Is that clear? Okay, so th this is the unsinate process which we are seeing right yeah, now. And this is the right adrenal. No, no, no. no this aorta, this? aorta. No, this aorta. above. Yeah, this vessel, is vessel, vessel. So I think we will proceed with the RCP. You can proceed with the lecture. Uh, what is this? What this septum is? Uh, this may be a common channel. Dr. Puri is asking what is this septum. So is this a common channel that we are seeing right now? Because this is seen much better here. There was a diverticulum actually. This is the diverticulum. Can you see? This is the diverticulum. This is is this the diverticulum yes. or this is but this if this is diverticulum. This will get filled with air and water. Will so you see the number of stones? Can you see it? The number of stones. This one, one two, two, yes, and three. Okay. So, okay. This is the diverticulum. This is the diverticulum. These are the stones, and this is the pancreatic duct. And the so most important uh, uh, is the gallbladder is intact. No. So we'll you please go on with the lecture. We will proceed with the RCP of the case. And we'll get back to you in about uh, ha half an hour uh, with Dr. Vikram Bhati again for the demonstration of mediastinal U.S. So there will be a lecture, Dr. Malay, now. Yeah, it, I think there is a lecture now, Dr. Surinder Rana. Okay, so there is a lecture there right now. Yeah. Okay. This will okay, be delivered from here. Okay. So we'll have a transmission up to 30 minutes. Okay, okay, Dr. Julia. Good afternoon to everyone. And first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for the kind invitation to be part of this uh, workshop on AUS and ARCP, but also to be able to talk about how to do a cell astrography in 2022. But first of all, we need to take into account that AUS has had a great evolution over time, reaching what we call advanced imaging. So this started in the beginning of the U.S. in 1986. We can remember that uh, in that year there was the uh, Maradona scoring to England with the hand. But now in 2021, we are able to go to Mars. Uh, so at the end, what happened in, in the U.S. over these years is that we have really increased the diagnostic capabilities based on... We have better and better uh, ultrasound devices nowadays to perform a US. So when we talk about advanced imaging, I think we can focus on three main topics. One is the possibility to evaluate the stiffness of the tissue, and this is elastography. The second one is vascularization, which is contest enhancement. We've already had a topic from uh, Christoph about the usefulness of, of this very nice technique associated with endoscopic ultrasound. And another combined with sampling and advanced imaging would become focal but of course today and in this session i'm going to focalize on a us guided elastography so to have a guide on what we are going to talk about in this next uh, minutes 
first I would love to explain what is elastography and what are the different types of elastography that we have available today uh, when we do an AUS. Uh, I think as important is how can I interpret the information in different clinical settings? And of course, if we need to interpret it, we need also to know if this is accurate or not in the different clinical indications. And I will end with some take messages for the for all of for all of you. So when we talk about the yes elastography today, we have two different uh, ways to do this technique. One is the strain elastography, which is the most one well known associated to endoscopic ultrasound that is going to evaluate the relative stiffness of a tissue by its response to compression. So in this setting, uh, we know that we will have the qualitative one, which is going to be the patterns related to the color map, and the other one is the quantitative, which will be the measure of the strain rate and the strain histogram. What is very important in this method is by the compression, where the slight compression with the probe towards uh, the, the tissue and help by the compression from the big vessels, we are going to have a color map in which the hard tissue is going to appear in blue, whereas the soft tissue is going to appear in red and the intermediate stiffness is going to appear in green. The other technique is shared with elastography, which is very well known in the field of percutaneous ultrasound, but now has reached uh, AUS. But I think we still have the lack of information on how this technique is going to work. But we are going to have a, a, at least a, a comment on how to do this uh, with elastography, on what we have learned until now and how to do it in based on, on, on AUS. But if we talk about the estering elastography, it's also very important to take into account different concepts that is going to guide us on the knowledge on how to do this technique. So we need to know a little bit about the frame reject, with if it's a filter that removes the noise, uh, the, the artifact that we have with the noise. We have the noise reject, another filter that is going to remove the noisy pixels, so it's going to reduce to obtain colors. We have the knowledge of persistence setting to improve the image quality, the density, we have the frame rate, we have the dynamics, we have the relative strain, and this is extremely important, I will show you an example. And then we have to know about the strain ratio and the strain histogram, which are going to be the ways that we can quantify a strain elastography in different clinical settings, of course, mostly known in uh, solid magnetic lesions. But if we come to the knowledge, uh, uh, just uh, give me a couple of uh, minutes to, to explain. So what we are going to have is a compression between the transducer and the different um, organs uh, with the big vessels that are going to be in behind. So whenever you will have a large strain, this is going to be soft. But in the other hand, when we have a small strain, this is going to be hard. And this is going to be translated in the color map that we have just commented. For instance, we have two examples that if we just fix in the colors, these are a couple of uh, lesions that are really hard and that's why we see them uh, blue. But it's also very important to take into account the size of the ROI because a strain elastography is based on the relationship between the different uh, organs that we have in, in under evaluation. So if we just focalize in the lesion, we can have a wrong evaluation because what we are going to uh, evaluate is how stiff is the lesion that I want to evaluate as related to the surrounding tissue. So it's very important to have enough tissue inside of the ROI to be able to have a good exploration and a good understanding. Then, of course, you're going to have a lot of different uh, buttons that you need to play, but I've just placed here from the previous uh, systems from Itachi, and I'm just going to focus on, on the frame average, because this uh, frame average technique allows not only to focus on one single image, but it's going to allow us to perform the evaluation on a sequence of time. And this is going to be uh, very important to try to avoid any kind of bias on selecting with the image that we think is going to be better when we are trying to evaluate what evolution is uh, and understand. So just to show you an example, this is how we see, and this is a pancreatic cancer. So this is how we can see the ROI is 50% about of the lesion. We can very nicely see this blue pattern. Then we do the frame average. You see that we are just uh, analyzing that frame, that, that continuous frame. So we will to have the mean of the evaluation. Now I'm going to show you how we do the strain ratio, selecting the lesion of interest and the reference area from the gut wall. And then the other option is to do the strain uh, histogram that we are going to place a box 
that no, we are going to have the final, uh, final evaluation ah, in the mean. Okay. So this is the difference. This is how we perform. Um, uh, the, the qualitative, which is the pattern, then we have the strain rate, as you've seen, and now we have the strain Eastern. So these well, are the different that. ways that we can do Elasto hmm. uh, today. But what are the patterns? How can we interpret these images? Uh, at the end, this is the main goal of today, is try to understand okay. and try to show you how we do elastography. So these and these yeah, patterns yeah. are based on pancreatic solid lesions. These are the huh. four main patterns that we are going to see. And come on, That's not only in pancreatic yeah. lesions, this is cost consistently well, see well, in, in, in some other yeah, indications that we will discuss afterwards. But if we focus on, on, on the elastography patterns, we have uh, the cardia. green cardia, one, which is, uh, related to normal pancreas. Okay. We have this heterogeneous green, but with some blue spots, small blue spots that is uh, typical of chronic oh. pancreatitis. Oh. Then we have the blue predominant patterns that are karate, mostly karate, related karate, to malignant karate, lesions karate, because we know that malignant karate, lesions karate. tend to be more stiff because of more density of cells. Cells. So we have the pancreatic adenocarcinoma, which is mostly uh, blue but a little bit of heterogeneity because of these green areas that are mostly correlated to necrotic fibroid and this is typical for pancreatic adenocarcinoma. On the other hand, if we have a very homogeneous blue pattern, this is very much related to the presence of a neuroendocrine carcinoma. And what are the values of a strain ratio and the, of the strain estrogen? Look, when we have a strain ratio below 10 and we have a strain histogram over 50, these are consistently related to benign lesions. But in the other hand, of course, if we have a strain ratio higher than 10 or a strain histogram below 50, this is mostly related to malignant lesions. But again, we need to have important concepts. We need to understand what is the meaning of this color map. Look, why if you have this lesion that is very much looking in BMO to an neuroendocrine tumor, it did an FNA and it turned to be a neuroendocrine tumor, this was a D1. So if you take a look at the elasto, it turned to be a green lesion. So come on, Julio, if you told us that blue lesions uh, 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 um, the neuronal tumors tend to be blue, homogeneously blue. Why this is green? And look, this is a G1. G1 means uh, that the uh, Chi 67 index is low, that the mitotic index is low, as we can see in this histological evaluation. So at the end, this is, is going to be soft because we have a low density of cells. But in the other hand, is we switch to this other neuronal tumor that you see that is mainly blue that we did a biopsy and turned to be a G3 neuroendocrine carcinoma. G3 means that there is a low proliferation, a high proliferation index, a high number of mitosis. So Adenis is going to have the appearance of a heart lesion because there is a high density of cells. So this is very important to understand that, for instance, not all neuroendocrine tumors are going to be blue because the benign ones, the G1 ones, are going to be soft and we are going to see them green. Unless switch to the most complex uh, disease to interpret, which is chronic pancreatitis with classifications. And I brought this as an example because it's, it, it's key to understand. If we were able to understand this image, uh, we are going to understand how to do elastography. Because here we have some classifications inside of this uh, chronic pancreatitis uh, case. So how are we going to see the classifications? Of course, blue. There's nothing harder than classifications. They need to be blue. But on the other hand, in this evaluation of Elasto, away from the calcifications, we still, sa we still can see some blue spots. And we direct the FNA to these blue spots outside of the calcifications. Mm -hmm. And it turned to be a small foci of uh, pancreatic adenocarcinoma in the context of a chronic pancreatitis. So the two messages is don't rely on the blue pattern when you have a lot of calcifications. So that is why they, as we will see the specificity of uh, Elasto, when we are trying to evaluate a pancreatic malignancy and when we need to include in those cases chronic calcific pancreatitis, this is going to be a really complex to understand. Mm -hmm. But if we, you follow me in this idea, in this image, probably you will understand better how to do and how to interpret elasto in the setting of the most complex case, which is a calcific chronic pancreatitis. Uh, so what about shear wave elastography? Shear wave elastography is recently new. I just tried to brought here an example on, on how we do it. And at the end, this is uh, uh, something that is really starting. So it's very similar to what we do uh, when we do it from percutaneously, but there is still the need 
to have more data. There's just a couple of studies in the evaluation of uh, pancreatic cell lesions. So at the end, we will have the measurement of the velocity. We will have the the, 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 the measurement in kilopascals of the pressure. But I still, there is a lot of uh, things to do. And I don't think that is going to be a very good idea from my side to try to include directly show wave elastography as a standard of ages guided elastography. So let's keep in, in this in, in, in the second part and we will see in the future on, on what is going to be the role of this new elastic technique in, in associated to endoscopic ultrasound. So if, if we have just understand a little bit about uh, how to interpret it, what are the patterns and what is the meaning of this technique, let's go to the clinical applications and how to get this data in a clinical routine. So we focus on clinical applications, and at the end is something similar to the standard uh, approved or, or, or just published in the ESG guidelines on or just get the sampling. So of course we need to focus with elasto in solid lesions because any kind of liquid is going to be a nightmare for elastography. So of course we cannot include cystic pancreatic lesion as an indication for elastography. So I think today we have enough data to say that in pancreatic solid masses, it is a very good tool uh, also for so pseudo lesions, I think we have uh, we have it, very nice information area. and very nice images on on how to differentiate different pseudo lesions based on areas get the elastography. I'm going to show you what is the potential role so in the staging kata. of luminal tumors. Uh, I think the evaluation mostly of lymphadenopathy it's very important because it's going to decrease the, our time when we stage, for instance, a lung cancer because it is very good to select the most, the lymph nodes that are most likely to be malignant. Uh, there is more and more data on the role on solid liver masses and also for the evaluation of parenchyma liver disease. And of course, this is a miscellaneous. And uh, since we have this very nice technique, uh, uh, together with our systems, probably we can use it in, in many different indications. But let's try to go step by step. Let's try to focus a little bit on, on solid pancreatic tumors because the first good indication, and I want to show you some data, and I want to show you how to interpret it to make a proper differential diagnosis as just following our previous comment is in, in this setting. So here, for instance, we have some examples in this, in this slide in which we can see a couple of one very small pancreatic tumor, uh, homogeneous uh, blue lesion with some grains inside that these tend to be and, 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 and adenocarcinoma, uh, the same as in, in the other in the other picture that we have uh, here. Again, this is another very nice image for a pancreatic cancer. But look, in this image, we can see that in B mode seems to be a solid lesion, very much looking to adeno, but it turned to be green. So this green lesion at the end turned to be just an inflammatory process. And again, in this uh, um, image that we have, Again, in this pancreatic uh, case and uh, this chronic pancreatitis, which is was mostly a uh, uh, heterogeneous green predominant pattern, at the end also tend to be a benign disease and not a malignant disease. So with these things, are we really accurate to differentiate between benign and malignant tumors? And I've just tried to bring the latest uh, meta-analysis that was published in, in 2018. You see there's a lot of various studies included in, 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 in this meta-analysis from Thang, and we can really see that the sensitivity, both with qualitative and with quantitative elastography, is very high for malignancy, over 95%, but we have lower levels of specificity, around 60 to 65%. And this is mostly because of the problem to interpret properly chronic calcific pancreatitis, this mass forming chronic pancreatitis with calcifications. So it's just a matter of understanding. So if we just to summarize, uh, what is the accuracy for the termine malignancy in terms of differential diagnosis? I think we have a very sensitive technique. We are going to detect almost all malignant lesions, but I think uh, we, we still need to improve in terms of specificity. So probably this is a matter of learning and this is a matter of training. So probably we need to train more and learn more of the technique and have more data uh, with a good interpretation of, of may, mostly of uh, chronic pancreatitis. And again, to show you some more examples, this we can see the image of a pancreatic cancer, the previous case that I showed you with the G1 neurocrine tumor, this very nice image of, uh, of course, the calcification is blue, but the rest of parenchyma is heterogeneously green. So this was a mass forming chronic pancreatitis. This is another pancreatic adenocarcinoma. This is another case of, a of uh, mass forming chronic pancreatitis. And this was the previous case with the small foci of cancer 
in the setting of a chronic pancreatitis. So believe me, learning to use this technique becomes extremely useful in the management of uh, solid pancreatic tumors. And this is the way, this is how to interpret it and how to do elasto in this indication. Uh, next question can be, okay, Julio, but you have a lot of expertise. What about the learning? Can you reach a good interobserver uh, equipment? And look, we did it. We tested with a, a fellows and with the trainees that came to Santiago. This is a very nice study published by Joao Soares that stayed with us for a while together with our Portuguese uh, colleagues. And we found that with experience, look at the Kappa score. The agreement when you have expertise is extremely high. But again, there is a need to have expertise to be able to reach a very good uh, accuracy of this, uh, of this technique. So it's good. But of course, everything in life, in, it needs training. And just give me one second, uh, and I will cover one uh, couple of ideas of for sure what uh, Christo have already told you about contrast enhancement. Because if we combine elasto with contrast enhancement, we are going to even increase more our diagnostic capability. And this has been shown in these two studies. One is published by my group in New York Journal in 2017. And there is a multi-center European trial in which I have the fortune to be part of it from uh, published on, on New Asia Journal in 2020. And with the combination, we can even increase, maintain the sensitivity, but reach in a specificity as levels over 80%. And this is an example on how, if we combine, we can really orientate better what is going to be the final diagnosis. So this is a case of a heterogeneous blue lesion but with the not the topical, not the typical uh, pattern of a pancreatic adenocarcinoma. So we uh, put a core needle and this turned to be a metastasis from a lung cancer. Uh, this was a, come on, a benign net. And this is the typical, the typical heterogeneous blue pattern with the hypovascular contrast enhancement uh, imaging of a pancreatic adenocarcinoma. But this is not only for differential diagnosis, you need to use and you need to interpret the elasto to optimize your strategy for staging locally uh, pancreatic cancer. And this study from Yamada is extremely important in this, uh, in this context. Sorry. You can see very nicely that based on AUS gated elastography, we can increase our capability to a stage for the vascular staging of pancreatic cancer as compared to multi-detector CT scan and also with B-mode um, AUS imaging. So if you see these images that I am showing you from the paper of Yamada, this is a very useful combined tool to B-mode to increase your capabilities to optimize your staging strategy for uh, pancreatic cancer among all the solid pancreatic tumors that can be evaluated for the staging, local staging with this technique. But of course, not everything is cancer, not everything is uh, pancreatic tumors. We've also tested chronic pancreatitis. And look, how to interpret it. This is the two main uh, images that you are going to use to distinguish a normal pancreas to the left to early chronic pancreatitis to the right. And you can see that the B mode is slightly different, but the, come on, the elasto pattern is completely different when you compare normal pancreas to early chronic pancreatitis. But what are the data? What are the, the is this really true? What has been published on this topic on chronic pancreatitis and AUS gated elastography? Look, we know that the correlation between the number of criteria and elasto based on a strain histogram is as high as 0 0.812. We know that there's also a very nice correlation between the pancreatic secretion, the bicarbonate secretion after the administration of secretin and the elasto in a strain, uh, the strain radio evaluation. But a Japanese group has shown Look, a kappa score of 0 0.9, when they correlate the histogram with the histological score in patients with chronic pancreatitis, which is really, for me, amazing, is uh, close to perfection. And, but with also, in our study that we conducted in our, in, our, in our group, we found a very strict correlation between the stream ratio and the presence of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. That means for the, also helping for the staging of chronic pancreatitis. In fact, we have developed the multimodal AUS based approach for the diagnosis of early chronic pancreatitis. And we found that AUS gated elastography is an essential and key tool in this multimodal AUS based approach, which includes the output of bicarbonate 
the BMO number of criteria and also the evaluation of this sensibility after the administration of secreting. And as a spin-off of this study with even more patients, as commented before, we have found a very nice correlation between the uh, output of bicarbonate and the levels of the strain ratio measured by AUS gated elastography. So believe me, there's a lot of patients with suspected chronic pancreatitis. Balloon, balloon. Use this very nice technique, as I already showed you, to try to optimize the detection of these patients in early stages. But now let's go away from the from the pancreas. Let's go for a, a very nice, nice indication, which is lymph nodes. And you can see in this um, review study that we published together with Christoph in endoscopic ultrasound in 2015, I need to recognize that Christoph is doing a great job uh, putting all us together, trying to bring a lot of information about how to do and what are the indications and what are the strengths of this, uh, all these advanced imaging techniques. But look, in this review study, sensitivity is extremely high. Most of the studies are around 85 to 100 percent with a very nice specificity to try to, to differentiate a benign node from a malignant node. And here you have the, the, the two options you have in this picture, where is a malignant node? And in this other picture, what is a benign node? But to make it even bigger, look, this is a patient with a sarcoidosis, a green pattern, and this is a patient with a metastatic lean node, absolutely blue, hard lesion, a lot of proliferation, a lot of cells inside. So this technique is very good in this setting, but even more. And this is a picture, uh, courtesy from Jensen and, and Christoph, in which in this, this node, uh, Christoph and, and, and uh, Dr. Jensen reach this is small blue part of the node for FMA, and this was finally a malignant node. So it is good overall, but also good to detect and try to direct where to place the needle to optimize the differential diagnosis of this lymph node evaluation. So just think when you are staging a lung cancer with a lot of nodes, how helpful AES gated elastography is to try just to select the best nodes really to sample. Now we're also working in elasto in subepithelial lesions because we know from this study from Suji in, in 2016 that GIST are harder than other type of uh, gastric subepithelial lesions uh, like lyomyoma or avran pancreas. And this is the suggested the usefulness of this technique, which can also assess tumor hardness of these subepithelial lesions. And one image is better than many words. This is how we can see uh, a gist, and this is how we can see a lyomyoma. So you can really see in these two examples that this methodology also allows to differentiate between different types of um, subepithelial lesions, mostly to be able to detect better gist as compared to uh, benign ones like lyomyomas, uh, as this study has really highlighted uh, a couple of years ago. But now we're also working in gut lesions in the possibility for a local staging of this type of lesions. And look how nice in this um, uh, gastric cancer, how nice we can really depict the layers in the mode, but how we can very nicely really be sure that this um, tumor is not really affecting in the distal part. So I think this is going to be a very nice technique uh, helping to optimize the local staging of gastric cancer, esophageal cancer, and probably rectal cancer. And this is the example of the opposite. This is a, a lesion that is really uh, not going over the, the layers of the stomach. And on the other hand, here we can see that what this was a relapse of a um, cardiac tumor, and we can see like the, the lesion is really going in, inside and really affecting with the local invasion. So I think this is another potential indication. We still have data lacking on this idea, but uh, this is one of the things that we're thinking and we are just drafting a, a new protocol to try to solve this question, whether I just get the elastography can be a good indication to optimize the local staging of gut uh, lesions. But now we start to have more information on liver diseases. And this is very nice study showing that there is a difference uh, between normal fatty and theoretic patients and this is evaluation as you see in the screen as you see in the in the scheme uh, is being done AUS guided so probably it is not only that we can do a very nice uh, AUS guided liver biopsies today but probably in, uh, in the future as soon as we are able to compare 
and optimize the, the methodology for just get a lab, uh, liver biopsy. And we can really very nicely compare to Elasto. And in this case, I think a strain, uh, oh, I'm sorry, oh. share wave elastography oh. can be a good indication. Uh, this is an, a, another of the good future for just get elastography, which is the evaluation of liver diseases. And I can keep talking a lot of different options. So I just bring as a latest idea, summarizing that is not only what we have already saw, but here I have some examples, again, some more lymph nodes, how we can guide FMB, as I have already told you, how we can also evaluate left adrenal gland. So at the end, all lesions, all solid lesions that are suitable for being evaluated by AUS might be a good indication to use AUS get elastography. So that's this an open window, an open door to use this very nice methodology in many different indications. So just coming to the end for my take home messages, I think Elasto is a very useful technique available to be used in all patients. Uh, the key point is to learn how to do it and how to interpret it. And I think there are multiple and variable indications that I'm sure this is going to be spread with the more and more use of this methodology, even more now that is available in all uh, AUS systems in the market. This also is available in Olympus scopes, Pentax scopes, Fuji scopes, mostly because not all of them are, uh, are in, the, uh, in the way to be used by, by ETAS. So just uh, would uh, love you to invite you to come to Santiago de Compostela. If you want to learn a little bit more on, on AUS get elastography, I will uh, very, very happy to welcome you to Santiago and also inviting you uh, it's one year from now, but uh, I, I think you all have a very good opportunity to know and to learn a lot of uh, AUS uh, coming to the year US 2023, which is going to be the 20th anniversary that is going to be in, in Milan at the beginning of uh, March next year. So thank you very much for the attention and uh, waiting for the uh, Q&A. Thank you. Thank you for the excellent uh, lecture, Dr. Uh, Julio Iglesias, sir. It was very informative. Thank you very much. So, I'm sorry we are running late, Julio, so we will not be able to give you time for questions and answers. Okay, Mare. Uh, don't worry. Okay. The next case we are going for is a 21-year-old uh, young lady uh, who presented with loss of appetite, significant loss of weight of 10% of body weight. Uh, from three months, our hemogram is showing mild iron deficiency anemia and uh, ultrasound is showing multiple abdominal lymph nodes, the largest measuring 2.2 centimeters which can be seen in the ultras ultrasound image that is on the right side of the screen and chest x-ray did not show any uh, mediastinal lymph endopathy which you are expecting, uh, suspecting uh, with the suspicion of tuberculosis but there is widening of the hilar region. So our plan is to US, uh, US, uh, take a US guided FNB from the lymph node and also to assess the mediastinum in detail by Dr. Vikram Bhatia, sir. Uh, See, in this case, the diagnosis is more sir. or less clear, but our aim is to demonstrate uh, the basic, basic uh, structures of the imaging in stomach and from mediastinum. So we have got 20 to 25 minutes for this. And uh, so Vikram, you are on. So, uh, uh, me, Dr. Malay and Dr. Rajesh Puri here uh, will take you through uh, together with the anatomy and uh, uh, off the screen or maybe on the screen we will take the FNS also, there are some nodes. So any evaluation, one second, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. So sorry, uh, any evaluation of the uh, mediastinum begins in the stomach. So we, I am past the GJ junction into the stomach. And you have a standard view in front of you, which is the splenoportal confluence and the, hepat the celiac artery bifurcation into the splenic artery and the hepatic artery and the left gastric artery going up, uh, left hepatic artery going up. Let me take this artery which Dr. Malay has pointed back and this is the celiac origin. What you see above is the splenic artery and the splenic vein. The splenic vein forms the behind of the pancreas. So the pancreas exists between the transducer or actually the gastric wall. Then is the lesser sac which is a virtual space, you don't see it, so we presume it is there. And what is behind, between the, ext, the wall of the stomach and the splenic vein is the pancreas. So 
uh, looking back at the artery, we go down and here at the splenic artery also uh, joins the hepatic artery and then the hepatic artery gives off the left hepatic artery which goes along the left lobe of the liver just under the screen and the right hepatic artery which sort of dips, join, uh, dips down. But the, in, the interest which is to us when we go down into the abdomen in a case of mediastinum is to go to the left and look at the left adrenal and we can reduce the image and the left adrenal is actually found between the aorta and the top of the left kidney so this is the top of the left kidney and you can see the renal structures and this is the aorta here and what is above the aorta is the crust of the diaphragm and we sometimes can confuse the left crust of the diaphragm for the adrenal so I'll just show you the two structures this is the left crust which we see over the spine and the intervertebral disc behind and if I rotate further this is the left adrenal so now we can make the image a bit big sir ah, okay now we can increase the okay so now we have uh, the left adrenal the left crust of the diaphragm can I have the uh, arrow please so this is the left adrenal and this is the left crust of the diaphragm please don't confuse the two the adrenal has two wings it has a seagull shape and we normally look for any metastasis which can happen in around one-fifth of the mediastinal uh, malignancies so we see the medulla and a hyper sorry the, 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 the hyperechoic medulla and the cortex around it and the center where you see two vessels and the two wings of the seagull we sometimes can also see often can also see the right adrenal from here and metastasis though is more common in the left adrenal than in the right adrenal but we can see both the adrenal from here we also quickly look at the celiac lymph nodes we look at the left gastric lymph nodes and we look at the the liver for any metastasis so we see the left lobe of the liver segment 2 and segment 3 we look at the left hepatic vein we look at the umbilical part of the portal vein we look at the ligamentum teres which goes down and we look at the ligamentum venosum which goes up here uh, sorry uh, up here and ligamentum venosum will drain into the point where the left hepatic and the middle hepatic veins join so this is the ligamentum venosum here so between the ligamentum venosum and the probe is the caudate lobe and a little bit rotation there we will show you the subphrenic lymph nodes in this case but otherwise you will see the keva this is the IVC is this part clear can you just briefly show the segment two minutes so the segments very briefly are uh, so for the segments you must remember that we are looking from behind and to the right of the patient so it is not a truly coronal sagittal or axial section so it is a oblique view so what we do for the segments is there is no clear demarcation we are looking across the the radiological segments and there is no line put on the human being from inside so we if i can slowly slightly increase the view the most consistent would be the portal vein radical so if you put some doppler over the uh, the thing and show us the reduce the Doppler gain please so we can see the B2 segments or the segment 2 portal vein radical on the right of the screen and we can see the third segment B3 radical on the left of the screen so what is above normally is segment 2 with its own uh, conjunction of portal vein radicals and biliary radicals when we push down 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 with the big wheel down that is we angle the probe up we start looking into segment 3 this is segment 3 with its portal vein and its biliary radicals then we have to rotate right or clockwise to see the two coming together and joining so now I am rotating and you see these two come together so I am sorry this is segment 3 ducts and portal vein I'm sorry this is segment 2 and you see they will come close together the left hepatic vein has gone in between 
So if you see the portal vein in cross section, you will see the hepatic veins in long axis and vice versa. Now as I rotate, see that they, these two will come together like this. And so the segment 2 and segment 3 portal vein have come together to form, this is called the UP or the umbilical part of the portal vein, which in the fetal circulation links by the ligamentum teres uh, down below, which is the site of the falciform ligament and the round ligament and also area of evaluation for rex shunt for these patients. Now as I rotate, so what is above, this is segment 4. So this is segment 4 because we are looking on one side of it and in US from the gastric part we see a disproportionate a big part of segment 4. If I pull you up, we can see we just saw the ligamentum venosum here and ligamentum venosum you, the mark is the junction of the middle and the left hepatic vein where they join the IVC is where the ligamentum venosum will join. So you can see very nicely the middle hepatic vein and the ligamentum venosum going here. This is the remnant of the ductus venosus which in the fetal circulation will carry blood from here across here into the heart and then I will show you the remaining fetal circulation. What is between here is the caudate lobe or the segment 1. If I now push down, down, down and go back on this lobe which we decided was segment 4, I continue to rotate to the right or clockwise to reach the liver hilum. And now you see that this vein which is the portal left portal vein becomes superficial, comes practically under the under surface of the liver and you see the left hepatic artery also and then it gradually joins the main portal vein like this and this is the area of the hilum you see certain lymph nodes on top so the hyla is a bit distorted and if I show you the portal vein the part of the vein which goes down is the right portal vein and the area of the segment 4 the, this is the lymph node, this is the segment 4 which is overlying the hyla is the quadrate lobe of or part of the segment 4 of the liver. If you pull up you can actually see part of segment 8 also but since there are accessory veins in between you can never be very sure that you have truly seen middle hepatic vein. So I just mentioned that we see the superior part of the right lobe of the liver and leave it at that. Uh, Sorry, uh, Malay, now can we pull back yeah. the mediastinum? Yeah, yeah, anything? can you? Doctor, we have got another Dr. 10 Puri? minutes to show mediastinum. Dr. Puri, anything? Okay, so for mediastinum, since we are centered on the keva, we will take the keva into the right atrium. So this is what the TEE people call the mid-esophagus bicaval view. And you see the bicava or the two kevas here the one which is closest to you is the left atrium and if I rotate to the right that is the right atrium. Now for imaging of the mediastinum the basic steps are for me is that you start in the stomach and you pull back and you rotate every 3 centimeters 180 degrees or 360 degrees from the outer to the outer. And for that you have to be very careful because when you rotate the scope has a tendency to come out. So you look at the scope markings at the patient's mouthpiece it should stay stable as you rotate. So I shall just show you one maneuver of rotation which is going from here and see that my arm has gone back so much to the outer and then we rotate, 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 rotate now to the right going over the lungs over the heart to the outer on other side which is at this point difficult for me. So we go from outer to the outer but as you see my scope has come out so let me go down again. So Dr. Malay can you point out the structures here? Please? Yeah this is the this is the uh, IVC. IVC? This is right the atrium, superior vena cava, superior vena cava, hmm. this is left atrium, pulmonary artery. Yes, and you can also see for the endoscopist, it is very important that you pick up a patent foramen ovale.
So this is the interatrial septum. And this can we inject agitated saline just 2 ml because that will appear in the right atrium. And, and normally see the, you must uh, see the bulge of the interatrial septum. The left side is the part which has a higher pressure. So the convexity is towards the right side. And then you have a muscular part. How do I increase it? You have a muscular part of the interatrial septum. This is called the septum secundum. And you have a membranous part. This is called the septum primum. And this encircles the fossa ovalis. And if you have a patent foramen ovale, you actually Inject don't need a saline here. You don't need a saline here. You can see a patent foramen ovale as flailing of the septum IV. primum over IV the IV. septum secundum. The importance for us is that these patients have a higher chance of a right to left embolization after glue injection. So for us, if you are doing an US, it is wise to see. We will also see many other structures here in the, in, in the right side of the heart, which is the entry of the cava. Sorry, so just Correct. allow me because I am not very familiar yeah. with this. Hello, uh, Dr. Malay. Yeah, just one second. We are injecting something, some normal saline. So before that I can show them something? Yeah. Inject. So, so no, before if that. So you see the eustachian valve here? Yes. And you see these little, so we have injected the bubbles. So this is the right atrium into which they have come. And you see that the no, intact saline bubble should not last beyond, uh, last into the pulmonary circulation. So they should not appear on the left atrium. And this is a more objective way to confirm a, a right to left shunt or a patent foramen ovale. But with the US magnification, you can actually see septum primum and secundum separating and it is reasonably common. So it is okay to make a good note of it. And hepatopulmonary syndrome, yes. we use it as a detection. Hmm. US for detection of hepatopulmonary syndrome, if less than three cycles they appear in the right atrium, that is a good way to detect hepatopulmonary syndrome. So we were talking of the fetal circulation. What you have here is called the eustachian well, which in the fetal circulation will, de will deflect the blood from here across the fossa ovalis into the left side bypassing the lung. So this is a good curiosity. Uh, if this part is very prominent, we call it a Chiari network and this can be associated with infective endocarditis. So on US, we can also look at right heart failure because in general, in general, the size of the right atrium is no more than two-third of the left atrium. If the right atria is enlarged by eyeballing, we can see the part, the, 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 the right atrial enlargement. And this wall of the right atrium in diastole should be less than five millimeter thick. If it is thicker, then we again think of right heart failure. All this is important to us in gastroenterology. We can also Dr. carefully look here. And if Dr. you see... Dr. Malay? Yeah. yeah. What will be the... Sorry, Dr. Bhatia. Please. What will be the, uh, uh, the, the presentation after this? Is this going to be a presentation or a live case after this? We are going to have a short case of a, uh, gastrojejunostomy, 10 minutes, and then you can have a lecture. Dr. Okay. Welles lecture is there, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would request that, you know, because we are having a lunch break here, so maybe in 10-15 uh, minutes, we can start the GJ. Okay. Or we can, can we keep the lecture after this, Dr. Wallace lecture, 17 minutes, and then we start the GJ, what do you think? Yeah. So, no, you, you can start, uh, because we have, uh, uh, so, so you Okay, can after 10 minutes, you start the GJ then, okay? So, so what do you want? You, uh, I think after Dr. Bhatia demonstrated this, we can go to the GJ if you are okay with it. We will go. go. We will finish off in 10 minutes because patients are fasting. So we no have problem. Some, no problem. So we will thank you. We will do that within 10 minutes. Okay. No problem. Sorry Dr. Bhatia. No problem. No problem at all. So this is the opening of the IVC and if you look again, this is the opening of the coronary sinus. So just wanted to show you that you don't confuse. Uh, sorry, this is the coronary sinus. Again, very important for us because in right heart failure, it dilates to more than 10 millimeter. And you can see the coronary sinus in cross section here between the atria and the ventricle. And this is just to show you that the opening of the IVC and the opening of the coronary sinus with its Thebesian valve are pretty close together. And this is the coronary sinus which you see in cross section here between the atria and the ventricle. And if there is a right heart failure, again, this is a soft sign for the endosonographer that 10 millimeter more coronary sinus is of interest. So normally, 
for endosonographer we do pick up a lot of pathologies in the heart so it is okay to have a five minute look now dr malay i am back to the left atrium left ventricle and you can show us the mitral valve sorry this is the mitral valve you have the left atrium above left ventricle below and you have the right ventricular outflow track which is being pointed out here so this is the pulmonary trunk now if i trace the pulmonary trunk here now you see what is called the subcarinal space which is the left atrium below in a very nutshell and obviously the uh, right pulmonary artery above dr malay will tell you the detailed boundaries here but then on the we right, don't have time on the right side if you take the right uh, pulmonary artery you see divide into above and below and what is below is the is the marker for bronchus intermedius so that's the limit of the uh, sub carinal space on the right side what is below this level is the stations 8 and station 9 lymph nodes which you cannot distinguish unless there is pleural effusion for the endosonographer the stations along the lower paraesophageal areas will mean n2 disease for a lung cancer if the cancer is ipsilateral if contralateral and n1 if it is ipsilateral if i see lymph nodes here this is ats station 7 the subcarinal space then it is n2 no lymph node whether it is right sided lung cancer or left sided lung cancer now the structures that you see here are the subcarinal space the left atrium the right pulmonary artery the aortic outflow tract the aortic valve you can see the coronary is the arteries and many other things also which i am not going into if you pull up over the subcarinal okay. space you reach the carina or the trachea and if i take it down the bronchi take off at 45 degrees like this this is the left bronchus the trachea and the right bronchus so this is the area of the subcarinal space and what you see behind it are the reverberation artifacts of the air and the tracheal cartilages this is the trachea now remember that the orientation in mediastinum is very simple if you rotate the scope to the left you go to the left because you are looking from front to behind and to the left lies the descending thoracic aorta this is the aorta and what is behind the aorta is the left lung so if you have left pleural effusion left sided lung diseases you will see it behind the aorta with the descending mediastinal uh, thoracic aorta as the window to the left lung anything to add here dr malle please yeah yeah means uh... so, so from here you withdraw the scope till you reach the aortic arch and then you turn 60 90 degrees to the right big wheel down and this is the ap window area can you freeze it dr malle please now very broadly we have called it ap window area but for want of sorry so 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 this is the ap window area cursor so this is the aortic arch this is the left pulmonary artery this is the area virtually of ligamentum arteriosum and this is the area from the top of the aortic arch to the top of the left pulmonary artery medially the left margin of the trachea is station 4r 4l or the left lower paratracheal lymph nodes what is here from the top of the aortic arch to the bottom of the aortic arch is station 6 or the pre aortic lymph nodes here which we can sometimes target from above what is from the lower border of the aortic arch to the upper border of the left pulmonary artery below the ligamentum arteriosum is the station 5 the true ap window so in this view we can see four lymph node station american thoracic society 4l 5 and 6 and the significance of these lymph nodes is that if you have a left sided lung cancer they are n1 nodes if you have a right sided lung cancer they are n2 nodes if you find them so you must also in your mind know the uh, the oncological significance of these rotating to the right you reach the trachea you see nothing and if you rotate further to the right you reach the azygous vein here i think vikram we will have to wind up, wind up. Okay, so we will done. take the uh, we will do the fnac at other place because hmm. we have another case waiting hmm. okay. of gastrogenostomy so uh, here right now can i remove okay can you i remove please remove? so i am in the neck and i'll remove
Thank you. So we can take questions while they are getting the patient ready. We will be ready in two minutes. So and, uh, I'll take some I questions in the yeah. meantime while you shift the patient. I think Piyush, uh, you don't have audience here, so but unfortunately our patient is sedated. So we are proceeding with the gastrojejunostomy mm -hmm. uh, right now. And uh, in the meantime, we have two questions, few questions. You can please take up the questions. So, Vikram, very nice question, very, very crisp and clear. Uh, we should know, uh, like, uh, which are not reachable, which station nodes are not reachable Amar, by US. Are so, uh, if I start from the neck, the 2R, 2L should be done, can be done by US but can be done by ultrasound from above. The 4L is classically reachable, 4R traditionally not reachable but practically we can always see them above the azygous arch and rotate the scope to the right and target them so they are not without our reach. Station 6 or the pre-aortic, if they are large, sometimes you can puncture from below the aorta, sometimes not. Station 5 nodes, if they are very big, they sort of pout into the, between the outer and the pulmonary artery, you can puncture them, so of, sometimes not. So station 4L is always accessible, station 4R to me is mostly accessible, station 5 and 6 may sometimes be accessible. Station 7 is very easy for the endosonographer, they are the subcarinal lymph nodes, always N2 for a lung cancer, regardless of the size. Station 8 and 9 are accessible, not accessible to the EBUS. And station, the lymph node stations beyond the pleura, which are station 10, 11, 12, 13, obviously they are beyond our forte. But we don't normally need them to stage the lung cancer because they are within the pleural reflection. So for the patient it is irrelevant if we can't reach them. And in the abdomen obviously we can reach the celiac, the left gastric, the splenic hilar, the periportal, the subphrenic the retrocardiac and the left adrenal and also the right adrenal which I could not show you how to see and obviously small uh, liver metastasis. So practically everything is reachable what is of consequence to EOS. And uh, little diversion, what about duplication cyst in the mediastinum, what's your, what's your take on duplication ah, I cyst? I said, station 10, 11 we can't do but they are not relevant because they are within the pleural reflection so it's okay. The right side is at the station 10, 11, 12, better than the Yes, yes. Sorry, you were saying? Duplication cyst, uh -huh. like uh, should should we be puncturing them, should we leave them because, um, uh, you know, it, so the beginners, you know, they see a cyst and they want to puncture, so I think a word of question from expert. So, no puncturing of the duplication cyst. Some recent case reports that they are safe if you give antibiotics, but no, you don't need to puncture them, number one. Number two, there is a significant risk of mediastinitis. Uh, you can confuse Pani them with a leomyoma being in the second uh, sono, sono layer, but there are ways to demonstrate the cystic contents inside, the location, the increase through transmission, the contrast and so on and so forth. So, uh, you can diagnose a duplication cyst on simple B mode Doppler contrast and harmonic, so you don't need to puncture them. It's not safe. Dr. Malay has started the GJ, so I think the. No, camera you, I will take uh, two minutes. You can answer one or two more questions, okay. please. It's Karvatko. Mm -hmm. So, uh, next we have a 70 year old gentleman. Uh, who presented to us with a complaint of uh, weight loss, intermittent painless jaundice along with melina on and off and recurrent nausea vomiting for past one month. So imaging was done, CT was suggestive of a periampillary mass infiltrating into the duodenum with hepatic mats and retroperitoneal lymph nodes. Upper GI endoscopy was also done which was suggestive of D1, D2 growth beyond which scope Suction could not be negotiated. Further, the patient also presented with a fever, chills, rigors two weeks back and uh, uh, for that, uh, the patient was in cholangitis and we did a US guided Apparent. polydoco duodenostomy. Now, the further plan is uh, to do US guided gastrojejunostomy to relieve gastric outlet obstruction. So, I would like to request Dr. Malay sir to demonstrate the procedure. 
So we are, we are, though we have intubated the patient, we have a small problem is that there is a lot of gastric residue in this case. So we are facing a small problem of removing this gastric residue which should have been emptied out. I will just suck for one minute, otherwise uh, what we will do is we will probably record it and the audience if there is coming back. So Rajesh, what do you suggest? We go ahead or we... No, it's always better if there is no gastric residue that is important. Okay. But let's while doing the procedure focus the jejunal loop and keep on aspirating it. Because if you see most of the contents are liquid and I think by aspirating them we may be able to achieve. So if you see on endosono most of the content appears to be liquid. Liquid, okay. So we can suck it, we can focus the, can we put the 200 ml of the water into the jejunal tube. So this is the modified version, we are using the uh, naso biliary drain. Is that right, Dr. Malay? Yeah, we are using the naso. you should have an e-pass tube by Taka Itoi. Uh, but yes, we can use the naso biliary drain or we can use the uh, NJ tube. Yeah, this is one of the loops. So this, this loop, by chance, we, we didn't pass in, but we already find that the tube is going into this loop. This is so good. This is the loop into which this is already good. good loop. And we can probably. So have you passed some fluid? Yeah, it's already there. Very good. So this yeah, loop. This so we will just confirm that this is the tube. Uh, have you pushed some water? water. Are you putting some diluted uh, methylene blue or? Ranjit, put dilute methylene blue. So, dal diya kya? Have you put in? Yeah, it's visible. So okay. Malay has nicely focused the. Uh, I, I think it should be the D4 or the proximal DJ flexure. So we'll just see on the fluoroscopy where we are. Fluoro, we'll just see what is the relationship of our scope with the tube. So my suggestion to Dr. Malay because this water, have we given the buscopan to the patient? We have not yet given buscopan. The patient is slightly honest. And we should do little early, otherwise the water will empty. Okay, now, now, give the so stand. Let's complete the procedure and then no, discuss. I think then that discuss later. Better. So, will have, uh, we are using the hot exhaust. Hot exhaust, yes. Uh, can we put the water, please? No, focus nice. This is not focus. First, pehle wala loop karo. Ah, this is right for us. Or karo. Kick karo. तुम्हारा उल्टा चल रहा है ना? हाँ मुझे पता है। फोकस करो थोड़ा सा। पानी डालो। हो जाएगा। Take it to the loop nearby। लाभ ये देखा है। Exio। So we are ready with the exios। We are now going to puncture it। We are apply color Doppler। But there seems to be no vessel, major vessel between us and the। So before it goes out, we will is it close to the tube? Yes, it is close to the tube. So the first step is to make the tip of the stent wet. Now, will you use it? The second step is to fix it. Okay. The third step is to Fix. Can we put water? Water, water. Plate You know the functioning of this? You know the functioning? No, no, first let's take it out. So the first is, let us fix it. Let us fix it, this. Yes, now this is fixed. Now, this is okay. Now you have to release. Can somebody focus it here? Let's focus the loop nicely. This is a pancreas, you know, this is not right. Little bit more better. Go more close. More close loop. So we lost it because, uh, but I believe we, we uh, this is not, this is pancreatic window. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I will pull it back. This is the pancreas. I will decrease it because I will be going in the intrapancreatic area. What has happened? Have we zoomed it? No. Something. Uh, no. I. Wait a minute. It's 
No, 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 no. Hmm. It's something zoom has. It has unnecessarily been zoomed. It's okay. There's no problem. No, no, no. Wait, wait. Zoom mode. Zoom. Yeah, I understood. But it's okay. Wait. You can focus the loop. First, focus. No, no. Scope to Iran, is it? No, can can, no. can we have the attaché engineer, please? For a second, can we have some focus. small problem. We will go back. Tab tak loop focus karo. Isko unzoom kar do. Unzoom. Isko zara. Attaché engineer. No, no, I don't want this. It has by chance become zoomed. I want to reset it. Start again. Okay. So we have to either close. Okay. So now it has come. Now I'll push it in. This is stomach. I will go below the pancreas. This is I am gone below the pancreas, and this is the place where I am trying to go. This is the loop I want to enter. So the only thing is now I will zoom it. And do you think this is okay or? Let us do suction. Do suction because we have to suction. Focus the tube a little bit. Yeah, yeah can we? We can see the tube. Is okay. Yes. Yeah, this is the tube. This is the good window. Yes. You can go like this. Do suction. Do first suction. I'm doing suction. Is working? Suction. What exuus lagao? It will not be. Exuus is channel. Ah, to usko hata ke suction karlo. You should come. Ah, this is okay. You can go. But I, I prefer you should. Yeah, this is very good window now. You have. I think we can do it now. Yeah. Just make it unlock it. Go in. it is better if you if you do have a suction do yeah, suction yeah, do we will suction remove first. it do the just, suction just 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 keep the loop in the view just keep the loop in the view i will remove it cuz shall i remove no, no, it this is okay now this is okay this is okay i will remove the uh, yeah put the water little bit do the suction yeah this is absolutely fine now you go in yeah, do a little bit more suction Okay. Yes, this is okay. This, yeah, this is the other way. Yeah, this is okay. I want to put it in this way or this way. Yeah, yeah, this way. But you should close. Come close. Do a little bit more suction. Your scope is in the long. Can you see the fluoro, please? Long. You see, a yeah, scope is in the long loop, mm. so a little bit reduced. Make okay. it in a straight way. Yeah, this is better. Mm. This is better. Yeah. Better. No, no. Can you pull the scope little bit and adjust little bit? Yeah, this is coming. Can you make the patient supine, or this is okay? Yeah. No, patient is relaxing. Twenty minutes. Supine कर लोगे तो आपको और better हो जाएगा. आपका scope straight हो जाएगा. Can we do it supine? Just yeah. see them. Do little bit supine. Do it supine. Yeah, don't lose that window. Yeah. Pull the scope little bit. Can you show the? Yeah. Can you pull the scope little bit? Yeah. Yes. Now this is no. This will be better. Don't worry. Everything will settle down. Now. This is the other way now. Your problem. Yeah. You see? Yeah. This is better. You see? Now focus. Yeah. Can you see the tube also? Yes. Now just find a good window. I think this is okay. Yeah. Now so you have to puncture it like this. So make first. Uh, can you put the water a little bit more water? Yes. Can you put the water in the tube? And it should go in the straight. Uh, 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 Cautery is attached. Yes, it is attached. Yeah. You have to go in. Yeah. Oh, there is a blood. Yeah. Go in. Go in. Go in. Go yeah. in. Go in. You are in. Yeah. Just wait. Just wait now. Just no, just 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 wait. Lock it. Lock this. Unlock this. Listen. Just focus. Now. Can yes. you put the water? Yes. Yeah. Now just now. No, no, not this. Pull this. Pull this above. 
Yeah, pull. Yeah, pull. You see now the flanges has come. No, no, it's just wait. Yeah, yeah. Make, yeah, make the work. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. No, it's okay. The stand has already opened. Can you show the floor? Yes. Just. Yeah, just wait now. Now, just wait. This is okay. Now, you have to, this is already locked. Now, you have to pull little bit in, unlock. Is this okay? Is this better? No, no, I, I will show you what to do. Done. This is okay. Lock. Now you have to release again the second one inside the scope only. Yeah, release the second one. Release the release completely. Release. 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 Yes. Is released? Yes. Now what you have to do? I will do unlocking. You pull and you rotate your scope clockwise a little bit. See the, put the air inside. Yeah. Rotate to the right. Push out, push out, push out. It's done. Hey, push out. Yeah, it's already done. Okay? Can you see now? Now we have to see that we are in or not. Do the suction. Can you put the wire? Can you put something? Yeah, we can see the sheet. Yes, we can see the sheet. Is that okay? Now just show the just show the Can you see the sheet there? Now take inside this. Take your scope inside this. The USB scope will less likely to go, but uh, we take the upper GI scope, we dilate with the balloon. Can you give the upper GI with the uh, CRE balloon of 10 millimeter or 12 millimeter? Upper GI scope with the 12 millimeter or 10 millimeter hurricane balloon. So we or will CRE do balloon. this. We will do this. You can start with the lecture of Dr. Wallace because we are sorry we are late. And uh, so we will suck the, the rest of the contents and we will finish it off. Dr. Malay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, when when you will show us the endoscopic view? Okay. We will no, just, just quickly show minutes. this. No. If you can. No, no. Yeah. We can put in the endoscope. Can we put the gastroscope and you know yes, just? Yes, yes. Is it because we couldn't see the endoscopic view when you were deploying it? So it's deployed in the bowel. So okay. it is always better. What you do? You release the distal flange, and release the proximal flange inside the scope. And then push with the pusher and do a clockwise movement of your scope. That will make your stent out of the scope. So this is the best way because this is a two centimeter uh, lumen opposing stent. It is difficult to see endoscopically while doing that. Sometimes there is a possibility either the stent will come out from the intestine. So it is always better the proximal flange should always be released inside the scope. Moreover, I believe clockwise rotation and slight uh -huh. pullback of the scope is also required. Gastroscope is here? Gastroscope. So you start with the lecture, please, where Dr. Piyush, because uh, half okay. an hour and 5 o'clock is our deadline to send Dr. Mohan Ramchandani. And before okay. we send him, we have to uh -huh. extract a lot from Dr. Mohan Ramchandani and we will show you show because, okay, it has come. I have removed my gloves. Uh, Dr. Puri, can you show the just two minutes the endoscopy? Is it what endoscopy? will be the next case, Dr. Malay, after Malay this, Malay after the Dr. Wallace lecture? Can we show the endoscopic view? Then we can start the lecture. Turn on my side patient. Suction on it. Suction on in here. We have syringe there, 
Senin de ne? Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, we can see the strand now. Excellent, excellent. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. I was a little bit concerned, you know, we didn't saw the strand. So, excellent demonstration. Thank you. Okay. So, let's suck this fluid. Here, then. Wire, eh? Uh, Dr. Khalid, Dr. Mazin, please stay there because after that there will be live transmission after the Dr. Wallace lecture. Hello, my name is Michael Wallace. I'm the Chair of Gastroenterology at Sheikh Shahbud Medical City. And I'm very happy to give this talk today on advances in interventional endoscopic ultrasound. Um, there's a very long list, and in fact, a list that's growing quite rapidly on uh, uh, US interventions. We've really seen in the last 10 years remarkable advances in this area, beginning with some basic things that we do, management of pseudocysts and walled-off necrosis, but increasingly draining other areas and gaining access to other extraluminal structures, the bile duct and gallbladder through direct US puncture, abscess drainage in any region uh, in proximity to the gastrointestinal tract, upper or lower, management of varices, and even arterial interventions such as injection of aneurysms, delivery of coils, and as we've all seen, uh, rapidly expanding the lumen to lumen um, uh, apposition with the lumen opposing stents and some recent advances in devices such as magnetic uh, apposition devices. I won't uh, cover too much on US portal vein uh, and portal vein sampling today, but this is another very important area. What really changed this was lumen opposing metal stents. This really allowed us to connect two lumens together safely and securely, beginning with pseudocyst. But then once we learned how to do this, we realized that we could drain almost any other object or importantly, connect two lumens together, such as creating a gastrojojinostomy. There are now at least three lumen opposing metal stents on the market uh, that are shown here. Um, when we think about draining um, and access to the bile duct, the most common, uh, the most common application, uh, we can, uh, uh, the complexities really come down to whether we are draining, where we're accessing, uh, what's our approach, and what's our technique. And as you can see, there's multiple options in each category, and that's why you get a very large number of options for example, draining an inaccessible uh, bile duct. I want to show just some examples of this. So we're all familiar with pseudocysts and walled off necrosis drainage. Uh, here's just a nice graphic of how we uh, deliver the lumen opposing metal stents into an area of walled off necrosis. It is important to remember that we don't need to use these uh, lumen opposing metal stents for simple pseudocysts. Uh, those can be drained very effectively and much less expensively with plastic stents um, if there's a pure liquid or a very small amount of debris, typically a less than 30% solid material. When we think about accessing um, uh, the, the, the biliary tree uh, compared to the current standard in an inaccessible bile duct would be a percutaneous bile duct drain. They are very effective. They can be done relatively quickly, but they're very uh, difficult from the patient perspective. The patient, it's painful. The patient has to carry an external drain with them uh, that presents many problems uh, socially and, um, and medically. So can we do this through a direct US puncture? And the clear answer is yes. This is a, a paper just from about five years ago looking at efficacy and safety of US guided biliary drainage in comparison to percutaneous drainage yeah. when ERCP yeah. fails. 
And this was a meta-analysis of multiple uh, uh, series um, going back to uh, 10 years ago uh, now. Um, and what they showed is that, first of all, uh, the procedure is, is quite safe. Um, uh, it uh, has a relatively uh, a comparable uh, complication rate to, um, to percutaneous. Um, and so overall, it's, it, it's quite equivalent in terms of its efficacy or technical success. The biggest difference um, is clinical success. These, uh, these uh, tend to uh, work very well. Uh, overall, the uh, meta-analysis favors an EOS-guided approach. Um, uh, compared to a percutaneous uh, approach. And most importantly, it favors an EOS approach in terms of adverse events. Uh, the pain associated with a percutaneous strain, leakage of bile around the liver is very painful. Uh, all of these favor an EOS guided approach. Uh, what about um, uh, going directly into a dilated bile duct, for example, in a uh, in an obstructing pancreas tumor where the bile duct is not accessible, or even if it is accessible, uh, is it more effective to directly drain uh, for a colodoco duodenostomy uh, using a large lumen opposing metal stent? Again, uh, this has uh, been shown to be efficacious. We don't have a large series yet comparing this to traditional approaches, but in the case of an inaccessible papilla or a failed cannulation, uh, this certainly is a very good option. Um, what about the gallbladder? So gallstones are one of the most common um, indications for a general, a general surgeon. Can we start to drain the gallbladder directly, either in acute cholecystitis or uh, even uh, considering just symptomatic gallstones? Well, most of the early data on this uh, has been done in patients who are high-risk surgical patients, where the surgeon says, no, I don't really want to drain this right now, but the patient needs drainage. Again, a percutaneous drain is a possibility that has all the same pain and discomfort uh, as uh, a percutaneous bile duct drain. So in this study, um, uh, 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 they compared EOS guided cholecysto, uh, cholecystostomy uh, versus endoscopic transpapillary cholecystostomy for acute cholecystitis in high risk uh, patients. Obviously, getting a biliary drain uh, through the bile duct, through the ampulla, into the cystic duct has its own set of challenges and does sometimes require, require a direct cholangioscopy. Um, so again, one more area where we can uh, directly drain uh, the gallbladder. And again, here is another example of a paper published on U.S. guided gallbladder drainage in patients with acute cholecystitis and high-risk surgery. Um, using the electrocautery enhanced lumen opposing metal stents. So we're at a relatively early stage of the medical literature on this. We don't have uh, large controlled trials, but it certainly looks to be feasible, especially in those patients that uh, are poor candidates for surgery. Here's just an example of this. Uh, you can see uh, the gallbladder, very thick gallbladder wall, perhaps some pericholocystic fluid. Uh, there's sludge material in the gallbladder. Uh, lumen opposing metal stent is punctured directly from the duodenum. We see pus then draining in, in the lower left panel. And we see the nice uh, CT scan showing the lumen apposition between the gallbladder and the duodenal lumen. Uh, what about converting a percutaneous drain to an internal drain? This is a popular option for hospitals that have traditionally been doing percutaneous. Uh, drainage, uh, but they're unable to remove that long-term percutaneous drain. So again, just some nice examples of uh, converting uh, uh, that internal drain uh, now into a transluminal, um, in this case, a, 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 a transduodenal um, uh, drain. One of the things that we're increasingly beginning to see in the literature is other devices to create lumen apposition. We are fundamentally limited with lumen opposing metal stents with the diameter of the stents. We now have stents up to 20 millimeters. However, a surgical anastomosis, for example, a bariatric surgical anastomosis is typically at least four centimeters in diameter. Can we create larger safe anastomoses, for example, with magnetic devices? 
Magnets have been used in medicine and surgery for decades. Can we deliver a mag magnetic device that forms uh, a, a circle, or in this case, a square, uh, place it in the small intestine, and then uh, connect that to a magnet uh, on the stomach side. And we're increasingly seeing these types of applications. This actually is data from over 10 years ago from Chris Thompson's uh, group showing these self-assembling you know, magnets for endoscopy. Um, and this literature continues to evolve. We don't yet have clinical systems that are available. Uh, there's ongoing animal testing, but I think this is an area that is likely to be of some value uh, in this setting. Uh, U.S. guided uh, gastroenterostomy, a GJ anastomosis or gastroduodenal anastomosis is now becoming mainstream. There are many different approaches to this procedure, but in the patient who presents with a pancreatic cancer, with an obstructed duodenum or a, a, a distal gastric cancer, um, uh, this is a, a quite good option for patients other than a surgical gastrojejunostomy. Uh, in the first four or five years of this, uh, uh, there were many different and somewhat complex techniques um, to access the, the downstream small intestine. You can see some of them here, even placing water-filled balloons that then became a target to puncture, and then a, a wire might be fed. But nowadays, it's been simplified considerably uh, by filling the lumen directly with fluid, uh, either through direct uh, installation through the endoscope or through a type of a nasobiliary catheter, and then puncturing and delivering a lumen opposing metal stent, essentially freehand without uh, any guide wire. And I'll just show some examples of this um, uh, uh, if we can here. It looks like the, the video is not playing, so we'll skip over that. Um, I do want to touch on a new role for EUS, which is endohepatology, a new paradigm. So in this case, uh, we, we know that we can do liver biopsy, for example, uh, through an echo endoscope. But increasingly, we're starting to see uh, broader applications, delivering coils into uh, esophageal and gastric varices, particularly large fundic gastric varices. And recently, uh, measuring the portal pressure uh, and the hepatic vein pressure to measure the portal gradient. Well, why would you consider EUS when we already have other ways to do this? Well, if you're thinking about working up a patient with a chronic liver disease, you have multiple things that need to be done. You want to do an endoscopy to look for gastric and esophageal varices. You want to do ultrasound and elastography uh, and possibly liver biopsy for fibrosis. You want to measure the portal pressure gradient, which is typically done by a transjugular approach. Uh, you want to stage. Uh, liver lesions, perhaps do a diagnostic paracentesis if there's ascites, or local treatment for hepatocellular carcinoma. Those all have traditionally required multiple different approaches, multiple different, different physicians between GI, radiology, interventional radiology, and surgery. EUS, on the other hand, can essentially accomplish all of those tasks. Um, what are the different things that you can do through uh, EUS? Liver biopsy, paracentesis, treat varices, measure portal pressure, you can do elastography and examination of the liver parenchyma and lesions. You can drain liver cysts and other interventions. This literature is now rapidly emerging. This is a, uh, the simplest of these, which is a liver biopsy. We know that with the new Francine type needles that are now widely available, we get good core biopsies. This was a retrospective analysis of 110 US guided liver biopsies as part of a multi-center study. Uh, it compared to 23 patients with a percutaneous liver biopsy and 38 with a transjugular liver biopsy. And overall, uh, what it showed is that the length of the tissue, you know, basic technical parameters, get very large uh, uh, pieces comparable um, uh, to uh, traditional methods. Uh, you get the number of portal triads, complete portal triads, again shown here, 17 portal triads equivalent, if not actually higher, uh, than other methods. Um, so it appears to be very technically uh, feasible uh, and effective. What about measuring the portal pressure? We know that an elevated portal pressure gradient is the best predictor of the risk of variceal bleeding, but that requires an indirect measure and a uh, of measuring the hepatic vein. 
and where the catheter is then wedged into the hepatic vein to try to create a single conduit of pressure between the portal vein and now the wedged catheter, and then create the, the gradient or measure the gradient. Um, so can we do that? Now, also here we talk about treatment of gastric varices. Uh, so we know that we can inject glue, we can inject coils, and now the preferred therapy that's emerging is the combination of coils followed by glue or some other um, tissue, uh, uh, tissue adhes adhesive material uh, that causes a contained thrombus. The advantage of delivering coils first is that it reduces the chance of embolization of the glue. Uh, this is a, a trial of patients uh, with a suspected portal hypertension who needed coil therapy. It was a randomized trial of 60 patients undergoing either coils alone or coils plus cyanacrylate glue. It was very effective, particularly the combination. 86% had immediate disappearance of varices. Rebleeding was much lower with the combination coils and glue, and the number of reinterventions. Uh, or in this case, uh, the lack of re-interventions was better uh, with the combination therapy. There was also another systematic review and meta-analysis, 23 patients over 850 studies with a generally very high efficacy rate, 97%, uh, a complete obliteration rate of 86%, low recurrence rate, and relatively low, although there was some early rebleeding and some late rebleeding. In terms of pressure measurement, this was really first done just about five years ago, um, uh, puncturing the portal vein with an EOS needle and then transducing uh, that pressure directly. Uh, so you can measure both the portal pressure. Uh, it's often done in the intrahepatic portion of the, the, the portal vein so that there's some tamponade of any blood that might leak out. Uh, adverse event rates were very low. In fact, there are no adverse event rates. Uh, the time uh, to do the exam is relatively quick, less than 30 minutes, and the findings correlated very well with, with clinical and endoscopic parameters of portal hypertension. And most patients can have the US guided liver biopsy at the same time. So this concept of a one-stop shop, do an endoscopy, look for varices, get a liver biopsy, measure the portal pressure if needed, treat a varices is I think very appealing concept. Here's how it's done. So the, uh, there, we need to learn a little bit of the liver and liver vasculature anatomy, uh, which we may not be as familiar with as endosonographers, but it's relatively easy to learn. We can identify the uh, typically the middle hepatic vein right at the gastroesophageal junction. The 25 gauge needle is punctured and filled with saline. And then the back of our EOS needle is connected to a standard, or in this case, a novel uh, pressure transducer. Um, then the portal vein is, um, is identified uh, at the uh, hepatic hilum. We want to pass the needle through some liver parenchyma in both cases. So any small amount of blood leakage is usually tamponaded uh, by, the, uh, by the liver itself. Uh, here's the proprietary uh, small pressure gauge that is actually administered now with the uh, approved, this is an FDA approved device. You can attach this pressure gauge you do several measurements. Uh, you typically flush with saline and then let the pressure equilibrate. Here measuring at the mid axillary line. Uh, you do that in the first of the hepatic vein and then the portal vein and get the difference between the two. So to summarize, we're seeing this rapid expansion of US guided transluminal uh, interventions that have really revolutionized non-surgical management. The management of fluid collections such as pancreatic fluid collections, abscesses, obstructions with uh, uh, essentially gastrojejunal bypass uh, done endoscopically, management of bleeding such as variceal bleeding, and measurement and risk stratification of cirrhosis. I want to thank you all very much. It's been a pleasure to talk with you today. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person with you, but know that it'll be a fantastic meeting. Thank, thank you. you, Dr. Michael, for this uh, excellent uh, uh, presentations. Uh, can we take one or two Hello. questions? Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, Doctor, uh, how are you? Thank you for this uh, good lecture. I'd ask uh, some question regarding the uh, one question regarding the procedure of putting coils within the vessels here during US. Uh, can you express some information about putting coils within the vasculature? Doctor Michael, are you with us? Uh, Dr. Khalid, Dr. Michael is working in uh, 
SSMC today. So this is uh, recorded. This is a recorded. This is a recorded one actually. I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, we, we can ask this question to the to the faculty there, Dr. Khalid. Once they are online, just see whether the transmission has started from there. Yeah, yeah, sir. We, we are ready with the question. case, sir. Uh, we are getting ready with the case. With Dr. Mohan about the US guided coiling. I think they got one case of fundal varics, I suppose. Yes, sir. They got one case of US guided coiling with glue of fundal varics. I think they are going to demonstrate that. I don't know when, but I have heard that there is one case which is there. Can you start the transmission there? So we can go for the live. Yeah, let me see. Show me what is they are showing there. Transmission, do Yeah, yeah. From India. Camera, do yeah, I think I think we can go live with with your friend Dr. Khalid. Yeah, Mohan. Dr. Mohan. Oh, Dr. How, are you? Mohan? How are you? Can you hear us? Yes, yes. Your Dr. voice. We don't hear you, Dr. Mohan. Can you Mohan. hear me now? Can you hear me, please? Yes, yes, Dr. Mohan. Okay. Go ahead. How are you, Dr. Khalid? Fine, excellent. Fantastic to see you again. Okay, thank you very much. Me too. Can Can we ask that question, uh, Dr. Khalid, to Dr. Mohan? Yeah, Dr. Mohan, uh, there is a question regarding the technique of uh, uh, coiling of the fundal varix. Yes, yes. So, uh, uh, the, the technique. Uh, that, that tec technique uh, is very simple. The advantage is that uh, uh, one during active bleeding, when there is a lot of blood in the stomach, you can still target that because you don't require uh, visualization of the lumen. And uh, the most important thing is to use, use a 19 PRT. gauge needle and approach from the esophagus uh, and, and then puncture the fundal varic. There will be a lot of intramural gastric collaterals. We have to aim the collateral which is protruding into the lumen. You can see that by injecting a lot of water inside the stomach. That will make more clearer the part of the varics which is projecting inside the lumen of the stomach. There are many collaterals, perigastric collateral, we should not aim that because our aim is to prevent GI bleed and that can be only be done when if you target the lesion which is most responsible for the bleed. So we can approach by 19 gauge needle and uh, to puncture that we do not aspirate to confirm the blood. In fact, we inject some uh, distilled water. Uh, to see the bubbles inside the varix and then we load the, uh, we measure the varix. Uh, uh, most of the time you will require 1.6 centimeter or 1.2 centimeter coil uh, to be placed. Uh, you can place 3 to 4 coils depending upon the size of the varix and then you have to stay for some time because the coagulation will not occur immediately. And once there is some uh, coagulation, we can use the same 19 gauge needle to inject Spike the glass. glue. And glue should always be mixed with lipidol because the lipidol increase the solidification time. And uh, to be uh, able to pass the glue through the 19 gauge needle, we need some solidification time to be increased. It also increases the radio opacity of the glue. So you can trace the glue where it has gone. So lipidol increases the solidification time so that the needle does not get blocked and we can see on the x-ray. Then you can inject 2 to 3 ml of glue safely because these coil act as a scaffold. That coil catches the glue and prevent the embolization. That is the fear of embolization once you are injecting the glue without coil. So not only the volume required comes down but also the risk of embolization comes down. And we have now a lot of meta-analysis available. In fact, uh, Pro Professor Wallace showed one in his fantastic talk about the efficacy of the glue plus coil. The recurrence rate of bleeding was less than 5%. So that is the uh, importance of using a coil along with glue. Thank you. Uh, can we take another question, Dr. Mohan? Yeah, please. Yeah, uh, regarding the liver, uh, US guided liver biopsy, uh, it's increasing in the literature and it's, uh, do you think that in the future it will take over the uh, uh, percutaneous biopsy? Uh, 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 it's long way to go. Uh, as of now, uh, the literature has shown there's a contradicting literature. Uh, the, uh, there are few studies which are supporting that. We have now routinely doing that. 
and uh, in our own experience uh, the left lobe liver biopsy is enough uh, we have not we, we used to take right lobe also but now we are uh, using only left lobe biopsy which is equal uh, results uh, and of course as the quality of needle is increasing we are using acquired needle but also we are grating now shark core needle which may be uh, slightly better to get the tissue but uh, I think uh, uh, the liver biopsy uh, may be may be from the percutaneous wait, road wait, wait, we are wait, going wait, to wait. the so sorry, yeah. Mohan is multitasker. Mohan has in the meantime talking to you. He has put in the scope also. No, no, okay. I, I so no, no problem. So we wanted him to wait. Okay. So if, let us present the case, doctor. So sorry about the interruption to the audience. Sir, we it's okay. Go ahead. Hello. So this is the uh, wait, wait, Fuji, wait. Fuji Fuji scope. Let him present. Wait. Hello. Yeah, we'll go Dr. to the Malay. case history. Yes, sir. Uh, we have 28 year old gentleman uh, who is a known case of extra hepatic portal venous obstruction and portal biliopathy. He had past history of pain abdomen and jaundice previously for which we have done CBD clearance of the CBD stones and we have uh, done stenting. Now again he presented with uh, pain abdomen and jaundice and LFT is showing obstructive pattern with alpha rise significantly sir. So plan is to do a ERCP and uh, assess this portal cholangiopathy status and stone extraction and cholangioscopy which is free quite sir. Thank you. We have with us Dr. Sahed Rati. Sahed Rati is a pathologist from Chandigarh and he is also one of the leading experts in portal biliopathy and portal hypertension. So Mohan, proceed. Sir, yeah. So now uh, my aim is to see the viruses also. So I am putting this scope in a snake position. When uh, I can see the can, uh, forward, can you can see, see the, the nice yeah. viruses. I am just putting the big knob in down position so that I can see by the side viewing endoscope almost like a front viewing endoscope and it is important for us to, uh, to notice these big viruses and once I reach to the G junction for the beginners the technique which I apply is to reach to the antrum because they need to know how to reach the antrum is palm up position so you can see now my hand is in the neutral position the left hand and as soon as I enter the G junction, I do palm up position like this. My hand is now seeing the roof and then I push and then I back push, push and reverse position, push and reverse palm up position. You can see now, I, I will never miss that. So uh, once you reach the G junction, move Wait your... Wait a minute. Yeah. You said it again. What is palm up is? Palm this up, is palm down. This is neutral position palm up when my palm sees the roof so, so you, okay. I'll, I'll repeat this again for the beginners slowly yes. slowly you are too fast man. okay so so once i am going in i am going with the big knob down so that i am converting the side viewing to the front viewing that is important because i need to see these viruses once i reach to the g junction this is my neutral position sometimes beginners will go into the fundus Fundus, but I want to see this channel which is going from the to the right side to approach that you have to do the palm up position open this angle and push push and as soon as you come into this channel you do palm up and then you always will reach to the antrum gastric antrum okay. oh. so how do you enter pallora slowly now no, okay, but I, I am facing, I think this is not, I have to change the scope. To change, can you change the scope? You have another ERCP scope? Okay. Something wrong with the knobs yeah. of this scope? Huh? 830. No, no, no. I think we have to 5, change. 5, 6, 30, no that? problem. Uh, we remove the scope. No, 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 don't worry. 5, 645. He leaves at 5. In, he lives in 20 minutes, he will, okay. 20 minutes? No problem. Make it 25. Make it 25. Dr. Male, which airport, Mohan? T3. T3, okay, 145, 1 hour 45 minutes. Dr. Male? Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, do do we have a case of fundal varics also? 
Yes, we have a case of fundal varies, but that will be later. First, we okay. listen to the 25 minute uh, of Dr. Mohan's case in this, and then he will see him off. My yeah, cutoff was five o'clock, but it is 4:15 here, so we will send him a quarter to five. Yeah. I, I know that he has to travel. Like you know, we we have audience we, uh, since morning here in Dubai. So we just want to tell them what are the other uh, next cases lined up. So the next they cases lined up is a complex bile duct is a bile duct injury for ERCP and the fundal varics for glue injection. Very good. So are we are we planning a cholangoscopy in this case, Doctor yes, Malay? Yes, that is what we are planning. Whatever we can yeah. plan quickly. Yeah. We can plan, but don't worry. We I think we can show everything. So, what are the precautions we need to take when we are doing a ERCP in portal biliopathy, Dr. Mohan, Dr. Malay? What are the precautions uh, we need to take during the ERCP for portal biliopathy? First, let him now reach because there is one small sense of urgency because of his flight. So let us see okay. what is inside and then we will keep on asking the questions. So now once you see the se se setting sun side, I just nudge this scope down and turn to the right. See that? I turn right, push the scope more right and then can I don't we lock, I use my thumb to keep it near. Stayed. You want to do cholangiogram directly, you want to use yeah, remove? I, I, okay. I will remove the stent okay. and once I am planning the cholangioscopy, I usually do not inject the contrast because uh, the contrast will convert the cholangioscopy image glassy and you may not interpret it well, but if you must have a MRCP report available to have what you are planning. So if, if we have a good MRCP, I will avoid colon contrast. So now we have found some portal bilio evidence of portal biliopathy in endosonography last. Okay. Sorry, we cannot give you that, but uh, we'll have to proceed with spyglass now. Okay. Spyglass? Yes. So I'll I'll require some wire because I don't want to fiddle too much here. Wire, cannula wire. No, I'll go with sphincterotome. No need to dilate. And in fact, uh, when portal biliopathy is there, there may be uh, periampullary collaterals also. So unnecessary dilatation is not required. Over the wire here. Over the wire because I don't know the anatomy. If that is a good anatomy with dilated duct with stone and my plan is to do laser, I always preload it laser and go freehand technique. When I am doing for diagnostic like indeterminate strictures, I always go on the wire. So you can see now we are just placing the wire here. Can we push the wire please? So we published uh, our data on direct cholangioscopy without doing anything that actually saves time and money because in indeterminate structure, no, no, I want a full long wire. Long wire, long wire. So uh, in that situation what happens is in our scenario whenever there is a structure you take breast cytology or biopsy and put a stent and by the time patient comes back you have a negative report. So in such situation we, we evaluated when the CT or MR is not able to diagnose whether it is cancer or not, any stricture we go directly with cholangioscopy and we can get that answer very quickly. And that in fact saves money because patients who are coming far, far away, they have less hospital visits, less number of cholangioscopies or less number of ERCPs, less hospital admissions. The, 
Okay, that's a very good question. In fact, we saw that because if there is a pre pre test, there is a known as pre test probability. Like a patient who has uh, old age, who has lost weight, who has more imaging characteristic of cancer. Here we don't depend on the biopsy also. We will be able to have a diagnosis based on uh, only visual impression. But if your pre-test probability is low, then we should also depend on the biopsy. Yeah, because the uh, IgG4 cholangiopathy and the malignancy sometimes may confuse. Yes. So uh, the pre-test probability of the disease is very important to yes. take the final call yes. if your biopsy is negative. Yes. Otherwise, the biopsy is the gold standard because if such patient require a chemotherapy prior yeah. to go for a surgery, yeah. then the oncologist is not going to start the chemotherapy on the basis of morphological criteria of cholangioscopy. So let us go inside and see what is happening in this bile duct. What precaution you take to avoid the cholangitis in an indeterminate biliary strictures? So, uh, indeterminate biliary stricture, first of all, I choose my patient. Choose means if there is a type 4 biliary stricture, I usually avoid those. But I, I must know that whether mm. this uh, uh, biliary system is drainable or not drainable. So, Dr. Mohan? Yes. I just want you should tell the beginners how to introduce the cholangioscope. Yeah, yeah, you okay. have gone with the very ease. But you tell how to make the assistant to make the big knob up to direct the cholangioscope yes. towards the CBD yeah. so and what knobs you are going to use to introduce your cholangioscope inside the CBD. You should avoid the elevator. So please guide us on this. Yeah, yeah. So uh, whenever you are going over the wire like I did, not much technician's role is there. But once if you are going freehand technique, it is like bending of the sphincterotome you can ask your technician to bend the up knob so that the the uh, the cholangioscope is guided towards the uh, intramural part of the uh, intramural part of the duodenal bile duct so that importance thing is there can you attach it now and also to have a very good sphincterotomy you should not struggle you should not struggle manually to get inside that may cause increased pancreatitis. So if you are a good sphincterotomy, that is the most important thing to do before you do a cholangioscopy. So I, I do not know the anatomy, so I will go straight away to the, to the vision. Can you change to the vision please? Uh, sorry Mohan, it's on your back side. Dr. Mohan, if you look on your back side. Oh, back side. Okay. So now. Mohan has a very, very flexible back because he is doing the cycling. <laughs> so you can see now, we, we can see inject water, so please, water. So uh, Mohan, can you show us how to control both uh, yeah. scopes? Here many things you have to see. One is, you can see my, my mother scope mother scope is stuck to the chest like this and I am controlling the scope, this scope with the left hand and I am now controlling the, uh, uh, the cholangioscope and also I am twisting my body to right so that I am, I am not bothered about slipping from the duodenum. If your body is on the right twist, your this part is controlled. And now, do, you fix the, uh, do you fix the wheels? Pardon? You can see now there are many small stones over there. Inside. We don't see the other image. Can you please uh, show us the other image? Okay, other, other image we have to show. Cholangioscope. Yeah, yeah now show it. So these are intrahepatic ducts. We can see, uh, uh, and I am going inside the intrahepatic duct there. Mohan, yes. um, uh, please just comment on the suctioning when you do the. Uh, cholangioscope because this is very important. Yes. So if you can see here, there are channels over there. This is the suction channel and this is the pump which they have attached. Uh, so can you point the camera towards the hands please? Yes, yeah. This one. So this is the suction and this is the pump which they have attached. And now we, we have to take care of not only the, because here the challenge is 
uh, I may slip out of the duodenum. So, this position, can you see the fluoroscopy? See that, no. that, that position has to be perfect and that can be achieved by right rotation, the mother scope attached to your chest so that not much of movement. Now I am on the right side and now I am only concentrating on the cholangioscope. So there are many intrahepatic stones, small stones, but I, know, I don't know why they are not coming out because there must be some obstruction below. So we have to integrate the lower CBD. These are so many sto small stones. These are not big stones. So they should not stay there unnecessarily unless there is some obstruction. So in portal biliopathy, there is obstruction below because of uh, a stricture. And you can see now we are really we are coming down to a stricture. So this is the stricture. Now this can be. Can you show us the image, please, of the spy scope? Can you see the? Scope, please now. This this picture. No. So the so there is a short stricture over there. This one. Can you switch the image? Switch the image. Ye dikh ra? Yeah. Okay. Mere koi to karna hai. I know sir koi karna hai. I'm unable to show that. Okay. Yeah. Now it's better. Can you? Now, can I see my spy position screen? Screen? Yeah, we can see, Dr. Mohan, we are seeing. No, no, but I yeah. want to see the fluoroscopy, where I am. Uh, so, see that I am in a mid CBD. It is not lower CBD. So, the stricture is in the mid CBD here. Screen? Can you see the screen, please? It is. Yeah. Well yes, yes, this yeah. appears to be benign. No, but I, I am thinking about intraductal varices here. See that these are, uh, th this can be a large collateral encircling the bile duct. So you never dilate these strictures. And there are secondary stones above that. So there is a short stricture in the mid CBD, which looks like to be a vascular stricture to me. And because of the prolonged stasis, there is a ischemia developing over there. So in such situation, one should understand that it is not only the extrinsic compression of the bile duct by collateral, but because of the prolonged disease, there is a ischemic damage happening to the bile duct. So if there is a shuntable vein, this patient requires a shunt surgery followed by bilioentric anastomosis or dilatation mm. of the stricture can be done safely once shunts are done to decompress the bile duct or uh, collaterals. Can you see that easily? That is a very nice stricture. Yeah very short stricture in the mid part and above that are secondary stones. So, so Mohan, you think, you think that this is the benign stricture? Uh, that's what I'm saying. It's a ischemic stricture in the portal biliopathy because of the prolonged collaterals. Prolong, if you see the, if Malay can do a, a EUS to show or I can have an introductal ultrasound which can definitely show uh, the collaterals around around the, this part of the bile duct. That the is bile. what we found in yeah, US. Yeah, yeah. So that is why we gave to yeah. you. So this um, below bile duct is okay. There is normal. So there is a very short stricture. So so what we do in such situation, if there is no shuntable vein, we put a fully covered stent that compresses the collaterals around the bile duct. And after some time, these collaterals may get fibrosed. And once you remove the stent after six months. You may have a you may have a complete resolution of the stricture. So, Dr. Do you Mohan, think multiple stents, plastic stents can also work. Can also work, but first of all, we should see the shuntable vein because this disease is a lifelong disease. Patient, if they are not decompressed properly, will develop secondary biliary cirrhosis, will require transplant. So, if you have a shuntable vein, good splenic vein, and then a, a shunt surgery can be done. We can decompress the collaterals around the bile duct. And then we have to treat this stricture. If that is only because of secondary compression, one stage surgery is done. But in this situation, I can predict that he will require a two stage surgery when a bilioentric anastomosis or a multiple plastic stents will be required. So, Dr. Mohan? Yes. By impression, what do you feel? It is a ischemic stricture or it is a varix? varix? No, it is a ischemic stricture because there are mucosal changes. In ischemic stricture, in uh, varices changes, there is only extrinsic bulge. 
here we can see lot of mucosal changes which is pump pump see that the lot of, there is a fibrosis you can see clearly fibrosis around that so this is a benign structure prolonged ischemia in that area leading to a short ischemic structure mohan why why fully covered stent why not plastic stent because fully covered stent is a ex expendable stent that compresses the collaterals around the bile duct correct while plastic stent won't compress that so dr mohan preferred the covered stent in this particular situation because if there is a small varices inside the cbd that is also will be taken care yes. if it is a benign biliary structure which is post cholecystectomy then yes multiple plastic stent is an option but looking on this case i think the fully covered metal stent or i will say first shunt surgery after doing a ct ngo and then we can take the call should we do the bilio entric anastomosis or should we do the if we do the shunt then we can dilate we yes. can put the multiple stand and we can remove the debris also yeah yeah that can be done but uh, the data is still not there uh, majority of the studies have done two stage surgery uh, but in this case we have now a very clear cut diagnosis that there is a short structure in the mid cbd treatment is either fully covered stent in absence of shuntable vein shuntable vein then we put a stent do the shunt surgery plan the bilio entric anastomosis or dilatation of the structure as we do for any benign biliary structure uh, mohan do you give a prophylactic antibiotic after the spiculars yes yes very important and this structure uh, khalid you can see this is not a complex structure even if you do a naso biliary drain or a stent majority of the water which you have insufflated will be drained out but uh, if there is a complex structure even type 2 or type 3 a 3 b you may not be able to uh, decompress all the system and in that scenario antibiotics becomes much much more important so you want to place a stent uh, stent right i want now? to place a fully covered stent if there is a availability otherwise we'll put a stent and do a portovenogram mr portovenogram to see what is the anatomy of veins around it we talk to the surgeon whether they can decompress these collaterals around the bile duct or not so uh, you can proceed with the uh, lecture veins whose lecture dr surinder rana and we you will put in the stand we will have to say bye bye to mohan for for this fantastic demonstration though we gave him very little time but then he uh, gave a fantastic demonstration of uh, the spigla so thank, thank you, you mohan thank you thank you we, so much we were waiting thank you, for mohan hold it for this no, no, thank you very much professor malay for giving me this opportunity uh, it was worth coming here learned a lot myself thank you so much no no, no. thank you thank you thank so you we'll mohan put in the stent yeah. can you put in a stent to ठीक है मैं डाल हूं 2 मिनट में नहीं निकल लो आप वो भी मतलब डर आ रहा है ना कौन नहीं टाइम है आई नो व्हाट हैपेंड सो जस्ट वेट फॉर 5 मिनट मोर विद स्टे विद अस इफ यू हैव नॉट स्टार्टेड द लेक्चर बिकॉज़ वी विल लर्न मोहन सेज ही हैज गॉट 5 टू 10 मिनट्स मोर वी विल नाउ लर्न समथिंग अबाउट स्टेंटिंग एंड ऑल मोहन व्हाट डू यू वांट वेट वेट 5 मिनट्स मोर आई विल पुट अ प्लास्टिक स्टेंट स्ट्रेट Uh, pig tail I, i will put a pig tail because the structure is not tight and there are multiple stones proximal to that soft structure and if your straight stent migrate out he will develop severe cholangitis so okay. we will put a double pig tail stent in this patient what about multiple stents to dilate this structure no, unless i have anatomy of bile duct why i am doing that okay then then only if, if it is a completely ischemic a vascular structure then you can do but if there are collaterals then there is no point because it will never get dilated okay so the collaterals will never dilate not never dilate the ischemic structure will get dilated so that is the difference yes so that is important uh, assessment yes. okay so that is okay. simple so you prefer a pig tail yeah you you don't want migration no i don't because there are stones over it uh, and then they will act as a ball wall they will stop complete uh, the bile flow and patient already undergone cholangioscopy he will die of sepsis okay so you dr malay 
So, but you said that this is not a malignant structure. Not a malignant structure. So, you are not so worried about cholangitis. No, no, no. Not a complex malignant structure. I am still worried about cholangitis. I want to drain it. I want to drain it by a double pigtail stent because the migration rate will be almost nil there. Okay. Dr. Malay. Yes. Uh, what's next after this? The what's the ne is it a case or a lecture yeah. now? Next is a lecture of Surendra Rana, pancreatic fluid collection. Then, after uh, that? Then we will be having a case of uh, glue, bundle barracks. Then there is one more lecture. And one to, we have three lectures and uh, one complex bile duct injury case. So, is, the glue will be shown by Dr. Rajesh Puri. Okay. And the complex okay. bile duct injury by Dr. Chiraksha. Okay. So, we got like after the lecture uh, or is it possible for us to have the glue after this or uh, we need a break for the lecture? Yeah. No, no, we don't need, we don't need a break. You can, no, more no, no, like yeah. the lecture. Is it necessary to have the Mohan, lecture? what are the tricks? So, uh, the tricks is, uh, first of all, you should allow the stent to come out. For the stent to come out, you have to put the elevator up and then move away from the bile duct, otherwise it will not come out. To move away from the bile duct, you have to make the big knob away. Down. Uh, big knob away means down. And then big knob near, it will bring the papilla in kissing position. You can see, the big knob away, you move away from the papilla. Big knob down, you are inside the papilla. So, I put the end of the stent by big knob up, then I stay here by uh, doing this and then create a space, push the stent down out and again the big knob up or elevator up. If you want to save elevator, use big knob. Again, create a space, big knob and then like this. Again, create a space, push the stent out, Flight what time? big knob like this. What time? 15. And this you can come to the marker and that is all. And once the marker is there, this is the end of the marker? Beach marker. Beach wall. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Screen? I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we have to go more. Okay, so once that marker comes, I again big knob away, create space, push the stand down, wire out, and then you can deploy the stand like this. So that is, let us uh, give a clap to the master of cholangioscopy. I would have seen oh, well, well, the well, best cholangioscopy you. demonstration I have seen ever in my life and thank in you. such a short time. Thank you so much. Okay. So you carry on one, Mohan. Uh, take the scope please. <coughs> and you carry on. Thank you very thank much. You, very much. But you can you. now start the lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, no, don't hold, don't hold. Good afternoon everyone. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Malay Sharma for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to participate in this international EUS conference. Today he has asked me to speak on role of EUS in pancreatic fluid collections. Dr. Khalid, Dr. Mazin, stay there, stay there, stay there. After we the lecture, there the is a live transmission. Fluid collections are amylase-rich collections of pancreatic fluid that results from either pancreatic duct injury that accumulate in or around this pancreas and this usually occurs after acute or chronic pancreatitis, pancreatic trauma and rarely after pancreatic surgery. And over the last two decades, we have seen evolving nomenclature of pancreatic fluid collections and the final uh, nomenclature was derived from revised Atlanta classification, which identified two phases of acute pancreatitis and pancreatic fluid collections and the local complications were thereafter classified into four different types. So basically the pancreatic fluid collections are classified into acute fluid collections, acute necrotic collections, acute pseudocyst and walled off pancreatic necrosis. The four basic things need to be seen to differentiate among the four are what was the underlying type of pancreatitis, the time course that is the time from the onset of illness, whether the solid debris is present or not and whether an encapsulated wall is present or not. So, a fluid collection occurring in the setting of interstitial pancreatitis within four weeks of onset of illness without a well-defined wall and with no solid debris is called as an acute fluid collection. 
and similarly the same fluid collection when it is beyond four weeks then it is known as an acute pseudocyst uh, fl fluid collection happening in the setting of necrotizing pancreatitis within four weeks will have a solid debris but no wall is known as an acute necrotic collection and a similar collection which has got walled off beyond four weeks is known as walled off pancreatic necrosis so this is an important concept in the management of pancreatic fluid collections to assign a proper and a correct nomenclature to a fluid collection before we embark further on the management. It's important to differentiate the difference between acute and a chronic pseudocyst. An acute pseudocyst occurs in acute interstitial pancreatitis beyond four weeks, whereas a chronic pseudocyst is again a fluid collection without a solid debris, but occurs in a setting of a chronic pancreatitis. So just to give you a pictorial example, acute interstitial pancreatitis, the pancreatic parenchyma is enhancing very well. And then a fluid collection developing within four weeks is an acute fluid collection. And once the four weeks have elapsed, it forms a wall, which is known as an acute pseudocyst. Similarly, acute necrotizing pancreatitis, you can see non-enhancing pancreatic body with extensive peripancreatic necrosis. And then the fluid collection which develops within first four weeks is an acute necrotic collection with no well-defined wall. And once a wall gets formed, it is known as a walled off pancreatic necrosis or a walled off necrosis. Now, after understanding the nomenclature of pancreatic fluid collections, let's look about the management. We all have seen that the management has traditionally been surgical. The surgery was quite effective, but was associated with a complication rate of up to 35% and mortality rate of about 10%. Therefore, this encouraged the development of non-surgical approaches for management of pancreatic fluid collections. Initially, percutaneous puncture and aspiration was the first non-surgical management approach, but then it was highly ineffective because of high recurrence rates of up to 71%. This was followed by a percutaneous drainage with indwelling catheters, but again, it has a complication rate of 5 to 60%, including fistula formation infection and bleeding. Therefore came the endoscopic management and endoscopic management as we currently understand is of two types. One is you correct the underlying pancreatic duct disruption, which is known as a transpapillary drainage. And the another approach is to create an alternative cystoenteral drainage route, which is known as a transmural drainage. And the role of US predominantly comes in the transmural drainage. And that's what we are going to discuss in this today's lecture. Maybe we look, look at the role of EUS in pancreatic fluid collections. It can be either in as a diagnostic role or an interventional role. And that's what we are going to discuss in the next 15 to 20 minutes. What's the diagnostic role of EUS in pancreatic fluid collection? It is very useful because it can help us finding a masquerader of a pancreatic fluid collection, such as a cystic neoplasm or other entity. And it is more important in setting of chronic pancreatitis or if there is no definite history of acute necrotizing pancreatitis because any fluid collection occurring in a setting of acute pancreatitis is usually a pancreatic fluid collection. Then it helps us in establishing the relationship of the collection to surrounding luminal and vascular structures. It helps us in identifying abnormal collaterals, vessels, and even pseudo aneurysms which are mi missed by cross-sectional imaging. And the most important role of EUS in pancreatic fluid collection is to identify as well as quantify the solid necrotic debris. And this has an important prognostic information for the management of the patient. Now, we all know that EUS has a higher resolution. So because of this higher resolution, it helps to characterize the inner morphological features such as septations, walls, and solid necrotic debris much better than other cross-sectional imaging modalities, including CT and MRI, as shown in this EUS pictures, you can, it can identify a clear fluid, an ecogenic fluid, which is probably suggestive of a thick fluid, and then a solid necrotic debris. So one can identify and quantify the solid necrotic debris by using an endoscopic ultrasound. And similarly, one can do an aspiration if there is a doubt. And like in this patient, it's close mimicker of a pancreatic fluid collection, but on aspiration, you find it to be a mucinous material. And as I was talking about, it can sometimes help in finding small pseudoaneurysms which were missed on a cross-sectional imaging, as was in this case using EUS and color Doppler. It can also help us in finding abnormal collaterals. This is a patient with acute pancreatitis, a fluid collection, and a splenic vein thrombosis. You can see these collaterals, which can be much better picked up on EUS as compared to other 
cross sectional imaging modalities and then one can also document the change in the morphology of the fluid collections as we see that the fluid collections gradually over a period of time will liquefy but the liquefaction process is quite slow and this can be very well demonstrated on endoscopic ultrasound why it is important to quantify the solid debris because there are a number of studies including our study where we have shown that the outcome in the terms of number of endoscopic sessions and requirement of direct endoscopic necrosecmy or surgery depend upon two important parameters of pancreatic fluid collection one is the size if the size is more than 10 cm or if there is more than 40% solid necrotic debris then the requirement for surgical or endoscopic necrosecmy is much higher as compared to the situation in which the size is less than 10 cm or the fluid collections are predominantly liquid now after understanding the role of diagnostic eus Let's look at the role of interventional EUS in pancreatic fluid collections and the interventional EUS, the drainage, that is the transmural endoscopic drainage of pancreatic fluid collection is actually a workhorse in interventional EUS. All majority of the centers, 80% interventional EUS is drainage of pancreatic fluid collections. So we all have been doing the drainage of Endoscope, endoscopic drainage of pancreatic fluid collections blindly. This is how we used to do document the pancreatic fluid collection on a cross-sectional imaging modality. Then blindly using an endoscope, look at the bulge, puncture it with a needle knife, push a wire, dilate the tract and place the stents. But we all know that this blind puncture was associated with two important complications that are bleeding and perforations, which can even lead on to death of the patient. So that's why came the role of EUS. In EUS, you are doing the transmural drainage under vision. So EUS helps in doing the, these transmural drainage in a much better way. So what you do on EUS is that you can very well identify the pancreatic fluid collection. You can look at the morphology, identify the necrotic debris, and importantly, identify and exclude the abnormal vessels which are coming in the tract. And one can safely do an EUS guided transmural drainage rather than doing an endoscopic transmural drainage. And now we have studies which have shown that EOS guided transmural drainage is better as compared to blind endoscopic transmural drainage in terms of complications as well as the uh, results of uh, resolution. Now, if we look at the contraindications for endoscopic transmural drainage, when we were studying, it was told that presence of collaterals, pseudocyst at atypical locations like liver, spleen, kidneys, the distance of the fluid collection more than one centimeter from the gastrodural wall on a cross-sectional imaging modality and if the pseudocyst wall is calcified one should not do a endoscopic transmural drainage but with the help of EUS all these contraindications have been taken care of and we can safely perform EUS guided transmural drainage in these situations also. For example this was a picture which I showed you where there were collaterals so one can exclude these collaterals using an EUS guided Doppler and then puncture the fluid collection and do a drainage. Similarly patient with a calcified pseudocyst, this calcification is virtually impossible to puncture. So with EUS, you can identify these calcifications, take a tract where there are no calcification, puncture it, dilate it, and then place stents and there will be resolution of the pancreatic fluid collection with calcification. Similarly, the fluid collections at atypical locations like spleen, here you can see the cyst has been punctured from the stomach and the drainage done. This was followed by a transpapillary drainage to heal the disruption in this particular case. Similarly, this is a renal pseudocyst again punctured through the stomach and the drainage <coughs> accomplished using EUS. And similarly, an intrahepatic pseudocyst in the left lobe of the liver, which can be punctured from the stomach, the tract dilated, and then uh, stents placed. So, this is a transesophageal drainage of the pancreatic pseudocyst from the left lobe of the liver. Similarly, again, a similar large intrasplanic pseudocyst again being drained under an EUS guidance. Now, I'll just briefly talk about the various technical aspects of EUS guided transmural drainage of both pancreatic pseudocyst as well as walled off pancreatic necrosis. So, EUS guided drainage can be accomplished using either plastic stents or metallic stents. The procedure is technically quite simple. You identify the fluid collection on EUS, puncture it with a 19 gauge needle, pass the wire across, and in case you're planning to put plastic stents like in this fluid collection, which is 8 centimeter with no solid debris, it's a clear fluid, so it will be best treated economically by using plastic stents. So we put two plastic stents 
and then within two weeks the there is a resolution of the pancreatic fluid collection and if the collection is large in size as in this case again you do an mri you find very little solid necrotic debris confirmed on us but since size is 14 cm it's better to put a metallic stent in this situation so that's what is being done the pseudo cyst puncture with a 19 gauge needle the wire being pushed into the fluid collection and this is a fluoroscopic image of the same the guide wire coiled into the large pseudo cyst and then falling past passage of cystotome this is the stent delivery system for a fully covered lamps so this is what has been deployed under eus and fluoroscopic guidance and this is what you can see the stent being deployed for a large pseudocyst. Similarly, this is again a large fluid collection. Here you see a little solid debris also. Again, the size is quite big. So here we are going to deploy a cautery enhanced lamps, which has probably made the procedure much simpler. There is no need for needle uh, and even wire also. But at our center, we prefer using a hybrid drainage where we have a wire also to have a secure access. So the, what we do is identify on EUS. Then this is the puncture being done within hot axios, so you can see under fluoroscopy, the, the catheter with the stent is being pushed in using a cautery. And once the stent has gone in, the inner flange is deployed under EUS guidance, and then the delivery system is pulled back. And then you deploy the inner flange inside the scope, and then you push the wire. So once the stent has been deployed, we push the wire so that in case of any uh, mishap, the tract is still being accessed to the wire and one can do rescue endoscopic maneuvers. And then this is the complete stent being deployed. This, this is an axios being deployed. And then post dilatation because there is a post deployment because there is a substantial amount of solid debris. The stent has been deployed, uh, dilated using a CRE balloon so that it immediately uh, gets the full deployment diameter. And that's how hot axios is deployed. So now I'm going to talk about various techniques of EUS guided transmural drainage for world of necrosis or pancreatic necrosis. So we can accomplish this by various uh, ways. One is a simple endoscopic drainage, which can be accomplished by using multiple plastic stents and a nasocystic drainage catheters, or one can use a metallic stent. Then one can do a direct endoscopic necrosectomy if the solid debris is substantial, or you can do a hybrid drainage where endoscopic drainage is combined with a percutaneous drainage for a quicker resolution. And then finally, we have a multi-transluminal gateway technique where multiple punctures are made into stomach. So you can put multiple stents at different sites into the same collection, accomplishing a quicker drainage. So let's talk about these one by one. So one is using multiple plastic stents and a nasocystic drainage catheter. Just to show you an example, this is a large wall of necrosis. So this is what you do is you put multiple plastic stents and a nasocystic catheter. This is used for irrigation using either hydrogen peroxide, saline, or streptokinase, either of them can be used. And these are the serial cross-sectional imaging, that is the CT images showing after multiple sessions, the collection is gradually reducing, and then you are able to remove the solid debris, and finally there is resolution. The same can be accomplished using a metallic stent. So again, giving an example, this is a large wall of necrosis. So here you are going to place a a Nagi stent, so a Nagi stent has been placed. So this is a lumen opposing metallic stent, and this leads on to resolution. And this is a CT image post drainage where you can see that the, without doing a necrosectomy, the solid necrotic debris has drained out from the collection because of the large caliber of the uh, lumen opposing metallic stent. And then following the resolution, the stent can be uh, removed. Then another way is to do a multi-luminal, uh, multi-transluminal gateway technique. Here you do is multiple punctures where so you can see a large interconnected wand. So you first puncture it from the stomach, put multiple catheters. Then the second puncture is done from the duodenum. Again, put multiple catheters. And then you can see multiple catheters in the same collection from the stomach as well as from the duodenum. And then this is the follow-up image showing the resolution of the pancreatic fluid collections. Then sometimes if the spontaneous drainage does not help, one has to take the scope inside and do a direct endoscopic necrosectomy. You can do a direct endoscopic necrosectomy using the same conventional endoscopic accessories like dormia baskets, snares, balloons, and rod baskets. Un unfortunately, there are no dedicated endoscopic uh, necrosectomy accessories. So we have to use the ones which we conventionally use for other endoscopic interventions. 
So the current treatment of choice for wall of necrosis endoscopically is a step up approach where you first accomplish the drainage. This can be accomplished using either a plastic stent or using a metallic stent. And then if after putting these stents and doing irrigation also, there is no resolution, one can do a direct endoscopic necrosectomy and uh, this will help in resolution of the uh, world of necrosis. So it is important to remember that 70% of world of necrosis drainage alone will suffice and only 30% of patients are the one who need necrosectomy. So necrosectomy is not required in all the patients. Now, with improvement in endoscopic drainage, the results, and now we have randomized studies which have shown that endoscopic drainage should be the treatment of choice for necrotic collections beyond four weeks. But what about patients who have necrotic collections less than four weeks? That means there is no well-defined wall, but patients still need drainage. We all know that in this phase of illness, that is week three and week four of illness, if there is a pancreatic necrotic collection and it needs drainage, then the percutaneous step up is the standard of care. That means you do a percutaneous drainage and if the patient improves, that will happen in 30% of patients, then no other intervention is required. But the remaining 70% patients will require uh, another intervention, which could be either a percutaneous endoscopic necrosectomy, PEN, or most of these patients will actually require a surgery in the form of ward. So although surgery being the standard of care, now there is a shift to percutaneous step up. But now we have studies which are starting to tell that maybe in this week three and week four of illness also, one can probably do an endoscopic drainage. So this was the study which we recently published in Journal of Gastrointestinal Surgery, where we compared early drainage that is within four weeks to late drainage. Uh, and majority of patients underwent a late drainage, only 34 patients underwent early drainage. And here we what, what we found that the solid amount of solid debris uh, the use of lamps and use of necrosectomy was much higher in early group as compared to late group. And this is obvious because the amount of solid debris is higher. As I have told you earlier that with time, the solid debris liquefies. So if you are draining early, you are going to have more solid debris. And similarly, salvage surgery, bleeding, mortality, complications, all were higher in early group. So what we found that early drainage is feasible, possible, effective, safe, but then it is associated with slightly increased risk of complications as compared to delayed drainage. And similar results have been from other centers where early versus drainage, delayed drainage has been compared. So this is one study from US again showing almost similar results. And then we compared endoscopic versus percutaneous in the first four weeks of illness. And again, we found that endoscopic transmural drainage, although associated with higher mortality as compared to delayed drainage, but when it was compared to percutaneous step up approach, it was better, better in the terms of time to resolution, requirement of salvage surgery, and an important complication which happens in percutaneous drainage. External pancreatic fistula does not happen in patients who undergo, undergo an endoscopic transmural drainage. Just to give an example, week three of illness, not a well-defined wall, patient with acute necrotizing pancreatitis, undergoes an EUS guided transmural drainage using a metallic stent. So this is a metallic stent has been placed and following that undergoes a necrosectomy three days later and this patient had a successful resolution. So it's important to emphasize that early drainage is feasible and possible, but in present times, it should be done only at expert centers with a very good radiological and surgical backup because the drainage within four weeks is associated with increased risk of complications, which can sometimes be life-threatening. Now, what about world of necrosis at difficult locations? For example, this patient has an emphysematous necrotic collection and you can see it is at the level of antrum where, where you are getting an impression onto the stomach. So using a linear EUS, it was virtually impossible to get an access into this collection. So we switched on to a forward wing eco endoscope. So here you can see that this collection was brought into the angle from where the needle will come. So this was punctured using a 19 gauge needle. So this scope does not have an elevator. So one has to be a little careful while pushing the wires and other accessories because they will slip. So again, you can see on fluoroscopy, this is a forward wing eco endoscope, the needle being pushed into the collection, the wire coil, and then you place a metallic stent. So again, a fully covered lamp has been placed and this patient had a successful resolution and the stents were subsequently replaced with plastic stents. What about US guided transmural drainage in patients with portal hypertension? We all know that 30 to 50% of patients with acute necrotizing pancreatitis will have splenic vein thrombosis. 
and in these situations you tend to have these collaterals so using an eus avoiding these collaterals these collections can be safely drainage, uh, drained using an eus guided approach so this was one of our study where we found that eus guided drainage of world of necrosis is safe and effective in patients with portal hypertension and intra abdominal collaterals then what about patients with pseudo aneurysm so here again this was our paper where we looked at an approach of first angioembolizing the pseudo aneurysm and then using an eus guided approach to drain it so again showing you a patient with a splenic artery pseudo aneurysm coiled and then following that using an eus guided approach the collection was drained so you can see the coils you can see multiple plastic stents and a ct of the same patient showing the resolution of the acute necrotic collection now before i conclude some important aspects of us guided drainage now we have lamps and lamps have been considered as a game changer but are actually lamps a game changer we have to see the carefully the results the advantage of lamps is it's easy to deploy with high technical and clinical success rates the den can be easily performed through a uh, through the lamps and we have studies as well as systematic reviews which have demonstrated that lamps are superior to plastic stents in terms of overall treatment efficacy with fewer endoscopic procedures but we carefully look at the limitations of lamps there is high cost you need to replace it with plastic stents in dpds there is a issue of clogging of these lamps by necrotic material which requires repeated procedures and we have a recent randomized study from shams group which have shown that except for a shorter procedure time in lamps there was no significant differences either in the outcomes or in the adverse effects between lamps or plastic stents let's look at our data we had a data of 166 patients again we found that the technical success the rates of one resolution and complications were similar in both the groups our lamps was associated with significantly shorter time to resolutions so basic message from all these studies is that both lamps and plastic stents are effective one need to individualize in a patient with a necrotic collection with a high amount of solid necrotic debris or a very large size lamps should be preferred on the other hand patients who have a pseudo cyst or a small fluid collection which is less than 10 cm in size plastic stents should be used because they are as effective as lamps in this situation then we talked about den we all know that we are using various types of devices like snares dormia baskets rod baskets stone removal baskets and forceps of various shapes have been designed so all of them are equally effective but none of them is very effective but now recently there is a novel device which is an endo rotor powered endoscopic debridement system which was developed by interscope medical so basically what happens is it has got a cutting and a sucking system so it just goes through the accessory channel and you start from uh, sucking and cutting the necrotic debris so there is no need to repeatedly change the accessories it will be just sucked out and the studies have shown very promising results and we have await the comparative studies with other uh, direct endoscopic necrosectomy tools before this comes into routine clinical practice then another important issue is how long to leave the lamps the lamps removal should be done at 8 weeks or 12 weeks or even earlier because the studies have shown that lamps related adverse events like bleeding biliary stricture and buried stent in gastric wall happens if the lamps are not removed beyond 3 weeks most of these will happen if the lamps remain for 6 weeks or more so one has to carefully follow the collection if the collection has resolved then the lamps should be removed and lamps should not be left in place for more than 6 25%, weeks 25%. we had looked at an hybrid NCC approach where we removed the clogged stems instead of opening it and this was followed by insertion of multiple plastic stents with this this pilot study had showed that this approach was much better in terms of resolution as well as adverse effects in comparison to the appro approach of declogging the stems and putting a nasal cystic catheter and then doing repeated necrosectomies but the important message is the labs should be removed within 6 weeks otherwise the risk of bleeding and other adverse effects arises finally an important issue is then it should be done up front or one should do step up we all know that den has an ability to directly remove the solid necrotic debris but it is associated with high morbidity and even mortality it's a labor intensive procedure and is associated with higher cost and there are comparative studies the comparative studies have shown that immediate den provided quicker resolution of worn with fewer endoscopic interventions and immediate den in this study was found to be an independent predictor of resolution of worn but then again immediate den was associated with increased risk of 
complications. And early den is associated with the risk of stent dislodgement, which can occur, occur because of immature fistulous tract with potential risk of gastric आगे? perforation. चलो, and we all know that 70% of patients with Vaughn will achieve resolution without den. And there are studies, including study from our center, which has shown that with den, there is increased incidence of endocrine and exocrine insufficiency. So a step up treatment of initial drainage and den only in those patients not responding to drainage is the preferred treatment modality in 2022. So to conclude, US guided drainage has established itself as the best option for drainage of pancreatic fluid collections. It has high clinical efficacy, which is almost similar to surgical and percutaneous approaches, but with lower morbidity and costs. We also have learned that LAMS is a game changer for management of necrotic collections. And although DEN is efficacious, but we need better devices for safe and effective DEN. Thank you so much for your patient hearing. Let him first speak the history. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Then you will do it. Look what it is. Jerry Lagadena. Can you breathe? Somebody yeah. present the case. Are we live? We are live. Can present the history. Fluoro is. Where is the fluoro? fluoro Keep is. the fluoro nearby. Uh, he is a 36 year old male Can having. Okay, you start. So, good evening, everyone. And Dr. Sahaj, uh, who is from PGI Chandigarh, consultant gastroenterologist. And he is performing the upper GI endoscopy in a case of chronic liver disease with the fundal varics. And he underwent twice glue outside and he presented with the GI bleed. The, our plan in this case is to do the EUS guided glue and coiling. Any patient of upper GI bleed with the fundal varics come, generally in our practice what we do, we do a CT NGO and look for the shunt and we look for the BRTO. We discuss the patient in detail and then we plan that should we subject this patient for the BRTO or should we do a US guided coil and the glue injection. One of the very important indication is patient is actively bleeding and it is difficult to reach the radiologist and they are going to arrange just changing the scope and you can inject the glue and coil in an actively bleeding varix is one of the important indication. Second, you can do as a primary prevention. If you look at the varix, appears to be more than 2 cm. It is what kind of fundal varix it is? So this is a GOV2. GOV2. And this is a tumorous varix. It's approximately 3 cm at least. And this is the uh, what is the endoscopically visible. When we do the endoscopic ultrasound, it may be bigger in size. It's probably going to be bigger. So GOV2 is one of the ideal indication mm -hmm. or? I'm sorry? Uh, and what uh, other varics we can do with an EUS guided? Uh, so uh, we can ectopic do... Ectopic uh, varics we can do. Right? We can do any ectopic viruses. Okay. So the reason yeah. of doing the upper GI endoscopy is to look for the esophageal varices mm -hmm. because the root of the EUS guided is transesophageal or the transgastric. If the esophageal varices are large, then I prefer to use the transgastric route. We can change the scope now. Sure. So, if you look at the esophageal, yeah. there's a hardly any varices. We can yeah, very small varices. And back. I stand corrected. This is not only only the initial part was three. This is this is a much larger varix. Yeah, and it appears to be trilobed or so. Trilobed. Yeah. One lobe is here, second and third. Absolutely. So we can see the esophagus. The reason of doing the upper GI is yeah. to look for the esophageal varices. Yeah. We can so remove the scope. Those are very small. Yeah, we can remove the scope. Okay. So our plan Suction? is to do the EUS. Uh, yeah, we can take it out. We'll sure. suck during sure. this. We'll suck during so our aim, we just saw the so there was no varices in the esophagus. Is that right? Yeah. And the plan is Small to do varices. the EUS guided glue and coil. Uh, before starting the procedure, I would like to just request uh, uh, a camera person to focus on this. Can you focus on this? So. Uh, uh, is always better because when you know that the size of the varix is more than 2 cm, generally I, I use the 19 G needle. If the coil used is more than 10 mm in diameter, then it is better to use the 19 G. If the coil is less than 10 mm, you can use 22 G needle. So the th 19 G needle, either from any of the company. Second, after measuring the size of the varix, uh, the coil size should be chosen. It should be 1.2 times 
larger than the size of varix and this concept we have learned from the radiologist so we have got a multiple size of the varix we'll measure the uh, varix size and we'll do it we are using the lipid oil in my practice i always use lipid oil i'm going to discuss why then we have a, a cyanoacrylate glue for is n butyl cyanoacrylate glue so we have a n octyl and butyl so generally in the n octyl has a polymerization time of around 20 seconds so you don't require to use the lipid oil but in n butyl which has a polymerization time of 5 to 6 second and there's a chances while injecting through the needle there's a possibility you may uh, block the needle so in my practice i use the 80 20 40 60 or 50 50 dilution of the lipid oil with the cyanoacrylate glue now uh, the 19 g needle uh, can you give the scope let us do the eus and uh, can we bring the patient here nearby so any brand preference that you have for needle no uh, i have a no preference any needle can be used uh, dr male will you on the eus scope and it's just the my 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 way is that right now i am in the i am in the stomach can you see the ascites here i am going to rotate and i will ask to give me a 100 ml of the water can you give me the 100 ml of the water please suction is the suction on I need a suction. Still not decompressed. No, is not suction coming. Suction is not coming. No. No, is not coming here. Look at here. it might be block here in the scope channel okay now yeah scope is is the scope channel is this is block can you clean it can you clean it karna change this capture so i will first suck it now i will put around can you give me the water please water dena water 100 ml water please so any question you can ask while we are going to focus again is blocked no first you have to change the it. us scope please i think is ki suction channel uh, rajesh surender rana here yeah hi surender i uh, just wanted to ask which scope will you prefer a forward doing eco endoscope or a linear eco endoscope when you are injecting coil glue in a gastric varix yeah so surender the very important question you have asked because i have not come across with the forward wing scope but when you see the literature wise if any ectopic varix in the duodenum or in the pyloric antrum the forward wing scope is okay while when we are talking about the fundus you have to retroflux the scope so i think the linear or the other a forward wing or the linear echoendoscope both are equal but yes in the ectopic varices in the pyloric antrum or first part of the duodenum it is always better to use the forward wing scope but i have no experience of using the forward wing scope in my practice so can you give the water please pani aur dena water i am going to focus the varices yeah can you see now can you put the water please Yeah, uh, Doctor Malle. Yes. Uh, yeah. Can you give a little bit more water? Can you reduce the flow again? Yes. Now put more water. Now, can you see the fundal varices? Can you remove the Doppler? Can you remove the Doppler from here? now uh, can you give me the cursor yeah see this is the gastric lumen can you appreciate the gastric lumen is that right am i audible yes yes so this is the gastric lumen 
and this is the intraluminal or intramucosal varices. So what is important is you should always inject the intramucosal part, you should not inject the shunt. You see the musculus propria, can you show the musculus propria Dr. Malay? First let me just measure the, um, the diameter rise. Can you give me more water please? Patient is intubated is not a problem. Diameter is about 1.2 cm. Okay, the muscular is now. Now, can you see the gastric lumen first? This is the. Yes, this is the gastric lumen. Okay, this is the gastric lumen. This is the intramucosal varices. And can you see a large shunt here? Can you appreciate a large shunt? Yes. So, what you should avoid is you should not inject the shunt. Uh, this is the varix, Dr. Malay. This is, what you are, this is, this the, is the musculus propria. Can you show the musculus propria on the? Yeah. This is the musculus propria. And anything which is here is the large varix. Okay. This is also in, inter. Can we make it small? Yes. Can we put more water, please? Yeah. Can you give water, please? Pani on. Sir, can you please elaborate on why do you want to avoid the feeding shunt? Yeah, the reason is that if you look at here, number one, uh, there is a concept given by the Romero Castro that you should inject the perforators. But it is very difficult to identify the perforators and especially when you are dealing with the, such a large fundal varix. And I generally avoid perforator because the entire glue and coil is going to migrate to the, either to the spleen or so. So what is recommended is you should inject the intramucosal portion and this is the part of the varix which I am going to inject. This? Part? Yes. Okay. okay. And can we measure the size? So can you please walk us through how you decide where do you want to inject in such a large varix which yes. is such, a, sure. it has got a lot of loops in there. Yeah, absolutely agree. I will, I will just tell you. So you see that there is a multiple septa. Yeah. Can you see it? So what I do is I always inject. Let me first go through the needle. I'm going to scan. Can I take the 19G needle? The first of all, the needle should be flush with the 5% dextrose. There should not be any air. And what I'm going to do is a cursor is this. So I'm going to inject distal most portion first and then I will keep on withdrawing my needle mm -hmm. because otherwise the coil will have a multiple artifacts. If you inject the coil into the proximal part here, then it is difficult to suit this portion. So what I am going to do is, I am going to inject first here and then keep on withdrawing my needle and keep on putting the glue and coil. Is that okay? Yes. So distal most is this. Yes. So it is flush. Can you remove the stylet please? So we are removing the stylet. Remove the stylet. Just leave it. Remove the stylet. Flush with the 5% dextrose. Always keep 3 to 4 5% dextrose. Uh, yes, is that okay? Now my needle is in. I have, can you put a Doppler, Dr. Malay? Okay. I will take out my sheath out. Can you remove this? Can you see the sheath? And I am going to, uh, we will take the 2 centimeter coil, at least 3 or 4 2 centimeter coil. Is that okay? Okay. So, what I am going to do is, is that okay? Now, to confirm my needles inside, I will tell my assistant to suck it, first suck the blood. Oh, can you see the blood? There is a gush of blood. Is the blood is visible on the syringe? Push, push, push. Can you see? Now you see the water is coming inside. Can you uh, can you appreciate? Yes. Yes. Remove yes, this. Yes. Give the coil. How to attach the coil? You are going to show it. Uh, Doctor Puri, uh, which coils are we using and what size? So we are using the two centimeter by fourteen centimeter nectar coils. Is the nectar so coil? 
by wilson, wilson cook yeah can you show the, the very important how to attach just wait 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 now he has attached to the can you see here can you show us the hand yes coil is attached here now he is going to introduce the stylet at least for 10 cm in just focus it on hand yes now he has removed now we are removing the coil handle and we will reintroduce with the stylet slowly can you show the floro also please First, did you the flush the needle, yeah, did you flush the yeah. needle uh, after sucking the blood in order to facilitate easy pushing of the coil into the varex? What was the question? After sucking the did, blood? Did you flush the always, needle? Always, always because yeah. if you don't flush it, then the blood will be inside the needle and it is going to coagulate. Yeah, push slowly. Yeah, just see the, can you see the uh, coil has come out? Can you yes, appreciate yes. coil? Yeah. And fluoro also we can see. Yeah, introduce. Yes. Yes. It's out. One coil is out. Can you see the fluoro, please? Yeah. Can you see the coil on the fluoro? Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah. I need one more. Uh, one more uh, coil. coil. Yeah. I will require two to three coils. And the reason of using the coil along with the glue is it act as a scaffold. The problem with the routine upper GI endoscope is when you introduce the you are not very sure have you completely solidify the varix or not here under the endoscopic ultrasound guidance just wait before introducing so the reason of using the eus guided coil and glue is we are making sure under eus guidance that we have completely obliterated the varix number one number second we are minimizing the amount of glue to be used because the chances of embolization of the glue is very much so we are using the coil plus glue because coil act as a scaffolding to the glue which we are going to inject later. So the second coil is coming. Yeah, can you see in US? Yes. Introduce. Slowly. Introduce. Yes. Yeah. Introduce. 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 Yeah. Introduce. Can you see the second coil has come? Yes, yes. Yeah. Can you give me one more coil? Yeah, 20. Huh. Now, can you see the fluoroscopy? The two coil has come. So, these coils are showing reverberation artifact. Yes, that's why it should always go with the distal most portion. Is that right? Yes. Can you give me the third coil? So this is a very large varex actually. Ideally speaking, if there is a large shunt, I would have gone for the BRTO in this case. Because if you see a very large shunt there. And you should be very judiciously should use because I can see a large shunt there. Yeah, reintroduce the coil. Once the coil will come, you will let me know. Coming? Yeah. And this, it. you can see the, Release. this is going into the shunt. Yeah, yeah I can see it. The bubbles are yeah, going push, into the shunt. Push. Yes. So, we don't one, want the coil to go into the shunt. Yeah, one more coil. Uh, if the fluoroscope is visible. Because this is the outflowing perforator and the, the bubbles are going regularly into the shunt. So that yeah. is why... Uh, in this case, fortunately, the shunt is visible and uh, we are able to see the efflux of the, of the air bubbles into the shunt regularly. Let us see if the flow has come down a little bit or not. Not yet, but hopefully it will come down. After that, I am going to use one more coil and then we will inject the… Core coil. Yes. 20 mm here. So, this is the fourth coil Dr. Puri has placed. And see, you can see how much of the bubbles are flowing in as he was doing. There was some amount of bubble in the shunt. Can you show the Doppler? 
okay is reduced it is reduced the flow yeah. the amount of flow so is so what reduced. is uh, i think we can use what we are going to use we use the 2 okay. ml of the glue and 1 ml of the lipid oil yeah one more you can show the fluoro yeah remove the doppler yeah i'm going to use one more coil and then i'm going to so you can you show the fluoro once more because four coils size of the varix has also a little bit gone down yeah so 2 ml of the glue and 1 ml of the lipid oil but as we said this is too much of a concern because this is going quite fast now yeah i quite can see quite fast into I the shunt i can see i can see just wait yes the so 2 ml of the glue and the fluoroscopy needs to be shown at that time Doctor Puri, do we want to wait for some time before pushing? No, the no, the patient will keep no. on bleeding. Okay. Yeah, I said you use the uh, two ml glue, two one ml, ML glue oil. and one ml lipid oil mix. 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 Two ml glue and one ml. So lipid this is very important because I am directly inside the varix. So ideally, I should have used the 0.5 ml of the lipid oil because there is a large shunt. So I will just tell my technician to inject slowly. Keep syringe. Keep syringe. The blood will come back. Yeah, I will tell you. Five percent dextrose first should be flushed. Just wait. But let it. Let us first. Yeah, so flush it. Flush it a little bit. Yeah. Just. So this wait. is now we going very rapidly into the shunt because whatever yeah. we are going injecting is rapidly going into the shunt. So that is the crucial time. Arun, can you fix the flow yeah. higher up? Higher up. Adjust the position because when you inject the glue, that is the time we want the yes. shunt to be seen whether the. Lipid oil and glue goes into the shunt or not, and what amount goes into the shunt? Lipid oil is the contrast. Can we see the fluoro here? Is it possible? I can see. Fluoro, either looks like that. Unfortunately, yeah. yeah, no problem. So lipid oil has been mixed. Run, run, run. Why run? Three ml. Why run? Okay, yeah. So listen, it should be gradual. Now it should not be very rapid. And once you then no. water also a little bit slow, not very rapid. Is that okay? Because don't inject the way we are injecting into the with the forward wing. Yeah, inject slowly. Yeah, yeah, slowly inject, inject, inject slowly, inject, 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 inject. Inject. Fluoro is on. Inject. Inject. Water should be added. Yeah, inject, slowly inject, inject, inject slowly. Can you see now? Yeah, yeah, that's better. Can you see there is no no embolization? Have you noticed this? Inject a little bit. Can you see there is no embolization of the glue? Yes, yes. Remove the cap. Okay. Now the fluoroscopy, you can see there is no embolization. Is the fluoro image is visible? Yes, it is visible. And there is no embolization. And Dr. Malay, can you put the Doppler signal over the varix? Is the Doppler signal are almost absent? Can you see here? Completely gone. Yes. Not so more or less. More or less. Gone. Yeah, the, like you see, there's a hardly any any signals, <coughs> and within short period of the time, the rest of the signal will also go away. When you go out, can you show us the, the scope view also, please? The endoscopic view. Yeah. Let us change the. Let see, us change the. See now that is very interesting view because you. Yeah. See can you give the upper GI scope, please? Yeah, you can see the coil is now semi-solidified. Now, can you see here? This is yes, yes, we can see. There is another varix which is more. This is this is like a like a stent within this. Is you can see the coil, and we can we'll apply pulse. Wait a minute, we'll apply e flow. There is still some amount of flow. Yeah, but I think within a within a day or so, this is going. This will go away. Yeah, yeah. Just give it forty-eight hours to even solidify very hard. I'm changing my scope to the upper GI scope. And we are going to show you. Just wait for a minute. Lagao, fuse is there. Any question regarding that? I will just highlight first. Do an upper GI endoscopy. Look for the varix. Do an endoscopic ultrasound. Put a, a, around 100 ml of the water to look at the intramucosal part of the fundal varices. Measure the size of varix. According to that, choose the size of the coil. 1.2 times. 
larger than the size of the varex and you use the 19g needle if the size of the coil is more than 10 mm if the size of the coil is less than 10 mm you can use 22g needle and always flush the needle with the 5% dextrose or with the distal water never use normal saline after every aspect try keep on injecting with the 5% dextrose because otherwise blood will be inside the needle and while injecting with the uh, glue there is a possibility that the glue may uh, solidify inside the inside the uh, inside the needle so that is the best way of doing the procedure and uh, in one go uh, is always better don't overdo because if you overdo in that scenario there is a chances otherwise within 24 to 48 hours you will see the size of the varix will be smaller than the what was seen prior to that if you do a repeat endoscopy after 48 hours you will see the uh, varix size will reduce and let's see here Can you feel the size of the varix has reduced little bit? Do you appreciate? Difficult to say, but uh, means uh, if you say so, we will agree. Don't you think because the you size the of boss? the varix has little bit reduced? But I am very sure within 48 hours the size of the varix will come down. Generally, what we do, we do a repeat CT scan to look for the patent varices, and if it is there, then we re uh, re inject either with the glue or with a coil and glue. Well done. Excellent demonstration, well done. Dr. Excellent. Rajesh. Now you can appreciate uh, the varix has reduced in size, yes, don't yes. you say? I, I agree yes. with now. Now I agree. Now. This is becoming smaller. Inflation because it was sort of distended because of persistent flow of blood. Yeah. So it was sort of bubbling. Yeah. Now you that bubble is gone. Yeah. You now see we here? can see now we can see that uh, the size is so much that smaller. Because of that flow within the bubble now the flow is gone, so the varix has to collapse. Now. Yeah, the size of the varix has reduced. Absolutely. So it is because it was bubbling, you were able to. So now this is mostly coil. Uh, and if you look, the people talk about the cost. We have used the five. Uh, we have used the five uh, uh, coils, and that costs roughly around in India around sixty thousand rupees with the two ml of the glue. So it is the total procedure is going to cost 60 to 80,000 rupees. And even if we add the cost of the EUS, it is not more than 85 or 90,000 rupees. While when we are talking about the BRTO, it is going to cost 2.5 lakhs rupees. And patient needs to be hospitalized with a catheter in, has to go to the IR department on the day two. And I think this is the procedure which can be done as a day care. And I think very clearly you can see the size of the varix has reduced. It has reduced. Thus, this patient already had ascites, so probably would not have been the best candidate for BRTO. Yes. He's already and decompensated. Another case is if the patient is a child C cirrhosis or patient who has a HCC and has a portal vein thrombosis, it is difficult to do the procedure. And EUS guided coil and the glue reduce the risk of embolization of the uh, glue. And you have seen there is a no embolization of the glue. So well done, excellent. Thank I would you like very to much. Thank you very nice presentation. We have the um, two, two more lectures. We will start with the lecture now. And uh, then we will have another case after the lecture that is a complex bile duct injury where we would like to show uh, wha wha how we manage these complex bile duct injuries. So, thank you. So, so that thank you, Rajesh, for an excellent demonstration and fantastic job done. Thank you. Well done, Rajesh. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, now I will invite uh, Dr. Jazar. I think he has come. Where is? Yeah, you you have. It's very clearly beautifully done, sir. Beautifully done. Check check check. Dr. Vivek, uh, can you sir, uh, uh, can you share your screen, please?
Dr. Vivek, can you share your screen, please? Hi, good morning. Uh, am I next? Yeah, yeah, sir. Yes, you can share your okay, screen. Okay, I, I heard a different name. That's why I was asking. All right. Let's go with that. All right. Can you guys see this? Visible, sir. Yes. Okay, good. Can you hear me okay? Very well. All right. Let me know, please, when I can start. Go ahead. Please go ahead. All right. Good morning uh, here and uh, good evening uh, to all of you in, uh, in Merit, in India. <clears throat> I'm Dr. Vivek Kaul, and uh, I'm grateful for Dr. Sharma to uh, invite me to speak on this topic. Uh, I've been watching this course uh, intermittently as I can. Uh, uh, overnight and uh, this morning. And I think Rajesh, you did a fantastic job. Uh, the size of the Verix definitely had decreased if, if you want an opinion from the US. All right, my topic is uh, difficult biliary cannulation and uh, the objectives of this talk are to describe difficult scenarios faced in ERCP, uh, particularly related to uh, biliary cannulation. Uh, the options for difficult biliary cannulation in terms of uh, managing it, review the techniques, uh, to improve success rates and then uh, close out with some summary and caveats. So uh, uh, just a couple of things for uh, young trainees, fellows, junior faculty in the audience. Uh, and I understand this is being transmitted uh, outside of India as well. Uh, these are just personal thoughts, uh, you know, life uh, journey in ERCP. At the uh, novice level, the biliary cannulation is the predominant challenge, and there's no argument about that. When you're a trainee, when you're a young faculty and trying to get better with ERCP, you go to bed with this uh, question uh, in this business and you wake up with this question. So that, that should be the primary focus is how do I get uh, to, the, uh, to the benchmark levels for cannulation. At the expert level, really, the challenge starts after the cannulation. Uh, and these tend to be difficult cases with large stones, hyalur strictures, intraductal procedures, and so forth. Uh, and that's what the expert centers are typically dealing with. In fact, the vast majority of ERCPs that present uh, to the tertiary and quaternary level uh, centers are already cannulated and have had a sphincterotomy. So the challenge is beyond cannulation. Uh, for the student of ERCP, of course, uh, then the journey is a lifetime pursuit of trying to narrow this gap. The problem with ERCP is very unique. ERCP, I believe, and I maintain, still remains the most risky endoscopic procedure. We have great solutions for bleeding, perforation, sepsis. We don't have yet a great solution for uh, a severe pancreatitis with organ failure uh, and uh, impending death. Uh, that remains a challenge, which is why I think this is the single most procedure which has the highest rate of unpredictability in terms of outcome. A 10 minute ERCP can land a patient, uh, an uncomplicated ERCP can land a patient in the ICU or a three hour case may still go home the same day. Uh, all depends on, on the mechanics of what happens, uh, you know, between the, the cannulation, uh, the pancreatic injury, and the cytokine cascade. ERCP uh, biliary access remains the most common indication worldwide, um, and uh, clearly successful biliary access uh, can be at the basic level, at the intermediate level, and in the more advanced techniques that I'll discuss. Uh, the goal for ERCP cannulation and for the procedure itself is to maintain minimal morbidity. Uh, it is the gateway to therapeutics. Without that, you cannot begin to even uh, do any interventions. And one of the things I learned on early in my career is that uh, once you gain access to the bile duct with a wire or whatever catheter, uh, try not to lose it because sometimes it can be very hard to get back in. Uh, especially if you're dealing in, in patients with moderate sedation and, and the patient's uh, uh, the procedure uh, time is long. Uh, sometimes biliary cannulation or other cannulation or pancreatic cannulation cannot be achieved despite all efforts, even at expert centers by very, very experienced uh, people. So that's okay to understand early on as a student of ERCP. It's okay to abort and return another day. That's not a crime and the patients and their families uh, will, will be grateful for that. And obviously, as we'll discuss in the rest of this talk, uh, there will be alternatives to consider when standard techniques don't work. So the options, for the overview, the overarching uh, 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 box for, for this topic, uh, there is, of course, the vast majority of patients that when you get good at ERCP, there'll be a 10 to 15 to 20 minute ERCP case stone removal, stent placement, uh, no problem. Uh, but there are some cases that are more difficult and will require advanced techniques, such as those that are mentioned here. 
Now, in certain parts of the world, uh, PTC certainly uh, remains a very uh, reasonable resource. This is performed by IR. In some cases, it is also performed by gastroenterologists. Um, and uh, of course, in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, EOS guided approaches have become very popular and I'll mention them as well. And they have to be included in the algorithm now for difficulty RCP. Coming to the basics, ERCP with biliary cannulation really requires the endoscope to be in the best position. The movements from the, uh, from the endoscopist have to be slow and deliberate. Uh, and uh, the ampulla has to be placed in a, in a location which provides the best orientation for bile duct cannulation, and I'll show a couple of graphics to that effect. What catheters and wires, it's a, really it depends on local preference, but the wire-guided approach really has some sound data behind it. So what is the short scope position? This is the short scope position. The, the uh, ERCP scope assumes an L-shaped configuration, uh, and uh, this is really a more ideal uh, situation to cannulate. In some uh, units, the, uh, the, the shape will be L, in others it will be J, so don't get confused by that. So I produced both of them as an example. And of course, this is a long scope position. This is the ultimate scenario of a long scope position in a very long limb uh, Bilrock 2 patient, for example. Uh, you can see here the, the scope has almost become a pretzel. Uh, the same situation is felt in, in double balloon ERCP. Uh, you can see here the cannulation is further difficult because there's a pancreatic stent that has had to be placed. And then finally, bile duct cannulation was achieved. So uh, things can get really uh, difficult in, in some cases, especially in altered anatomy. But uh, even in normal anatomy patients, sometimes you have to assume the long scope position. When you're doing the biliary cannulation, there are still multiple options available in terms of catheters and wires. Uh, there are still some folks from the old school who uh, will prefer to cannulate with a standard catheter. Typically, they have a level of expertise that allows them to do that. Freehand, there are still some people who will inject contrast. But really, in either category, whether you're using a standard catheter or the sphincter tome, the wire-guided approach is the preferred approach and supported by data. Um, obviously, the approach to the, uh, the ampulla is different in the standard catheter approach compared to the sphincter tome approach. And here is an important graphic that I was referring to um, for students, for trainees, fellows, young faculty. Uh, unless we understand this particular orientation and concept, it's going to be very difficult to get, get good at ERCP. So what does this graphic show? This graphic basically shows that even though you're looking at the ampulla from over here in the duodenum, um, just like every time you look at the ampulla on FAS, the actual approach to get the bile duct, the higher success rates is when you come from below, from an inferior aspect and aim upwards at the 11 o'clock location. If you are looking directly at the ampulla and, and going straight in, then you're more likely to get the pancreatic duct, which of course is often the case with most fellows. So this is an important graphic that unless you understand this orientation and imprint this in your brain and use this in every case, even to this date in every case, this is the emphasis I place on biliary cannulation. You have to approach from below and, and kind of come from below upwards, aiming at the 11 o'clock location. And this is a graphic I made uh, to kind of consolidate most, if not all, of the aspects of biliary cannulation that are in play in the first five minutes when ideally cannulation should take place. So what are these considerations? Adequate sedation. Now, for the vast majority of my career, uh, we did a lot of ERCPs with moderate sedation. But over the last three to five years, uh, with the increased availability and emphasis on general anesthesia, and also the continuous and relentless increased complexity of these cases, um, general anesthesia has become the norm, and which is the case in most of the Western world uh, for ERCP, especially for uh, those cases that are very difficult. The short scope position I've already emphasized. The other aspect is to control motility, especially in young patients. Uh, motility can be an issue, so be prepared to, to control the environment with glucon or any other agent <clears throat> that you may have. One of the things I learned in my uh, ERCP training was that the movement should be slow. Uh, if you're moving too fast, uh, you, you know, it's, it's unlikely that you'll be successful in the short term uh, and, and going to make more mistakes. So make deliberate movements that are slow and careful. Uh, and this is a delicate procedure that requires finesse uh, and, and fast movement is not going to be uh, helpful here. 
And then we come to the, uh, the actual uh, zone of uh, uh, play, so which is the ampullary orifice. And here the papilla uh, basically has, as we know from the anatomy, both the pancreatic and biliary sphincters. The biliary orifice is oriented more towards the 11 to 1 o'clock location, which is shown here in the green circle. And the angle of orientation, which I showed you from the previous graphic, is coming from below, aiming up at the 11 o'clock location. And no matter how the duodenum or the ampulla presents, this should be our emphasis in every case uh, to orient the sphincter tome or the catheter or the wire in that direction. And that really does set up for success. And even in, in some cases, despite that effort, it is hard to, uh, to get the bile duct right away for a variety of reasons. Now, uh, other things are going on at the same time. Uh, as you are positioning yourself, you're bringing the small wheel in the, in the rightward or in the clockwise orientation so that you stay in a stable location in the duodenum. You approach the ampulla from below, as I mentioned, never straight on for the bile duct. And you advance the catheter and the wire uh, gently as your assistant uh, or yourself will advance the wire. And you bring the big wheel a little bit towards yourself with the left thumb. So a lot of things are going on at the time of the bile duct cannulation. And these are the reasons it takes anywhere from 6 to 12 months of formal training in this procedure, depending on the volume that you have at your center, to get really good at this and achieve the, uh, the benchmarks that have been established uh, for competence. So here's a small video showing a very uh, short video showing a very small papilla here. Um, and you can see how small the papilla is. The sphincter tome looks so large in comparison. Uh, so we determine the angle and we emphasize that the PD goes this way and the bile duct goes this way. It's really, really important to understand and emphasize this in every case. Unless we get this right, it's going to be very hard. So we go, we approach from below, and the below up orientation is constantly emphasized in, um, in, in cannulation. And then once we do that, the wire uh, typically will and should go in the bile duct, and even then, sometimes it may not. So how is difficult biliary access defined? Well, here's the ESG guideline uh, that uh, is used typically in studies to define it. Uh, more than five contacts to the papilla, five minutes of cannulation time and so forth. There's a little difference here in the international consensus. I think the more than one uh, in unintended PD cannulation with wire is a little too strict for, for daily practice, but, but uh, that's what is out there in print. Uh, so there are some standard definitions if you're going to be doing studies and, and want an objective uh, 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 kind of evidence-based or, or expert opinion-based uh, data that's out there. However, there are some practical definitions of uh, difficult ERCP, right? So they have been listed on this slide in, in some good humor. Endoscopist uh, starts sweating. That's difficult, right? Endoscopist turns to the assistant for advice. Uh, do you have any ideas? Uh, calling in the senior partner is a very common phenomenon. I have no problems with that. But uh, once you start doing that, you know the case is already difficult. Or uh, yelling at the anesthesiologist for somebody else in the room can also be a problem. Or telling the child nurse to canceling the rest of your cases in the morning will be a problem as well. That's a difficult case. Repeatedly saying, I knew this would be a tough one, 45 minutes into the case. Uh, that's a tough case, right? There's no argument there. And sometimes you're able to even overheat the fluoroscopy machine. Uh, and, and that's a long and difficult case. Uh, sometimes the anesthesiologist will come from behind the curtain and say, you got 10 minutes to finish this case. Otherwise, and then, of course, my favorite one is the nurse whispering in your ear, doctor, I think we should stop now. So these are practical definitions. If there's any confusion that the case is difficult, you can remove these comments. So when and why does biliary cannulation become difficult? Um, there are a lot of reasons that it becomes difficult, right? So diverticulum, uh, stenotic papilla, ampullary cancer, surgery, all kinds of different things that we know of. And I'll try to cover a few of these. <clears throat> but a couple of things that should be kept into mind is that despite all the patient factors, there's also endoscopist factors that can create difficulty, right? So that's why we emphasize on training, competence, and skill set enhancement. Uh, technical assistance plays a huge role. So if you're planning to do a complex case and you don't have the right type of technical assistance, nursing or, or GI associates available, 
Uh, that can be a very difficult day. Equipment can also be a problem, which I have not listed here. Uh, sedation support is difficult. It's very hard to do a complex case with moderate sedation or sometimes even with monitored airway control anesthesia. Uh, so there's a lot of factors that could be there that, that make a case difficult. And some days are just difficult. Uh, let's just say that, okay? Uh, I know it's not a scientific statement, but on some days, things just don't go your way and you need to recognize that and deal with that. So here is a case that came in a couple of weeks ago. This is a patient who is an older patient, had a dilated ducts and, and obstructive jaundice. Uh, she is a you know, mother of a physician and the case was supposed to go very straightforward. Uh, there was no pancreatic mass. It was either a stone or a small ampullary tumor. Uh, and here we go in, there is circumferential tumor in the, in the duodenum. And what do you do in such a case where the entire second duodenum is ulcerated and mass-like? Basically, you say a prayer and you say, okay, let me try gently in a couple of areas. And, and luckily, we found the ampulla in this location. As you can see here, despite cannulation, there is no way to predict that that's where the ampulla is. So sometimes difficult cases can present where uh, all you can do is try and, and, and uh, see that some things work. Uh, so the cholangiogram here showed a fairly long stricture with a lot of junk inside the bile duct. And she's headed to a Whipple. Uh, maneuvers to facilitate uh, biliary cannulation in difficult cases are listed on this slide. Uh, obviously, we start with the, you know, uh, the typical scenario is the, is the wire or the contrast is going directly in the pancreatic duct. Then we go to the double wire technique and we try wire guided over a pancreatic stent and then different types of access sphincterotomies. Uh, and then we go to the EUS guided or transpancreatic and we go to the EUS guided rendezvous approach. And then, of course, in some cases, we have to resort to the percutaneous approach and so forth. So a variety of techniques are available and uh, uh, that can be used depending on the skill sets, experience, resources, and uh, all that stuff available on hand. So the duodenal diverticulum is another common uh, anatomical uh, uh, construct that creates difficulty. You know, obviously... Uh, this old uh, scope from Olympus is not available anymore, but uh, there may be some newer scopes from, uh, from other companies that are slimmer in caliber. Uh, so one should consider those if, if a, it's a known case of duodenal diverticulum. Always use CO2 because the perforation rates are higher uh, in, in these cases. Sometimes we have to use a long scope position and actually put the endoscope almost inside the diverticulum. Uh, it's not highly recommended, but uh, sometimes you have to do that. And of course, uh, if I know a case is coming with duodenal diverticulum, nowadays I will pre-consent them for the EUS rendezvous. This is a very, very uh, important pearl or caveat that I can share. I think EUS rendezvous is, is an excellent option in those units where the ERCP EUS attending are available or are the same people. Uh, this is a, an almost guaranteed success uh, if you are able to uh, offer this to the patient. There are other things that can be done with the duodenum uh, in the diverticulum setting. Uh, endoclips can be used, uh, double forceps, uh, forceps and catheter technique can be used. They can be challenging, but they have been very, very successful both in the literature and practice. So here is a case of a duodenal diverticulum. You can see the difficulty in orienting the, 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 the sphincter tome. And again, the redundant folds in the ampulla. Uh, and just trying to get this in the in the 11 o'clock location, even despite the uh, the difficult anatomy, and that's really the key. Difficult papillary anatomy, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, really a small papilla like the one I showed you in the original video. Uh, I still believe in the in the smaller caliber catheters with the smaller wires. You've got to be very careful with them though, uh, because uh, they they avoid they they create submucosal in, uh, injections very easily and create false tracks. Papilla with redundant folds is a whole different animal. Uh, here, you have to understand that the access point to the biliary orifice is not a straight shot, that there are multiple redundant either musculature or folds that are getting in the way, and you have to kind of zigzag your way inside, uh, inside these, these ampulla. However, uh, if you have difficulty with these papilla as opposed to the small papillae, uh, these larger, more bulkier, redundant ampullae serve as actually better platform for needle knife uh, access fistulotomy, as I'll show you later on in the video, in the case. 
Now, the double wire technique is a very standard and commonly applied technique. Uh, so this typical scenario is that the wire is in the pancreatic duct repeatedly uh, and, uh, and, and you feel like uh, this is, uh, you know, the, the, you need to go to the next step. So you leave the wire in the pancreatic duct and then you approach uh, with a catheter or a sphincter tome. And the goal there is to be on the left side of the wire and aiming again towards the 11 o'clock location. You can see here, there's also a shallow diverticulum here, uh, which may also be playing a role. So be aware of the local anatomy uh, because that may be impacting uh, the outcome uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, that, in that particular case. Uh, the typical uh, 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 fluoroscopy view with the double wire is a pancreatic wire going over here and the bile duct then goes over here. Remember that fluoroscopy is a great aid when you're cannulating the difficult papilla. In other words, what I mean by that is in the vast majority of patients, once you have a pancreatic duct wire in place, Pay, pay careful attention to the orientation of the catheter over here. Typically, in the successful orientation where you will likely get the bile duct, the wire and the catheter will be on just the superior aspect of the pancreatic duct and just in close intimacy there and, prox and, and, and approaching leftward. Unless you get that orientation on the fluoroscopy, you're likely in the wrong place and you need to readjust and reorient the catheter. And of course, once you get the cholangiogram, then the next decision is what you're gonna do with the wire. And depending on the demographic of the patient, the risk status that I, that I perceive, and the amount of pancreatic trauma or papillary trauma that we have induced, I may or may not leave the stent. My general bias in these cases is that I will leave a stent than not. Now, this is a study with double uh, wire cannulation, 156, 146 patients. Uh, again, uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, those that are, sorry. This is patients with the uh, double wire technique, uh, you know, used in those that single wire had failed. And you can see here in 25 patients, double guide, double guide wire, wire technique was successful in 72% of those patients. And the rest of them still needed some kind of access sphincterotomy. The incidence of pancreatitis uh, was, was also uh, not that different. So here is another uh, technique, which is known as the transpancreatic or Goff sphincterotomy. This is a technique where basically I'll stop the video here for a second. You have repeated access into the pancreatic duct, and despite all efforts, you're not able to get into the common bile duct. Now, this is a scenario that is typically best suited for patients with uh, you know, distal bile duct cancer or pancreatic cancer, where the double guide wire technique may not be that easily successful because of the tumor, and also where the, the risk for potentially for, uh, for this approach for pancreatitis is relatively lower compared to a, uh, uh, to a younger adult or younger female where the risk for with normal anatomy where the risk for pancreatitis may be higher. In any case, uh, the technique is that you are in the pancreatic duct and you're cutting through the, the, the common septum and cutting your way pretty much into the bile duct orifice. So that's the technique and that's what's happening over here. So this sphincterotomy is through the pancreatic duct orifice. And then you open up the orifice for the bile duct and you cannulate that. So I'll play that video one, once more without interruption. And here's the placement of a wall stent. This is a cancer patient. So uh, I feel this is a good technique for patients with tumor uh, because uh, the access to the bile duct with the second level techniques such as double guide wire and such uh, may still be difficult. And you really need to cut through the area to get there. So there is data on Goff uh, and including more recent data than this slide. This is an earlier slide from a few years ago uh, where 68 patients uh, uh, were randomized to transpancreatic uh, papillotomy, which is the Goff procedure versus double guide wire and transpancreatic had a significantly higher success rate uh, and the post-ERCB pancreatitis rate was the same. And then there is this more recent study where 203 patients were randomized to transpancreatic biliary sphincterotomy uh, and versus double guide wire here. And the success rates were much higher uh, although in some patients, they did use the needle knife access technique as well. But the overall success rates uh, were still quite significant, 85% versus 70% uh, in these patients. And the pancreatitis rates were similar. 
So uh, for those of you who have not tried this technique, uh, I think in selected cases, you can start uh, considering this, uh, especially when double guide wire is failing. Uh, and I think you'll find that this is uh, quite successful. In general, it's been my bias to place a pancreatic stent in these patients because the level of uh, uh, trauma, particularly cautery trauma in these patients, is higher than just a double guide wire technique. So I would leave a pancreatic stent here if possible. Now, moving on to the next level of intervention and advanced techniques. Uh, this is the needle knife catheter, which is not new. Uh, but it's one of my favorite devices and probably uh, as uh, some one of my mentors mentioned to me when I was training uh, and when I first looked at this device in my training, uh, he said that this is probably the single most impactful uh, intervention uh, or invention in ERCP in the older era uh, and, uh, and, and has really saved a lot of cases over the years. Uh, for those uh, trainees who want to learn a needle knife uh, access, the best way to do it is, is uh, when you already have a returning patient coming uh, with a biliary stent um, and, and you can ask your mentor to, uh, to allow you to make a few cuts. It's safe with the stent in the background uh, and, and then that's how you learn over time. This is not something that you get good at overnight. Here's a video, this was what I was describing, was a bulky, redundant ampulla, very difficult to cannulate these sometimes. Uh, the emphasis here, as has been told many times, is to make the layer by layer cut and the bile duct uh, muscle will be over here and eventually you'll find it uh, and there'll be a yellow tinge of bile and then you kind of approach that and you cannulate right from the center over here. This is the fistulotomy technique, which is my preferred technique because it doesn't involve the papilla around, around, down here and it virtually eliminates the pancreatitis risk once you leave the papilla. Now, the pancreatitis risk that will exist will exist from uh, the, the 30 to 60 minutes that you may have spent at the papilla. That has nothing to do with the fistulotomy and that's what the studies have borne out as well. So here is an example of what things can go wrong with needle knife. Now remember, needle knife is, is very commonly used worldwide, including in our own practice. Um, but this is the reason that uh, traditionally uh, it has been something that people have been afraid of as well, uh, you know, in terms of perforation risk and bleeding risk. But watch this video and see when you commit to needle knife, uh, things can happen. And of course, this is the extreme scenario of what can happen. Uh, this particular case, uh, in this particular moment, uh, this cannulation was done. Uh, there was no way you can get this bile duct on that day. And that's important uh, to recognize that. And of course, the primary focus here um, is to control the bleeding. So uh, this is a pancreatic stent, and then we just try to control the bleeding here. And most of these can be controlled endoscopically, but occasionally if you run into an artery uh, that is larger caliber, patients may need to go to the IR. <coughs> so needle knife is fantastic, but every, every so often you'll have a problem that you should be ready to deal with. So then the question comes up is, does early needle knife or, or pre-cut, as we call it uh, in, in other parts of the world, um, uh, you know, is it is it higher complication or lower complication rates? So meta-analysis of uh, multiple randomized controls trials here, about 1,000 patients, cannulation rates were 90% in both persistence groups as well as the needle knife group, and the post-ERCP pancreatitis was also basically the same. So what this data tells us is that if you perform early needle knife, uh, you know, the outcome is, uh, is, is equally successful compared to persistence, sometimes higher, but the complication rates that was previously thought to be higher is, is not high at all because you're going in early. And the same thing is in a more recent uh, trial, uh, which is say six studies, about 900 patients. Again, no significant difference in overall cannulation rate or complication rate between early needle knife versus persistence. Um, and uh, of course, the pre-cut cases had higher primary cannulation rates and decreased overall risk for pancreatitis. Because if you leave the papilla earlier and move on to a different location, right at that moment, you're reducing the pancreatitis risk. Uh, this is a, a absolutely uh, latest study that just came out for difficult biliary cannulation. And this is an interesting study. It was just published, uh, I think, as we speak in GIE. 17 randomized controlled trials and 2,000 plus patients. Now, remember, this is a network meta-analysis, which is very hard to do and typically only performed on 
um, uh, high, very high quality studies. So what does this tell us? The two basic takeaway points from this study that was just published is that transpancreatic sphincterotomy has the highest success rate for biliary cannulation with a P-score of 0.97 and a sucra of 0.99. Now these are P-score and sucra are two technical or uh, biostatistical uh, 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 ways uh, used in network meta-analysis basically, basically tell us that how is one intervention compared to the rest of the interventions. So the higher the P-score, the higher likelihood that that particular intervention is the best intervention and therefore that is the number one. And then of course early needle knife and so forth. In the complication side, early needle knife was the best approach followed by transpancreatic syndrome. So this is the data from all the randomized trials that have looked at all the different difficult biliary cannulation techniques. And I think uh, everyone should take a look at this paper. It's, it's going to be an important paper which will be cited going forward. The ESG algorithm for difficult biliary access has been seen before multiple times. Uh, for the sake of completion, I wanted to show it here. Uh, so we have a standard uh, approach. Uh, you have no pancreatic guide wire insertion or you have a guide wire insertion. Uh, these are the algorithms you follow. So if you have no pancreatic guide wire, then of course you go with needle knife. Uh, and then if you fail, you come back uh, another day and do it. If you have EUS and the case is appropriate for EUS, you can probably go that route. Um, and then if, of course you have the pancreatic guide wire, then you go with the double guide wire technique, uh, put a PD stent and go that route and so forth. So it's a relatively simple algorithm, which is what we practice, but uh, it's out there and often quoted and cited. So I wanted to show it. So that is the traditional uh, ERCP based approaches. Uh, can't do a talk on difficult uh, biliary access uh, in 2022 and not talk about uh, the EUS component uh, briefly even. Uh, so this is a schematic showing the three different ways by which you can access the bile duct with EUS. This is the transhepatic way, uh, uh, the transgastric uh, hepatic access. Uh, this is the long scope uh, duodenal bulb approach, where as you can see, the uh, FNA needle is pointing uh, uh, cephalad towards the liver. And this is the short scope uh, uh, D2 position, uh, which is my preferred position, where the FNA needle is pointing uh, caudad or towards the feet. Uh, and is more likely to easily get the wire down through the papilla into the duodenum. So these are the three techniques um, and all of them have been tried. This is a case of a duodenal diverticulum here. Um, it's one of my favorite cases to demonstrate the value of EUS guided approach. Uh, these are difficult cases and not all intraduodenal papillae can be easily accessed. So we had pre-consented the patient and uh, we have the EUS showing a huge bile duct here. And that's the 19 gauge needle. And uh, as I said, my preferred approach is to go with the short scope D2 position. This position is relatively unstable. This is as you're withdrawing the linear equendoscope from the second duodenum. Uh, but uh, with, the, with the balloon and the usual uh, uh, techniques, you can keep the stability there. And uh, once you puncture the bile duct, especially if it's a dilated bile duct, uh, you have anchored the scope a little bit with the needle and then you get the wire down and then you're in business. So let's complete the video. It's just so much easier to get the wire in the right orientation compared to the long scope position. Uh, the exchange with the wire and the scope is difficult sometimes. So one has to be careful and then you basically railroad the sphincter tome and finish the case. So the diverticulum is a good example of uh, how to use EUS access. Uh, this is a case uh, from late last year. Uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating case because uh, this is what, you know, basically means that sometimes what you see is not what's going on. This is the lesson I learned from this case. So this is another older woman uh, who came with uh, biliary stone disease, failed ERCP at the outside center. Um, of course, there was a diverticulum uh, and that was the primary challenge. Uh, I could not find the uh, a, a very clear ampulla in this anatomy. I was inside the diverticulum, outside, everywhere. I spent a lot of time. And then finally, I was able to think that maybe this is an orifice right here. Uh, I interrogated it and was able to get the pancreatic duct. Okay, so I felt very good about myself and I said, well, this is the pancreatic duct. And I left a pancreatic stent there. And the pictures you're not seeing today are my attempts at needle knife 
right over very gentle and brief attempts thankfully uh, for needle knife um, in this uh, in this location which got me nowhere that day and of course the patient came back um, and we offered her uh, uh, you know uh, we discussed eus guided approach in in the, in the beginning that was uh, not necessarily discussed in detail with her uh, and not sure was she interested in her in that particular approach but after a lot of discussion with her daughter and the family we said well can we go to the next level and she agreed to the eus guided approach and we were able to get that done but the interesting thing is that in this particular patient when we punctured the bile duct with the wire the wire came from a completely different location which was proximal to the duodenal diverticulum almost in the junction of the d1 d2 location which is quite anomalous so what the lesson there is is that this was a minor papilla in the diverticulum and if we had continued to do the needle knife in this location we would have not only perforated but created other complications so uh, ercp uh, can present many faces and this case teaches us that sometimes what you see and what meets the eye is not what's going on one has to keep mind open and look at alternatives and certainly like i stopped that day after a certain point uh, being reasonable being being uh, you know being aware of what you're doing and what's not happening and what success is being achieved or not is very important sometimes it's very difficult to keep that context in a long difficult case but always look from the patient perspective if you're not getting anywhere you need to stop and think about alternative options <clears throat> and of course uh, some folks in the far east have taught us long ago that if you can't get bile duct access just take the take the ampulla off uh, this is duct. more on the lighter side of course we don't do that on a routine basis but we do do that for ampullary adenomas so this is the ultimate solution for difficult biliary access is take the ampulla off uh, but please only do that for the right reasons and uh, and of course this is one of them and then the bile duct is wide open for you all right so uh, i'm going to skip this uh, eus guided edge uh, procedure and just go with take home points um, ercp training skill uh, uh, ercp requires a training skill and continuous emphasis on technique there are really no shortcuts um, the goal really should be minimizing complications and maximizing success successful biliary access uh, you know has several strategies i discussed many of them today from basic to advanced including eus uh, which should be uh, in the armamentarium uh, as of today uh, and going forward uh, without successful biliary access there is really no no gateway to therapeutics uh, as we know and we do know there have been papers published on consequences of failure as well uh, i think so it's it's really the stakes are high but i think if we have a team of uh, services available uh, and we have a multidisciplinary approach we have a good consent from the patient uh, about the next steps and the alternatives then i think we can make most cases successful on the first session um, and in the short term alternatives do exist when ercp fails um, i think that's something that to be kept in mind uh, that uh, there are uh, there are steps 2 3 and 4 and you should resort to them as needed and that comes a lot of that comes with experience and and putting the patient first and the safety first thank you very much for your attention i hope this was useful i'll stop sharing the screen now ready thank you dr vivek any questions yes it is open i'll start with one what's your time limits trying to get into the bile ducts so i am a big fan of looking at the clock i think uh, i generally my first turn back or look upstairs is is around the is around the five between 5 and 10 minutes if 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 you know between 5 and 10 it depends on if the fellow is with me or not um i think that uh, right around the 5 to 7 minute mark uh, i am beginning to get a little concerned uh, that i might need to do something different and if you look at the esg and consensus uh, recommendations so to speak i think the numbers are right around there um, but uh, certainly at the 15 minute mark uh, i am pulling out something different yeah absolutely and it's something very important that we really failure sometimes is very important to safety regarding to our patients because you don't want to 
be dogging on that ampulla for half an hour because then you're setting up for trouble, whether it's a perforation or uh, pancreatitis or wherever. Right. I think that that's the key thing is, is doing the same thing repeatedly, uh, you know, is now it's also true that, you know, depending on your experience and expertise level, the five minutes, you know, at an expert level, uh, probably include already a lot of tricks. Uh, but five minutes in a in a the novice level uh, probably don't include a lot of different maneuvers or reorientations and such. So it's a, it's all relative. But I think the key point is to be very respectful of the papilla, uh, respectful, uh, you know, and and adherent to the proper techniques uh, that that we emphasize in this lecture and uh, others have as well, and and utilize them. And as long as you're doing that, I think you have a little bit of a liberty on time. Uh, but if you're uh, if you're traumatizing the papilla already in two minutes, then those two minutes are as bad as a half hour. Thank you very much. Other questions? I don't think he's hearing you. Uh, yeah, I can just repeat the question. I'll be happy to answer. Thank you very much for nice presentation. If we have a uh, difficult for cannulation of common bile duct after many attempts, uh, you prefer to put stent of pancreatic duct before f before finish to. Uh? Yeah, so uh, that's a very good question. It has been asked for the last 25 years. Uh, Dr. Freeman responded at DDW one time and I was in the audience, he said, if you think about placing a pancreatic stent, you should probably put one. And the meaning of that statement is that you as the endoscopist know the best how much trauma you have caused, how much difficult the case was, and what the perceived risk for pancreatitis is. So if you, if you, if you are concerned enough that this patient will get pancreatitis and you have the skill set to place a, a short pancreatic stent it doesn't have to go all the way you just have to bridge the papilla please do it Thank remember you, though Vivek. so yes so can can i have the mic please now i'm sorry we are running just sticking okay. to our time schedule we no have problem absolutely left two ercp left and <laughs> the last Lecture I, of Dr. Anand. I Sarah. think in 20 minutes you can do five ERCPs. No. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for the opportunity. I'll be here I have watching. I Dr. Chirag Shah. So uh, can Dr. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We have a 35 year old lady. She underwent lab cholecystectomy uh, one week back, and the surgeon's note was uh, is noted that there is a frozen carotid triangle, and during the dissection, accessory duct leak was found, and there was a damage, and he has clipped the right hepatic duct, and. Uh, there was a PCD placed and it was initially driving and draining 400 ml per day and post operative day 2 ERCP was done and CBD stenting was done. Post stenting the output has decreased from 300 ml to 15 ml per day but on the post operative day 17 the drainage output has increased to 200 ml per day. So LFT is showing obstructive jaundice, ERCP has attempted but failed cannulation. So we want to see what is the reason for this, uh, so where is this leakage coming from. Uh, I hand over to sir for so uh, at the onset I'd like to thank Dr. Uh, Malay sir for giving this opportunity uh, so we are dealing with a case of bile duct injury which was detected intraoperatively and uh, uh, then it was managed with ERCP now the patient has again increased in the bile drain output and uh, uh, the we can see the drain there is pus there if the camera can show we can show that there is pus draining in the but in the, in the drain so i am entering into the uh, oral cavity this is the fuji film ercp scope Sl patient is awake patient is awake can you sedate a little bit so i am now into the esophagus i am sliding the scope slowly <laughs> Here we have entered into uh, acro across. Now we are across the G junction, so I will suction the fluid, whatever is there inside the stomach. This is very important because otherwise the patient can lead to aspiration. So we can see the fundus. We have aspirated all the fluid. Now I will turn my scope to the right and push a little bit so that I enter into the antrum. Once I enter into the antrum, I will follow the curvature and gradually push the scope forwards so that I can see the setting sun sign. 
we can see I am across the pylorus now entered into the duodenum first part. I will gradually slide the scope and now we are in the duodenum second, second part. Now I will rotate the scope and reduce the scope slightly. So we see only pus coming out, I do not see the stem yes. and we see some blood also. There is some blood also. So what has happened once if the stent slips out, the patient gets cholangitis and not only cholangitis, they get septicemia. So can we see on the fluoroscopy if the stent is there or not? If it is a just we, case of slip distance. Can we have a check? We will check with fluoroscopy whether the stent has slipped in or what. So the stent has migrated out, we do not see any stent. Okay. So the job is simple. So this is one of the problems that we had seen. Yes. So here so here we can see the bile duct opening and the bile is coming slowly in the upper end. So we will attempt there and probably we should be in because the procedure has been attempted previously. Uh, can so I get we have to now do two things. Number one, establish what exactly is the status of the bile duct. Okay, that right. is one thing. Is there any persistent leak from the bile duct? And, and of we course, have to stand. And why why there is cholangitis? Bile duct injury should not have ideally have cholangitis. Right. So basically, the stand migration has led to partial blockage, blockage, and that has probably led to secondary infection. That is what I presume, uh, because such late infection otherwise is is not very common. Here I can see the duct uh, slightly, so I'll straight away attempt in that area. Go a little closer. Wire in. No. Hold on, please. So we see the pancreatic orifice below, and we see the bile orifice above. Above, yes, sir. Okay, so can, can I will probably torque it and hold it for you. So it's because you can, you are not able to make a good position for some reason. Probably because there is lot of edema there. Because so. So couple of things are coming to my mind now. One of the problem is that is this the correct orifice that we are facing or is this a is this a fistula? Bo attempt. Okay. So this looks like check. the correct orifice. Check wire. Now we'll check the wire. And the pancreatic orifice is again yes, deep in. So it has gone into the bile duct. But fluoro, check. Check fluoroscopy, die. Straighten the wire please. Die. So what we are seeing is that the wire is going in a curved manner. Right. And it is not yes. straight away. So it Inject. is not straight away going. It is going in a very curved manner, but it is going up. And we can see there is a leak. And what appears is that this is a leak is now complete, almost complete. Complete transaction probably. So what I will do is. I would probably try and push. Maybe this is still complete transaction. Maybe still partial transaction. Uh, uh, okay. Withdraw, it has withdraw, gone the, withdraw the wire. Withdraw the wire. Withdraw the wire. Try once withdraw more. Withdraw the wire. Withdraw the wire. Uh, unbo, unbo the sphincterotum completely, and then then attempt the wire. Floro. So it's going in the same direction, probably outside the wild duct. So what I am trying to attempt now is I will bring the sphincterotum lower down and then bow so that the wire can go straight into the opposite direction. Now bow a little bit. Fluoro. Can we see Try. the fluoro image? We can't see the fluoro image. Try. Out. No, no, no. I am there. there. Yeah. Fluoro. Withdraw the wire and try again. Now it is going in the same direction. 
that is the cystic that, that is the clip surgical clip which was applied but the ercp has been done previously so at that time it was not complete transaction so we do not have the image available of that time but it appears that this is almost a complete transaction right so can we convert this complete transaction into a standable or not that is the question so if we are able to cross the wire maybe we can place a stand but it's going to be difficult because we are not seeing the proximal most part of the chd and the duct so so what are the options we have one of the option is that we can try a spy class and uh, see if there is something going on right sir that is one thing but that will be difficult i don't foresee any second thing is we one of the thing that i would point out is that this is a rounded appearance and once i see this rounded appearance the chances of negotiating such a stricture are less right and it's right now out. this has gone into the into the drain okay, in the drain. track which is created and wait a minute drain. it has gone into a drain through this tapered Cystic part can depth, you zoom yeah. zoom fluoro zoom zoom over fluoro So this has gone through this part. This is the tapered part through which it has gone. So I think this is the place where it is gone, and this is probably. So we, we, what can we lose? We try pushing at the same place. Right. So, so no, but this is going into the wrong. This track. is going into the wrong track actually. So, and it is going out. So if we advance it, it will go into the wrong track. Right. Right. Okay. Right. So can you pull sure. back and try some other direction? Floro, bo here in the middle part of the CBD. Yeah, that is see. different. See, zoom. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Floro, this is different because the first one was going through the tip. This one is going through a little bit side. But and in this case, if I push, push the sphincterotome, maybe because it will coil up, and Floro? then maybe it will go. Yeah. Try, just push. Try, Floro. Floro. Hmm. It is going up, sir. Floro. So, but we have to advance the sphincterotome up to that point. That point so, no, no. so I am taking the sphincterotome no. to the tip. No, no. Wait, pull back. Pull back just a little bit. Straight. Push it Floro? slowly. Push it slowly. I'll, wait. Now, again, straighten the guide wire. Floro. No, small pull back. Straighten, Floro. Okay. Attempt. Now we will push and die. We try push and die. If this dye goes no, into the bile duct, no, this is leaking out. Wait a minute, push, push, push more, push, push, a little push. bit more. It's leaking out completely. I no, think. no. Let us check whether Floro? the upper part is going into the bile duct or not. Push a little inject, bit more. Inject, inject, Floro. No, 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 no. no. It's, it's completely out. None of the ducts are being opacified. So this case uh, we have mm -hmm. been able to demonstrate is now converted into a. Complete transaction, and I don't think we can try uh, uh, anything can, in this anything, case. Anything, anything in this case. I think we so have to wait in the drain. Done. Yes. We will remove the scope. So, and we will go on with the last case of the day. Uh, so, in the meantime, I would like to. So, after uh, during removal of the scope, many a times we are in excitement that uh, we have yeah, we finished the procedure, but we have to careful. We have to make we all the. the PowerPoint. Uh, locks unlock and yeah. then only remove the scope otherwise if the scope is in a lock position many a times we may perforate so we may have to be extra careful of not making perforation while withdrawal of the scope and all those cases we have to suction all the fluid which is there inside the stomach while withdrawing the scope and the scope withdrawal is gradual uh, looking at the mucosa where uh, probably whether you have injured or not whether there is any evidence of blood or not so that you can check for your complications when you withdraw the scope. So, uh, we will show a couple of uh, two, three interesting cases videos. We will show just side before in the meantime we will shift to the new case and uh, what happens with the bile duct injury cases. So, these videos show what different type of bile duct injuries we encounter. I think one of the interesting cases was the first case today where we encountered bile duct injury of the, because of the trocar of the laparoscope. Now these bile duct injuries can be uh, of different types and they can inject side, they can inflect completely. Like in this particular case I was trying because I felt 
that uh, we can probably uh, get across the guide wire. What are my eye experience? Four cases, I have seen clips like this. We have parked in the guide wire and we have been able to open up the clips. So that is one thing. So that is one experience of bile duct injury. Second is, uh, we have had some segmental dissections of the liver. So complete, complete transactions to segmental duct joining lower down. So these segmental duct joining lower down, so that is one experience we have had. So that is number two. We have experience of almost 200 cases of almost completely structured bile duct where we have placed multiple stents and this uh, multiple stents uh, we have removed after period of six months to one year. So placement of multiple stents is the uh, one thing. So the bile duct injuries uh, I have uh, on my mobile, I will probably show it on my mobile and let him zoom what is uh, another uh, bile duct injury that we have. A very interesting case of uh, bile duct injury. So in the meantime, as I said, we are going to show start the case. Okay. So this is the video that I am showing. So you are showing, okay. So the, uh, night, night, uh, we will show, Dr. Chandrakant will show the vid interesting cases, okay. Chandrakant, can you describe it? Okay. Now this is a case, again, we are similar to the trocar injury where we found the patient had hemobilia and after hemobilia, a patient had bile peritonitis, we placed a drain and you can see that in this case, the bile is draining, can you, con uh, bile is draining, can you concentrate here? Can you run it once more? When you, this is the bile is draining from this part, so there is a leak from this duct going across and then the bile is draining across. So this is again a segmental injury of a duct from liver. So how did this segmental injury happen? What was surgeon told me that when he was removing the gallbladder, dissecting out of the gallbladder fossa, one part of the gallbladder fossa, parenchyma was removed. So now the next case. No, next case, next case, this one. No, not this one, this we have shown. We have discussed this in morning, no need. Next case. This is a case with spontaneous disruption of entire bile duct because of the presence of a stone and this is the NBD and this is the bile duct drain has been placed and this patient is now still, still with us for last two months, cholangitis. This is the stand. Next case. Next case. There is one more case. Yes. This one. This one. This one. This one. No, this one. Last one. So this is a case. This patient has selective duct involvement, segmental duct injury of posterior, right posterior duct. And this is the stent in this duct. The bile leak was not dropping down. And we found out that in this case, there was selective involvement of right posterior duct lower down. So we have shown you a couple of interesting bile duct injury cases. So we will now come to the last case of the day. And we have got uh, 25 minutes to show uh, how we will going to handle it. So during the daytime, we had some time crunch and we, we were not sure what exactly is going to happen. But fortunately now we have got about 20 or 25 minutes to show what we want to show. So in this case, we will be showing the mechanical lithotripsy, how we execute a mechanical lithotripsy 
in these type of cases and of course there the grades the grades have shown their tricks but and so i will now show in this last case because uh, 7 o'clock is the deadline when we have the lecture of anand sahai and it is 6:40 and i have got 20 minutes to show how we remove the stone in this case so in this case the thing is that i will start again with the side wing endoscopy i will show what exactly is my way i start generally with have my head to the left okay so in this case in the morning we could not remove the large stone with the balloon so this patient was fortunately fasting and we are now going to remove the stone so whether it will be by laser or whether it will be by lithotripsy we will try to do it by lithotripsy rather than by laser so now i am going to push it in scope in i am going to just shake my hand just show here was show here when i reach around pharyngoesophageal junction i am going to shake my hand so that the esophagus enters so now i am inside the esophagus so shaking hand relaxes the pharyngoesophageal junction i am inside but i will not advance into esophagus like this i am adopting a bent posture i am a tall man no i will adopt a bent posture and then i will rotate his scope like this and keep on pushing it like this and keep my finger on the air button so that i inflate it and as i read the lower end junction i can see the distended here i have moved my knob down half down half left and hyper extended i do it for endoscopy also so that i can see whole of the stomach mohan said palm down i would say not only palm down i would say instead of palm like this i will say like this so my hand is hyper extended palm is in fact facing the floor and then i am here this from here i would like to rotate my scope in push rotate and i am not even looking at the screen just so. and i will just want to tell you that hopefully i want to tell you this is the movement i will just look at the screen once okay i am here i know the pylorus is on this side okay now we will execute this movement sort of blindly i will push rotate and move it up and advance okay so i am somewhere near the pylorus so this is the trick that i say. learn this in endoscopy learn this trick in endoscopy palm down no means palm in fact down hyper extended push rotate and move it up now i am coming to the pylorus I have videos published prediction prevention management of perforation in ERCP. So they are important videos. I can share them with you. I know where you will create these perforations. Number one is just inside pylorus. So my entry pylorus is again with my hands. I do not push the endoscope like this. I try to slide it like this. Okay, sliding. See my palm again. sliding bringing it closed so it is i am trying to bring it close close to the pylorus keep it here okay now what this is here you will do the second type of perforation i will ask my assistant okay to hold it press it press it press it and i am at pylorus i prefer not to push i will just move right and left knob to the right little bit just 2 mm push not like this i am just inside but i will not congratulate myself but i have to go deeper rotate the scope 
Move the right hand lock knob to the right. Rotate the scope. And go rotate and move it up. I will wait. I will wait. Move it right and left knob twice, 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 rotate and rotate. So, in this case, again, I am now seeing this is the pylorus. There is lot of, I will, lot of bubbles are there. So, I will try and suck these bubbles. Now, I am seeing the D1, D2 junction. What now? Rotate slight and left knob to the right. Move up. And I have reached the critical point where I can shorten it. I will again tell. I am rotating right and left knob to the right. I will move up. So, there are three ways to shorten the scope. One way is you pull the scope, rotate it like this. The second way is make a U of the scope. Can you show this? The scope is now in an L shaped. I will make a U of the scope by pulling it out slowly. This is making a U. U. And rotate again clockwise. So, we have been able to reach that. So, we will now remove this stand. 7th French. 7th French stand. We will be able to remove. The question is, do you think sphincterotomy was a small? Do you think we need to divide the sphincterotomy? We need to increase the sphincterotomy. We will do a pre-cut. So, I will show you another type of cut. In this case, I am pushing it in, stabilizing my scope with the left hand and do a pre-cut. So, though there has been reluctance shown on people as to what we can do, but right now, I can either extend a sphincterotomy by considering classical way, but I am just offering a pre-cut. This is the needle. I will just take it out. I will apply cut over the stand. So, as the respiration is moving, I am extending the pre-cut over the stent to increase the size of the sphincterotomy in this case. Again, very careful with my pre-cut. The needle is more out. I will decrease just the needle bit back. Needle more out, slightly more out. Okay. I would like the audience to just show something else. While I was doing this pre-cut, I would like to show you. Can you show here? My fit was like this. I was waiting for the papilla to come closer. Can you see my foot? Yes. And then I will press. I was synchronizing the cut with the tap and this was ultra short cut that I was doing. Okay. So, we have increased the no, snare. No, no. They want me to still increase the size even more. My assistants say, huh? 
So it's increase size? No. We will remove it. We will now remove the stent. I think I have dared a little bit more. We will remove the stent and then proceed for Okay. Open. Close. We have closed the stent. We will remove it. Release the elevator. Pull it back through the scope. And then we are done. Okay. Now, I do not like papilla at this place. I would like to show you what I can do to bring the papilla in the right upper quadrant. Number one, I will push my hand inside, push the scope inside, and the papilla will move upwards, upper quadrant. Second thing is, after this, I can ask either my assistant to hold, press on it, press on it. So it is still in the upper quadrant. Now this scope, once it has reached the upper point, it is okay. Fine, great job. But the problem is whether it is in this quadrant or whether it is in this quadrant. So you see, as I move my body to left and right, the quadrant change from right upper quadrant to left upper quadrant. So I would prefer to keep in this right upper quadrant by clockwise or anti-clockwise. So first is to bring the papilla up. I will show you once more. Now the papilla is down. I will pull it back. Papilla is down. Now bring it in the upper half. Push the whole scope. Keep this left hand here. Rotate crosswise. It has gone to upper half. Now in upper half, Move to right and left quadrant. First check whether this will work or not. Okay, this is working. It is in the right upper quadrant. But if it does not work, then move it up or down. More important, move it right and left. It is right and left. Now, understand the difference between this and locking. My knobs are not locked. Because they are not locked, I am able to stand like this. I do not prefer locked knobs. Locked knobs means more chances of perforation. So I am in the right upper quadrant. I have papilla there. I have extended the sphincter out me. And I can see the builder. And now I want to basket. To bring the basket and bring the basket and what I am going to do is push in a basket here. So the question is, should I increase the size of sphincterotomy or this is adequate sphincterotomy? I have not judged it, but since I am planning a lithotripsy, I will not increase the size of sphincterotomy. The basket that I am going to show you, this is the basket open. We use it in India, simple basket. We get it for about 3000 rupees, which will convert to about 50 dollar, 40 dollar. We do not use it again and I am going to push this basket inside. What I am going to do with the basket is, I am going to take it out and this is the basket has come out. I am going to pull it back, minimum, minimum out, minimum out, minimum out and then lift it. Question is, it is a straight basket. How will it go inside? Now I am going to kiss the papilla, move it in and move it more up. Push the basket in and see it has gone in. So because my papilla was originally in the right upper quadrant, my basket was just small bit out, small bit, not too much out. I had to just move it up, it went in. Okay. Now I will again stabilize because in this process, 
the scope has come down again, papilla has come down again and I do not want it here. I will again crisscross, push it here and then. So, now I will inject contrast and see what is happening. I am holding the scope like this, turning my neck, check is it in the right direction or have I entered the pancreatic duct. Okay. I have entered the pancreatic duct, sorry. So, this is the problem. Sometimes you can enter the pancreatic duct, I saw it with the direction. So, be careful next time. What I can do is, I can remove the basket. I will make it pre-curve it a bit more with my hand, pre-curve it, then put it again inside and this time go with the partially curved basket, but a little bit more higher up to the topmost part of his sphincterotomy here, close and then push it in. Not only while pushing it in, I am turning to the right while pushing it. No, I slipped out again here, push it in, pushing, turning to the right. Can you show me the floro? It will go into the same direction once more. So, I am not. I am now going more higher up, third time, floro, going to push the scope in and then see if I can go. Not going? Yeah. This time I am in the right direction. Floro? Yes. So, this time I push the scope little bit more in and turn more clockwise so that I can get the right direction of basket. Okay. So, I am now the basket has opened up. The problem is in this case we had difficulty in finding the right position of the stone. So, what I am going to do is before injecting contrast, I am going to bring the scope out of view of the scope. For that I am going to push it in, more in, turn to left, more in, turn to left, more in and more turn to left and see if I can turn to position in some position and bring the scope bring the scope, yes that is that is okay, that is okay. Bring the scope in such a position that it is no longer in equation. So, though my scope is unstable, but the injection of contrast will now show the basket, uh, the common bile duct in a proper position. Okay, now inject. So, this is the stone we found and now I am going to move the basket in and out, trap the stone with the basket, oh, it slipped, I will go again up, now I know I will shorten it once more, I know where is the stone, I will come to a more stable position, Loro, ok, open. So, now this stone is troubling me, it has gone up and the basket is not going up. So, we will see. So, this basket stone has moved up and it is sort of impacted again at the upper end. Bring it down. Okay. So, there is not enough space between the stone and the stain. I should have been more careful while I was jiggling. I had not anticipated it. I was in a hurry to grab this stone. So, I am in a little bit of soup because this basket is, what I will do is I will suck it. Okay. Hopefully, the stone will come down. Is it coming down? It is still a squarish stone, bad stone and it will trouble me because the basket will not go up. Now, this side other side open, okay. so this is not going up, I am going to push this basket 
to the left, stone to the left, apply more pressure, go in a long loop and then see if I can go up or not. Okay. So, while I was going in a long loop, I saw that there was possibly another stone and I will just see if there is another one lower down. Yes, there is, there is. I am above this, so I am in between two stones. So, as I told you when I was doing the ERCP, I saw two stones. So, can you point out there two stones? So, there is a stone lower down. I will just push my fluoroscope. Fluoro, 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 because? Yes, now you can see clearly the two stones. So, what I am fortunate is, I will try to get the lower stone first and then decide about it. Fluoro? So, I am coming my most basket portion, but do not, do not see the problem is the stone has come to the lower most end and I do not like it to come to the lower most end. But one thing I just found out that the diameter of lower CBD is not as narrow as was predicted or as what anticipated by my colleagues. So, I am now trying to so, this stone is compressing the bile duct and I am also at the very lower mass and so what I will do is I will now just move basket inside slow floro floro this is the movement I am doing I am moving 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 more and moving my scope to the left and right rotating trying to get different axis trying to rotate it in the hope that I will catch rocking my body to left and right in the hope that I will catch this stone and in this case I am less worried. So, this stone is partially not yet the again I am pulling out yeah better better torquing torquing the basket like this sometimes pulling back now hopefully my worry is that this pulling back this stone will still slip out. I pulled back and this stone slipped out. Okay. So, what do I have next? I believe now that sphincteroplasty will be able to take care of both the stones because this stone is adequately fitting in. All I want is a 10 or 12 mm sphincteroplasty and I should be able to take care. So, what has helped in this case is probably executing the only thing is it is sometimes uh, you have wire in this wire. wire we are now going to advance a balloon sphincteroplasty into this this is it is more often sometimes difficult also to introduce the balloon sphincteroplasty up no up floro so the balloon sphincteroplasty has gone up we are now putting it in okay this is here the problem is that now this balloon is sphincteroplasty <laughs> is on the side of the stone okay so i am again in a smaller soup what to do because the stone is not above anyway so what we will do is we will nonetheless just inflate the balloon we will just inflate, do a sphincteroplasty, count to 60 seconds. So, what are the problems with this sphincteroplasty? Is sometimes the balloon stone can get impacted into one of the wall of the of the CBD. Okay, this stone is very much at the lower end of CBD. We are now waiting. Anand, I am sorry, I am 3 minutes past my time. I am going to take about 2 more minutes to finish off this procedure and we must have the balloon ready. Balloon and because we have done the sphincteroplasty, are we counting to 60 seconds? How many seconds now? So, we are now adequately dilated the balloon just to the size of the lower end of CBD and these stones should come out. Okay. So, 60 seconds over? Okay. Deflate the balloon, but keep it here 
and see the bleeding has appeared. The, I will wait for some time because this is a complication that can happen because if the bleeding continues I will reinflate it. I will reinflate the balloon. I had anticipated this bleeding. I will reinflate it but I am waiting. So the bleeding is a bit more than I would have liked. So we will just reinflate the balloon not so much pressure inflate yeah okay and we will keep it inflated and now we'll count to about two minutes go and wait maybe take a cup of coffee and come back in those two minutes if I can and then be sure because we will be able to stop this bleeding after two minutes so can we count two minutes from now okay it can be two to five minutes. The second thing that I am going to do now is number one suck keep on sucking because if there is bleeding continuing and start thinking of the alternatives that I am having now because if the bleeding continues if we want to push in some water the water I cannot push in because the blood that is going from the upper part of the sphincteroplasty I am not sure whether this blood is continuing or this is just old blood. So I want to put in some water from the suction channel to irrigate it. I am I'm pressing both buttons so that water goes press fast. So I still cannot find out whether this blood. So the blood when sphincteroplasty bleed occurs goes from in the patient is supine to 3 o'clock position. It is going toward 3 o'clock position but if I see the lower end of the blood in the second part of duodenum, I do not see the blood flowing down. So the bleed probably has stopped but I will keep it inflated uh, one and a half minute. Hmm? One and a half minute. So we have the balloon ready. Do we have the balloon and guide wire ready? Because even if the bleed continues, I will now have the standard balloon and guide wire ready to execute the process. Anand, I am sorry, I developed a complication, two but minutes, huh? two minutes, sir. we have crossed two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Two minutes, ten seconds. Okay. So can you? Two so minutes, seconds. two minutes. Deflate. Deflate the balloon now. We remove this balloon now and sometimes with this displacement, the stone may come out but I am now ready to put in the balloon there is blood mixed with balloon I am not worried my job is to be cure to clear uh, to clearly put in the balloon within the bile duct first this is the balloon now here I have entered into pancreatic duct I am correcting my axis. This is the axis I am correcting here. Move to the right. Place it. And the stone particles have crushed out. No, 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 no. Okay. Again push it in. Am I in the correct axis, fluoro? Yes, sir. So I have gone into chloro. First I will inflate the balloon lower down. Below the lower stone. Inflate. Inflate the balloon. Inflate remove it remove it slowly because even though it is sphincteroplasty this balloon can hurt the sphincterotomy more and can cause more bleeding so this is balloon has come out but it has not damaged my bleeding further now i will go higher up higher up and in the meantime i have instructed that injection should be kept ready for stopping the bleeding i am going higher up above the second stone I have gone higher up am I above the second stone or is there a stone lower down fluoro what is the stone lower down oh, inflate inflate ok what is, is this an air bubble ok this is an air bubble this is not a stone ok I will inflate ok now I am above the stone inflate 
the balloon has burst no it's okay i am now removing it removing the stone removing the stone now i want to see if the stone gets delivered and i am keeping it pulled holding it with my hand like this holding with two fingers moving the down knob down waiting for it to come out and the stone came out okay so the stone is out now and as i said you deliver it like an episode me but right now there is only one remaining problem and that is the bleeding is still there so right now what i am going to do is the bleeding has decreased i will show you how to stop this bleeding by tamponade from outside or by tamponade from inside now we will inflate the balloon and this is the inflated balloon that i am pressing against press inflate full balloon i am pressing it against the sphincterotomy so i can keep it pressed against the sphincterotomy this is called tamponade from outside or i can press it from inside so olymp uh, olympus people are there they have got a special balloon long balloon to strong this breeding can you ask if the olympus people have given the balloon because that balloon is a longer balloon and it can be used not only for sphincteroplasty it can be used for stopping the bleeding in a long because right now we are stopping from outside so let us see what is the effect of stopping the bleed from outside otherwise i can try it from inside the only problem is after the sphincterotomy the balloon may slip out so release delete deflate i will now push it in inflate the second is tamponade double tamponade what is double tamponade i will inflate the balloon here full inflation i will bring it back i will not remove it so see on fluoro 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 die push and die now the balloon i will not pull it back i will just keep it tight and i will move my up knob up this is called double tamponade my balloon is pressing from inside by the duct and i am pressing the up knob up with the i have locked the knob and this is double tamponade i am offering if i fail to stop the bleeding with this double tamponade i will use injection of adrenaline but i am not concerned so anand i have taken 10 minutes extra we will be sure we will take care of it we'll post the result outcome of this video after your lecture so you can proceed with your lecture now um, is it okay now i hope the audience push is it okay with the audience now means are you happy you want to see the conclusion of this i think it looks very good thank you sorry it looks good i think we can move to dr anand yes okay thank you Good evening. Today, uh, I've been asked to talk about uh, FNA, FNB uh, tips and tricks. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Malay for the uh, chance to be with you guys today, and hopefully, we'll see each other in person sometime soon. So today, uh, I'd like to start off by talking about FNA versus FNB, which is best, maximizing FNA FNB yield, and then we can have a little bit of a discussion about difficult situations. But to be honest, with the new needles now. Uh, I'm finding that there are fewer and fewer uh, difficult situations to address. So the take-home points, uh, the techniques for maximizing the yield of FNA and FNB are the same. So basically these needles uh, work the same. There's nothing special to do and you can take exactly the same procedure you use for FNA to use uh, for FNB. Rows uh, may be still, uh, still be helpful for FNA but is not needed for FNB. For FNB, we use Mohs, so Rows is rapid on-site evaluation by a cytologist, whereas Mohs is macroscopic on-site evaluation of the, score, the core specimen. 
I think the most important thing now is that the dentist have the needles work extremely well. So if you're not getting good results, the problem is more technique and not the needle. So technique is clearly, in my opinion, more important than the device. And I think the one thing that people don't do properly is that they do not move the needle tip within the lesion adequately. You have to move the needle adequately in the target lesion to collect tissue into the needle. So just to show you that uh, in this meta-analysis of FNA for pancreatic lesions, the overall sensitivity was around 90%. I think that it actually should be higher than this now because this includes uh, more difficult lesions and more obvious lesions. I think that for obvious cancers now, you should be getting results over 95%. And again, if you're not getting these type of results, the problem is not the needle, it's your technique. So if you're not getting at least 95% for obvious cancers, you should really be looking to improve your FNA or FNB technique. So cytology, uh, you know, was the first technique we used. And for easy cases, you know, obvious masses, huge masses, large SMTs, the sensitivity is really over 95%. The problem is in certain situations, uh, more difficult cases, questionable masses, smaller lesions, in difficult positions, uh, for example, in the presence of metal stents and things like that, the yield for cytology may go down. Also, certain lesions, such as uh, linitis plastica, um, uh, IPMNs, with, uh, which may have low-grade malignancy, cytology may be more problematic. So is FNA sufficient? So I think for most of what we do in the U.S., uh, EUS FNA is for the diagnosis of epithelial cancers and uh, ancillary tests are needed in a minority of cases so most of what we do certainly is pancreatic adenocarcinomas or adenocarcinomas of other origin and FNA is fine for that and believe it or not there's actually no convincing evidence that getting a core increases the diagnostic yield for epithelial cancers uh, however FNB uh, may reduce the number of passes required so the question is, instead of using a more expensive FNB needle, why not just do uh, uh, an extra pass and maybe a cell block and uh, reduce your overall costs? So FNA and cell block, is it as good as FNB? If you look at this table, basically for everything that you need for most cases, you can get the same thing with a cell block as compared to a, a core specimen in formalin. Uh, the only difference is that with, with cytology, you don't get the structure. And it's rare that we really need the structure to just diagnose cancer. You may need structure for diagnosing things like lymphoma, autoimmune pancreatitis, things like that. But for most things we do, structure is not needed. So for most cases, FNA in a cell block is probably just as good as FNB. So FNA versus FNB, why get a core? Well, if your pathologist is just not very good at cytology, you may need to get uh, core biopsies. Again, where you need structure, uh, lymphoma, AIP, things like that. Obviously, for liver biopsy, which is a subject I will not be addressing today, you do need structure. And then cases where the cytology doesn't work very well, uh, when you get, for example, a dry pass, linitis plastica, very sclerotic tumors, uh, very small SMTs, uh, although I would argue that the, the need to biopsy such lesions is, is questionable uh, at best. And uh, if you don't have access to rows, uh, perhaps then uh, I will show you uh, a little bit of data later, I think, showing that with FNB, looking at the core specimen uh, obviates the need for rows. And then FNB, uh, there are some unforeseen benefits we notice because we've migrated primarily to FNB. Uh, the positive negative results, so with FNA, uh, when it's positive, that's great for cancer. You know that there's cancer. When it's negative, you don't know if it's a, a false negative um, uh, or if you get uh, just no tissue, really, if you maybe had a more sclerotic lesion. And then in benign diseases such as chronic pancreatitis, uh, some lung diseases such as silicosis, things like autoimmune pancreatitis, we found that a negative core biopsy for cancer is also... Um, 
um, gives us more information because it shows us the positive diagnosis of a benign condition such as something like autoimmune pancreatitis. And then we've had uh, a few cases where we were doing FNA for many years in, in the same lesion. Uh, for example, uh, a low-grade evolving sort of malignancy, sort of a, an IPMN that seemed to be changing. And then once we switched to FNB, we finally were able to diagnose uh, a low-grade malignancy. So the FNB appears to be able to diagnose more subtle cancers better than FNA. And then you also get a serious pathology report, not just positive or negative, but a full pathology report, including all the tumor markers and genetic analysis where, uh, where it's uh, indicated. Why not get a core? Basically, the, the primary reason, I would say, is money. It's not because of technique or anything like that. These needles tend to be more expensive. And so, um, you know, if you can't afford it, then uh, you may want to use the, FNB, uh, the FNA needle for most cases and a reserve FNB for selective cases. We actually looked at this when we were started using the FNB needle. Uh, we were not allowed to use it for all cases. So we, we looked at it at a selective use protocol in more difficult uh, lesions. So um, we use a 22 gauge Francine tip needle, that's the Acquire, um, and we found that it provides adequate uh, tissue for histological analysis in 92%. Remember, these are difficult lesions. These are lesions such as laryngitis plastica, autoimmune pancreatitis, indeterminate lesions in chronic pancreatitis, things like that. The sensitivity for malignancy was very high, uh, over uh, 90%, and uh, all these results were obtained without rows. So I think that if uh, money is an issue. You can reserve FNA for your basic cases, and then for more difficult cases, uh, the FNB needle pr performs extremely well. So I think it's important uh, when looking at FNB needles; they're not quite all the same. Their their tips are not the same. The way they gather tissue is not the same. And I think you have to separate out the the mechanisms of scraping versus cutting. So this was the first uh, FNB needle, the, the, the reverse bevel needle. And this needle um, is fairly sharp, uh, but it tends to scrape tissue into the needle on the way in and on the way out. And because of that, it's a little more traumatic and you tend to get cores, but they tend to be a little bit bloody and it may be difficult. In fact, data have shown that it's quite difficult to distinguish blood cores from true tissue cores. The new cutting needles, as you can see here, this is the Francine tip. This is the uh, the shark core tip, the shark tip. Um, these are very pointy, and they cut through the tissue very effectively. And what we found that if you don't use any suction, uh, what you get here is much cleaner specimens, a lot of tissue here, and no blood. And this makes macroscopic evaluation for cores uh, easier than with scraping needles. So just something to keep in mind. I think these needles may be a little more expensive as well, but they do make the macroscopic on-site evaluation uh, simpler to do. So how do we maximize the yield of FNA and FNB? So remember, the technique, as I said, for FNA and FNB are the same. There are certain variables that do impact the yield of FNA and FNB. So obviously, who's doing it if the operator is more experienced? For FNA, if your cytologist is more experienced, that helps as well. What will obviously more obvious easy lesions are easier to get a diagnosis from than more difficult lesions that are maybe in more difficult positions. And then in, as I say in certain situations for example particularly with metal stents um, where you can't see the lesion very well uh, or if there's been previous chemo radiation things like that um, this may make uh, particularly FNA more difficult. Now, the, the one factor also that is, I think, the most important factor is the sampling pattern. If you can imagine here the pancreatic duct, this is a pancreatic lesion. Here's a pancreatic duct stricture with upstream dilation. As you know, what you see as a mass can be all tumor, but also a lot of it can be um, obstructive pancreatitis, particularly upstream from the stricture. So if you sample in only one area, particularly behind the stricture, uh, you may just get uh, pancreatitis and no tumor. So I think, first of all, if you are going to sample a lesion, try to focus on where the stricture is. 
uh, particularly if you don't see the lesion very well. This is generally where the tumor is. But also if you're going to sample, you should try before taking a needle out of the scope, sampling in as many places as possible. And as I say, you need to move the needle within the lesion. So you need to take the needle and move it from one edge of the lesion all the way through to give as much chance to scrape tissue out or to cut tissue into the needle and fill your needle with tissue. Okay, I think this is the most important thing. I don't think you have to go quickly. Uh, I just think you need to really move the needle all the way through. And you will feel with uh, some of these cutting needles, for example, that it may be a little bit more difficult to move the needle through the, through the, uh, the tissue, but you've just got to push your way through and really collect as much um, tissue in the needle before taking it out of the scope. And if you consider moving it through many different places, uh, and taking it out of the scope just one pass. Usually we found now that after the first pass, if you see that you've got good tissue on the Mohs, you've got a diagnosis for sure, and you rarely need more than two passes to get a diagnosis. As I say, again, if you focus in going many places, you increase your chances of actually hitting the tumor, and don't forget to focus on where the stricture is. So, um, I think most people know that the, what I'm talking about is the fanning technique. So Sham uh, Vardarajla, when he described this in his study, uh, described it as going through the wall and then staying behind the wall and kind of torquing and trying to move in different directions. I find that in hard lesions this actually may be quite difficult. So we prefer actually coming out of the lesion, moving over with the elevator and going back into the lesion, even if we have to go through the wall multiple times. And we actually tested this, uh, for example, one, one uh, pass of 1 times 20 strokes versus 2 times 10 strokes versus 4 times 5 strokes with what I call this multi-pass technique. And we found that this technique actually provided uh, better results. We sort of modified this technique. Now, instead of going through the wall many times, uh, which may increase the yield of, of tumor seeding and may block the needle with a little bit more, or at least fill the needle with more wall tissue, if there's space between the lesion and the wall, try to go through the wall only once and then come back, stay behind the wall, move over with the elevator, and by coming out of the lesion, you are really much more free to really move the needle into a completely different area of the lesion and go through into many different places, but only go through the wall once. Size does matter, particularly for FNA. Um, I think one of the reasons that smaller needles seem to work better is that they're easier to manipulate and they're easier to pass through the tissue because they're smaller. They do give you less blood because there's less capillary effect with a smaller diameter needle. The 19 gauge needle is the biggest needle and it is of no value. There are very many studies now showing that 19 gauge needles do not provide any advantage over smaller gauge needles and they're harder to use and they just give you more blood. So that is definitely a no-no. For FNA, uh, the data suggests that the 25 gauge needle is better than the 22 gauge, particularly because it gives you less blood. And for FNB needle, we find the 22 is better than the 25 because the 25 works fine as a cytology needle, but it doesn't give you great core. So we suggest for FNA using a 25 gauge needle and for FNB using a 22 gauge needle. Again, the 19 gauge needle should be reserved for liver biopsy. And just here's some data, meta-analysis showing the 20 gauge, 25, appeared to be better than the 22. And on-site cytology, well, if you do an aggressive multi-pass technique, I'm not sure it increases the yield uh, of cytology, but if you're less experienced, certainly having somebody in the room to tell you whether your samples are adequate uh, will help. But again, if you move the needle very aggressively within the lesion, all through the lesion, many times, I think you will get uh, adequate tissue, whether or not the cytologist is there. So if you have a cytologist, by all means, use them. You get a rapid response. It may reduce the number of passes uh, you required. It may show you if you have a surprise, for example, neuroendocrine lesion, and show you that a cell block uh, will be needed. Uh, and I think it's particularly good for pancreatic lesions. If tumor seeding is a concern, for example, pancreatic body lesions, where the gastric wall will not come out at surgery, or somebody who's anticoagulated and you want to minimize the number of passes, having on-site cytology may reduce, help you reduce the number of passes you need to do. 
we uh, don't think it's necessary if you're doing something like just but you know looking for lymphoma things like that where you just need a lot of tissue you're going to put it in for flow cytometry SMTs as well and just low probability lesions we don't we don't call the cytologist for that but I must say that since we moved to FNB we never call the cytologist anymore we use only macroscopic on-site evaluation and here's some data just showing sort of a little bit of contradictory evidence uh, suggesting that that actually on-site cytology may not be necessary uh, in, in some cases. This is a randomized trial by Alberto Largi uh, on FNB with and without rows, and basically a large study, multi-center study, almost 800 people, and they actually got more co more cores without rows, and it shortened the, sam shortened the sampling time, and they showed that rows should not be used routinely uh, for FNB. Mo's just looking at the slope pole just to show you that the bigger the syringe the more suction you get the larger the diameter uh, of the needle the more suction you get and all these here where you see no suction here this is all the slope pull so the slow pull is basically no suction it gives you enough suction just to get a bit of blood in the needle but it actually doesn't produce any more suction than that and the reason why some people find slow pull helps them is that slow pull takes time so I think people just sample for a longer period of time and that's why their yield increases so remember slow pull is the same thing as no suction and the yield with no suction is just as good as with suction so slow pull is a waste of time okay I strongly encourage you if you're doing slow pull to simply stop and just use no suction the stylet uh, I think we were the first to show that the stylet was of no value and since this first study there are at least two or three other randomized trials and not one study has shown any benefit for the stylet I even think that the stylet uh, with no blood no stylet you get more tissue in the needle at that time so I strongly encourage you to stop using the stylet it is really of no value it increases procedural time and it increases the risk of needle stick injury for your assistants who put the stylet back in the needle. So it is, we, we, when we do our first pass, we take the stylet out immediately and never use it. We use it only to push out the sample if the needle gets blocked, or we use it to push out the sample for liver biopsies to avoid fragmentation of the core. So how to maximize the yield of FNA, FNB? Use a multi-pass technique. Use a 25 gauge needle for FNA, make slides in a cell block if you need it, get a cytologist in the room. For FNB, use a 22 gauge needle, use Mohs, not rows, and again, this, the absence of suction will help you get better macroscopic evaluation. So suction, including slow pull and the stylet, are all unnecessary and needlessly waste time, and excess blood caused by these techniques uh, make Mohs more difficult. So the take-home points, we know fine needle aspiration works very well and is cheaper than FNB and is sufficient in many cases. If you need a core, now you can truly get a core with greater than 95% success. People with access to both are migrating to core for the unforeseen benefits and it obviates the need for rows. So if you can afford core needles, I strongly suggest uh, you go for them. Uh, just remember though that all core needles are not quite equal the concept of scraping versus cutting uh, so um, if you can get a cutting needle I think you'll find you get a little less blood and will make your macroscopic on-site evaluation a little easier so difficult situations as I say for me now with these new core needles um, there's all the yield is almost I would say hundred percent if First of all, you always get tissue. If you don't get tissue, it's a needle that's just so sclerotic. There's no other device that will really work. And when you get tissue, you either get a diagnosis of cancer or you get a diagnosis of a benign condition. Uh, this applies, as I say, a little bit less for cytology. Um, some of the issues we have with the core needles is getting through the wall, particularly with the Francine tip. You have to make sure that the, the needle goes perpendicular to the wall. And you may have to, to really have a little bit of a more aggressive jatting technique to get through. Uh, but once you get used to it, uh, it works generally all the time. But all the other problems we used to have with the scope being bent, the needle getting bent, stuff like that, 
it doesn't seem to be an issue anymore with these new needles. Uh, if you do have problems, I think it's always better to keep the scope straight if you can. Uh, for head lesions, when you go into the duodenum, um, uh, before putting a needle in, go into D2, straighten the scope, put the needle in, then pull back and get the needle. Do Try and do the biopsy with the scope in a straight position. Um, I'm trying to think of other situations where we really have trouble. Uh, very mobile lesions, for example. For example, small SMTs in the stomach. I just think those lesions, we don't even try to biopsy them anymore because they never change anyway. And I don't think it changes management. For uh, very mobile lymph nodes, I think uh, you may want to go through the GI wall first, then put your needle onto the lesion, the node, and, and focus on biopsying the node. Try not to do everything at the same time. Uh, for leading lesions that are out of reach, uh, sometimes they're, they're too deep for the elevator to go deep. You can try sticking the needle into the wall of the GI tract, then pushing the scope in to make the needle bend f further deeper into the lesion. Uh, but otherwise, we really have almost no, no uh, more difficult cases anymore. But if you have difficult situations, I'd be happy to try and uh, address them with you either after this talk or if you want, uh, you can get my email and, and just email me your questions. So I thank you for your attention. And as I say, hopefully uh, we'll see each other all together in person sometime soon. And I look forward to our discussion or any questions you may have. Sir, any questions for Dr. Sahai? He is live now. I'm on the phone with Malay. <laughs> Okay, well, take care. Take care. <laughs> bye. Bye. So, I'm sorry my slides were not advancing. I don't know how that happened. That was a little strange. So, Anand, uh, hi, Vivek. Uh, excellent points, as usual. Uh, Thank very, you. Uh, very honest and uh, transparent exposition of the data. Um, so, uh, you know, I think in terms of the the, the core needle uh, brigade, uh, you made some points about FNA being, uh, you know, still still uh, the go-to for a diagnostic purpose. So, so can you enumerate for the audience once again, please, what are the absolute solid indications, pun intended, for core needle sampling? <laughs> for, for core needle, okay. So yeah, for, for me, for, for um, the FNB needle, right? So that the FNB, audience yeah, sure. the, with the top five indications for FNB, because... I agree with you fully that the FNA uh, serves the purpose for the vast majority of, of patients, uh, and especially even in pancreatic, unless you're doing molecular profiling, which a lot of them, let's be honest, most of the centers in the world are not yet there. So I think we want to make sure that we put things in perspective. So the top five reasons to do FNB. So I guess the, the first one would be just failed FNA. If you really have had a patient where where you failed, I think it's probably reasonable now to go straight to FNB. Uh, if you're, especially if to bring the patient back, you want to use, you know, the maximum, um, increase the yield the possibility to the maximum. Uh, things that come to mind for me that are just notoriously difficult are like um, thickened gastric uh, wall where you're suspecting linitis. FNA there is in our hands been very poor. Um, uh, autoimmune pancreatitis for sure. Um, um, any time where it's just sort of, I, I, I find these, um, uh, things that you're expecting neuroendocrine tumors, although neuroendocrine, you can, even with, with the cell block, you can get, I think enough tissue to do the, uh, immunochemistry properly. Um, I'm trying to think where else, uh, uh, probably lymphomas, right? Yeah. Lymphomas. Yeah, for lymphomas, sure, for yeah. sure, for sure, for sure. And, um, but basically, wherever you need structure, uh, yeah. and or as I say, if they really do want to do this uh, next gene sequencing, for example, uh, I, I get the feeling that the core is the way to go. Although there's at least one cytologist who works with Paolo in Italy who says you actually get more DNA from 
that from is correct. psychology that's that you do from a core biopsy. Correct. Yeah, absolutely correct. The synostic studies have shown that the DNA quality in FNA is actually better. Um, yeah. Uh, there's actually papers on that topic, which is these are the, the subtle, uh, you know, factoids that uh, don't emerge in these, uh, you know, high profile conversations around, you know, when you, mm. when you, at the big meetings, right? So the, the fact remains that the DNA quality uh, is much better with FNA, but it's a total volume that you're looking for. Exactly. I'll tell you that at, at our center, just for the sake of conversation for the audience, uh, we have, uh, we have immunotherapy trials going on and, uh, for pancreatic cancer. Um, and every so often, like for all the reasons you mentioned, especially in the second duodenum with a metal stent in place, it's very hard to get a safe core biopsy done uh, with the bulk that these needles bring to the table. So every so often we have to go to an FNA route in a particular case. And, uh, and I don't tell the lab uh, exactly what I did, but in the evening, I always check with them how many million cells they had. And, uh, you know, the FNA has not, has performed, underperformed the core, but has always been adequate for the purposes of molecular mm -hmm. uh, profiling, mm -hmm. as long as you do adequate number of passes and get enough tissue. Right. Out. So I think right, the, right. the volume of tissue is the key here. So um, I've just found by doing one, one pass, one or one or two max, you saw that, uh, that um, the, 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 hopefully you saw the, the the, the pot with the with the the sampler that's usually what we get for 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 all of our cases that's about a, amount of tissue and with that we never i don't ever remember getting a report saying inadequate tissue for the 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 micro satellite instability yeah. and all that kind of business right. you know they, they manage to always do a complete report like the slide in the bottle you showed, if you have that visual um, uh, uh, output, so to speak, uh, at that point, you're looking at a 90 plus percent rate. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. Uh, you know, and there will still always be the, the, you know, the odd lesion that, that you keep sampling and, and you don't get anything. Uh, one other question I had, if Malay is not uh, has any other plans for us, uh, is when you finally describe the the four times uh, five sites and, you know, staying within the lesion, explain to us a little bit how that is different from Shyam's original multi-fan technique. Uh, I found them to be, uh, you know, the clock turned full circle and you kind of came back to that multi, you know, the fanning technique. How, what is well, no, because Shyam, in, in his videos, he never comes out of the lesion. I see. He stays in the lesion and he tries to just torque and move over somewhere else. Right. And for some reason, people... Um, seem to be hesitant to come out of the lesion and go back in. I don't know why. Or to come back into the lumen and go through the GI wall again right. when it's really not a problem. And to, in my mind, when you come out of the lesion and you com when you completely come out and go somewhere else, to me, you're always getting new tissue. Same thing right. for nodes. If you come out of the node and go in somewhere completely, it has to be completely <laughs> new tissue. You know what right. I mean? In my mind, that's that's what I think. So I really think you should really tr make an effort to come out of the lesion, move over and go somewhere completely different. You know, and I got the feeling with the, with the staying inside the lesion, as I say, particularly with very hard lesions, I think you're really not going that into many different parts of the lesion. If you come out, you can really go into all four quadrants, the entire lesion before taking a needle out of the scope. I agree with that. I think the the, uh, uh, the 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 needle is kind of fixed inside the lesion, exactly. so uh, is only there's a significant limitation to how much you can move. So in that sense, that technique is different. You come out of the lesion, but don't come out of the wall. Yeah. Uh, so that's nice. If possible. Uh, yeah. So I don't see uh, that there are any questions from the audience. Uh, Malay or the everybody must be very. Uh, sir, very Dr. Malay excited. is in another OT. So thank you very okay. much, sir. We are about to close the session. Sounds good. Thank you, Dr. Anand Sahid. Thank you, Dr. Vivek Call. Thank you very much, sir. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Be well. Thank you. Stay safe. Take care. Bye. See you, Vivek. Bye. See you, man. Bye. Bye.